What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Monday, March 25th, 20 and 24, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours. On today's show, plenty of Longhorn basketball talk. The men's season came to an end on Saturday night. The Texas women's team is still dancing. We'll recap the first two matchups for both the Longhorn men and the Longhorn women. We've got some Texas spring football updates to talk about. We'll talk plenty of March Madness as the Sweet 16 is now set in the NC2A men's tournament. We got some Longhorn baseball to get into. We got some NFL to get into. And Bucky's crush is in some hot water a lot to discuss between now and 10 o'clock on a Monday show. What's going on this morning, Buck? Oh, nothing much, BK. How was your weekend in Vegas? Weekend was great. Uh, got back yesterday. I need three to four more good nights of sleep to catch up. On I sleep. bet. But uh, no, I made my annual donation to the casinos and resorts out there in Sin City. So Another one starting to be built right now. I do expect a thank you note coming from somebody <laughs> over uh, there. At some point, but no, it's awesome. I mean, I, I I highly encourage any college basketball fan, really any sports fan, to try to get to Las Vegas for the opening weekend of the NCAA tournament at some point because it. How are the lines? Are the lines long? Or are they pretty efficient in what they do? Yes, I would say both. I mean, it depends on where you go in terms of that level of efficiency, but everywhere in Vegas is packed. I mean, most weekends in Vegas are packed, but uh, I was talk talking to some folks who work out there and they said like, no, opening weekend of March Madness is one of, if not the busiest weekends of their year every year. So there are a ton of people. Uh, if you're a single guy looking for women, probably not the weekend to go out there. If you're a single guy looking for dudes, probably the weekend to go out there. Dudes. Yeah, a lot of dudes out there, but no, man, it was it was fun. Uh, really good time and lost a few bucks, but didn't get completely destroyed like I have been at times in the past. So uh, we'll call it a successful weekend. How was, how was the how was airport? Because it's one of the most efficient airports that I've ever seen. They don't play around. They get you in and out because they want you back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, I had a 5 a.m. flight yesterday morning. And I also had a little layover in Houston as well. So very questionable decision by me to go with the Sunday morning flight. So I, I think I slept 30 minutes Saturday night because I was just like, all right, wow. if I actually try to go to sleep, then I'm going to sleep through my flight. I'm not going to make it. And, uh, you know, I wasn't going to go to bed at like 8 or 9 p.m. on Saturday yep. to try to actually get a good night's rest. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think I got 30 minutes, 30 minutes of rest. It was hilarious. The The entire row, I was with two guys who looked like they were college students. And I, I don't think there's ever been a more hungover row on an airplane in the history of air travel. Oh, my God. I mean, all three of us were hurt. And I thought I was going to yak for at least an hour of the flight. Uh, and the guys next to me were, you could tell they were hurting too. We were all just trying to pass out, but just don't man, turn that flight around. Just keep it going, brother. We kept, we kept it going. Yeah. It was a full flight too. I was amazed how many people were at the airport in Vegas, at like four 30 in the morning on a Sunday. I'm like, okay, I'm the only person who's dumb enough to do something like this. Right. Not a lot of them out there. The entire airport was packed. And I guess it's people who had the same thought I did. It's like, I just want to get home so I can go back to my own bed. Sure. Rest. I don't want to like spend a few unnecessary hours in Vegas because I'm going to be hurting either way. I'd rather be hurting back at my own place That's than right. in, in some uh, Vegas hotel or Airbnb or something. So, yeah, made the made the decision to get back early, and I'm yep. glad I did. But man, once again, we uh, we're still we're still catching up on some Z's for sure. No doubt about it. Good morning, to the soldiers at Fort Cavazos, Texas. The soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you so much for what you do. It is appreciated, and do be careful out there to you and your families. Hey, man, how was uh, your weekend back here? Good, good. I finished up all my, uh, you know, unloaded on Saturday. I unloaded a, a whole 10 yards of that dirt that was in my in the big brown truck. Unloaded that, the finale of getting all my stuff in, more manure, more dirt in there. Went out and got all my the plants and everything else, and I will start planting Later on this afternoon, stuff will be in the ground and and ready to go. So, guys are coming in to finish some couple things, and 
I am, uh, I'm ready to go, man. I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to get this planting season going on, the tomatoes. Uh, other than that, it was, you know, I watched, I watched some of the golf, the basketball, you know, Valspar. I watched some of that. I watched a lot of basketball, saw some really, really good games. And Texas wasn't one of them, but I did see, I saw the Aggies in Nebraska game, which I thought was one of maybe most entertaining games so far until AM played Houston last night. And that was just amazing. There were some great athletes there uh, on both teams. So um, that, it, it's been fun watching. And I didn't know that North Carolina team was as good as they are. I know they've been up and down, kind of up and down. But, man, when they're on, they are good. That's a good basketball team. There are a couple of really good teams still left in the tournament in that Sweet 16. But for Texas, it was it was simply, you know, your, your star players can't disappear in two straight big-time games. And Dylan DeSue, yeah. well, bad for him because he's been such a, a warrior throughout, you know, the last two years just had two of his worst games. And, you know, the guy that you expect to, when when the guy goes down, you expect the guy to lead, and that's one of your guards. And I expected Tyrese Hunter, but that guy was so busy throwing the ball away to the other team. It was just amazing. The turnovers in the tournament just kill you. They, they just do. You can't turn the ball over as many times. And, tr- and, and you're still in the game up until the last minute, the, the last 30 seconds. How the hell they were still in that game, I don't know. Yeah, you know, it was, it was- kind of crazy. It was a defensive struggle, to say the least. And the reason Texas was in that game against Tennessee on Saturday night was because of their defense, right? The Longhorns. Right. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. Were great on defense. I mean, Tennessee, you know, shot 34% from the floor. Texas actually shot better than Tennessee did from the floor on Saturday. I mean, Tennessee at one point was one of 18 from three point land. The two teams combined to go 10 of 48 from downtown. It was wow. a defensive 10 of 48. struggle. Yeah. Oh, it was it was ugly. But Texas kept getting stops and they kept giving themselves a chance because of those stops that they were getting on defense. But unfortunately, the Longhorns just weren't able to get the big bucket. I mean, they they were down nine at halftime. They were down 11 a couple of different times in the second half. You felt like they were done and they fought back and they cut the deficit to three a couple of times. They got it down to two. Hell, at one point they were only down by one point. Yeah, the the Brock Cunningham foul, that was that that's that that's the one that kind of sent them on a little mini run that they never overcame. They really just never, even as close as they got, they never could overcome, you know, that five point, oh, you know, yeah. basket and then a five, then, then a three pointer right after getting the ball right back. That was, that was a huge turnaround right there. Yeah. That was obviously something that happened in the first half, but when you lose yeah. a game by four and yes. you go back and realize you gave up five points on a single possession it is easy to look back at that Brock Cunningham flagrant. What you, what you really did is you gave up an incredible amount of momentum at that time. The dude, he just can't help himself. I mean, that was his last well, he, ever game as a Texas basketball player, so it's kind of fitting that he did have a flagrant because that's just what Brock Cunningham has become. That's, that's and that's not and that's not playing. That's not playing physical basketball. That's playing right. dumb basketball right there. You can't he just, do that. He, he can't help himself. Like you, you would well, think in an right. NCAA tournament when you're a 15th year yeah. senior that you'd have the wherewithal to no, not do that, right? No, like can't. I can't, you I can't, can't. Avo- I can't afford to cost my team five points on a single possession when we're going up against the two seed, right? A really good team, and he just, I don't know what it is about Cunningham, but like he's always been that type of player. But this year, and especially down the stretch this year, he like just wanted to really embrace a villain role and just it felt like every game towards the end of the year. Yeah, you're looking for when it's going to happen, when he's going to push a guy or shove a guy in the back or whatever. You know, he had an elbow the other day to hit a guy in the head, which, I mean, that the game before that, guys were just flailing on the other group. That, that other group were just falling down on contact. They were playing very weak basketball, I thought, and, and getting the benefit of some calls, but – Dude, you can't have your elbow up. You still can't have your elbow. I don't care how tough you want to be, and and basketball is is now wussified. No, you can't have your elbow up there. You've you've been around the game too long to know that. But you're right. He just can't. He can't help himself. Can't help himself. No, and it's annoying that we had to keep talking about that this year. Uh, we won't have to talk about that anymore because Brock Cunningham's Texas career is over. And look, he did plenty of good things during his tenure in Austin, but. Uh, yeah, frustrating end to his time here. No, frustrating end to the season because Texas was right there. Uh, you give them credit. They played hard. They fought back. But obviously that stuff doesn't advance you in no. the NCAA tournament. And at the end of the day, it's frustrating because you were right there 
You had your chances down the stretch against a very, very good team. Texas just couldn't make the big bucket, right? The Sioux missed a shot that would have tied the game in the final minute and a half. You know, when the Longhorns were down three, so they were down one. Tennessee got fouled. They made their two free throws, so it was a three-point game. And, you know, and instead of calling a timeout, Rodney Terry had one timeout left. It's less than 30 seconds to go. I thought he should have taken a timeout, drawn up some sort of play, right? Texas didn't need a three there. They could have gotten a quick two and played the fouling game to elongate the game and give themselves a couple of extra possessions down the stretch. But instead, they don't take a timeout. They run a horrible play that ends up with Max Aismas taking like oh, a fadeaway good. three from the corner. Terrible fadeaway three, that was. And then, you know, Tennessee gets the rebound. His last two games that he and DeSue were just, I have no clue what was going on there. And, yeah. you know, especially from Dylan DeSue. And it wasn't the three-pointers that he missed because he took a million of those. The ones that he was missing was those little bunnies that were right there for him. And he generally doesn't miss that little jump shot, you know, from less than 12 feet away. He just – it just was – he just was not – he wasn't good. I'm, I'm sorry. that Those were his last two games were maybe two of the worst games I've seen him ever play. You're being nice. If you're uh, By saying he wasn't good, you're being nice. He was bad. He was bad. And it sucks because last year he was Texas's best sure. player in the tournament before he got hurt. Hell, he was one of the best players in the entire tournament before he got hurt. And he's obviously been the best player on this team all season long. And you were hoping like he was going to be on a mission because of the way his March ended in 2023. And look, Texas obviously won one of the tournament games, but you're right. He was bad in both games in the dance. He was four for 18. Buck, I, I don't think there's been a moment this year where I was like yelling at my TV whenever Dylan DeSue shot it. Cause usually like he's been the best offense for this team. Usually right. even a bad Dylan DeSue shot has a better chance of going in than a good shot for a lot of the other guys on this team, but everything he was throwing any, any at the shots rim. better than what Dylan Mitchell will throw up. I mean, that guy was hitting the bottom of the net in game one, the bottom of the net on a jump shot, not the rim, but yeah. the bottom. He couldn't get it to the rim. That That is not an NBA player. Now the no. two lefties that play for Texas A&M, those are NBA players. I mean, those dudes, they're left-handed and guess what? They're going to take you to the right, but they're going to get back to their strong arm. That, that was a fantastic group that I watched. I'm like, wait a minute. Who are these guys at AM? And Dylan Mitchell is supposed to be a guy who's supposed to be an NBA player. I said it's not even close. Yeah, Dylan Mitchell. You know, we'll see what his future holds. I mean, he's got a couple more years of eligibility, so he obviously could return to Austin, but uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. What along. It's time for it's time for them to move along from that dude. Oh, you're saying it's time for Texas to move along? Yeah, yeah. If if you want move along, you no. find you can find a high school kid that's uh McDonald's All American that's gonna do he gives he gave you nothing. He gave you no. nothing in two of the games that they need him. Now, I understand the other guys, but they've been giving you something all year. Ace and, you know, Ace and DeSue have been giving you something all year. This guy's giving you, giving you barely anything all year. And then he gets to the most important games, and he gives you nothing. Yeah, Dylan Mitchell was one for three with two points in 26 <sighs> minutes points. on Saturday. Had just four rebounds. Played some good defense. I mean, everybody on Texas played some good defense. And yes, they did. Yeah, even, you know, even Tyrese Hunter, who just decided that he would throw the ball to the other guys a whole bunch. Yeah, but he played. He played tough defense. They they all played great defense. Yeah, because you know, they didn't have any offense going. That's for sure. All right. I mean, Dalton Connect is one of the best players in college basketball. He's a consensus first team All American, and he was five of eighteen shooting. And that was a Kai Ziegler, their star point guard, two of twelve shooting. I mean, it was a struggle offensively for Tennessee and once again they were one of 18 from three at one point they finished three of 25 from three for the game and uh, what's weird were, BK is as bad as Ziegler was he still controlled yeah. the game for them you know yeah I mean he did have he seven he could, deep, he could deep he's a good defender himself yeah. steals yeah yeah he's a good player I mean Tennessee look Tennessee's better than Texas that's why they were favored to beat sure. Texas you know they're a two seed the Longhorns are a seven seed like they were, uh, they were supposed to win that game on Saturday, yes. uh, and they did. But, yeah, I mean, to, to play that good of defense, coupled with Tennessee just having that bad of a shooting night, because as good as the Longhorns were on D, a lot of Tennessee struggles were just them missing open looks. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially from three, and they're usually a much better three-point shooting team than that. And it just it adds to the disappointment of the L. That, uh, yeah, they also I have guess. an aggressive big man that's aggressive at all times. I mean, he – he may foul out of a bunch of games and get close, but their big dude was physical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, Texas, if you told me to foul out, did he eventually foul out or did he make it with four fouls? He never went, he never fouled out, did he? No, nobody fouled out in that yeah. game. 
everybody in the Houston A&M game that you talked about oh. fouled out. It felt like, I mean, Houston, I was worried Houston was going to have to start bringing in fans from the stands to finish that game. If it went to a second overtime, I don't know what the hell Houston was going to do in that epic clash between the Cougs and the Aggies yesterday. But and the Aggies yeah. got some guys will be returning to that. They got a group, a pretty good group. Yeah. Yeah, they do. I mean, it was a good year for AM. They they were a top 15 team to start the season. That's what they we actually, said. I remember saying that a couple of weeks ago, how you kept saying. I mean, this is a group that was supposed to be good, and you could see why. I mean, yeah. they played their best ball at the end of the season. That was that was good basketball. That was a good basketball game. As I said, I really enjoyed the Nebraska AM game. I did because I wanted Nebraska to win, so I hated it. I don't I never enjoy something that AM wins. It's not fun. Come on, man. Can't do you don't that. Want, you don't want the Cornhuskers there every win either. Yeah, that's that true. to be tough. Two, two, those two teams playing? Yep. I think Nebraska is the lesser of two evils, but uh, I don't think I would have celebrated either team winning no. that one. I was pretty happy Houston found a way to get the job done in overtime yesterday. But yeah, for Texas, going back to the Longhorns, Buck, I mean, if you would have told me before tip-off on Saturday that Dylan DeSue was going to go 4 of 18 – and Max Acemus was going to go three of ten with four turnovers. I would have told you Texas lost that game by thirty, right? Yeah. I, I never would have thought it would have been close. You need your best players to be your best players in the tournament. Absolutely. And look, Texas played two NCAA tournament games. They didn't crack sixty in either of them. Now they got a win because Colorado State couldn't buy a bucket on Thursday. But yeah, you, you're really playing with fire if you can't even get to sixty. You're playing a team as good as Tennessee, who's been ranked in the top 10 in the country all season long. Uh, yeah, you, you get stuck on 58. you got a very slim chance of finding a win. And at Texas offensively, especially in the half court, when they were able to get out and transition, they could make some stuff happen. But whenever they got set into their half court defense, oh, Tennessee is one of the best defenses in the nation. So give them some love, too. Uh, Texas just couldn't get buckets when they needed to, and that was a theme of the season. But, of course, that's what really did them in in this NCAA tournament. Yeah, I mean, Dylan, like, as, as I said, that that guy, you know, he's going to have an off night, but I didn't think he was going to have off nights, not back-to-back. I'm like you were. I think I thought he was going to come back strong after the first game that he played. That was horrific for him. I mean, I I, I, I expected Ace Moose, I expected them to put some taller guys on him because that was what the Big 12 eventually – I don't know why it took them so long, but they figured out, let's put a big guy on him. He's going nowhere. He's not jumping over anybody. He's not coming off of, of picks and screens where he can still jump, you know, all you got to do is get your hand in his face. He he has a tough time with 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 hands up on him, and he's just not that kind of – he doesn't have that kind of quickness. He's a little fella. You know what I mean? Ziggler has quick – Ziggler Ziggler has quickness. That dude – that dude moves. I mean, he comes off of screens, and he comes off on the move, and he'll go, he'll go to the rim, but they'll find other guys. His assists are pretty good when he goes – to the whole, I don't expect him to, but he does throw up some some BS that goes in every once in a while too. Yeah, I mean Ziggler's a true point guard, and Texas he is. Didn't, he's absolutely, you're absolutely right. He's a true point guard. Like Max Acemus is not right. Max Acemus no. is the size of a point guard, but he's really a shooting guard, right? Like that's that's yes. what he does. He, he's he has not, a hard time getting his shot off over bigger guys. Right. Yeah. 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 Look, Acemus had a tremendous season, but against uh, some of the more physical defenses that the Longhorns went up against. Uh, he did struggle at times, and he struggled on Saturday for sure. And you brought up Tyrese Hunter earlier, Buck. Wow. Now, Tyrese Hunter was great in the last three minutes of the game. He helped bring Texas back, had a couple of layups, had that three to cut it to two before Dalton Connect iced the game with some free throws in the last 10 seconds. But for the first 37 minutes, I thought Tyrese Hunter was point shaving. I was looking for him. I thought he was hanging out with Shohei in Vegas placing money on the games or something like that. I mean, he was just – he had six turnovers – Taking oh, yeah. bad shots. He was Lately. afraid to throw the ball. He was afraid to, that he he had talking about having the yips of just passing the ball to his his players that were just close to him. He was nervous about throwing the ball then. Yeah, just, you look at you look at nervous. You're right. You look at Tyrese Hunter. He was the leading scorer for Texas with 13 points. But once again, most of that came in the last three minutes. And look, you, you give him credit for what he did down the stretch. But that's that's Tyrese Hunter in a nutshell, isn't it? We've yeah, talked about how inconsistent he's been all season long. And even in the same game, Buck, like you're right, he looked scared and nervous and lost for like 37 minutes. And it's like, God, who is this guy? And then he plays great. And it's like, where was that for the first yeah. 90% of this game? What are we doing? Well, they even had opportunities like Dylan DeSue. You know, that's how bad he was. Then he'd get to the free throw line late in the game and he missed two free throws. I'm like, dude, okay, 
you're having a bad game, but sit there, compose yourself, and make these free throws. Your team needs these free throws. He was just off, off. I don't, I don't know if it, if his knee bothered him or whatever. He just looked tired, and and it's just hard to say. He just had a bad game. He just had two bad games, yeah. like you said. And I'm being nice to him. Right. Yeah, I don't know if it was injury related uh, for Desu. I remember, he got hurt, you know, down the stretch in that Baylor game. I think the second to last game of the regular season. Didn't miss a game after that, but maybe he wasn't at a hundred percent. That guy was yeah. not missing shots when he got it at, at the ten to 12, eleven to twelve yeah. yard. Uh, foot range. He was making those jumpers. Were, he's that little jump shot that he would have in there. Dude, it wasn't even close to going in. No. no. It was a bad time to have a bad game. It was. And Yeah. Uh, you know, a bunch of Texas players had a bad game. I, I, I say on the positive, and here's a guy who is coming back for the Longhorns next season. I thought Kendall Weaver was spectacular again. Yeah, I just got nervous every time. he Because he was starting to take his jumper. He started to feel it, thank goodness, because nobody else was hitting him. But every time he takes a jumper, I go, no, yes, no, no, yes. Yeah, he, he works on that part of his game. He had, he's got energy. He's got all kinds of energy. He's got great hops. He he knows how to defend. You know, he knows how to defend, and he gets away with hacking. I don't know how he gets away with it, but he does. He slaps down at the ball. He must get a lot of ball, and they must not hear any skin, but he slaps at the ball. He gets away with it. it they let him play tough defense on, on offensive players, and he can rebound, and he can start a break. And he he really, for a guy who's going to be there for a couple of years, that's that's what that's good to see that because as, as you I think you believe that his jumper will get even better. I do. I mean, I, look, that's got to get worked on. He did make a three. He switched in a three on Saturday, which was great to see. But you're right. I mean, what makes Kendall Weaver a weapon for this team is just how aggressive he is, and he plays fast. And he was one of the bigger contributors for Texas. You look at all the guys the Longhorns got from the portal last off season. You know, Kendall Weaver was kind of an afterthought. And yes. he's, I think, the guy, or at least one of the guys that Texas fans are most excited about for the future. Because, yeah, in his, you know, in his redshirt freshman year, uh, he got so much better over the course of the season. He had 13 yes. points on Saturday, yes. six of six from the free throw line. He's great in transition, plays that lockdown defense. He hustles, you know, 24 7, 365. And he's not, I don't think he's ever going to be a star player. But you think of guys who can be a part of your program for three or four years like that. That's going to be an X factor for Texas if he keeps. Yeah, and, it, and the moment doesn't seem to bother him. Like you said, he gets up to the free throw line and he just makes them. You know, he doesn't he doesn't take an extra deep breath. He just goes and he just plays. Yeah. The moment doesn't seem that it's that big for him. He he enjoys the moment, you know, when he gets down there and he has to go to his right and make plays because he will go to his right now. And he, and he just makes plays He's, and he can come off the ground so quickly and and defend and block shots and he will try to go over the top of you too so i mean i, I like the way he plays it, it's fun to watch him it's not fun to watch Dylan mitchell play it's just not fun to watch him he's not a, he has for a guy who's supposed to have all he's good if there's nobody around you and the ball comes off the rim and he slides by you and he dunks the ball but he just he's not aggressive offensively he he has no confidence in his jumper as i said it was hitting the bottom of the net he would come off a pick. He'd have a nice where he can rise against. He's not like uh, Acemus where he can't get his shot off, but his shot's no good. No, he's not good. I and mean, there's nothing to it. Dylan Mitchell's not a good basketball player. And it sucks because he was a top 10 recruit in the country two years ago. Wow. And he was you know, supposed to be one of these turnaround type of players, right? Sure. And he, he's going to go down. I don't know what the future holds for him. I've said it on, on record that I think he should leave right now. Like, you're like, well, he's not ready for the NBA. Why would he go to the NBA? Well, if he comes back to college for another year, then people are going to realize that he's not good. And Yeah, well, the NBA is going to realize that guy's coming back again. Well, the NBA, yeah, the NBA is all about potential. And the longer you stay in college and show that you don't have much potential, the worse your yes. chances are of getting drafted in the NBA. So, you know, I, I think Dylan Mitchell actually hurt his draft stock by coming back this season. He had a better year two agree. than he did year one. Yeah. But because like he still looks lost, especially on offense, I mean he gives you nothing offensively. And I just I don't know how if you're an NBA team, you can look at that guy and say, No, he's a guy we want on our roster. He's a guy who can help he, us win. He can't handle the ball. No, on the, even just one on ones, forget going against a couple hands reaching in there. He can't do the one on ones versus a guy where he can just take him, just take him. There's nothing, there's nothing where he gets to his left side where that dominant side of his where he can dominate you. 
with his athletic ability. He doesn't have a shot from there. He doesn't have anything off the backboard, you know? You know, you see those lefties that can dominate you. They go right, but then they spin on you and they get to their dominant left hand and lay it in. He doesn't have that. I'm like, how are you not missing that with the athletic ability that you have? Yeah, he's a great kid, obviously yeah. not taking any personal yeah. shots. Are some of these things coaching too? I mean, aren't they? Aren't I, I, they? I don't know. You, you know, to an extent, yes, but you got to have feel. Like Dylan Mitchell was ranked as a yeah, top 10 doesn't... recruit because of the athleticism, and he put up sure. some ridiculous highlights, and he was doing things on a high school basketball court that not a lot of guys could do. But he never yeah, really right. had a great shot. You know, you kind of hoped that would develop a little bit. And some of that can be on coaching. Uh, but coaches can only do so much there. And then, yeah, he just, he just doesn't have a great feel for the game. And that's he, – he's not the only, like, top 10 to 15 recruit in the history of college basketball who just, just hasn't had it, right? Uh, it sucks. But he's, he's going to go down as, like, one of the most disappointing Texas basketball players ever. Unless he comes back for two more years and gets significantly better – then we can look back and say, boy, we were wrong on this. And it, God, you know, his development was awesome. I'd rather, be, I'd, rather, I'd, rather be, I'd rather be right on this and part ways and find some other kids that are ready to go. Yeah. They can yeah. give you something. I mean, it's, really. It's annoying. I mean, like this would be annoying if Dylan Mitchell was like a, a three-star recruit and this was the type of performance you'd be getting, right? You'd, you'd want no more doubt. from a starter at the University of Texas. But because this that is – dude was starting in the games. And then he brought Horton in as a starter. I'm like, we're trying to get off to a good start here. Why, don't we, why, why is that guy starting in basketball games yeah, at the University of Texas? I, I don't – I'm like – I'm thinking, are they waiting for him to hit one of these jumpers one time? Because he's a liability on defense. He's going to foul. He doesn't rebound that well. And you want him to get a streak going, shooting. And when he doesn't do that, then you need to go ahead and get him out of the game. I don't care if it's one minute into the game, 30 seconds in the game. First of all, he shouldn't be starting in your team. Yeah. Horton only played nine minutes, but he did start. And that was, you know, Ronnie Terry kept switching up the lineup throughout the year, right? Weaver started for a few games in conference play. Cunningham started for a few games in conference play. Horton started like the, just that fifth starter. And Ronnie Terry yeah, was almost, I my almost best five guys in the tournament playing immediately. Yeah. 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 I mean, Horton didn't, didn't really do anything. And you're right. I mean, he was horrible on defense like he was all season long. Let's hear from the coach. We got uh, some audio from post game. On Saturday, the Longhorns, of course, watching their season come to an end, 62-58, to 58, the final score in the round of 32. Here's uh, Rodney Terry first, his opening statement following the L. Um, a lot of respect for Coach Barnes, family to me. Um, happy for him uh, and his team. But I'm, I'm really proud of my team and my guys. I love these guys. These guys had a heck of a year. Um, we got better and better as the season went along. Uh, they really persevered through some adversity at times, and they just stayed the course. And uh, I'm just so proud of how they carried themselves all season long, on the court, off the court. And, uh, you know, I can't be prouder of a, of a group uh, that I've had a chance to be a part of and work with every single day and coach. So I love my guys, and I love their effort tonight. We came up a little short, but uh, these guys are winners, and they're going to be winners for the rest of their lives. That's good. He's got a lot of coach speak to him. Yeah. But that's that's fine. I mean, there's 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 that sudden certain grit that I think you have to have when when tournament times and loving your guys is nice, but they need to love you by playing well. And the two your two stars did not play well for two games, two straight games. And you know, some of that stuff is the, the nice guy stuff is okay, but man, there needs to be there a couple of those guys needed a boot in their ass. I mean and if you if, if you got guys hacking guys and turning the momentum, that guy can't get back on the floor. And if you and if, if he's doing it, I don't care how what what he is as a hustler. If he's going to cost you five or six points in a stretch, that guy can't get back on the floor. That that's costing your team. You know yeah. that's that's there's, there's silliness. If if you got some guy that you think, well, I got to see if he's our spark plug, so I got to start him tonight. That's on you, coach. You put your five best players out there. Let's go. You know, get grab the momentum of games immediately, not to see if who's on and who's off. You know, that's 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 if you're unsure yourself. And Rodney sometimes to me he just he coaches unsure. Mm. You know, he throws in lineups that are just I don't think he's sure of. He's just kind of hoping that they'll work out. You know, yeah. yeah, they had a nice year. They didn't have a great year. They had a nice year. That's all. Yeah, it was a nice year, and you go back and look at what Chris Beard did in his first season in Austin, and it's very similar to what Rodney Terry just did, right? Right. 
Texas was a six seed in the NCAA tournament and Chris Beard's first season. They won their first round matchup. Then they lost to a really good team in round two. Uh, this year's squad with Rodney Terry, they were a seven seed. They won their first round matchup and they lost to a really good squad in round two in a close game, right? I mean, Chris Beard's team barely lost to Purdue in that 3-6 matchup a couple of seasons ago. It came down to the final minute. Uh, I remember Jay Nivey hit a dagger three with like 50 seconds to go. But Texas was right there against a really good team in that game, and they came up short. And then same thing here. And against a really good team, Texas yep. was right there in the final minute and came up just a little bit short. So, uh, look, I, I, like, I am not the biggest Rodney Terry believer out there. Uh, I made my stance, or I set my stance when he got hired, but Rodney Terry should absolutely be back for another season. I mean, this sure. was not a, a this is not a bad year for Texas basketball. I mean, this is a very nice year. Yeah, it's a solid year. Like when you come off an Elite Eight performance and you get that taste of being that good and you get that close to the Final Four, then anything short of that is going to feel underwhelming. But Texas lost so much from that squad last year. Obviously, it was the first full season of this head coach. Like it, it was unrealistic expecting the Longhorns to get back to that point this year. Now, the hope is okay, this is what you did in year one. You got to get better from here. You got to get better from here. And that's what you hope Rodney Terry can do is that he could find a way this offseason. It's going to be tough because Dylan the Sue's gone. Max Aismith is gone. Brock Cunningham's gone. IT Horton's gone. Really, the two guys that matter in that bunch are the Sue and Aismith. They were your two best players. They were your two leading scorers. Those are not going to be easy guys to replace. If you're RT, right. you've got to find a way to replace him. You've got a really good high school class coming in, including a McDonald's All American and Trey Johnson from the Dallas area. But you got to hit the portal. You got to do whatever possible to, to make yes. sure that this team is better next year, despite losing your two leading scorers. So, yeah, not, not an amazing year, but a solid year one. Uh, if you're talking about, or if you hear anyone talking about Rodney Terry losing his job, I think that's crazy. He he did enough did so. to deserve the chance to at, le at least get one more season to show what he can do as the head man for this program. Yeah, going into the SEC, he's he's not going to face the, the quite the ta talent he's he's faced in the Big Twelve, but it's damn starting to get close. There are some good teams he's going to be playing against from this point on too, and he's got to be able to recruit guys and he's got to get in that transfer portal and get some grown men in there. You know, I mean, he's going to have to get some big, strong, physical guys. I mean, Shedrick is – he just – I mean, I'll, the big men that I saw this weekend, BK, he's not on the same level near those dudes. No. He just no, not. And Shedrick, you know, he was just hurt all season long. He can't come back right. for another season. I think I want him to come back for another season. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, big guys dealing with injuries. He's got shoulder problems, back problems. That just kind of plagued him this year. So hopefully he can get healthy this offseason. Yes, and come back get, a little bit stronger. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we can get – look, I, I don't think – if Caden Shedrick's one of this team's best players, then that, that's going to be a problem. But I think he can be more of a contributor in 24-25 than he was in 23-24. Sure. Um, and, and, yeah, we'll see what Tyrese Hunter does. He can come back for another year. We'll see what Dylan Mitchell does. He can come back for another year. We talked about Kendall Weaver – but you're losing. I mean, this was not a very deep team this year. So you talk about only losing four players. That's less than you lost last year. But you're losing four of your top seven guys from from this year's squad. So, uh, yeah, you got to find a way to, to bring in some more talent. And that's a huge part of coaching nowadays. It's roster construction. So, yeah, can, and I would be and, and, and I, I would think that, I mean, as much as I said, they ought to part go at part ways with Tyrese Hunter. If he decided he wanted to come back another year. I, you can't be against that. You just got to hope that he spends his time shooting, understanding he has to control the game. He can't just throw the ball away. He can't play in spurts. He has to be more consistent as a player. I'm not talking about consistent from game to game. I'm talking about from minute to minute within a ball game. Yeah. Then yeah. he's got to be that guy, you know? You're right. Yeah, I mean, if Tyrese wants to come back, you you, you take him back for sure. And you oh hope that God, in his yes. fourth year of major college basketball that sure. he can put it together more so on a night-in and night-out basis. Uh, yeah, but I don't, I, I don't know what he's going to do. Like, I, I, mean, I don't think Tyrese really Hunter – I don't think Tyrese Hunter should stay for his sake. Like, I, I think he needs a change, change of scenery. I don't know if that's trying his hand at the professional level. I don't know if portal, that's hitting the portal. Go and, yeah, for yeah, going somewhere yeah, else for a year. But like he he has not developed, and I don't know if it's on him. I don't know if it's on the coaches. It's probably a combination of both. But for that guy, he should probably leave. 
yeah, if you're a Texas fan, despite the annoyances that uh, that he would sometimes provide, uh, considering how much else you're losing, I think you would absolutely yes. welcome Tyrese Hunter back with open arms if no he doubt. does want to return. So it is, no, there's no doubt, but he may suit himself well being coached by somebody else too for a year. <laughs> somebody and, and on another- the Excuse me, Buck. Someone on the code of text line, 512-222-9328. I wouldn't pick Hunter on my team at Gregory Gym. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's what it just felt like. I mean, it just it just didn't get better. And, you know, some of I mean, coaching does matter. I mean, you look at some of these guys and you say, that guy should be pretty good by now going, you know, second year in college, third year in college. I mean, he's he's been good before. What is it about here that he couldn't be better? I mean, he just didn't get better from year to year. I know sometimes don't you have to get a little bit better as right. as you progress in the sport? No, he 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 didn't. And his ball handling and his his just thought process of you can't throw through a guy. Can't you know some guys you're not going to throw it over, but in key key times you can't turn the ball over. You can't win. Your team can't win games the way Texas turned the ball over in the last two games and got you know what I'm saying. How about- First time they got away with it. The second game, not with that team. That team played – boy, boy, does Tennessee play good defense. Now I, I see why well, they talk about how good they play defense in the SEC with, with that Tennessee team. Wow. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a top three team in terms of defensive efficiency, according yes. to Ken Palm. So you, you give them no a lot doubt. of credit. Like that, They've been doing that to teams all season long. Uh, but, yeah, back to Tyrese Hunter. I mean, that's your inbounder. Like that, that's a big role to have. Like that's that's a guy that coaches have to trust. If you're inbounding the ball in key situations, yes. like that, that means a lot. And Tyrese Hunter was called for traveling on an inbound, not something you see every day. And then he also had that awful turnover where he and Max Aismas weren't on the same page. And it was just like a very minor press that Tennessee was instituting. Like it, it should have done anything, yet Tyrese Hunter threw the ball away. Went out of bounds and it gave yeah. Tennessee an extra possession. That's one of six Tyrese Hunter turnovers. So it's yeah, like, Nace was not uh, that much better. I mean, he is he's a guy who runs to the corner and then they double team. I'm like, don't go to that corner. Yeah. Whatever you do, stay in the middle of the court. Do not get your little ass caught in a corner. And time in and time out, because it was open, he ran to the corner and they doubled him up and he had to throw some miracle pass that a bunch of them were miracle passes. And a couple of them just got he just can't jump over anybody. When they surround him, when they double him up, it's just you're looked at and you're going, is this CYO basketball? Doesn't he understand he's like five, nine and in the corner when they when the six, six guys get him, he's not going to jump up, leave his feet and throw over these dudes. Yeah. 17 turnovers as a team for the Longhorns on Saturday. And you couple that with the fact that they shot 36 percent. I mean, it was it was bad. It was bad half court offense. And. You know, Texas couldn't get themselves a lot of clean looks. They were forcing a lot. Dylan DeSue, you know, forced a ton, shot 18 times from the floor, and a lot of them were just like, all right, can we not work for a slightly better shot than this? Uh, it's just, it was it was a struggle. Well, it, he wasn't taking those guys down low like he did during the course of the year, taking a bunch of guys down in the paint. He wasn't able yeah. to do that. Uh, he didn't, well, he didn't do that on Saturday. He wasn't taking guys down in the paint. They weren't having any of that. You know, he wasn't going up fakes and stuff. They were just staying on their feet and defending him. But as many threes as he took, because I was like, this isn't your day, but you need to take the threes because nobody else. And I saw Kendall Weaver start taking the three. I saw him hit one. But, dude, he started taking a couple of those. I'm like, there was, it was almost like the wrong time for a bunch of guys to be taking threes. It just wasn't their time to take them, you know? Yeah, I mean, DeSue was a you know, 50% three-point shooter during the season. He was maybe Texas's best long ball shooter during the year, but right. in the tournament, he was 0 of 6 against Colorado State, oh. and he was 2 of 7 against Tennessee. So that's carry the one. 2 of 13 wow. from deep in the tournament. So it's like, I, yeah, I mean, uh, DeSue, uh, the people early in the year were like mad at DeSue for shooting threes. It's like, no, this guy's shooting yes. over 50%. Like, those are good yeah, shots. He's got to, yes, for him. But when it mattered most, like you said, I mean, it was two bad games in a row for DeSue and, and that stat right there, just him being unable to buy one from beyond the arc was uh, was a problem. In Texas, yeah, they're one or two shots away from winning that game. And that's that's it's going to be a long off season just thinking yeah, about yeah, what, what could have been free throw line, missing those free throws at the end too just were i mean i'm like i don't know who you're I, I don't know DeSue didn't miss what any free throws this? he didn't no he was two of two from the line i'm trying to like texas was 11 of 12 from the free throw line as a team so i'm 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 trying to 
How are they in game one? What was the game one like? Probably not that good. But hmm. I don't yeah, I'm trying to try to I mean he missed a bunch of jumpers around the free throw line. Maybe that's maybe that's they were just they were of. so close in those little shots that I'm so used to him getting in the paint and making those little jump shots were contested. Maybe I'm thinking they were they look like they were for free. That's for sure. Yeah, he wasn't making but, them. Let's hear from Dylan the Sioux after the game. Uh talked a little bit about Texas. Fighting back, making it a game down the stretch, but ultimately coming up a little bit short. Yeah, I mean, um, we felt like we were playing solid defense. We gave up a, um, a couple offensive rebounds, too many offensive rebounds in the first half. Um, so we wanted to kind of um, buckle down on that. Um, but we felt like we were getting good looks and we were playing good defense and getting stops. And as long as we continue to get stops, eventually we'd make enough shots to get back in the game. And um, that's what we did. And unfortunately, they just didn't fall for us down the stretch to, to finish it. Yeah, they didn't make enough shots because they did play pretty good defense. Yeah, and you, you you hold Tennessee to 62, and you, you love your yes. chances. But uh, once again, Texas not able to crack 60 in either of their tournament games. And I hate it for Dylan DeSue, a local kid who transferred oh, yeah. back home to try to help the state university. And he was so awesome for two years, but especially this year once he came back from that injury. And I just I hate his two NCAA tournaments ended the way that they did. Right Last year with an yeah. injury, you feel like if he's healthy – I mean, to L, Texas still should have made the Final Four if the refs just didn't steal one in the Elite Eight last year. Even without Dylan DeSue, it could have been a Final Four team. But with DeSue, if he played against Miami last year, you feel like the Longhorns are going to a Final Four. And then this year, he was healthy, I think. We don't know if he was 100%, but obviously good enough to play. But just, yeah, back-to-back disappointing games for him. I just I hate it for him. He's a great kid, incredibly intelligent. I feel like he's got a future playing basketball at the next level. I don't know if it's in the NBA. I think he'll be on a summer league roster this summer. Sure. Um, maybe he's a G League guy. Maybe he's a Europe guy. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, a dude who fought hard for this program for the couple of years he was there. And it it, it's, it, it pains me that uh, that's the way he had to bow out because obviously yeah, we know he's better than that. Yeah, that's the way it makes me feel. It's just painful to see after game one that it would roll back and happen to him in game two. Yeah. I'm like, no, there's just no way that's going to happen to that kid. You know, mm-hmm. just where he works so hard. I mean, he's it just it's, it's like painful that you knew that Brock Cunningham was going to get one of those fouls eventually again. You just knew it was like you said, you knew it's coming. It's just going to happen. Certain things you can't expect, right? Like right. We, we we learn to expect inconsistency from Tyrese Hunter. Yes. We learn to expect not a whole lot from Dylan Mitchell. We learn yes. to expect a cheap shot from Brock Cunningham. Like th- those things, it's like, right. every once in a while with it not happening though. Th- those those things are, yeah, that's true. Those things are almost free plays on the bingo card, right? <laughs> yes. But but you don't expect Dylan DeSue to go four of 18. No. You don't expect Max Aspis to go three of 10 with four turnovers. Like th- those are the things that, that just killed you. That just killed you. You are able to overcome that other stuff all year long, but you know, yes. when, your be- when your best players are combining to go seven of 28, Wow. And a, a game against, once again, a great team that's a top two seed that was in the top 10 in the country in terms of the AP poll pretty much the entirety of the season. Uh, that that you can't overcome. So, well, how'd, your, how'd your bracket look? I mean, I, the shock of smarts got me. Well, yeah, let's let's get into bracket talk. We got plenty of other NCAA tournament talk to get into. We'll talk about the women's team, some football, uh, but we've we've gone a long time without any sponsor shout outs, Buck. All right, let me say hello to our good friends at Texas Orthopedics. Folks, if you're seeking that specialized patient focused orthopedic care, contact the text te- contact the experts and our friends at Texas Orthopedics. Their surgeons, of course, believe in surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, sports medicine, spinal care, trauma care, joint replacement, rheumatology, and of course, even more. Dr. Christopher Danny and Christopher Stockton. They are dedicated orthopedic surgeons there, and their goal is to get you right back into that good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Folks, Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. For more information, go to TXOrtho.com. Absolutely. Shout out to our friends at 7-Eleven as well. If you got a little case of the Mondays, need you to pick me up to get your week started. Yeah, you need that paper. You need that hard copy on a Monday. See See what the sports writers are saying about this. That's the opposite of waking you up. You read the newspaper, you're going to fall back asleep. Come on, man. Don't need that. Get you some coffee. Get you an energy drink. Yeah. Except a little Debbie's. 
A little Debbie, Sna oh, yeah, uh, that little sugar rush. I guess that yeah. could help you this morning. They got everything at 7 Eleven the hot drinks, the cold drinks, the prepackaged snacks, uh, of course, the pizza, the wings, the rollers. They've got donuts every morning out there, hot and fresh, grab and go. They've got everything you need to get your day, your week started at 7 Eleven locations all over the great state of Texas. There's bound to be one near you. And uh, it's the best convenience store in the world. We love having our friends at 7-Eleven on with us on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Shout out to Leaf Landscaping Supply Services. I was there this weekend. Got all my stuff all finalized, what I'm doing around the yard, around the landscape. But, folks, nobody does it better. Monterey Oaks and 290 South and, of course, Pond Springs Road up north. And they've got all, all the landscaping equipment that you need, all the fertilizer, they're going to tell you about which side of the house to put certain plants in. And believe me, folks, they've got experts there. They've got contractors there available to help you out. And if you want to do it yourself, be careful of where you put your stuff. But we are in the time right now, BK, after a little bit of rain, of course, that I called last week that uh, we had. And there's a possibility of rain today. But I'm not throwing that out there, okay? I'm not going to throw that out there because I've been pushed back. Oh, no, you want you to have Didi. She hasn't shown up today to tell us if it was going to rain or not. What? Hold on. Hold on here. Hold on. Back. Yeah. You can't. What does that mean? There's a possibility of rain. Are you predicting rain or not? It's already kind of rained over. It rained early this morning, but that's, I don't count that. I'm talking about as the sun is out today, as we have light during the course of the day. Yes, we will have some showers today. Okay. How's that? Yes. How's that, DD? It's good. That's what I want. Is you can't say crazy? possibility. And, and then tomorrow, if it rains, you'll say, oh, I told you it was going to rain. And then if it doesn't rain, you'll say, oh, no, I didn't tell you it was going to rain. Oh, do you we think it. I would do that? Yeah, we do. I do. Okay. That, so that's I, probably right. I probably would do that. But folks, yeah. Leaf Landscaping and uh, Supply Services has everything that you're looking for. Trees, flowers, vegetables, you name it. And they've got people on site to help you out. Don't just start shaking fertilizer and then throwing plants in and thinking that's the right fertilizer. By the way, my dog ate a bag of organic. Louis ate a bag of organic fertilizer <laughs> on Friday. Dude, ate the whole bag. I yeah. went out. There, I'm like, oh uh -huh. no! And I said, and the people are coming. They're mowing the grass now. I'm like, that dog is going to be, have like baby shit all over the place, and he did. So I was out there with buckets of dirt covering it up because I couldn't even put it on a shovel. That's how. That's how it was. That oh. dude is so dumb. He had the so, runs. Oh, yeah, of course he did. Fertilizer through his oh. system. He ate a, like a giant bag? It was it was a bag about this big. And oh, all my it. Dude, God. he didn't leave a granule in there. That dude ripped the bag and ate it all. I was looking around on the ground to see if there was any on the ground. Dude ate it all. What does that I, even I, taste like? Like, does, does it not just taste like dirt? Does he eat dirt in the backyard? No, it, it's got to have some little, some taste to it. Maybe salty, nasty. Oh, dishwater kind of taste, but he went through it and it went through him, but he's feeling, he's feeling good because he's fertilizer good. made a shit. Do I have that right? Oh, maybe that's what it, maybe he fertilized the grass too. Oh, but I had to do, I, I do, I do poop detail before the, before the mowers come anyway. Cause I don't want, you don't want that on your tire. You don't want to step in that, no, especially what he just had going on. Oh, the other thing is I didn't get to you on Friday. But check this out. You know, you had, you know, Joyce had to help me, of course, this morning with my computer because, you know, I mean, I don't erase anything. I've got like 60,000 messages on my deal because I never hit get get out. She goes, can you erase this? There's something on here from 21 on here. Can you get rid of that? I'm like, why? Where is it going? Can it just sit there? She goes, no, it screws up the computer. That's why it's asking you to pay another Ten dollars a month because you you don't have enough space in there. Well, this is what happened. You didn't hear about this Spectrum. My wife calls Spectrum because there's an extra hundred dollars on the bill this month, and she's trying to figure out, you know, all this time why is the bill up a hundred dollars? Well, you know me, I must have hit Apple something, on you know on the TV or something. I must have hit it. No, it's all my fault because it, it always is. Sure. So I'll just take the blame for it. And the lady, as she's trying to, you know, she's just trying to find out. Why is that hundred more dollars this month on my spectrum bill? Well, the lady eventually says to Joyce, she goes, "Are you kidding me? You're worried about a hundred. You're, you're worried about your your bill when there's kids starving all over the world. What? 
I said, Joyce, did you go make F and excuse me? And she goes, <laughs> she goes, no. She goes, she goes, ma'am, I'm just trying to find out. I'm trying to get some information from you. And and the lady said, well, I've had enough. She hung up on her. She what? Her. You know how my manner she is. She hung up on her. And Joyce called back just to talk to some management there. I said, oh, my God, I needed that to happen to me. Just let that happen to me. Just let that lady say, hey, do you know there's starving kids all over the world and you're wondering, you're worried about your $100 extra on your bill? The lady said that. She's supposed to be helping her. Oh, my God. Was that an F, excuse me? Was that one of those? Should that have been that? Should that excuse me, bitch. <laughs> I, would, I would be talking to people. I'd still be talking to Spectrum today, trying to get that lady fired. I and can't. then the, she was oh. maybe having a bad day. Joyce said, maybe she was having a bad day. I said, she was about to have a really bad day if you let me call Spectrum. She was like, do not call them. Do not. She goes, I can handle this. Oh. The lady's probably, the guy told her she may need some more training. I, I said, no, she needs another job. I was going to say, yeah, she might have been having a bad day, but she just had a worse day after that because she lost her job from doing yeah. that, which maybe, uh, you know, I, her life might actually improve if she no longer has to be a call center employee for rectum. But God, she dropped yeah, her yeah. starving kids in Africa, bitch. Started, no, she just started the old, you know, there's kids around the world that don't have any food. And you're complaining about why don't it. you go help them instead of staying on the phone with me? <laughs> I would have gone, I would have gone out of my mind because oh I'm God. that guy for something like that. But my wife is really nice like that. And she just she said the lady got upset at me because I'm trying to dispute. Can you tell me what happened? And then she she hung up on her. That's I insane. I would have called and said, I wanted the same exact lady. Yep. And if she wants to keep her job, she can't hang up because I'm going to give her an earful. And if on the other end, if she hangs up, you guys need to fire her immediately. What would you have said if you called back and got to speak to her? I, I just, I definitely would have said, lady, this is my money. You don't pay the bills at my house. I'm just trying to find out. You're supposed to be helping me. And if you want to help the kids in Biafra or wherever you want, why don't you go there? I would have definitely said, you need to go there and help them because you're not helping me. Biafra. Or wherever. I'm not familiar with that place. Tanzania. Like Tanzania. I mean, sexual country or something. Biafra. I would have just said this. You're not helping me. You need to go help them. Yeah. Hey, hey. Okay. Here's what I would have said. I would have been like, all right, fine. Take that hundred bucks and donate it to charity. If you do that, that's perfectly fine. Donate it somewhere. That's going to make a difference. How about that then? That's where I want my hundred dollars that I shouldn't have been charged to go. So that way you can feel like you're making a difference, all right? And you won't get mad at me for calling about this. Oh, the, the excuse me came right up in my mind. Oh, I said, I said, George, you've seen that. She goes, yeah, I've seen that. I said, you should have. That was perfect. I mean, really? That's how mm -hmm. you help people? That's what Spectrum's got going at their offices? And no, it wasn't some lady from India or Asia or whatever answering. She was just a normal lady here in from Texas or whatever. And she was rude. That was so been, rude. And then like, okay, all right. Well, you can't help me with this. Can you help me with these? These what? These nuts. <laughs> I would have been there for hours talking to that lady. She would have hung up on me at least six times because I would have kept calling back. So I would have oh. got the spectrum general manager or the or the uh the captain of spectrum. You know what I mean? Right. Like, why does she care so much? Like, oh my God. Unless she was the CEO of Spectrum. I don't know why oh. she would care so much about $100. That's a, a $100 million plus company. She's and she's freaking out. You, she's telling you what you need to worry about? Like, right. here's I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard of that. That's never happened to me where, where someone on a call center has hung up on me. I've definitely hung up on them after not hearing what I wanted to hear. But I don't think they've ever hung up on me before. Yeah, she said you're not making any sense. Click. Oh my! God. You're not you're not worried about the right things. So y'all, did y'all get it figured out? You called somebody else, and oh, yeah. did they tell oh, you where the money oh, was she, going? No, she she got it. She didn't get it totally figured out because she was so exasperated messing around with the the lieutenant of Spectrum, who's saying, uh, "I think she may need some more training." That's how they it kind of got left. I, and that wouldn't have been enough for me. You know, I'd have been there all day. I would have I would have said, "Nope." I'm not going outside for the next two hours. I'm going to be on the phone with the Spectrum people. 
Oh, and that's man. how ignorant I get when, when it comes to stuff like that. Tell me what to do with my money. And you're supposed to be helping me do this. And you're telling me there's starving kids around. I would have had, I would have, it would have probably got to, I don't really like to get to be that rude. But if I could have got the particular lady back, the same lady, and they made her answer my questions, I, it would have got rude. I would have got rude. I'd love to hear that recording. You know how whenever you call one of those places, you get oh, the yeah. automated well, you know, your call will be recorded for quality assurance. Someone's oh, got a recording of that call. I'd, I'd love but, to hear that. Oh, yeah, she's got that. I mean, that, that's what the guy said. We'll go back and check exactly who that was. She goes, we can find out who that was. And talk sure. to oh, yeah. So she, that's what done. they'll do. I mean, no, but Joyce didn't want to have her fired, of course. She just wanted to have her. She needed some sensitivity training. I'm like, F that. She, <laughs> you, you're gone. Yeah. Here's what here's what you would have said to her. Shut up, bitch. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not that bad like that. Mm. I just, you know, I've just got my little nitpicking things that I would go after. Of, yeah, you know what? Get yourself a get yourself to one of these starving nations. Get use that hundred dollars and to get a flight over there yeah. and go help them out because you're not helping out anybody here. Yeah, why don't you go over there and make a difference? <laughs> all right, quit yelling at me for for trying to save a few bucks in this economy. Yeah, save my money. Oh, it was too Bless. funny. That's a shout out. Shout out to your wife, by the way. We we didn't talk about this to start the show, but this was a pretty hellacious beginning to the week for us. Now, usually we uh, you're usually on before me, but usually by the time we get to 715 or 720, both of us are on. Yes. We're doing some show prep, discussing what we're going to talk about today, asking about you know, how everybody's doing and how things are going. And you called me at about like 725 this morning. I hadn't seen you on the YouTube yeah. yet. I'm like, and you're like, uh, you send me the link. I didn't get the link. So I sent it again and something was going on with your email to where you, yeah, you were not receiving the email invite link to join today's studio on Texas sports unfiltered. I got the Friday's link just kept coming up and your wife, uh, helped out. We, we, we went on FaceTime. It took us like from seven 25 till about seven 57. We were a little worried. We were going to have to delay the start of the show, or it was just going to be me to start the show. But thankfully, uh, we were able to find a way to, I mean, we restarted stuff. We had to download a new browser on the computer. We went through a little of everything. But uh, I got to give your lovely wife some love for for helping today's show yeah, happen. I'm just, I'm just so, you know me, I don't, I don't erase anything. I've got like 67,000 emails or whatever <laughs> from when I started this years ago. I just, I, I just don't take the time to, I just shut it down and say later. See you later. It'll pop up again tomorrow. My wife says, delete this stuff. You, there, there's nothing you need to know. We're back in COVID, COVID times. What are you doing? Talk Get rid of that stuff. So Okay. So, yeah, when you when you click to explain this to you, but also the people. So, it's it's email links. So you've got a MacBook, and there's a separate yeah. app for email. So, you had that open, and every morning you click on the link for the day's show. Right. We've been doing this for like eight months now. Just about. Yes. Every time you click a link, it opens up a new tab on your internet browser. You had not closed in one single tab. You had eight months, five shows a week worth of tabs of just different broadcasts that we had done. You had not X'd out a single one. And what about my doctor's appointment and things like that, that I've, you know, all these things I'm going through from all over the country. How about all these things? They're sitting in there too. Oh my God. I mean, yeah. So let's say we do like 20 shows a month on weekdays. Four hey, times who's five. counting? I'm keeping those for prosperity. I mean, what if I pass away? What if people want to go back and hear this stuff? Uh, when my computer- having, no, yeah, there's other ways to do that. They can just go to Spotify or Apple or YouTube and find the podcast. It's it's all there. You don't have to worry about that stuff. No, the cloud's got it covered. You just, you're can hurting yourself. I mean, do I have to go press these things one by one? Can I get a whole, like, a shitload, like, gone, like, hit it, gone? Yeah. Or do I, I have think- to go one by one by one by one? You don't. Uh-uh. I think this morning with uh, what we did, you're you're set. You're off to a fresh start. You're good. You don't have to worry about the hundreds to thousands of tabs that you had going into today. I think you're taken care of. But at some point in the future, maybe let's go uh, less than eight months before we clear up your internet browser again. Yeah, I need those for my memory, for my in my head. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not at all. Oh my god. All right. 
Let's uh, let's shift computers. gears. I don't like computers. No, no, we no. we know that. I mean, it, it's like talking to a newborn baby trying to get you. Oh, do you see me? Do you see me over here when I'm doing stuff? You're looking at me at the phone up and everything. Yeah, we're FaceTiming. All, all you were doing was holding your phone to the computer screen so I could see what your wife was trying to do. She gets she's, so frustrated. She's a, she's a PC gal. So, like, you know, you've got a Mac. So she's great with PCs, but she didn't know exactly what she needed to do. And she gets and, so frustrated, man. It's like it's it's the frustration level goes in a, and it gets there quickly. You know what I'm saying? It gets there in a hurry. Yeah, it does. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Now she hold on, sneezing. Excuse there you me. go. That's got to be a good look. Hopefully, I hit the mute button in time. Yeah, yeah it was. It was. Uh, it was a struggle. It was a struggle, and it's amazing how little I, I'm impressed. I don't mean this in a bad way. Like I'm impressed that you have gone this long in this life. And I know computers weren't around when you were a kid, but like they've they've been around for three decades now. And sure. the fact that you you know as little as you do is impressive just how how much of like a point of emphasis it's been in your life to not get caught up with that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've never it just it's like the like the video games that you, we talk about when I say I don't spend time sitting in I I just don't spend time at the computer, yeah. you know. I I don't need to google it or whatever it is, I'll find out on my own somehow. I mean, it's just that's just me. That's just the way I roll. Yeah. I it can works. look up I just don't it, it works for me being in front of that computer and doing things. I mean, I, as I said, I see kids that play their video games. They don't leave the house. You know, I'm like, where are you going? I got, I got this game. I got to play with this guy for the next three hours. I'm like, for the next what? Oh, for the mm -hmm. next two or three hours. I'm like, shit, man, I could be doing something else besides that. It's and it's not like it's like I'm doing something special, but it's special to me. And being in front of this stuff and, and going through emails and send me an email. I'll see it. I don't erase it, but I'll, I see it. You know what I'm saying? On my phone, I see it all. Oh, so you know my phone is loaded with the same thing then. Yeah. It's, at some point, you'll have to clear out your phone too. But to this point, you've been no, I'll okay. Just paying. I'll just add, get more. Here, here's another $15 a month. There you go. Yep. And you yes, know, that I'm, the one, be... I'm the one who hit apples. I, mu I must have did something to create that. I do, dude, dude, rectum, rectum, they just increase your bill every once in a while. Like, no. you know, there's a chance you did nothing wrong and your wife did nothing wrong. They just decided to hike your prices a little bit. They do that all the time. That's what they, they do. Been pretty, I've been pretty good. So I've been, I've been pleasantly surprised after I got rid of um, uh, Direct TV and got to Spectrum. I really have. I, it's just, it's been really good. The, 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 the phone service, the, the the mail service, the email, the the TV stuff, the setup has been, it's been it's been good. I mean, yeah. hell, when I had Direct TV, if the wind blew like it was blowing last night, I'm done. And you had that old dish on the top oh, of the shit. house, big ass nasty looking dish hanging off the side of your house. Yeah. yeah, those days are mostly behind us. But look at Longhorn Bears comment right here. Spectrum increased the rate on my service again. That's the fourth time this year. And there's a what? chance they just they just do that. That's what these cable companies do. It's their bid. And by the way, if you got a wife and that looks at the bills, she notices everything. She, if it's off by, you know, by three dollars, she noticed why is that off like that? She's going to ask questions about that. It's good. You know, People I try to nickel and dime you left and right. You need to have those checks and balances. You need to make sure you're not getting screwed by those big corporations, dude. Is that why they get to be big corporations? I think so. They nickel and dime millions of people. This is this is you, by What's the way. What's a computer? Yeah, okay. But What's I do know computer? I know about maps and things, such as I do. <laughs> oh man, it's they don't have maps. Good. Don't forget, kids don't have maps in Africa and the Iraq and everywhere like such. Yeah, I know they need food after the lady from Spectrum told me, Hey, you're worrying about the wrong thing. Yeah, you, you gotta to help out you gotta help out those bisexual kids across the world or whatever you said. By Afra. Sorry, by Afri the Biafrans. They uh, they really need some some help over there. But can you imagine somebody telling you what you do with your money, and you're trying to find out about your money? I mean, that's it's it's a fireable offense. But like I said, maybe she was having a bad day. That's what Joy said too. I said maybe she's just having a bad morning. I said she would have had a worse morning if it's me. I mean, because I mean, no. I look forward to shit like that. I mean, it's like, did you really do that and say that? I'm not speechless very often in this life, but I don't know if I would have been able to come up with a competent sentence after hearing her say that. I would have been so 
shell shocked. Like, did you, not even did pissed, you, just shell shocked. Right? I would have been like, I would have been like looking for Ashton Kutcher. Like, am I getting punked right now? Like, what, what is <laughs> happening here? Did she really, did she really just tell me this? And then, and then she h- hangs up on me. Like, wh- what is going on? Bigger things to worry about than that. That's what she said. Bigger things in this world to worry about. Okay, Kids you're start, about man. you're about to have to worry about where your next paycheck's coming from. That's what been right, be... that's what have been on my mind right there because yeah. I'm talking to somebody's boss. Oh my goodness! Great you know what? Story. And little things like turning a plane around. You know, like you and your drunk buddies throwing up on each other in the flight. Yeah. No, we just have to roll with that. Even if your boys are throwing up on each, turning around, throwing up on each other's faces and in their laps, we don't stop the plane. We go. We get yeah. back to Austin with the rest of the people. We did. You know, no, no crazy uh, flight stories to talk about. I uh, flew there to Vegas, flew back from Vegas, and made it all in one piece. Are you on? Uh, Southwest. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah, reputable. No. I'm good. I'm good with South. I'm I'm good with Southwest. They've always done a good job. And the excursions to Vegas must be pretty good. Had some turbulence in the last 30 minutes of the flight, but all good on that nothing, front. Nothing like some, that. Bubble guts. Yeah. Some guy like walking back from the bathroom and he was like putting his hand on every seat to help oh, kind of guide him. Back your head and stuff as you go, as he goes by. Yeah. This was on the way there. And he, yeah, he just, he grabbed my shoulder. He thought it was like the what? corner of a seat. He just like uses my shoulder as a <laughs> balance <laughs> like, beam. Yeah. I'm like, what? I, I had my headphones in. I was like half asleep. I just turned. I was like, what the hell was that? And I turned. <laughs> the guy, yeah, he thought I was a seat or he was just mad at me or I don't know what that was. He was Instagram famous and he oh just wanted to use the alarm. I had a middle seat yeah. on the way back yesterday. That one, that one was, was tough. Oh, bad bit. Well, we're on bits here. And we'll get back into the sports here momentarily. So it was a 5 a.m. flight I was on out of Vegas. And I, I mean, more than half the plane is hung over, Buck. I and mean, you could tell. Reeks of boo. Boo's oh, just freaking in a disaster. The, and they, they've got the lights on for half the flight. They're doing like a beverage cart run because it's dark outside. Like they, the, the manservants and the yeah, stewards. Yeah, manservants, did you? Yeah, there, there's a lot of men doing that job yesterday. Uh, you know, they, I guess they need the light to see where they're going with the beverage cart. We don't need the beverage card at six in the morning coming back from Vegas. All right. Keep the yeah, lights sleep. off. We let us sleep. sleep. And the worst bit of all time is the person who has their personal light on oh. one of those red eye or early morning flights when everybody else is trying to sleep. And it's like, no, I got to read. I got to know. You know, put that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got to watch the little TV away. in front of me. Yeah. Like yeah. watching the TV in front of them. Like, hey, I got to see this. I miss this. I miss my show. I got to check it out. That's, I mean, that's to me, that's okay. If you're on your computer, or on your iPad or on your phone, like if you're watching something like that's your, you know, the light you, you could see a little bit if you're sitting next to them, but it's not as brutal as the overhead light. Oh. And that's those. Oh, I hate that too. That's an annoying bit. Another bad bit. You're right. Indeed. That's All why right. I stick the headphones on and not even listen to the music. Don't talk to me. Don't even, don't come by with it. Don't ask me if, would you like some coffee? Uh, would you like pretzels? No, I don't want any pretzels at 6 a.m. Keep your pretzels. Let me sleep. Yeah, I'd like for you to stop banging into my knee with that beverage cart, please. Oh, All right. God, that's why I hate the aisle, too. Every time I'm sitting in the aisle, I get clocked. I mean, one of these days I'm going to lose an ACL from that deal. Yeah, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't good. I had the pickaxe this week, and the sharp part of the pickaxe hit me in my my what my what you know my knee. My reconstructed knee. Yeah. Damn, I thought that was all metal in there. That thing, that hit that, whatever bone I had left. Man, I couldn't stand up for like 15 minutes. I tried to stand up, and it hurt so bad because oh. the pickaxe got me. And I, I thank God I wasn't swinging it hard. I just kind of grazed that, my knee. Oh. oh, I went down. I went down to my good knee on my left knee, and just, and I was there, I swear, 15 minutes. You know, there was nobody around. So my wife, of course, makes sure that I always have my phone so I can call her if I'm down. You know, I've fallen and I can't get up. I didn't have that life alert. And so I'm on one knee. The freaking dog is trying to mug me with his fertilizer breath. And I'm like, come on, let me get let me gather my thoughts. This damn thing hurts. I don't want tears to come out of my eyes. I don't want anybody to see me with a tear coming out because it hurt that bad. Oh. That sharp part of the pickaxe gets you in the knee, on the side of the knee. Oh, it's like it was almost. It's as bad as getting hit in D's nuts. 
the mm. way I went down and I stayed there, but the dog kept effing with me. Dog, leave me alone for I hit you with this pickaxe. I mean, oh my God. So you, you were doing gardening. You had a pickaxe, you swung and missed and you hit your knee no, and then you I fell. Hit the ground first, it banged off some hard ground. And then the, the sharp thing came up and got me right in the knee. And I went, Oh, I went down to my, and I'm like, wait a minute. This doesn't just hurt. I think I've done something. I may have screwed up the metal in this, this fake knee. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, did I just ruin this titanium, this piece of metal in there yeah. and screw it up? They're going to have to go in there and replace that. Thank, oh, thank God it was that knee. Cause if it was the other knee, you might've needed to get a second one replaced. Oh, dude, it hurt. And I yeah. stayed down. It wasn't one of those jump back up, prove to the people around you that you're all right. I stayed on the one knee leaning on the pickaxe and I swear BK, it almost came out. Tears almost came out of my eyes, but I didn't do, I didn't let it happen. Were you able to get up by yourself? Oh, no, I eventually got up after the pain subsided in about 30 minutes. Oh and, dude, I wanted to hit that dog. He was, like, knocking me down on my side. I had to get back up on one knee. And I know the neighbors are going, I think that dude is down. Why does this dog keep knocking him back down? <laughs> on down? He's trying to play. He thinks you're trying to play with yeah, him. I was playing with him. I was like, shit. And I'm cussing this dog out loud for everybody in the world to hear. Get the F. Get your slobber. You slobbered on the side of my neck and stuff. Like, get off of me. You're getting Frenched by your dog while you're awful. Worried See, if you're gonna smelling like fertilizer. I'm like, oh, yeah. but I got it done. Thank you, Leaf. I'm I'm there. Today is put the pray, put the veggies in the ground. There Quit messing go. around. It's that time. Time to grow something now. All right. Some quick sponsor shout outs here. By the way, we've got some Cabo Bob's gift cards yeah. to give away to the people. Two of them, as a matter of fact. We'll give one away during today's show. We'll give one away during tomorrow's show as we uh, bring out the randomizer again this week. Very nice. But uh, mad love to our friends at Cabo Bob's. We're giving away $50 Cabo Bob's gift cards every time the Texas baseball team or the Texas softball team wins their weekend series. And if both teams win their weekend series, well, we give away two $50 Cabo Bob's gift cards. The Texas baseball team took two of three from Baylor at the dish. The Texas softball team, another sweep on the road at UCF. They took all three against the Golden Knights. The Texas softball team, 28 and three on the season, still a top five team in the country and a nice uh, home series for Texas baseball. So two nice. different Cabo Bob's gift cards to give away. We'll do one of those today before 10 o'clock. All you have to do to enter into our Cabo Bob's giveaway, leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube or hit us up on the code of text line, 512-222-9328. It doesn't matter what you say. doesn't matter what you comment. All you have to do is give us something, and you will be entered to win that $50 Cabo Bob's gift card. Awesome, man. Awesome, indeed. Our good friends at Big Hat, want to thank them. I had my mocktails this weekend watching some golf. Sat back with my margarita mocktail. No alcohol involved, just the taste of ginger, lime, orange. It was delicious. And there are the HEBs. I saw them at the BK's HEBs. They've got their uh, supplies at, at HEB. And now they're coming out with a new one, too. They're, I, I forget what it is. Mojito. Mo, the mojitos. Yeah, they're coming out with that. But, the, oh, I, I love the one that I have. I'm, I can't wait to taste that mojito and see what that tastes like. But it was delicious, and I need it because after I hit myself with that pick, I was looking for the mocktails with the real stuff in it. <laughs> Woo! Man, oh, man. But they are getting all over the place, the Big Hat group. So appreciate it, uh, Big Hat and what they're doing with us, and and I do love their mocktail. But the mojitos coming out, yeah. very nice. The mojito mocktail, yep. They've got the margarita yeah. mocktail, and now the, uh, the newest addition to the Big Hat family is that mojito mocktail as well. I've had it all now. So we've got we've got Big Hat. Of course, we got the greatness of Olipop. If you're interested in if you're if if you like your soda, but you don't want your sugar. So and I'm still doing good. I'm still doing with my, you know, no candy bar thing. I'm, I've been doing pretty good. I did sneak a piece of cheesecake in here, BK, during the weekend. <laughs> I mean, you know, what's still, you know, it's still in the freezer. The cake cake. How long will that last in the freezer? I guess anything frozen can last until it's unfrozen, I guess. Okay. I don't know if this stuff goes bad, but it's still in there. And I asked my wife, she goes, no, you can't have that till you come back from your appointment. Because next week I'll be out of here on Tuesday. I'll, I'll be headed to Tampa for my surgery. Hopefully surgery on Wednesday. Yep. But finding out 
if I'll need surgery on Tuesday. But I said, you think I can have a piece of that cake when you get back? She goes, no, that's the that's the exact time you don't need to be eating sweets when you get back. I'm like, that's bullshit. What is this cake for your next birthday? Yeah, what? why is she not eating it? No, oh, no. She doesn't mess around with all the sweets and stuff, period. Okay. You know, we, we kept her from working out when we were playing with the computer. Mm -hmm. And, so and is... yeah, it's weird. It's just, it's just strange. You're, I don't know you're... why people save cake. I never heard of that before until I met this woman anyway. Oh. Nobody in my family, because there was never, I, there was eight kids in my family. There was never a piece of cake that was in the freezer for later on, period. Right. I'm just trying, trying to figure out what you're saving it for. Like, if you do get the okay to start eating sweets again, the first sweets you're going to eat is like a six-month-old cake that's been sitting in the freezer? No. Hey, you're going to go, gonna go to 7-Eleven, you're going to get a Snickers bar. Sn I'm going to get a six-pack of Snickers bars. Yeah. yeah. With 16, with 16 Coca-Colas. No, I'm going to get my Olipop. Yeah. Love Olipop, man. I had like three grapes sitting around here. And then now we'll be talking very shortly here. Today I'm going to meet with the people from Clean Cause. So we do like our liquids. Yeah, we you do. Know, of course. And you've got your other liquid that you like, of course, Allstat, but that's got alcohol in it. But we 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 love liquids here at Texas Sports Unfiltered. So if you got liquids that you want to advertise, <laughs> we're into it. Believe me. We yep. do some liquids, man. We do some liquids, man. Yep. Love Olipop. Great tasting soda. That's actually yeah. good for you. It's a game changer. If you're like the buck and you're trying to cut back on sweets, hell, everybody should be trying to cut back on sweets a little bit. Get you some Olipop. There's hardly any sugar in Olipop. We're talking like two to five grams. Look at yep. your can of regular Coke or Dr. Pepper or Sprite oh, that you're drinking and compare it to Olipop. Major difference. Plus, yeah, nine grams of fiber in every can of Olipop as well. So you're helping to support your digestive health. Whenever you crack open an ice cold Ollie pop, love that stuff. And yeah, all stat beer. That's, that's the beer that I drink. That was the worst part of being in Vegas over the weekend is that they didn't have all stat beer. Uh, all stat though. They've got it all over the state. If you're listening in Austin or Houston or Dallas or San Antonio or Fort worth, whatever you can find six packs of all stat beer, wherever you buy your beer. And of course it's popping up more and more at your favorite bars and restaurants throughout the Lone Star state as well. So make sure you're asking your bartenders, waitresses, waiters, servers, whoever for Old Stat Beer. You go through a lot in this life. Reward your taste buds. Reward yourself with Old Stat Beer. No impurities. No regrets. Nice. Okay. I don't even know where to go now. Oh, can we get to this Kim Mulkey story? Yeah, I don't understand why people are 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 messing with my girl. There's no reason. There's no reason for reporters to be agitating her she's not bothering anybody she never has she's always been calm you know she's cool everything's going good and some reporter from the what is it is it the washington post wants to start agitating her for some odd reason i don't know what is, what is she trying to they're trying to bring up dirt on her yep it seems like that's the case so the article has not dropped but uh, i think pat 40 tweeted out late last week into the weekend and he said that there's about to be a bombshell article posted about LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey. And that made the rounds. And, of course, the LSU women, they're the defending national champs in college basketball. And they're in the tournament right now. Like, they were just about to play their first tournament game this year when that tweet went out, basically insinuating that, uh, yeah, somebody had something on Kim Mulkey. And we are all able, uh, about to find out what it was going to be. So we still don't have the exact details of the story, but some of the rumblings behind the scenes are that a few former players spoke anonymously to the Washington Post about some of Kim Mulkey's coaching tactics, and perhaps there was some mistreatments of those players while they were Just being coached. Hard. She wants them to be good. Which, I mean, that's the least surprising rumor i've ever heard in my entire life Seriously. i was thinking that's you were what, talking thinking, that's, that's what it? the story is is that kim mulkey has been abusing her players i'm gonna laugh forever and i'm gonna say i told you so to you and everybody else because i've been saying that she's the scariest human being on the planet for years and i think i'm about to be vindicated by a bunch of her former players coming out talking about how she abused them how they were puking at 3 a.m. in the morning or some workout or something. She's That's the not going to surprise you, is it? No. Oh, my God. I, I bet it's physical. I bet it's also, like, psychological, mental, all of the above. Like, she seems like that type of coach. And, look, she's a great coach. She's won three national championships. She's one of the best women's basketball coaches of all time. Well, you know who else was a great basketball coach? 
Bobby Knight, that guy was a piece of shit. He treated his players horribly. I don't think Kim Mulkey was going full Bobby Knight, but like that, that type of coaching, it can lead to success, but also it can rub people the wrong way. And if the reports are true, then it feels like, yeah, look, I don't know if Kim Mulkey's going to lose her job. I don't know what's going to happen. We don't know Probably what the story not. is, but uh, people are about to maybe find out the darker side of Cruella de Mulkey. Oh, like you think she has it. a dark side? Do you really think she has a dark side? I think that it's. I think the. I think all of her is a dark side. I don't think she's got a bright side anywhere. That's just. I mean, why is this guy bugging her for this? He's been asking for this interview. She said for like two years, and she just. She doesn't want to talk to him because it's all going to be about dirt. I mean, so, really. So here's. What about the thing that she's done in helping the kids and stuff? Hey, maybe I've given a hundred dollars to the kids who are starving all over the world or something. You know what I mean? So my Kim wife Mulkey, may not be. My wife may be complaining, but you know what? Yeah. Kim Mulkey doesn't do it like that. No, She's Kim giving Mulkey, money all Kim over. Mulkey, the she was on a phone. She would have reached her hand through the phone and grabbed the woman on the other side, pulled her hair, and just beat her, beat her, and beat her beat up. Her. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the type of woman Kim Mulkey is. Yeah, don't don't put your wife in the same category as her. Come on, man. Wow, it's disrespectful. So Kim Mulkey. During a press conference, like this, I think it was right after LSU's first round game. They beat Rice in round one, and they won again yesterday. So they're on to the Sweet 16 for the second consecutive year. But Kim Mulkey had like this three and a half minute monologue talking about this reported Washington Post story. I we're not going to play all three and a half minutes. I've got a little over a minute about her just berating the Washington Post and berating the reporter who was She's gonna sue them too. Put, putting this together and yeah, threatening legal action against that publication. Here's Coach Mulkey. This is exactly why people don't trust journalists and the media anymore. It's these kinds of sleazy tactics and hatchet jobs that people are just tired of. I'm fed up, and I'm not going to let the Washington Post attack this university, this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. I've hired the best defamation law firm in the country, and I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. Not many people are in a position to hold these kind of journalists accountable. But I am, and I'll do it. That's all I'm going to say about this right now. And now I'm going to get back to talking about my basketball team and winning this game tomorrow. There you have it. So I, I just think it's, I mean, the, the whole thing is gold. And once again, we didn't play all of it, but – she she starts off by talking about how, yeah, this reporter has been trying to contact her for a story for the last two years. And then she says, well, he reached out to me 48 hours ago asking for another comment. And then he said he was going to post the story next week if he didn't comment. And she's complaining that she didn't have enough time to respond. She's like, well, he reached out to me within 48 hours of my first tournament game. I'm not going to respond. I'm trying to focus on the tournament. It's like, coach, you right. just said he's been, trying to, he's been trying to contact you for two years. Yes. You literally, you literally just outed yourself by saying he's been reaching out to you for a comment for two years, and now you're like, "Oh, he put me in a tough spot because I'm about to coach my team in the NCAA tournament." That's wrong. And then the hilarious thing is, Buck, like, I assume this article is going to be about how she harasses and threatens her players, and then here she goes yeah. harassing and threatening this reporter right here. Not really. By the way, if she you didn't do anything wrong, Coach. Why are you commenting? Why are you why are you have this prepared statement like? You, you clearly know something's going on. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this prepared statement before the story even comes out. So you must be guilty of something, right? Well, she's guilty of something. And that guy better have all his – I mean, the, the I's better be dotted, T's better be crossed because she's not going to back down. She's not going to say, oh, no, this isn't true and go away. She's not going away. She's going to sue somebody over this. I mean, she's whether she has the right to or not, she's not going to sit back. I don't care how long the guy's been waiting to do this to her, but she's she she already has a sense of what's coming about to happen, BK. Yeah. You know, like you were saying, here's she's already caught wind of what they want to talk about. She, well, I mean, I, 
she's going to sit like the, the, the Washington post has an amazing legal oh. team and they, they of usually course. like they, they don't publish big stories like this unless they're confident in what they're posting. And unless like they feel good that if somebody did come back with a lawsuit, they would be able to win. No problem. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how this ends. Once again, we haven't even seen the story yet. It hasn't been released by the Washington Post, but it seems like we'll get something maybe today, but at some point this week. But yeah, I, I just a four minute tirade just complaining about the Washington Post saying it's a hit piece. I don't know. I don't know how this thing ends. Uh, we see in sports that if you can coach, they'll they'll find a spot for you. If you can coach, if you could play, if you can executive, you can get away with a lot in this, but um, this, this could be a bad look for Coach Kim when this does come out. Uh, yeah, especially if it's if it's going to be about abuse. Yeah, and here's her. This is after LSU's win over Middle Tennessee State in the round of 32 yesterday. She is uh, berated. I don't know what she's doing. I think she's just in that post-game handshake line yelling at a Middle Tennessee player, do you work for the Washington Post? I think that's no, what she did right there. No, she's telling her how good she played. You did a fantastic job. You just ran into my team. That's what happened to you, but you had a good game. That's very look at look how sensitive she is with that young lady. Trying to tell her that she played well. You know, maybe next year, maybe next year you won't be crying in, in the handshake line. Maybe you'll be smiling because you'll be a victor. You know what I'm saying? That's all she's trying to tell her. I mean, that's good coaching. That's like being a good mother right there. You should be applauding that. I, I know that, but she's trying to, she's treating them like she treats her players, like she's a good coach, good mom. That's, I mean, come on. I don't. That's just don't showing know. compassion for your opponent. That's all. What do you think she's doing? Is she slapping like like Bochum Beckler did John Magovic? Think she's getting slapped? I just, no. It's like she's squeezing. She's just grabbing this girl's face and squeezing her. She's not. She's not squeezing. You're just making that up. She's not squeezing. She's holding her gently. She's I know to that smash her, her face in. I I know that touch, that caress by her. I know no, that you don't. You wish you knew that caress by her. That's your dream is to be caressed by her, but you don't know what that is. She's trying she's to flatten this it. girl's face. She just lost a tournament game, and now she's getting berated and abused by the other you coach. Just, you got it all wrong. When this article comes out, you're going to come back to me and you're going to say, "Buck, you know you're right about her. People have it all wrong about her." Oh my god. She's like quite that's... What is that outfit? She looks she looks like a That looks like um Crayola Crayon box right there. What is that deal? <laughs> <she's wearing? laughs> I don't know. That was the jacket of choice yesterday for Roy G. Coach Biv. Wilkie. All the colors of the rainbow there. What's there the deal? Go. She is doing that Roy G. Biv impersonation there. I'm not <laughs> digging that. I need I need to have her extensions in. I don't like that short short cut on her either. Could you imagine if this happened in, like, know, the Bill Self in a, in a post-game line if Kansas beats somebody and he just goes to a player on the other team and squeezes his face in and gets right in his face? That'd be a massive story. She's a woman. She's a little bit more sensitive than the guy who had a heart attack last year no. try to coach through it. This woman is sensitive. She's being sensitive to an opponent. I don't know how you get all these bad things out of that. It's just squeezing. I don't know, man. The girl's crying. Squeezing her like she's her a college zit. career. Her like she's a zit or something. She's and then not she's got some that. 60-plus year old women just like bashing her face in oh on national television. It's like, what are we, what are we doing here, Kim? I applaud this kind of coaching right there. Yeah, hands-on coaching like that. It's your That's hands off the other team, coach. That's not a, that's not being abusive. That's we not, berated not Rodney going, Terry for yelling at UCF players. She's not going down with a hooker. We, she's not we doing yelled that. at Rodney Terry for just like yelling at the UCF players after that horns down incident a couple of months ago. We're like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't talk to the other players like that. And you've got Kim Mulkey putting her hands on the other players. She may have known that line. girl's mom. She may have known that girl's mother and father, and she's just trying to make sure that she's okay. Uh, that she gets on the bus and that she's happy with the rest of her her career there at Middle Tennessee State gonna, University of Middle Tennessee. She's going to be terrified. At, she's going to have nightmares of those hands, man. God bless. Just like the hands, hey, like the hands of an angel. Oh my God! That was the women's basketball. How about the Longhorns women's basketball team? Perfect. That was transition. Man, yeah. are they good? Like they were spe spectacular.
I'd like to uh, shout out the Texas women's basketball team for a few different reasons, but uh, at the top of my list of reasons, my biggest bet of the weekend during my time in Vegas was on the Texas women's basketball team in their opening round matchup, the 116 in the Portland Region 4. The Longhorns were 35-point favorites against Drexel. Guess what? who took Texas minus 35? You did? And the Longhorns won by 40. Wow. They covered the ginormous line. I was locked in on my phone. My boys are like, what are you watching? Like, all the games are on TV. I'm like, women's. Huge women's game. And they're like, you're up by 37 with two minutes left. Why? This matters. This matters to me. Points matter. So, yeah, shout out to the Texas women for not only winning their yeah. first game, but also covering. And they, yeah, you got away with that. You got away with that. You know, you don't get away with that that often. Now, South Carolina, by the way, in their 116 matchup, you know, they're the overall number one seed in this tournament. Yeah. Now, they were 55 point favorites. What? Against the Blue Hose of Presbyterian. It's not a derogatory term, it's the real mascot. And they only won by 52. They didn't cover that. Yeah. 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 But more importantly, the Texas women are still dancing because they won again yesterday against the great defense, Alabama. Yep. Yep. Great defense. 65 to 54. The final score from the Moody Center yesterday. Texas never trailed. It was a wire to wire win. They were in control throughout. And you're How many right. Block shots they end up with BK like 20. Felt like Man. it. And they, they held Bama to 34% shooting. They forced. Uh, 14 turnovers. Let's see if I can pull up the box score real quick. But yeah, it was a block party. Held both games for Texas against Drexel yeah. and against Alabama. Felt like block parties. I mean, the Longhorns were locked down defensively in both of those two games that they've played so far in the tournament. And let's see, 11 blocks for Texas Man. against the Crimson Tide yesterday in that 11 point win. It was a little we bit of a struggle. Bama. What's that? We own Bama. Oh, yeah, in every sport, right? It's like Washington owns us, but we own Bama. That's right. Remember got that. Him, got them in football this year. I think we're eight and two all time against them in football. And now we get them in uh, the NCAA women's basketball tournament as well. That was good to see. Uh, credit Aaliyah Moore, 21 and 10 for Texas. Madison Booker, another 20 point performance for her. She had 21 and six. Now, the other Texas starters combined to shoot just four of 20. The Longhorns only made one three. It was not a great offensive showing by Texas, but like you said, it was lockdown defense from the horns. Oh, and they, they size size matters and they were they were physical against both teams. Yeah, they were. Boy, they they really were the boards. These offensive rebounds. They were fabulous. And that's what Vic Schaefer's all about. Like he wants to be a defensive first team. And yep. he loves he loves the blocks. He loves the turnovers. He forced his teams forced like a number of shot clock violations in both of those games. Like that's the stuff that gets Vic Schaefer excited. And that's a big reason why this Texas team is the number one seed and why they've been so good this year. Absolutely. The most most uh, minutes I put into a women's uh, basketball game yesterday, that was the most. Good. good. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a fun it. watch. I watched it to the, just about the very end of it. I didn't turn it off early. I just wanted to see. I wanted to see if there was going to be another block shot because every time those girls from Bama kept coming down the lane, I'm like, you're going to get it blocked. You're, oh, yeah. you're not going to pull up and take this jump shot without them tipping the ball. Absolutely. It was great. They all played good defense. That was fun. It was fun to watch. Yep. And it's the uh, third Sweet 16 for Vic Schaefer in his four seasons at Texas. I guess he's been here for five years, but you had the COVID year for one of them, so there was no tournament. Uh, but uh, Texas went to the Elite Eight the other two times they reached it to the Sweet 16, obviously hoping to get back there and then hoping to take it another step further and get to the Final Four for the first time in two decades. Uh, Texas will play again next weekend. We don't know who they're playing. They will get the winner of the five-seed Utah and the four-seed Gonzaga. That game is tonight, so the winner of that one will move on to take on the Longhorns in Portland next weekend. But, uh, yeah, Texas gets the win. Once again, another Sweet 16 appearance for Vic Schaefer and company. And great crowd on hand. I mean, Vic Schaefer took oh, yeah. the mic after the game and thanked the in-house crowd at the Moody Center. Almost 10,000 in the stands yesterday. The Alabama head coach in her post-game press conference actually said, like, this was an awesome atmosphere. Shout out to Texas. They were gracious hosts. Great women's basketball fans here. We had a great time, and we're grateful for the opportunity to have played here. So it was a, a great look for Austin, a great look for the University of Texas. 
uh, and Texas did a great job hosting these two games. And obviously, good, good news for the for the Longhorns is they uh, they advance to the Sweet 16. The number two seed in this region almost lost last night. Stanford, who a lot of people thought could have been the one seed over Texas in this region, they got taken to overtime by Iowa State. Of course, the team that Texas beat in the Big 12 tournament final, and they had that big, I, I call her, uh, boy, this is mean, I call her Shaquille O'Meal, Audi Crooks. Oh, big, yeah. Big player for Iowa State. She she had uh, like 40 points in Iowa State's first round tournament win. She damn near brought Iowa State back against Texas in the Big 12 tournament. She almost pulled off, her and Iowa State almost pulled off an upset against Stanford. They forced overtime, but the two seed Stanford ended up holding on. So Texas almost got a little bit of a gift with uh, Shaquille O'Meal. Yeah, what do you think of that? You're bad. I'm bad. Yeah. You don't like you don't like that one? O'Meal. Was yeah. she round shoulder? She's round shoulder. She is she's she's round shoulders, as you like to say. But she's big. She's big too. When she's, I say big, I mean tall and round shoulder. Let's uh, let's pull up a pic. I mean, she's a freaking monster and she's only a freshman. Like she I'm is not gonna call her a monster. See, you think Kim would call somebody a monster? Well, I, I mean that like on the court, like she's one of the best players in women's college basketball already, and her career is just getting started. She's a freshman, yeah. She's uh as the kids say, she's been cooking, Buck. Wow. And that's a double entendre, I think, for her. Not not just on the floor, but that's Audi Crooks. She is always hungry for more. Oh my, you got all these little sayings. You are so you're are you body shaming? No, no, but she did average a McDouble double this season. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, oh man, yeah, that's mean. Can you imagine Kim trying to grab those cheeks? She I, I, could she get her hands around the, the no, no, dude. If Kim Mulkey, Kim Mulkey could take most people, but I think if she tried to fight Audi Crook, she would get knocked out. Wow, I'm not, I'm she's not got messing some with guns, that. too. Yeah, yeah, no, she's awesome. She's a stud and almost pulled off. A huge upset for Iowa State. She's one of the best players in the country. Say huge. You never had to say the word huge. I didn't say the word huge. You said the word huge. No, you said it. Yeah, she almost pulled off a huge upset. You said the oh. word huge. <laughs> I did just say keep, that. They just slip right out, don't they? That's a sports <laughs> term. All right, easy, Mike. That's a sports <laughs> term. People say huge upset all the time when we get to sure. March Madness, you know? They don't say anything about double-double McCheese. I know that. She's that's just what she averaged this season. That's all I could say. With cheese, yeah. And someone someone said she dropped forty in the opening round game. I dropped or gained? I'm not sure. <laughs> See, that's horrible. Oh my god. Oh boy, it's the lentil season, and look at you. Uh, I don't I don't do that. I'm not a lentil guy. I hate beans. Yeah, one more Friday, brother. One more Friday for me. Oh, that's it. Easter's coming up on Sunday, right? I had a mix. I had hey. I had a fillet of fish, and the first thing I thought about when I saw that cheese on that deal was you saying, what in the hell are they doing putting cheese on here? As I bit into that, that tasty morsel, and I got it from Dripping Springs, fresh from right from Maine, right to Dripping Springs, that cod. <laughs> That's not I thought coming from Maine. It's coming from maine and It's not coming from Maine. And the taste of that, along with a mouthful of fries, special. Oh. Sorry about that. I did slam down. You know what I? You know what I've done though. I have mm. not had any ice cream for the forty days, forty nights. I've been pretty good. Good. That I've been good on. I've had some sweets. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I'm lying. I haven't had a soda. That's what it is. I've not had a bad soda. I've had Olipop. I did have McFlurry with all the little chocolate Oreos you get, in there. You got the Oreo McFlurry. I got the Oreo McFlurry and I put it down into my mouth with the filet of fish and the and the fries at the same time. And I washed oh, it down. With the oh, was that? Oh man. Oh. I think hit the bottom of my stomach because I hadn't had any ice cream, but the ice cream with the cheese fish, oh, that hit me. I had to get home. I did this while I was while I was driving the car. Oh, I had to get I had to go over the fence in order to get to the bathroom. I couldn't even open up the gate. I was worried about the dog who now has a shot collar on. And, dude, you should see this dude. When I hit the shot collar on him, <coughs> BK, when he runs to the gate, he, 
He does that, but he goes up in the air. His feet leave the ground. And I want to do – I, you know how bad I want to do it for things that he's done before, but you can't do that. See what a good father I am? Okay, hold on, hold on. You need the shot collar on yourself, and you need to be shocked after eating what you ate at McDonald's last Friday. That is the, the fish, the cheese, the fries, and the McFlurry in one bite? Yeah, I put it all – I washed it down there with the McFlurry so oh I could swallow it. Oh, God. First of all, the ice cream machine not being broken is a big win. Congrats on that. <laughs> Well, that's no, that's only in Dripping Springs, not not Dripping Springs. That's in Oak Hill, your special McDonald's there. That thing's always broke there. Broke all summer, broke all winter. I bet you it's broke right now. I bet you I can go there. That thing's not working. It never works. I'm like, why do you guys have a machine? I still you know can't what I mean? believe. I still can't. Why don't you believe go to you. Amy's and just buy some ice cream bars and give them to people? There you go. You could just go to Amy's too. That works. I just I, there's so like go to Jack Allen's and get a good fish. Go to Cover Three and get those <laughs> mahi mahi tacos. What are you doing eating the fill of a fish at McDonald's? Nasty. From Maine, <clears throat> fresh Maine cod. That is. What is this? That's, That's not some farm tilapia. That's not farm tilapia. It's not. <laughs> As Jason says, that's a town lake trout that you're getting. Oh, you're... it was it was tasty, and I had the tata sauce too. I had the tata sauce on the cheese with a handful of fries, and then downing it with that McFlurry, and then I swallowed it all. And then when it hit the bottom, you could eat like boom. You could just feel that thing hit the bottom. <laughs> and I got home so quick. <laughs> wow, man! Oh man! Whose tata sauce did you have? They had its own, you know, last time it was kind of sour tasting Tata. Oh, shit. <laughs> Is it this woman? Did you have her Tata sauce? Why don't you reach back there in the folds and grab that 22 out of there? I'll teach him. I'll this teach was, you. This was a little jack in the crack. This was not McDankey's here. <laughs> you grab, it was her, you it was her Tata sauce. You can't shoot at people. You can't shoot oh them God. if they throw the fry. Even if they throw the fries back at you, you can't pull a gun out and shoot no. some kid that's sitting in the back seat. Have nothing to do with it. No, yeah, you, you can't. Know? You can't shoot at the kid. You can't shoot at the driver, the passenger. That's uh, unacceptable. That's, that's yeah, about that's, as bad as that rectum woman telling you that you need to worry more <laughs> about kids in Africa instead of worrying no, about your my wife, cable bill. I would not have been that friendly. I would have yeah. been. I would have been ugly. That would have got ugly in a hurry. She would have definitely hung up on me within within a minute of her telling me what to do about my money. She would have hung up. I would have cursed at her. I, I, I'm going to say that. I'm trying not to say that I would have swore at a lady that I don't know, that that wouldn't be manly of me. I would have cursed at her. Let me. Uh... I would have dropped, what the F did you say? <laughs> I mean, I would have. I was like, you just told me to, I'm trying to get worry about my money. And you're... Life is like that, though. There's some people that just, and you know what? Like she said, there are much. There's probably better things that I could have done with the hundred dollars. And she's right. Get you out of this country and back to helping the kids in Africa or whatever. Yes, or New Zealand or wherever. Or like such as such as man. That was unbelievable. I can't believe when my wife told me that. I was I was going to go buy Spectrum itself. By the front office, and demand something. When uh, when does Lent end? By the way, does it end on Good Friday or does it end on Easter Sunday? It ends on Good Friday because that's the last okay. no meat eating. Deal. So you got four, you got four days left. I've only I've screwed that up twice. By the way, so you've waited till Sunday or what? No, you I've had meat meat on Good Friday. Friday. Uh, bacon, bacon and eggs for the big man. You made it Sorry, so far. You made it. All the way to the fortieth day, and you give up on the last day. Come on, man. No, I said I've, I've I've done it twice. Where my wife said, "Would you like some? Would you like some bacon and eggs?" And I said, "Sure." And then happened to be on a Friday, and I'm like, "Oh no!" But then you know, I then stop where I didn't don't go and have a you know steak sandwich or something. I I make the mistake in the morning, then I'm pretty good. Ran right off. You got that point. Oh, I did have bacon and eggs that morning, all with the tartar sauce and the fries and the McFlurry. That was all in that day. That's right. What, you, you had bacon and eggs with tartar sauce? No, I had bacon and eggs that morning, screwed up. And then I said, now I got to go Catholic on you and have some <laughs> filet of fish 
with the fries and the McFlurry. Oh, that was cool. My that was my stomach took all of that on in a day. What a mess. All right. Good Friday's coming up. Major League Baseball also returns. This How about week. Texas baseball? Has does Texas baseball return? Are they bad? Yeah, I mean they they won a series over the weekend against Baylor. Once again, get your entries in for that Cabo Bob's gift card. We'll be giving it away before we uh, wrap things up at ten o'clock. Leave us a text. The code to text line five one two 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 nine three two eight or comment on YouTube. Uh, yeah, I think the biggest story from Texas is uh, they might have a rotation now, and okay. they might have themselves a Saturday starter because Ace Whitehead who is from Lampasas, great football player too in high school, um, started the year as a bullpen arm, and he's been inserted into the starting rotation recently. He pitched a complete game on Saturday in a 10-2 to win for the Longhorns in a game that evened up the series. The Longhorns lost 4-3 to in extra innings on Friday. Uh, LeBaron Johnson was great. Gage Bohm was also great, but the Texas offense just didn't do enough to give the Longhorns the win there. But yeah, Saturday, Ace Whitehead was magnificent. And then yesterday, too, another great pitching performance from Max Grubb. I mean, that's a good sign is that this Texas starting rotation that's been a little up and down after LeBaron Johnson, they might have uh, found something over the weekend with Ace Whitehead and with Max as well. So it's good to hear. Good. So the head coach, pitching coach, has got it. He's is starting to figure it out with his group. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think the jury's still out for – for this season, uh, Texas is 15 and nine on the year right now. They've got one more home game, a part of this 10 game homestand before they go back on the road and they'll be in Manhattan. It's a Thursday to Saturday series because of Easter Sunday. So they'll play Thursday, right. Friday and Saturday, but yeah, they've got a midweek game tomorrow and then uh, they dip back in the conference play. So yeah, look, we'll, we'll see how they do. I mean, they're very much in the mix in the big 12, but obviously still have uh, the majority of their conference series sure. left to play. But, um, yeah, look, we don't complain about series wins. And right now, no. Texas is tied for third in the Big 12. You've got K-State, who's 5-1. and one. They've been one of the bigger surprises in this league. That's the team you play this weekend. So it could be a big series that uh, has an impact on what the final conference standings look like. But, yeah, K-State is 5-1. and one. Oklahoma 7-2. and two. And Texas and West Virginia right now are 4-2 and two in Big 12 play. So uh, we'll see. But they're in the mix. Right now. Great. And then Everyone. you said we had the start of Major League Baseball coming up? And then Major League Baseball gets going. Yeah, you had that uh, Sewell series between the Dodgers and the Padres last week, and those were technically regular season games. But uh, real opening day is Thursday. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but your Yankees. I saw they, were, did they lose to the Mexican national team or something. Oh, I didn't even see that, did they? Yeah, they did. Hmm. No, they lost a team from Mexico. Trevor Bauer is pitching for them. And you know who's – I think it's Robin Cano plays for that team. Robinson that Cano? Robinson Cano must be 46 or something by now. Wow. I think he had yeah, a, home, I, a home run. Uh, the Diablos Rojos? Yes, the Diablos Rojos. <laughs> Y'all <laughs> lost to the Diablos Rojos? Yeah, they lost the game. The Red Devils? Yeah, thank okay. you very much. That's not good. Well, the Yankees open up the actual regular season, you know, playing Major League Baseball teams against Houston on Thursday. What a great way to start out the season. Yep, Yankees at Astros, a four-game series down at Minute Maid Park starting on Thursday. And, of course, Thursday night, there will be a banner raised in Arlington as the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers will begin their season. You're mentioning the Astros, but then you're talking about the Rangers. That's well, just slapping them in the face. Well, look, I got to talk about the defending champs. You know, that's the Rangers. Rangers beat the Astros in the ALCS last year. Now, last year, if we were doing TSU at the start of the baseball season, then I would have started with the Astros because they won the World Series two years ago, and they would have been the defending champs. Just giving now, your group some love, that's now all. It's, now it's the Rangers. They're the defending champs. So they will take on the Cubbies. This weekend, and that's a nationally televised game on Thursday night. Any futures, in use, any futures bets on the Rangers while you're in Vegas? What does that look like for? Are they favorites? No, no the uh, the the it's Dodgers small. are the favorites to win the World Series. Okay, now, the, Ra the Rangers aren't that high on the list. I mean, I think it's the Dodgers, the Braves, uh, the Yankees are in the top three again, like they always are. They they always underachieve nowadays. Way to go, Yankees! Uh, I think the Astros are fourth, and then the Rangers might be fifth or you sixth. You keep saying that like you want him back. 
You want you want him on that wall, don't you? You've been you waiting want for that. A little guy on the wall. Look at him. He's been sitting in this corner for months now, waiting for baseball season to start. And they just got beat by the what are the 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 the, the Lojos, Cabanos? <laughs> Who do they get beat by? Well, that's offensive. The Diablos Rojos. Rojos. Yes. That wouldn't happen if Jeter was around. No, I don't know if Jeter would have played in that game, though. They're, they're, you know, they'd save him for the, the real right, thing. Yeah, regular season. Yep, you've got your Jeter ready to go. I've got my. Oh, look who it is. Adrian Beltre, bobblehead, oh, ready to go. We are uh, almost set for the start of another Major League Baseball season. But uh, no futures. But look, I, I saw the Rangers win one. I didn't think I'd ever see them win one. So. I'm not going to get greedy and all of a sudden expect them to win two. I think they'll be good again this year. I would pick the Astros to win the American League West uh, again. and But I think the Rangers will make the playoffs. I think they'll be a wild card team like they were last year, and we'll see what happens if they get there again. Did you say the Yankees play on Thursday? Because I will be wearing my full Yankee outfit. There we go. I got, yep. I'm, I'm got my pants. I got my jersey. I got my hat. I will be wearing my full gear for the start of the baseball season. You have a full uniform? I do. Where'd you get that? I got that a couple of years back where I, I wore that. I'm gonna wear it. I'm gonna wear it on Thursday just for the start. Oh, and my man. Yankees cap. And I'm wearing my old Yankees cap, the one that I'm supposed to be buried in. Oh, that's awesome. You're gonna be buried I'm, in the Yankees oh, cap. Oh yeah. I got yeah, but I'm not not Yankees gear, just the cap. Okay, that's normal. Yeah, my uh, yep. dad was buried in his Yankees cap. Yeah. Except for I'm being okay. creamy. Hmm. Creamy? I'm going to cremate it. I hate to burn up a good cap. No, you're trying to be cremated. Yeah, I don't want to mess up a good cap, though. What's, what's the point of putting a cap on if you're going to get burned? I don't know if they even let you do that. I think they do. Okay. Unless it's evidence, you know, unless it's evidence that I was with Kim Mulkey or something, there's some DNA on it. We'll see. Whoa. We'll figure it out. We will figure it out, folks. She's going to kill you. That's how you're going to die? <laughs> you hang out with her one time, your hall pass, and then boom, that's the last time yeah, anyone ever hears from you. Absolutely. Could be. Oh, Could be. God. Yep. Thursday so, at 310 is uh, Yankees-Astros. Yes. Game one of 162. All right. Before we uh, wrap things up here, we'll get into some other tournament talk. We spent plenty of time talking about the Texas men and the Texas women, but the Sweet 16 wow. is set. So we'll talk about that here in a moment. But uh, first, Buck, how about a word from our friends out at Covert BK? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous Hill Country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Very nice. I'm going to tell the folks about my friends over at Relax the Back. You know, for years, I've been looking uh, for the right support for my back, and I needed to have the comfort after having thoracic back surgery. Relax the Back embraces a holistic approach for a healthier lifestyle based on 35 years of proven expertise. And their motto is live wellness. Relax the Back can help transform your routine uh, into a big part of your life, that healthy routine that you need to support, whether it's your shoulders, your neck, your thoracic, your lumbar area. They've got the, the, the right chair, the recliners. Uh, the pillows, everything that you need that's going to help your back. Believe me, you don't want to deal with a bad back. And if you're starting to have problems, get it fixed immediately with Relax the Back. I'm in my Relax the Back chair. I've got my other roadie downstairs in the garage right now. So if I get on the road and I need a chair, I'll just do that. I'll just bring in that chair with me. Sure. One of these Should. days. One, yeah, of, these one days. of these days, I'll do that. Folks, they've got two locations, the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods. And in Austin, up north at the Gateway Shopping Center, across from the Container Store, lift pain free like the buck with Relax the Back. Indeed. Shout out to Audiovisual Consultations as well. Hopefully, you've already made the call to AV Consultations to get your home TV setup done the way that you want it done. If you haven't, well, there's still time. Once again, Major League Baseball is about to start. Of course, the NCAA tournament is still going on. You're about to get to the NHL playoffs. You're about to get to the NBA playoffs. A lot of sports which means, yeah, you need to have your 
TV setup done in the comfort of your own home, and audiovisual consultations can get the job done for you. They've been in business here in Central Texas since 1988. They've been around longer than I've been alive. See the two TVs behind me if you're watching on YouTube, hooked up by AV Consultations, and you notice how good they look. They're mounted perfectly. There's no wire sticking out. Sometimes you go to a buddy's place and they try to do it themselves. There are wires everywhere, and it looks like shit. It's not going to happen with AV consultations. Professional work, great people. They will take care of you. All you have to do is give them a call, 512-255-8678. That's 255-8678. Or check them out online at avconsultations.com. Um, so if you're not sure about your air conditioning, you need to get to our friends over at Woods Comfort Systems because they'll make sure that that baby's up and running. We're going to have some 80 degree temperatures about to hit us here very shortly. So you want to make sure your air conditioning is working right. By the way, the heat has been cranking on some of these mornings. We had some cool and windy mornings, PK. And boy, my thank goodness, because, you know, I like to walk around here, you know, with a not a lot on at my house. So I need to have that. I still need to have some time the heater pop on. And that's great, too. But with Woods Comfort Systems, no matter where it's air conditioning, heating, plumbing, too, they can get it done for you. Make sure they come out and make sure your system's all ready to go for sure. For the right, right season, you want to be prepared for that. And I am thanks to our friends over at Woods Comfort Systems. 68 years of service. Absolutely. WoodsComfortSystems.com is the website. If uh, you need more information or give them a call, 512 842 5066. Shout out to all of our great sponsors here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. And anyway, sure. you will have your tickets at Syntex tickets for women's basketball. The men are done. The They're men are done. Back home, yes. And yeah, the men are done. But yeah, all your tickets to sports, to shows, to concerts, anything can yeah. be found at SyntexTickets.com. And y'all make sure to download the autograph app as well. Use the promo code TSU. It's free in the app store. It's a great place to get all of your Longhorn content in one place. Just search it, autograph in the App Store or the Google Play Store. It's completely free. You can find all of our podcasts and tons of other great Longhorn content, and you get rewarded just for being a fan. Discounts on tickets, discounts on merchandise, tons of great content and stuff for you all the time for free on that Autograph app. Just make sure you download it and use the promo code TSU. Buck? Yes, sir. The Sweet 16 is set, and there's a whole lot of chalk in this year's tournament. And that's a good thing. To me, this has been the perfect tournament. Now, be a little bit more perfect if Texas was still dancing. And selfishly, as a Kansas fan, I'd, I'd prefer the Jayhawks to still be there as well. But what I want to see in the tournament, I want to see a ton of upsets on day one. Right? I want to get crazy upsets, you know, 15s over twos, 14s over threes, whatever. But towards the end of the tournament, I want the cream to rise to the top. Like yeah. I want the best teams to be actually competing for a national championship. And that's what we have. So we, we had a ton of great upsets, right? We had Kentucky lose. We had Auburn lose. Uh, we had a lot of great games, too. Overtime, we had a double overtime game a couple of days ago. The Houston A&M game yesterday was a thriller. We've had buzzer beaters. I mean, it's been a spectacular tournament in terms of it. But also, we've got some really good teams left, which means we're going to have some great matchups next weekend how'd you like my big man from nc state dj burns yep they're wow. in the sweet 16 there it's funny the cinderella this year buck is the acc champion that's how chalky it's been like nc yeah. state 11 seed they only got in the tournament because they won their conference tournament but they're the lowest seeded team nobody else below a six is still alive you've got all four one seeds you've got all four two seeds you've got two threes two fours two fives a six and an eleven. There's your sweet 16. So, look, some people like the big-time Cinderella stories, and they want to see the uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 seed make it all the way. Now, last year's Final Four sucked because it was UConn as a four and a bunch of teams that weren't really that good. You want the best teams to be in it at the end. And, man, you've got some awesome oh, yeah. matchups coming up in the sweet 16 later this week. Sign me up for it. Absolutely, man. I enjoy watching the big man again the other night. He was something. Boy, what soft hands. He yeah, was – That I don't know if they can – I don't know. They don't They don't shoot well enough. But, man, is he something in the middle. When they get that ball down to him, he's a great assist guy too. And he, you're talking about a guy who looks like he's having fun. And it looks like – you're talking about a guy who looks like he can tear down some filet of fish with fries. Oh, he could eat 10 and, of those things. Wow. Got DJ Burns and Audie Crooks from 
Iowa State getting together. Oh, wow. See you later, Buffet. Yeah. Some of these. <laughs> <See you later. laughs> I mean, you, got, you got great game. Baylor lost. The Big 12 hasn't been that great. Oh, the- man, I had Baylor going again, too. Yeah, you had Baylor making it to the Final Four. You did have NC State in the Final Four, and they, of yes. course, are still alive. But some of the games we're going to get, I mean, UConn-San Diego State, that's a rematch of the national title game. Yep. Bama, North Carolina, Illinois, Iowa State, Gonzaga, Purdue. How about Duke-Houston? What a game that's going to be on Friday night. Creighton, Tennessee. I mean, it's that. this is what I want. This is what I want. Like, I want upsets, of course. Once again, it sucks that the Longhorns aren't there. But I I want these great matchups with great teams and great players once we get to the second weekend. And we're going to get that this year. So, yeah, we're going to get plenty of good games. Yeah, plenty of good basketball. We'll talk way more about it tomorrow. We'll talk more Longhorn football as spring football continues. We'll get into some Texas baseball. uh, But obviously, college hoops, the big conversation point today. But I see the fellas back from – NASCAR at Coda. We got Double R, and we've got Wags. A little chaos theory, gentlemen. Wags was out there at Coda. How we doing, boys? Doing great, man. Boy, big weekend out there. A lot of lot of freaking people, man. It uh, yesterday, and this was we, we were talking about it on Friday. Oh, am I muted? Oh, Wags is muted. Um, I was talking about it on Friday to where last year when golf was in, uh, you know that kind of hurt the crowd. But I got to tell you, man, I mean, it didn't look Formula One-esque, but I mean, that main grandstand up into turn one, there were a shit ton of people there, man. And um, good. That's good because uh, that that helps hopefully bring them back is is hopefully the case. Nice yeah. crowd, though, huh? Roddy, going up turn one, was that special turn oh, one? Oh, man, man, it, it was great. And and the Saturday the Saturday action was really good. Yesterday, you didn't have any cautions. Uh, well, you had two cautions, which were the stage cautions. So, uh, But you did have some stuff. Kyle Busch was a little pissed off at Christopher Bell at the end of that race and did all of that mess. Oh. But uh, it was – it was uh, I mean, it was just – the atmosphere was amazing. Uh, pre-race concert, all this shit. Uh, folks, folks, were, folks were pretty jazzed up. Folks were jazzed up, and that's how was your media room on Friday? Did a lot of folks start coming in there. That thing started getting a little bit more the, folks coming to the media room. The, the media center gets gets pretty crowded once you get into like Saturday afternoon into Sunday. Okay, um, it, and, and it's so weird the transformation that happens between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday because yeah, yeah, and the, yeah, that dude showed up, uh, Coach Sark. Uh, I walked up, he's like double R. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> My <laughs> brother R from Chaos Theory on double Texas R. Sports Unfiltered. He's like, Double R, what the fuck are you doing? No. He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> what are you doing out here, coach? What are you doing here, man? I didn't know you like racing, but uh no, I mean he was uh super good dude right there. And uh did y'all see who did the invocation? Who did the pre-race prayer? Did y'all see who did that? No, no. Dicker the kicker. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Dicker the kicker. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a really good time out there, man. They they hit a home run. You know, sometimes when the race lacks whatever, um, I can tell you that they definitely made up for it uh, with all the pomp and circumstance because it, uh, it was a really good time. And hopefully, I tell you what concerns me is a lot of times they'll say during the race, uh, we look forward to seeing you next year at Coda. They didn't say that. But um, ho- hopefully, hopefully it's back. I'm, I'm well, sure. Was it back. a four-year contract? Uh, that, that thing is year to year. That thing is year wow. to year right now. Uh, for, did the track, did they say the track, does the track hold up, Rodney? They say they were NASCAR happy with the track. Yeah, yeah. What was really cool about this, there, there were different sections or sectors, as the Formula One people say, that uh, were repaved. Um, so what you had is you had some old worn out pavement in different spots, and then you had the mm-hmm. nice patches, you know, in other spots. So that that, that kind of made some some havoc out there but you had a lot of guys you, you have to watch these races differently because what what you miss on tv is is all the shit that's happening in the back uh, i mean these guys running all over each other and and mm-hmm. spins and all of that i mean a lot of times there's spins that's happening um i'm fortunate because just with some of the folks that i know i can go watch the race in a different location to where i've got like 22 screens and i see every corner so you, you you see all the all the action happening right there, but it, I mean it was just it, it it's it's just a good time. It's just a so good time. Now. Ronnie's up here, you know, spouting out a uh, you know awesome you know technical stuff about NASCAR and F one and, and talking about Dakota track and everything. But what he's failing to tell you is the first thing that he always does is goes and finds the hot woman at the. <laughs> 
Not a bad bit. He nails them down. Nails. Oh, I mean, so I don't know who it's his guest was that he had one revved up. Hold on. What do you got? The randomizer shaking over there? Uh-oh. 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 Uh -oh. Look out. Randomizer's going oh, on. We got right. Cabo, Cabo Bob. Bob's gift card to give away. Cabo Bob's. Uh, the randomizer is speaking. And the winner is from YouTube, Sam Weinberger. There it is. Cashing in with the comment, now I got to go Catholic on you. That must have been something you said, Buck. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, cool. Probably about that fish you had from Mainer. <laughs> no, dude. Filet of fish with a handful of fries and a McFlurry to go to wash it down. Oh, oh that God. was good. Flurry. Why don't you go to Jack Allen's for fish? flow and mud? I, I do go to Jack Allen's enough, but I sometimes I get down there with with the with the regular people down here in Dripping. We're gonna have us a filet of fish, you know, some fresh cod from Maine. It was it was good stuff. It was good. I'm just worried about that ice cream. Is that real ice cream from those things? McFlurry, yeah, of course. That's authentic. No. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah real at McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know. <laughs> I always hear that that's not real ice cream. Like, well, what is it? It's not. What's that other ice cream they that people eat now? They call it ice cream. Um, Frozen yogurt? Sorbet? No, no oh, the it's Italian. Gel gelato? Gelato. That's not. Gelato jello. is not. I love jello. jello. Like, I love jello. I love jello too. Hey, 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 love that jello pudding. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> uh, Sam, get in contact with us. We'll get you your uh, your gift card. See you guys. Later, buddy. And when you dip the spoon in the pudding, make sure you put on the Cosby condom. The jello oh pudding pops. In the pudding pop. What a weirdo. Okay. Right. Welcome yeah, to Chaos cool. Theory with all your pudding pops. Hopefully you had a great weekend. Rodney was Jeez. watching left and right hand turns and locking down some really good looking guests. Uh, we'll talk a little you bit like about her? that. My man, my, I don't know. My, my, I guess my man just tucks it in the sock. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, he's firing off. Big engine up there at, at Coda, that's for sure. Anyways, not to get too vulgar on a Monday here. It is misogynistic Monday. I was going to talk about the Longhorn ladies, but it's Monday. Uh, so we can't talk. We got to wait till Tuesday to talk about them. Anyways, um, welcome to Chaos Theory. That's a joke. We obviously talk about the Longhorn ladies. Um, if you are mobile, make sure you hit us up on the Coda text line, 512-222-9328. Make sure you're locking this down on your social media platforms. I'm at not the fake wags on Twitter. Rodney's at the Rodney R. And then on the Instagram at the underscore Rodney R. I'm on there at the Wagner Wire and all of the social media platforms that way. My God, we are back in our home environment here. How about um, that? I, I got to say, it's it's good to be here, but it also it's it's it is not as exciting as what it is going up to Coda, though, man. Um, I had a fantastic time, but uh, look, dude, uh, I got to tell you, man, I do like being here in the audiovisual consultation bat cave. Well, Friday Friday was just, I mean, I don't want to say a clusterfuck, but but I mean, it, it was, was a little weird. It was a little weird. I thought we were going to be in the same room and, and yeah. whatnot. Uh, well, thank you for everybody with their patience. Thanks for BK for able to, you know, I figured on. out, I figured, I figured the buzzing out. I figured the buzzing out. What um, was the buzz? What was it? So here, here's what was happening. So, and this is why, and again, thank you for yesterday, because I know when I told you I'm taking a different PC, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm taking a different setup and all this different stuff. Uh, it was, you were kind of on the hook there to hang out, you, you know, during all that. So thank oh, you care, for, man. For, for taking the time. But uh, so here's what was happening. So with the, with the big, so I, I took my studio computer on Friday. And that's what I was running everything out of. Works fine every day. No problem. Whatever. But it, you saw it. It's big. I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's, 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 it's massive. You almost need um, an amplifier for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and it's and I have it purposeful in the studio for that reason. I took that. So so it was sitting. And this is so fucking stupid. So it, it was sitting right up against the on that desk where we were. It was sitting right up against that wall. And the and the, and it, was and the it was vibrating. We were hearing vibrating. Vibrate. That's what it was. And, and it was like anytime, anytime that we moved a while, yeah, anytime so that we easy. moved that's our headset, fix. anytime that we did anything or, or we went like this, Wags, I went back like Gene Sterator. I'm sitting there and I'm like replaying every fucking second of you. You know how uptight I was on Friday yeah. when this shit was yeah, you going could, on. You couldn't have a conversation. I was I, I'm a technical to guy. Me, I'm a talk to so, me. Use. So I went back and I watched this and it would be like, I would say something and I'd be like, I'd go like that and the thing would move and it would, go, and then you would say something, you would be like, well, here's what I'm thinking. And you would 
go like this and you would hit your 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 the wire and it would oh, move man. and it's like <clears throat> so it won't happen again what a cluster <laughs> uh we apologize thanks to everybody for your patience obviously you got us in the clear and concise voice presence of our friendly confines mine That's just right. happened to be i i call, I'm, i am i'm gonna start calling this the audiovisual bat cave there you 100%, go 100 because this is where we make the magic happen that's there for sure go. And there's a lot of toys here, man. We don't ever have to leave, my guy. Um, yeah. Anyway, it was it was fun to be out there. Uh, so, how was Sunday, man? Give me, you know, give me the rundown. I saw, you know, what was the was there a party? Give me what happens at a race behind the scenes while the cameras are on the track. I mean, I know there's got to be like drinking games and beer Olympics while you're doing NASCAR stuff, right? Well, so so over there where we were. Like like where you were on with me on 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 Friday, so I'm like there for for me to get to the fun That's stuff. That's gotta be like, hard of it. You're right at the paddock. Well, you're really you, you can't do any of that in there. I mean, you're not supposed to be. Um, oh and, right, and right, right. Media, and so that's the other bad part. Everybody's gotta okay. You for, can't even for, cheer for your favorite driver, can you? That, that's a whole thing where it's like I get people all the time where they're like, "Hey, if you run into so and so, get me an autograph," and I'm like, "You know, I'm gonna talk to him, but I can't do that." right <laughs> you know like um it's, it's just off limits at the paddock is that like a, the yeah, it's, 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 so the, that's the sanctuary for the drivers essentially from the media it, it's unwritten code you know it's like it's okay. like going to like if if we were going to go cover the cowboys you know we we shouldn't walk up to dak prescott right, 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 right. Right. but um so so just be professional it's being professional no but, but I, yeah yeah but but i can tell you one thing um what i and i didn't get to the fan zones i didn't get to any of that i was planning to do that i just didn't i got busy and, and get sidetracked and do different things but i i can tell you that from what i could see from the fan zones and like out uh, uh you know in the in the midway and, and then on the back side of the racetrack where the carnival and all that that it was jammed over there and before before the race they had a they had a concert out there where you know if you were a VIP or you bought some special whatever you could actually go out there and listen to the music on the front straightaway dude and that that thing right there was just whoo man it was just wall to wall and I mean you it, it looked like a Texas pregame there, there were so many people out there they were jamming it was it was amazing it was amazing I, I tell you it uh, that that's where you really that's where you really figure out how much of the the added entertainment is so important in a sporting event like that because that, that that's going to bring people in there are a lot of sure. people that go just all right well well to that to that you you know on the way out usually you hear you know see you next year but you spoke to that you spoke to bk and, and bucky about that um that was not muffled or mentioned this year uh and that gives you a little bit of pause and a little bit of air of concern right hopefully you know it all went well with nascar and and bobby epstein up there uh you know circuit of the americas to where yeah. they're going to want to come back is that is that actually up in the air is that a thing that we have to worry about well what it is it's more it's more of a nascar thing wags because now now their schedule oh, right so I, mean, I mean i'm sure bobby wants yeah. everybody back there. yeah yeah the the way the schedule works now is that they add venues they go to different places like i've, I've heard I've heard that you know the the pre-race exhibition, the clash, maybe in Mexico next year. Um, one of the tracks that was gone that came back uh, could be that that has exhibition races could become a points race, um, and things kind of shake up a little bit. I mean, like Texas Motor Speedway used to have two races, now they got one. I mean, Texas, this market is so valuable, right. and and but what I think Austin has done is that they have they have solidified themselves as as a true nascar town and i think that's why i'm so excited even though maybe the race yesterday lacked for a little bit of the pizzazz that the the crowd the atmosphere the just the just everything else that went on is going to be enough to bring it back and, and i think it will i think it will so it, it's just one of those things to where i'm used to i'm used to hearing that but but i know that the schedule just fluctuates i mean that's what that's like it's not like Bobby Epstein or anything to put a bid up to have NASCAR come back to Coda, right? It's just a selection process to where it, where NASCAR says, "All right, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna run here at, at Coda." It really is, you know, right. and, and like with with NASCAR, There's no like money slipped under the table or nothing like no, that. No, 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 no. And you know, one of the one of the biggest things with that is like the Southern California market. People are like, um, you know, we do, we don't need to be in Southern NASCAR. 
we don't need to be in Southern California, but NASCAR stance is, yes, we do need to be in Southern California because, I mean, obviously that's that's a whole different market. I mean, you look at what you got now, you've got down here in Texas, you go all the way to Chicago, then you go to Southern California and you hit the Dovers and, and the Michigans and all the places in between. So I'm confident that it'll be back, but it's just one of those things to where it's like, um, you know, you'd kind of like to know. You'd kind of like to know, but uh, great weekend all together. And again, SMI and uh, the folks here at Coda, they hosted us uh, extremely well, went well out of their way to uh, get us all hooked up and uh, always thanks to them. Yeah, for, it was a good uh, time. I mean, every, I mean nothing but class out there, by yeah. the way, um, yeah. yep. from yeah. from the drinks to the sandwiches to, I mean, hell, every, everything, man. It was not, nothing but class out there at the paddock. Um, all right, let's get into it, man. We had some basketball to talk about as well, um, you know. Texas, uh, we kind of we kind of talked about it. Texas exit stage right uh, on a night where Tennessee almost gave them the game. Rodney shooting about twelve percent, almost well, it's twelve percent, twelve percent from the perimeter here. Um, also, um, you know, turned turnovers. Right? I mean, I, I can't stress this enough. Turnovers, Rodney. Um, yeah, sixteen turnovers. Then you look at offensive rebounds, offensive rebounds, seventeen offensive rebounds. Um, 32 or excuse, yeah that's that's 32 32 uh total uh second chance points or times that they allowed uh Tennessee to get a put back or you know get another possession uh 38 more than the Longhorns had um mm -hmm. it's uh it's been a, it was a tale of the tape the identity of this team the entire time and here's the thing like Tyree Sunner got cooking or, or seemed like he got cooking towards the end of that game right and everybody kept you know up in arms like where was Tyrese uh, you know, in the beginning of this game, you know, what, what the hell, why wouldn't this happen? Tyrese Hunter can't get going like that. Weaver can't get going like that. If Max Aceman has the ball all damn game. All right. Mm -hmm. Now I know that Max Aceman is our pure shooter. He's a 3000 point scorer. I get that. Um, but when Max Aceman becomes your point guard, you're essentially taking the position away from Hunter. Um, mm -hmm. is, is Hunter going to sit out there on the perimeter and, and set and set up and wait for, uh, wait for Ace Smith to pass him the ball to knock down three. No, we all know that that shit ain't happened. So it's basically four on five, or 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 you make your offense ineffective like that or inefficient. So that's why I've been driving and harping on Hunter being the facilitator. That way, it creates the defense. It collapses the defense. It gets them in vulnerable positions to where they have to rotate over and maybe have to foul out. Hell, you saw what the uh, what A and M in in Houston. Uh, was happening, you know, towards the latter portions of that game when every both teams were in the double bonus. You know what I mean? Hell, it's it, it it is an efficient and an effective weapon to get the opposition in foul trouble, man. And not only that, you knock out your starters. Hell, Houston almost went out because their starters were were dude basically I, fouling out, man. And we'll talk about that. They survived, but back to Tennessee and Texas, dude. Um, Tennessee did that. Tennessee, I mean, hell, Z Ziegler was was driving and penetrating to the cup all the time and, and dishing it out. It was it. it by by a miracle, you know, the top SEC scorer of the year or, or player of the year, uh, Connect, couldn't hit a shot uh, from the perimeter. He had to result to, to coming into the paint. But still, like, Texas, take take fucking note of, excuse my language, man, and I know it's, 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 it's over. It doesn't even matter anymore. But take note of what the opposition does. Take note of what everybody else does. And I get it, man. If Ace is your top scorer, find ways to, to – to get him the ball without having him being so damn ball dominant, have him come yeah. off some screens, and, you know, run run some Reggie Miller action. Shit, I don't know, man. Um, yeah. But also, if, if Ace Smith is pulling up to try and get his own shot, he's also taking the ball away from Dylan Sue because Ace Smith doesn't really pass that much. Uh, that's yeah. that's my rant. That's all. And and you know that whole game to me was it, it was frustrating in a couple of ways because well, to uh, me it wasn't all game. It was all season long. Well, that's, that's, well, that's, yeah, yeah, because it, it really was in like we've talked about so many different times is this this team. What was the identity of this team? Exactly. And, what, and he never yeah, played right. defense, by the way. Yeah. He never played defense one yeah. bit all yeah. season long. Yeah, you, you, you get beat on the boards. I, I mean, um, and the whole thing is, I mean, when when you have a game like this, when I mean, Aismas and, and, and Desu, I mean, that, that's your guys. I mean, that's that uh, pretty damn clear. You know, we talked about that where if you're if, if you're watching this team and you want to figure out how to beat them you you handcuff those two 
and 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 that's going to that, that that's going to help your cause if you're the opposition. That's what they did, and and there's nobody to step up, and 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 there's there's nobody to step up and be that facilitator, and that's that's really the one thing that that I hope you know as we move into you know now the off season for Texas basketball that you're going to find somebody that's. That, that that's going to take that spot. That's, that's going to be your 12 shed, times, man. Twelve. You only got to the line twelve times. I know. You shot ninety-one percent. You only missed one. But I mean, you, you got yeah. there nine to- or uh, twelve times rather. Yeah. Go go find somebody to be your shed. Go find somebody that that's going to be that guy. Because I mean, Dylan DeSue, Max Atham, that, that that's great. But you need you need a dynamic player that that's going to be out. And and it's going to be it's going to be the puppet master. It's going to be the one that's do, right. doing. Right. It's got to be it's got to be the facilitator. One hundred percent. Right. And, 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 now, and it's, it's also like the point guard's got to be able to get his own shot. Got to be able to get to the cup and got to be able to score and stuff like 100%. that. But also, um, it, it, like it, it's it's facilitate first secondary pull up and get the jumper if there's no way or or no basket that's going to get scored in that possession or in that sequence you know what i mean like mm-hmm. it, it's pass for it's facilitate first score second yeah. that's that's to me that's the point guard that i'm looking for man but no matter what every point guard has to attack and when a smith has the ball he's not attacking because he's looking for a pull-up shot or a perimeter shot you have to attack and be aggressive to get the defense in foul trouble or get them in vulnerable spots and the longhorns did failed to do that all season long or it well, seemed it, like they failed to do that all season long and then the other part of that is i'm I mean, not trying to be i'm not trying to beat up on them i'm really not but i'm, I'm just i've we've been well, calling it's, it's it, the it, obvious flaws for, it's it's the obvious flaws Wags eight offensive rebounds. It's tough, man. It's horrible. I, I mean, tough. and 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 to, to your point right there about what, when you're having to pull up and and with the shots you're making right there, and then and then you're getting beat on the boards. I mean, you got to go. You got to go get a big dude. You you got to get somebody. That's the whole thing. A facilitator, and you got to go go get somebody that's going to be in the middle right there, and it's going to be able to fix that problem on the boards, man. Because that I, I, I hype on that all the time. I guess maybe because I'm a bigger dude, and that's that would be my job if I was going to be on the court. I wouldn't be a shooter. And and it's like, man, I just um, you know six assists versus eleven. I mean, it, it's. But the other frustrating part of this wags is where I said it was twofold for me was, yeah, we see all of this, but at the same time, how damn you were still in a position to win. You still almost could have won this game. Isn't that the shitty part? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, like I said, you know, you got Tennessee chucking up 25 threes, you know what I mean? And, and only three of them are going in. That's, that's not a good recipe for success. And that was what was allowing the Longhorns to stay in the game. The, the problem is that the Longhorns just couldn't, uh, couldn't capitalize off any of it, man. Off of any of the bad shots that it was, and you know that's the thing. Tennessee wasn't taking bad shots; they were getting overlooked. Mm-hmm. They just couldn't hit. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. but you know it is what it is. Uh, uh, Tennessee, my bracket's still intact because of that. That's pretty much the only the only portion of my bracket that's good is the, the Tennessee and Texas portion of it. Um. I don't know. My Houston bracket's still okay. They it survived. They got out of there last night. We retreated to a overtime delight last night. Yeah, uh, if, if I guess or or stress monster, depending on if you had money on that game or if you have Houston going all the way to finish your final four. Oh, by the way, like there's no possible way that I can win this contest that we have with oh, Texas yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, Like I think the the highest that I can finish is in the tenth percentile, but still, and that's even if everything goes perfect and finishes out i had kansas going all the way to the final four i had kentucky going to the elite eight um yeah just absolutely absolutely busted what's up mike what's going on everybody man it's good to see everybody here on this Mm -hmm. wonderful Mm -hmm. monday dude but you know who is advancing the lady longhorns vic schaefer and the lady longhorns there in the women's bracket they continue to surge decisively Um, decisively yeah decisively um are are you shocked at some of the were you able to see any of the women's tournament yeah yeah i actually, I actually watched um by the time i got back here I, I caught most of the second half of that game and and texas had it well in hand i mean they they had it from the get-go and and never looked back i mean that's a pretty pretty solid looking team right now uh when you watch these guys but again you know we've talked about i guess you know south carolina uh, you know it's it's, it's going to be hard but yeah, stanford's but, coming up um, stanford, uconn as well yeah, so yeah yeah it, no you know, no Iowa, that iowa state well, stanford game lsu game. almost dipped out lsu almost lost to Mount, uh, middle tennessee state um, well, they're 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 a little distracted. <laughs> they're, I think there may be some distractions going on over so there. I with saw them. this. So have have we seen what's in the news with with Kim Mulkey? 
I haven't. Have I seen, haven't. I don't have know. Have seen what the last press conference? I, I don't know what the. I don't, I, I don't have it pulled up, but um, and you guys can find it. So apparently, there is a journalist from the Washington Post that mm -hmm. alleged, or or Kim Mulkey feels that that this journalist is going to put out a hit piece or is trying to put out a hit piece on Kim Mulkey. Kim Mulkey apparently has been contacted by several of her former teammates and former assistant coaches about, you know, people from the Washington Post, a, a, a journalist from the Washington Post trying to extract information, mm -hmm. uh, negative information to be completely clear. Um, and Kim Mulkey, basically, I mean, the press conference, I was actually buying until she let one rhetoric slip and she said leak. When she said leak, basically, uh, the you know, and I'm paraphrasing here. If this journalist finds anything that gets leaked out of here, yeah, that to me sent off a red flag. And I'm like, well, if you're doing anything, if you're doing everything right, there's nothing that's going to be leaked. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. that I don't understand why that was in the phrasing, or maybe that she was just repeating something or whatnot. But beyond that, you know, I'm kind of with Kim Mulkey here. Hold journalists accountable. If journalists are giving you yellow journalism and a bad story and a bad piece and doing hit pieces on you, yeah, yeah, hold them accountable. Absolutely. Just because you feel like you're the fourth estate of this, uh, you know, of this country or whatnot, you do not have all, you know, una unaccountable power. Everybody has to be accounted, accounted for, man. Everybody needs to be accountable, dude. Your words have actual absolute weight to them and they can destroy a career. You absolutely need to be held accountable for your actions. Well, and that's the whole thing in this business. I mean, I don't care if you're print, I don't care if you're doing what we're doing right. or if you're in terrestrial radio. I mean, if you're going to spout out a take or you're going to do some kind of bit, you better be able to back it up. With, it, with it's facts. one thing you should say shit tongue in cheek. Like I say a lot of things tongue in cheek and I say, I kid, I kid, I kid right Right, after, right, right. right. Yeah. But you, you know, with this right here, and, and I mean, you, you, Look, I mean, we're, we're talking about Kim Mulkey, and and this is this is a coach where I mean, you got it. Look, I, very polarizing piece, very absolutely. iconic figure. Absolutely, you have to ad admire what she does. I mean, when you look at women's college basketball, I, I think a lot of it. I think a lot of it for us as Texas fans is we go back to the fact that she owned us when she was at Baylor, and and here we go, we we get to deal with her again if she's still around, depending what comes out of this. But but this is where the, this whole scenario is. I, I would. I, and the other thing, the other thing that I kind of took out of it, because BK played, a, we, we've got it in there. He, he played about a minute of it where she was talking about um, where she says that the journalist, uh, you know, wanted, wanted, needed within 48 hours, needed to have a conversation with her or whatever. Right. And, and so she was going with that. You know, she's got to get her team ready for, for you know, the she's tournament. Yeah, she, she's hired the the number one defamation. Right. Well, right. Firm in all but, of her. But the other thing that she kind of said, where you're talking about, were just kind of little things when you really go in I there. Found, and I, I see what be, I, I found it. So here's the here's yeah. the clip that we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. So bear with us. I know we've been talking about, but we're gonna play it here for you right here. Yeah, yeah. It's this about is exactly why people don't trust journalists and the media anymore. It's these kinds of sleazy tactics and hatchet jobs that people are just tired of. I'm fed up, and I'm not going to let the Washington Post attack this university, this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. I've hired the best defamation law firm in the country, and I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. Not many people are in a position to hold these kind of journalists accountable. But I am. And I'll do it. That's all I'm going to say about this right now. And now I'm going to get back to talking about my basketball team and winning this game tomorrow. Okay, so, um, that's, she scares me. So she goes on and she does. Like, if, if something gets leaked, if the Washington Post gets leaked, I, or maybe I misheard that. If that is the case, then then guys, I'm I'm kind of on the, the side of Kim Mulkey here. Um, the one thing that I will say, like lover or hater, and I haven't really been a fan of Kim Mulkey, but the one thing I will always give her a little bit of credit for is, is or not just a little bit, a, a lot of credit for. She always has, she's got her her girls' back, like or or so it seems. It appears like she always feels like she has the best interests of her girls. She will always side with them and keep 
their privacy a thing when a lot of people air out a lot of dirty air. Yeah. Well, and you know, the other part of that too was where, you know, the guy wanted to get a hold of her, but he had been trying for two years, I think is the other right. part where, where that's like, eh, you, you know, yeah, that was a know. minute of it. It's it's, it's really like two minutes long or it's, yeah. it's a long clip. It's a long piece. Yeah. It was that a, was a, like a, little, yeah. a minute of it, man. But but the whole thing is, I mean, you you have to admire her as 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 just a coach. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of sports coaches. Uh, when you have somebody like that, the success that they've had. But I, I think where she's talking about right there, where she's like this university and my team and all of this. I think this is going to stem probably a lot further back to the time at Baylor, to where because because apparently what what the journalist was trying to do and has done is go has, back. Yeah, reached out, yeah, reached out to so, some some past players and and I know she caught a lot of shit. You know when all when all the stuff was going on with with the Britney Griner thing, but the, the more that the more that you go back and you listen to Kim Mulkey, I mean the other cut that we play about COVID and I'm not getting tested and all that other shit, that just kind of it doesn't surprise me that she didn't have Britney Griner's back, you know, because that, I mean, look, Britney Griner moved on at that point. I mean, right. uh, Kim Mulkey's that like, was... you know, thank you, but you ain't my problem no more. So I don't know. I just, I mean, it's just, just another scandal, just another. Scandal. I thought she did speak up for Brittany Griner when Brittany Griner was was detained across she, seas. I she thought she did. actually did speak up for Brittany Griner. She, she did, but I think people wanted more of an effort. I mean, what the fuck is she gonna do? Yeah, like she's not. A contract. <laughs> I mean, what? The fuck? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. Uh, I don't think she knew any of those people in that country to be able to fix any of that. I mean, it's just kind of one of those things, man. But it, and um, if she did, you're not going to sit there and say, Oh, I know these people. Let me go say, yeah, you know, yeah, I know the exactly. Russians are and shit. Exactly. And, and this is the bad part. Like, like what Rue's talking about right here is when you get somebody that has had this, now I'm over here, like her tapping my pen. When, right. when you, when you, when you move when on, you find get, another story to write 100%. And, and, we got, and we do, do have men's basketball to talk about still. Well, but but I agree with her at the beginning of the of the of the of the conversation right there that she's having to where it's like what what does a lot of these journalists do? They're they're looking for the smut. They're looking for the negative. It's they're because they have nothing else them. to talk about, Ronnie. And, and and you know each platform out there, each you know uh, media engine has to have that that one journalist, or these journalists feel like they have to have the compelling story to where they're taking the the you know, the athlete down or the negative story to where it's taking somebody down, man, for some reason, good news just doesn't sell anymore. It's all about shit journalism. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, I watch, I watch Fox seven in the morning and it's like, it, they have this one segment where it's called uh good day, good news. <laughs> and it's like, it's like a minute and a half and they just talk about good things. You know, whether it's pets or, or elderly people doing really neat things. I don't really watch the news, man. I don't really watch the news anymore. I, I, I try to read as much as possible, but I like when it comes to like mainstream media, I don't watch them. I, one, yeah. I know what goes on behind the scenes there, so I don't watch. Yeah. Um, I don't, watch I, I don't know what this is all about, Wax. <laughs> hey, Wax, off topic, but Vanessa told me to tell you that, oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Did you go see Vanessa? My guy. My guy, Mike. How do you know Vanessa? Well, is, that, you is, that, is that your stylist? That is my style. Yeah. Um, I need one. <laughs> I need yeah, one. So that's the joke, right? Like, so sometimes because I got shadows in my hair or whatnot, like it's hard for her to see some of the, the cuts or whatnot. So, and she's yeah. like, hey, man, does it look good? And I'm like, well, it looks better. You know what I mean? I just fuck with her all the time. But actually, she's the best in the business. Whoa, 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 hey, hey, I won't whoa. go to anybody else. We don't need to know about what you're doing uh, with her. Hey, no, so man, she's she's fantastic. She's is she fantastic. up north? Is she up here? Yeah, she's up, um, up right by... Uh, Right by Best Buy or whatnot in student in Salon Six. What is it? Salon Six Twenty. Oh, okay. Or well, I, I need I need to get that uh, because salon it, it's, I don't know what the hell they call it, man. But it's one of those salon places. I go to the very best to take care of my hair. You well, my, my my hair is pretty easy to to get done, but I never get it done because I just go to the Great Clips or whatever, and it's like a, a, a sixty five minute wait, and I'm like, man, I ain't doing that. But it was like so this weekend, you know, because I knew I was going to be out there and doing all this other stuff, I had to go get a haircut. So yeah, I, I need a go-to person so i'm gonna need to get that from you because I, I i need to look better i need to be more presentable her name's vanessa man go uh you want your haircut like me go cv that's what i always used to say I'll go do cv it. she's I'll fantastic mike c man following through with the clutch there i like that man i love it i love it that that's mike, good i didn't even know we haven't even you know promoted her or gave her a, you know a psa or anything like that i'm you know i'm just liking the connection there i hope 
you know, hopefully uh, oh. you guys continue to go CB. That's for sure. Speaking of that, speaking of that, Wags, I do want to take a couple of minutes. I want to thank the fine folks over at Kreitz Barbecue over in Lockhart. So uh, my cousin Frank Tello works for them. He's one of the pit masters. They were out there catering for the AM racing team, the Haley Deegan Xfinity racing team. Hey, how about that? And he, he hit me up on the text. He's like, hey, man, Coke, come on over here, you know, whatever. So I went over and just kind of hung out with him. I, I, he's, I hadn't seen him in a while. We were just kind of hanging out. He brings me out this massive plate of Kreitz barbecue sausage turkey. He's like, he's like, take this home. That was that was on Saturday. I was gonna have like a frozen pizza. I was gonna say, what was the food that was on Friday? I just I stole food on the way out. Oh man, it, it, that, so I didn't steal it. I I didn't say it was there for everybody. I guess I just took it. Yeah, you know, they had good media stuff. There's the burgers, all, all this different stuff. But, yeah, uh, man. Yeah, got, I mean, we to... didn't talk about you know the winner of the race, by the way. William Byron being able to steal the show there on Coda on Sunday. Uh, that was not that guy was not in my notes. Um, was he in your uh, I mean, a, a lot of yeah. us like Chastain, but yeah. William Byron there taking the taking the checker flag. Daytona 500 winner is that guy, and he did something that hasn't happened in the next gen car era. Uh, this past weekend uh, in the Cup Series, where he was the fastest in practice, he won the pole and he won the race. Absolutely dominated. You could tell from the get go that uh, he was going to be the one to beat. And uh, he's that's a guy. That's a guy that started his career racing on a sim, dude. Didn't do short track. Didn't do all of that shit. He's taken to it and could probably, if you're going to go uh, call your cousin, want to try to make some uh, want to try to make some cabbage there on a Cup champion. Go with Willie B because that's his. Really damn good. Really damn good. Um, Wags, did you see Otani's going to speak this afternoon? Otani's going to address the situation. <laughs> did we call it or what? We, okay. So, look, we kind of <laughs> talked about this on, on the Wagner Wire, too. So, yeah. uh, we flirted with it on Friday. But here's the thing, guys. Um, baseball is in a, a huge situation, a huge pickle. Um, if you want to call it that, uh, no pun intended. They don't have just the best player in, in America, right? Like this is this a world yeah. issue? You know what I'm world. saying? Like we, we we flirted with this on Friday. Like this is not an American baseball player. This is not the greatest player in America. This is the greatest player in the world that plays in America on the biggest stage. Um, and if Major League Baseball that is struggling for viewership, struggling for you know a way to get younger, a way to entertain and, and, and kind of, you know, be a compelling driving force in sports, you know, to count kind of galvanize the youth and, and attract the youth. The way to do that is with a pitcher like Shohei yeah. or not, a, not a pitcher, hell, a, a, a ball player, a player like Shohei Otani, yeah. a guy that has six pitches, but can also rake at the plate. Um, a guy that we've never seen, unprecedented before because we you know we're talking about the if I, I always go back to the the double header that he played last season right where he threw a one pitch shutout and then you know two hours later went two for three in a dh position of course went two for three and hit you know two home runs uh, it, it's unprecedented we haven't seen a player like this he is the best player that i've ever seen in major league baseball mm -hmm. it, 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 he just is if major league baseball decides to suspend him give him a life ban uh, they, they lose one hell of a Bad product, they lose any type of marketability that they have, or they lose a lot of marketability with the, not just America, but with the world. Okay. Yep. They lose that. If they do acquiesce and say, Hey man, everybody has, you know, dark days and everybody has, has problems or whatnot. You seem to really have a problem if it's $4.5 million that you're in debt. You should be watching Texas sports unfiltered, by the way, show. Hey, we'll, we'll help you out with that. Nope, you're muted, dude. Oh, yep, yeah, yeah, there we go. We got you. Oh, I don't know what's going on right there. Yeah, you're you're talking away. It doesn't look like you're muted, but uh, I can't hear you. So uh, we'll let Wags work on what he's doing right there. But th this really is a it, it is a pickle for Major League Baseball because that that That's is the, just, it just oh, changed source. It just changed sources. You know. Yeah. Yeah. For, randomly for some reason i don't know what the, what the hell i don't know what the hell that happened oh I'm, yeah i, I heard the voice yeah double d said your voice change i thought you did that on purpose no nah, man i didn't touch it that was weird <laughs> oh, uh, but anyways like so shohei goes through uh what this what, like 4.5 million dollars of, of debt and you know major league baseball has to either make the decision that they're going to suspend him give him a life ban 
or acquiesce and allow them to continue to keep playing. But if they do that, you got to open the door for the Hall of Fame to, to Cooperstown to one Pete Rose. Pete Rose. All right. The, the hit king himself, dude. Um, and of course, you, you know damn well you're probably going to be hearing from Pete Rose here soon, especially you know, right that. after right after Shohei. Yeah. I won't say that it's going to be right after Shohei. But I'm, I'm sure that Pete Rose ain't exactly going to be quiet about this. No. If and he indeed be. this is gambling, which which everybody is speculating it to be. Yeah. And, and the thing with this, uh, Dave Roberts was was quoted. You know, he's like, this is this is Shohei. This is all on his own. I think it's a good thing. He's going to try to clear, add some clarity here to what's going on. But it, like I said right there, it really is a pickle for Major League Baseball because this is this is your guy. And like you said, and we've talked about it, it is worldwide. You do something with this guy, you're you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose money. Yeah, uh, uh, fan base, all of that. But here's the other part of it: if you don't do anything, being that you've already set the prerequisite with Pete Rose, right. even though that was a long time ago, um, if you if you backpedal and you don't do anything, or or it's much lighter, uh, or whatever the case is, you know, you're 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 you know that that's not good either as well. But the other part is where you go back to, man, that was a different day and time back then. I mean, the best case, the best thing that I can remember when SMU with, with all of that, the death penalty to SMU, <laughs> what they got the death penalty for back then, that's nothing. Yeah, but that that's team that's team oriented. That that was multiple players. I mean, this is this is just one player. You can't, yeah, this you can't is give just a, one. You can't, yeah, you can't penalize yeah. the Dodgers for no, 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 no. But, or the Angels for for but, gambling or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean more the severity of the penalty to where it's like that program got killed. Oh, I mean, gotcha, you, okay, you, gotcha. you, you know where where this stuff started happening after the fact, and it was like, dude, that was fucking. But, but what Rob just said, like, you can't if you kill this guy, you have you have you have destroyed your money horse what are you gonna turn to ronald cooney jr is that is that gonna be that's gonna be the guy that's gonna be you know driving in all the money for baseball no i mean it's fantastic to see you know a crazy amount of steals that's that's one of the the most entertaining and exciting part of the game for me right um so I, lo I love small ball uh and i love seeing steals right but rodney i also like seeing a guy that has six pitches you gotta have a star yeah you gotta have a star like, and, and not just not just the, a national it's an international star it's the first time i've seen an international star but well i mean like ichiro was fantastic right but ichiro was not dominating on the mound and dominating at the plate he yeah it just wasn't like yeah. but he was still and, and it's still a sensation to watch yeah and and it's it's one of those things to where like you know, I mean, Rob, Cunha is 100 percent a stud he is sure, fantastic sure. And, and and de la cruz he and de la cruz are going to be uh, sensational pieces for America, but yeah. this is an international stud. That's that's the, the biggest best player. This is the best player in the world. And there has to be there has to be someone like like with we talk about all the great run of Kansas City and everything that's happening right here. But when when you really start diving into that conversation, what and you trickle it all down and everything, what do you come to? You come to man Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's got to be that one where you know it's like billboard material. I mean, it's like who is? It's got to be face. Yes, and, that, that's... And, and and here's how here's how dominating of of a figure that Shohei Otani is. Shohei Otani's on the West Coast, right? Like usually the face, uh, Major League Baseball wants to make Aaron Judge the face of baseball so damn bad, but he just can't keep up with the electrifying um, stats and and just in play that Shohei Otani is doing. Right, like, Shohei Otani is the face of baseball, right. and he's right. on the West Coast. Like people got to yes. stay up to watch this guy play. That's yeah. the, I'm sure you're you're in a big name market with LA with the Dodgers or whatnot, but still, usually the face of baseball is on the East Coast, or the face mm -hmm. of face of any sport is on the East Coast. Sure, mm -hmm. Jordan was was Midwest, but every you guys know what I'm saying here. You guys get it. Well, I get yeah. full fuck. I mean, well, LeBron's West Coast. So well, and and, and it really does. Yeah. It really is. I mean, the the thing that we keep talking about it. We talked about it on Friday through all the buzzing and everything. Is the dudes international and, and baseball is a very international sure. game. Look, sure. the season started outside the United States, and I mean it's it's totally different. It's a to it, it would, I think this would be, it would still be a big deal. Let's say it was a well, no, he's he's foreign too. Let, let's say it was I don't know Clayton Kershaw. You, you know, who are you talking talk about? I'm if, if it was Clayton Kershaw doing this, it's like well that that's an American baseball player, or whatever. But this this is. In, this is the world, and this is the no, greatest baseball player uh, th that there is. Wags, this is really cool. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm, like, all over the map. I think we both are today. Code of text line, 222-9328. This is why we like doing 
what we do at Texas Sports Unfiltered. Our man Hop Dog checks in and says, Morning, gents. I took my son to Coda Saturday strictly based off of Chaos Theory promoting it. We had a blast. I appreciate you guys promoting the sport. Nice. Did you get out there and drive? <laughs> Maybe they did. Maybe huh? they you did. tell Maybe. Bobby. I, all you got to do is just tell Bobby that I said it was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. yeah. I, I got the girl Bobby, and you got Wag Bobby. Said it's all right, fine. If Wag says it's fine, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I got the girl and you got Bobby with uh, the car it. racing that's, out there. That's, hey. that's uh, the dynamic dude. That's all we need. Let me tell you about a one uh, person that you obviously you need go. in your place, and that's Tom McKay and Audiovisual Consultations. 512-255-8678. It's avconsultations.com. They have been setting the standard in audiovisual automation in the central Texas area over the past 35 years. And if you don't believe me, go to the website at avconsultations.com and see the gallery of projects that they've done over this past 35 years. You don't have an idea of what you want in your house. I guarantee that you'll get an idea after you see that website. That's for sure. If it's two TVs that you want or two arcade units, two arcade cabinets, or maybe four TVs like BK has down in his place as well, man. It's all deadly. It's all done with audiovisual consultations. 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. Absolutely. And if you were out at Coda and saw all those uh, good-looking cars out there running around and uh, doing all this stuff and you are in the market for a new or pre-owned car, truck, or SUV, there's one place to go. Let them tell Hi, you. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. It's my other friend, Hayden. Dan Cover's gonna come knocking on my door one day. Gonna, Someday soon he will be doing that, my guy. That's for alone. sure. All right. Um, so we had some uh we had some basketball over the weekend. Uh had some baseball news over the weekend. Don't know if you guys saw, I mean, all the guys, you know, Oriole fans or whatnot. Uh number one prospect in all of baseball, Jackson Holiday, is going to be designated and reassigned to go down to the minors. This has actually wasn't shocking if you've been paying attention to the Orioles, man. Um they got a lot of talent up there, and they don't really need Jackson just yet. Uh, why not utilize some of your studs that's on the roster right now and then try and get their stock up and then trade out to get pieces back in and then bring Jackson up? I think that's the route that the Orioles are going to take, um, and rightfully so. Um, I'm all about it, man. I think Skipper Hyde's got, him, got the boys right where they need to be. Um, and uh, looking back on it, man, we had Al Walsh on yesterday talking about some of the odds to go down. Baltimore's actually selected in – third to finish in the american league and with an under of an 87 win total i i'm kind of i'm kind of feeling that a little bit i mean i don't expect i don't expect them to be able to get out there and surprise and, and steal victories away and, and take teams by surprise anymore like they were in, in the initial part of the season last year right you know people weren't exactly taking baltimore seriously and they were able to to mash at the plate and maybe i'm or maybe there just wasn't good scouting reports on them um but regardless corbin burn come corbin burns comes in the return of john means big john means i think that shores up a little bit for the rotation bullpen still a little bit questionable but um the, the Orioles, I, I I assume that they will take care of that moving towards the trade deadline and and out. Um, the Rangers, Rangers have a pretty, I would say they have a pretty good chance to have a decent season. And I don't know how much they'll repeat. Um, I had Al Walsh on yesterday, and he thinks that the the Rangers actually do have a good chance to repeat. But he also likes the Mariners coming out and sneaking out of the West as well. So, um, we'll we'll see. Uh. Your Astros, my guy, need to make some moves, and I'm, I'm sure the lumber's there. They can sign up the lumber, but they are, you know, there's a little bit of concern there with the rotation um, that we were talking about kind of last year and how they were going to shore it up. Is JB going to be the plug? My guy, Houston's got, well, not to be cliche, but Houston does have some problems. Yeah, I, that that is the thing. I mean, they they've done a really good job uh, solidifying the the bullpen, you know, with the closers and and so forth. But yeah, I mean, Verlander already on the on the DL. He's going to miss the opener. But 
you know, with, with Framber Valdez, I mean, up and down. That's I your mean, eighth right now, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely, man. And that's, you know, I, I don't really know what, what, what happens right there. I mean, I saw some power rankings where I guess now Atlanta and, and, and here's where this could change. Significantly. Atlanta's got to be Atlanta. Atlanta's a clear favorite. Atlanta yeah. was the best team in baseball last year. It's just, yeah. And yeah. a, a, a fluke. I mean, the Phillies were, Phillies got hot. The Phillies mashed at, hey, at the right time. And I, honestly, I I did not see anybody beating the Bravos last year. I just it, didn't. It, and with the Rangers, uh, I mean, I think the Rangers, if they can duplicate what they did last year, I mean, if, if they can th – that AL West, like we've talked about, the AL East and the AL West, man, are just going to be so fun to watch. I mean, because you've got so many valid con you know, contenders right there with those clubs. But, I mean, I think with, with the Rangers, you've still got plenty of great pieces in place to where if you just keep yourself – Oh, sure. Uh, even if you're a, even if you don't win the division, even if you get in as a wild card and, and then do do exactly what you do or what what you mentioned about the Phillies. I mean, you get hot right there and you go on a run. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of people are yeah, just got to you, like Avaldi's not going to fall off. You, no, you know, no, if you're no. the Rangers, you've got some pretty good faith in your rotation there. You got some I mean, hell, you know what you can do at the plate. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the the the. the the damn gold and the treasures that you found along the way last season uh, that just started to develop in that lineup right. one through hell it felt like you know one through nine one through nine match. yeah 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 by the end of the year it was like I, I mean there wasn't a weak link in that lineup I, I mean the weakest link in that lineup I mean any other club would have died to have that you right. know enough. but you, you know like Sal says uh, when talking about Jackson that's that's the cool part about baseball that's what you can do Let, let's let's move him down Let, yeah. let's go Let ahead him, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then when yeah, and sounds right, like the Orioles ready, let's go. The Orioles yeah. are fine. The Orioles will be absolutely fine. They don't need Jackson at this point, yeah. man. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's the right move. It's the right move. So. Thursday will be a big day for us. I mean, I'm sure here chaos theory will will dive in. I mean, you got the Astros and the Yankees three fifty. We got we got a lock on a big guest for opening day. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we need. I'll, I'll, I'll get on that, man. I've been late. I've been very lazy with with guest booking oh, okay it's okay you know a lot of times a lot of times I, I talk to people and they're like we like hearing from y'all even if y'all are wrong about things we like hearing from y'all it's like well, we'll who's wrong I'm, I'm right about every damn thing that i talk about dude i'm wrong about everything i back it up I actually i've been nothing but wrong about my damn bracket i in matter of fact i got chalk too i got a lot of chalk and my yeah. bracket still busted. So, I gotta look at that. Where I, I think I'm like I picked the wrong of all the chalk. I picked the wrong chalk. So let me ask you guys this, man. And, and maybe I'm maybe I just don't know basketball, or maybe I don't know how to evaluate you know basketball talent because I heard a lot of you know national pundits beat people like me up for saying that Zach Eady is tall. Um, guys, I'm I'm sorry. Like the skill set, he can he can shoot free throws. I'll give him that. He's he's pretty decent free throw shooter. Um, but when it comes to being able to turn around and have your back to the paint and you know try and be dominant in in the paint, I've seen him miss baby hooks with just little you know hand contested at his chin. All right, he's missing baby hooks. If you're if you are an arm or a half of arm taller than everyone else out there, and you're still not you're not able to jump over people and and slam the damn thing down every time i i'm gonna question your skill set yeah. i'm gonna say that you're tall especially when you're you're over seven foot or you're close to seven foot zach you cannot deny the fact that I, sure he might be able to make a few i've seen him make a few passes too zach Eady, right and he plays good defense they're scoring and a lot of have, fucking points dude they're scoring a lot of points they are they're 100 i mean <laughs> yeah and also like it, it's on the opposition the opposition has so much pressure because of how big of a dominant yeah. you know force he is you know at, at the rim that they have to score almost every sequence down if they don't you know it's just going to be uh, no one can contend with him and and you know i i guess uh, even if you double team him he's able to get past a double team so that's the yeah. thing like you're yeah. gonna have to come out of man and, and play zone a lot and force purdue to shoot from the perimeter and, and hopefully you know they knock down some threes yeah. um but I'm, I'm tired of everybody of all the pundits saying you never see this guy take a night off. He always he always hustles. You know his engine's always running. That's great. No one's talking about his fucking skill set. Like you're defending him and saying that he's not tall, but talk about his skill set. All you're talking about is is his motor and how he, he mm -hmm. gives you know tremendous effort night in and night out. Yeah. You know he he's got tremendous. He's got great mid range. I don't ever hear that. I don't ever hear that he's got a smooth shot or he's just his his footwork is tremendous for how big he is. I don't ever hear that. I don't yeah. ever hear about, about his ball handling skills. 
No. I mean, yeah. what, Kevin Durant is is tall and, and, and lean and shit, and he's got one hell of a crossover. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Um, maybe... Uh, maybe I am a little bit too harsh on on the big man. Uh, I am a huge fan of David over Goliath. We all know that, but still, uh, I, if don't tell me I don't know how to evaluate a basketball player just because I'm I'm saying the guy's tall and I didn't I don't I'm not thinking that the national pundits are taking a shot directly at me, but there's a lot more people like me that think that Zach Eady is not that elite of a talent. He's just tall. He will play in the NBA. He'll give you some solid minutes in the NBA, but he'll also be coached up and get a little bit more physical. Maybe he'll foot, his footwork will get a lot better, but he's not going to be a dominant force in the NBA. Dude, I've been speak, wrong. I've, I've been wrong before, Rodney. Speaking of evaluating players, so so I'm sitting there watching the the man the A and M and Houston game last night. That was great. I mean that 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 was that was March Madness at its best. At right the there. time that over, but right before overtime happened, the the differential in free throws was 41 to 24 in yeah. favor of Texas A&M. Tell me that's not influence. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, no tell me that's not influence. No doubt. So so I'm sitting there watching that, and speaking of free throws, so when all that goes down, and as you mentioned, you, you know, Houston's running out of players. And here here comes here comes this dude trotting out, and I'll be damn, it's Ryan Elvin. And I'm like, dude, dude that's a Cedar Ridge guy. That, so that's the dude I was talking about yeah. on Friday, man. My kid plays with his little brother. Okay, I, okay, I, I did. Okay, so, so Jake so Elvin thinking, plays for Cedar or They yeah. played on the, the same AAU team on uh, I called, a- I called, ATX Future together. I called three years of basketball for Ryan Elvin over with Coach Black over at the uh, Cedar Ridge. Oh, right and this, on. Yeah, this dude comes out, and I'm like, man, look at this shit. I mean, how? Yeah, that's the guy that went off. That's the guy that went off in the in the um. Well, was, was it the Big 12 conference or was it the last game of the year where he went off? Like, yeah, you know, they, yeah. they were blowing people out and then he got some time and you yeah, know, yeah, went three for three or whatever from yeah, or three for man. four from three point land. So great for that dude. I mean, that, that he that that he got that opportunity right there. Great family. I mean, the Elvin family. Oh, yeah. His, um, his, oh. I think his mom played college basketball too. Yeah, yeah. Some of my favorite people. And, and I see him come walking out there. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, I'm like waking up my wife. I'm like, hey, look at this shit. It's Ryan Elvin, and she's like, "Who?" <laughs> yeah, Houston man. Houston got two two local studs. Two yeah, local studs. I mean, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, Ryan Ryan might not get that much time, but he's still he's a hooper, man. If you're on if you're on that that squad, a, a squad that's made three consecutive is it three or four consecutive yeah. trips to the final yeah. four or uh, yeah. not final four, Sweet Sixteen. I think it's three. I think it's three. Three, three consecutive three. trips to the Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, you're a stud. You can hoop if you if you're on if you're on that squad, you can hoop. But I, I saw where uh, they, they 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 talked to Shed after the game, and, and Shed was like, you know, they asked about Elvin, and he's like, I'm surprised he missed the first one. He said, uh, you know, you know that dude's that dude's as good as we are, you know. So he's clutch. Yeah. So so that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool to see that right there, and that that was a that was a fabulous basketball game right there, man. I, I don't I don't give the Aggies a lot of credit for anything, but God no. bless America, man. But no, I they had, get it out. But but see, here's I, the I thing. knew like, they were going so- to, to to go deep here. So the end of that game, Rodney, I was I was questioning Kelvin Sampson. Like usually, I don't. Kel- Kelvin Sampson knows what he's doing. He's he he, he his ideology is his NBA or his basketball acumen is probably way higher than mine, right? But when you have when you when you have the opposition in the double bonus, right, and you know that the only if if you foul them before a sequence goes down to where they could probably tie the game with a a desperation heave you know, from a three-point land, because they were down three, right? With one point, with, with 1.2 seconds left, if if you foul them right before, right as the ball is coming down, and you just and you just tap them and force them to go into a, you know, to shoot two. Now, I get it. He could probably make the first one and then try to, uh, you know, you know, try to miss the, the second one on purpose, purposely miss the second one to get an easy putback and tap in. But still, what's the chances that that's going to happen um, I, I think your percentage of making a three point shot is probably higher than getting a tap in or getting a, a successful tap in off of a missed free throw. Yeah, uh, a, a lot of things got to come into factor there. I would have now it, it you know it it's all for naught because Houston ended up winning the game. But if I was Kelvin Sampson, I would have elected to have somebody you know at least put somebody on the line to make them shoot two free throws. But again, keep also in mind that 
you, you, you probably didn't want to jeopardize, you know, having shed or having anybody else that was in foul trouble, you know, foul out because you had already lost four of your, your starters. Yeah. Too, yeah. So, I, I, I mean, think that was a big part of it. Cause you, cause you really were, I mean, you, that, that was the thing. I mean, you're, you're just watching them drop, you know, and, and it's like, and we dude, talk, dude, we talk that about it. That's kind of the way that you got to beat Houston. You got to yeah, get, you got to get them. Exactly. Beat. That's exactly how you got to beat Houston. You know, we we talk about it with Texas. It's like, how do you beat Texas? Get to sue in foul trouble. Well, you got you got to do the same thing with them. But but the the difference with them is they got so fucking many of them. I mean, it's right. like to beat Texas, you get one in trouble. But that I mean, four or five guys. And like you talk about rotations and everything that Houston does, it's like th there are so many people that are capable of making plays. And that's um, you know where it's gonna. I I had them going down to A and M, um, but. Otherwise, dude, I'm pretty solid, man. I, I'm yeah, actually, dude, your your NC State pick it's, is fantastic. Yeah, th that one there, man. It's in San Diego State and UConn got that one. Illinois, Iowa State got that one. Alabama, UNC got that one. I I, I had a yeah, Mark. Yeah, shit. Damn. See, I I mean, I, re, I like I remember being I remember San Diego State being pretty damn nasty last year, but I thought with you know maybe some roster turnover would would kind of you know impact this team to where they wouldn't get back to the sweet 16 but i mean dude they look they look mm -hmm. pretty damn nasty they man. do man they they really do um it looks like the, they, uh, the i had only... baylor winning baylor bowed out yeah um, baylor bowed out no I, I had them losing the the one where i'm really in trouble is the clemson arizona i had both of them out you know ladie might be the ladie might be the hottest player in the tournament right now i think he might dude he just might he just might so yeah this so, so this is where, I mean, here you go. The cream rises to the top. And I mean, and, and this very, is very much is chalk. I mean, cause really other than NC state, um, you, you kind of, well, maybe San Diego state, but, but kind of looking at the resume. Um, yeah, but if you knew what, if you, if you were paying attention to what San Diego state last yeah, year, you, yeah, you, knew, you would move you know, them on. They had a team that could, that could make a run, but I just, yeah. I didn't think that they would get back to the sweet 16. Yeah, yeah. But uh yeah, I I wasn't in on Clemson or Arizona, so I kind of fucked that one all up. But uh, otherwise, man, looking pretty good right there. These are these are some great matchups right here, dude. These these are gonna be so fun to watch. Yeah, it's the the action starts Thursday, man, and we'll break it down a little bit more on Thursday as we uh you know, not just gonna be opening day, but it's also gonna be tip off oh, of, of sweet sixteen too. So make sure that you have if you haven't called Tom McCade on visual consultations already, make sure you give him a call. That way you can get it set up for your optimal sports viewing package yeah yep. uh, but we got clemson and arizona you also got san diego state and yukon alabama and north carolina and illinois and iowa state so yeah um yeah. cyclones too man oh the, the i saw the women's cyclones uh actually took a dip and bowed out man after having yeah. a pretty stanford. good successful run um stanford getting the best of them there yep yep no doubt about it pretty good basketball game right there uh before we go got to tell you uh if you want to get uh, rewarded for listening to texas sports unfiltered yeah our friends at autograph like autograph like get yourself an autograph co-founded by congressman tom brady look at that i even got it right yesterday i even got it right yesterday are redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for acts of fandom that they take every day like listening to tsu the Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content in one place and offers you exclusive merchandise opportunities, tickets, and more. You're already listening to TSU. You might as well get rewarded for it, right, y'all? Head over to the App Store, whether it's Google Play or whether it is um, on, on the, I, uh, the Apple Store. Download Autograph, like Autograph, and uh, download it for free using the referral code TSU, like Texas Sports Unfiltered, TSU. A link to the app can also be found on the YouTube description as well. Check it out today. It is Autograph. Get yourself some cool stuff for listening to TSU. I'm so, I'm so, and did you do anything crazy? I mean, I know you were out of code all pretty much all damn week. What, dude, that's kind of been your that's kind of been your month, man. Your March, right? You've been you know oh, traveling yeah. out to a whole bunch of races. You haven't actually had a chance to to sit down and have a relaxing weekend yet have you yeah no i haven't and uh, it's actually uh that should be this weekend it's easter weekend right yeah I'm, I, I get all is it off. Yeah, it's an think, easter weekend i think it's easter weekend i, I, no. I don't know it's well wait if it's easter weekend when when the hell did we already have ash wednesday it's not easter weekend rodney oh yeah ash wednesday was a long time ago dude was it yeah yeah easter Jesus, where am i at yeah easter sunday <laughs> is this sunday is this sunday that's that's weird. I always thought April. This is where I get confused. So I was I'm, born, I'm so like I just I I need to come up for air here, dude. Guys. I was born April 9th, and that was Good Friday. And, and it's like I thought Easter was always there. I, hell, I I don't know. I, I'm with you. Yeah, because Ash Wednesday passed. 
Palm Sunday. I only knew it was Palm Sunday because my wife and 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 daughter went out of town. Uh, no, that that's coming up. That's every week. <laughs> oh, by by the way, a while ago I said hop down. Ring the bell. Ring the bell. Give him a bell hoop, ring. Give him a bell dog, ring. Hoop dog. A while ago is who Texas. I fixed it on the uh, on the code of text line. Yeah, that yeah, it's always ass Wednesday. Yeah, bro. Rodney, it does. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't. I would Rob. I wasn't going to say anything. The calendar year makes it move, but oh, it does. Because, yeah, because of the kids. Oh, is your birthday on the same day every year? I, I hope. <laughs> My birthday's every day, Wags. I live that's every day like about. it's that's birthday. what I'm you know about. what I'm talking about. It's like it's, it's somebody somebody told me once: live live every day like it's your birthday because you're that special. I'm like, no, okay. All right, you absolutely should. You, I don't know. You gotta. You didn't. So you don't do any relaxing thing. What? What? Well, what time did you get home on Sunday? I, truth be told, I skipped out a little early. Because you did you you get, you get in the media center and it's like I mean it. You get sleepy in there and shit. So and, I left. I was actually home for the end of the. And, race. and let's be honest, it, like the race was kind of a. Eh, the it race was. is on. It was. You know and, I mean, I, I don't care to sit around and and listen to press conferences and and ask questions that everybody else is asking you know for stuff like that i mean the the stuff the stuff that i want to know they won't let me ask right so it's like <laughs> I, I asked a question at a at a press conference once at a nascar race there and and i asked like this extremely technical question and and the moderator's like we may not have time for that one let's go ahead and move on i'm like what the fuck come on man so yeah, it's all good whatever yeah so i came home I came my guy. I know that oh, yeah. you had a little uh, a little bit of fun on Saturday night too. So <laughs> out there in the track, man. I'm telling you, man, it's not just a race, it's a party. So it, it, make sure uh, make sure that when we come back next year for Coda, make sure you guys come out there and, and say hi to Rodney uh, and I because we'll be back there. We'll be having a fun time. That's for and sure. that's how I operate, Wags. I go over there, get all lubed up, and that's when I start going to work working on things. <laughs> You're you're working on some pretty damn good guests. I gotta I gotta tip my hat to you, man. Working on things. Definitely man. called. I mean, you let Al Walsh stick on and watch NASCAR, and now Walsh isn't exactly a, a NASCAR guy, but my guy, man, one hell of a one hell of a guest there, dude. I, I gotta tell you, so so the the two gentlemen that I was talking to before Jacqueline came on yesterday, those are like two of. I, mean, I, was, I was talking about the two gentlemen. I wasn't talking about Jacqueline. <laughs> oh okay uh, the, so the, the 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 two those two dudes are like two of my heroes honestly and it was, um, it was the last race for um for doug rice yeah, doug, yeah right? he, he's retiring yeah so uh he he said something he said something during his show that made me think of chaos theory he said so when we're on the air we don't necessarily claim to be the chuckle hut <laughs> i'm like oh, that, that, that might be a little uh chaos theory uh-esque right there we call ourselves the chuckle hut yeah, yeah that's i don't uh, like that a little bit. i've never heard chuckle up before in my yeah, life my god uh, well he's an older dude so yeah you know so some of those oldies but goodies but hey, not oldie, up, but a goodie here's jeff I, Howe. Had a, had a dude i used to run around with back in the day who we nicknamed chuckle f and i'll let you fill in the blank after that but fred because <laughs> you know <laughs> Wags, chuckle you know, fun, you know, chuckle fun. Well, i'm sure both of y'all have had that kind of friend like just the way they carry themselves and Maybe just their uh, habitual line steppers. So you're you're the chuckle f in your friend group wags. Just I don't sometimes. know what I am in my fr- I, I'm. They called me Hollywood because it was just always a show. Sometimes you just uh, that hair dude. They just take it too far. You know, it's kind of like the super troopers line, right? Like our shenanigans are cheeky and fun. His shenanigans are cruel and tragic. That's <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Well, I don't know. We had, a, I don't know. We had, a, we had a few of them that took it a little too far. Um, but we, all, I mean, we all survived. So, uh, <laughs> especially that asshole back there, is that it? Like, yeah, they're, yeah. I don't want to incriminate anybody. I'm still we'll bring insane. Jordan on real quick. I'm still insanely jealous of that Mortal Kombat cabinet in the corner. Don't be there. jealous. Just come over and play, man. Come over and have fun. Don't be you, jealous. You ain't you ain't ready for me to hit uh, the scorpion spear move over and over. I'm, I'm probably not. I'm probably <laughs> not. <laughs> but I'll be honest, Wags. It's been a minute since I've done it, so I'll be plenty rusty. I'm, I'm, inv- I'm inviting you guys to come on over and have some fun, man. That's for sure. What's up, Jordan? How you guys yeah. doing, man? Tired. My God, tired. <laughs> One word. Tired. <laughs> a man of many words. Hey, we're going to let you guys get to it, man. I got to get out of here and get to a meeting. You guys be good, man. Enjoy the rest of your all's Monday. We'll see you guys Tuesday for another edition of Chaos Theory. Enjoy the ride. Later, boys. See you guys. All right, it's Jeff. It's Jordan. It's only an hour. It's about how long we'll be on here. 
Jordan, you good, man? You made that long drive back to the Metroplex from Austin yesterday. Yeah, yeah, just that <clears throat> that that time of the year and Mondays are always hard. You know, you got to decide: do I wake up and write the stampede? Do I do it Sunday night? You know, how do I do it? So, uh, been a been a long Monday morning, but just that time of year. It's so, all good, man. Uh, let's. How's practice? Well, that's what I want to do. So I want to I want to give you time to talk about recruiting. And KJ Lacey was a practice actually, so he was out there. Um, I want you. I want to give you plenty of time to talk about Battle Houston. Uh, Battle Houston seven on seven. Plenty of time to talk about Elite Eleven. Uh, and I do want to talk practice. So why don't we? Why don't I do this? Let's get basketball and baseball out of the way. Then we'll do practice, and then we'll kind of go the last half hour or so with recruiting. So Baseball is the easiest one to talk about because Texas gets a much needed series win over Baylor. I haven't seen if the conference has released players of the week yet. I got a feeling Max Blue's probably gonna be your Big Twelve Player of the Week, considering yesterday he had three home runs. He's now your Big Twelve leader in home runs. This is a guy, Jordan, and Alito product, so it depends on what you consider the Metroplex. You can consider a lot of things the Metroplex, but let's just say up in your neck of the woods now. You know, Max Ballou's a guy that didn't play a ton last year but had a really good summer with the wooden bat playing out in California, came back, had a really good fall. Is I want to say he's he's got the chance to be a five-tool guy, but a guy that definitely can hit for power. He can definitely run. He's athletic. Uh, we've seen the arm in the outfield. There are still times where, and, and in his defense, with some of the issues he's had in right field, uh, Augie Garrido used to say it all the time, and Augie told me more than once, right field is the toughest position to play in that ballpark, especially when you're talking about a night game and, and you get into the twilight just because of the shadows and the way it is, the way the sun sets over the clamshell and the way the, the shadows hit in right field. He said it's the harder. Augie always felt like right field was the hardest position to play in that ballpark. So you give Max Ballou a little bit of leeway from that standpoint, but he's a guy that's seen it really well. And I did I actually was sick yesterday. I was under the weather, so I didn't get to go to the game yesterday. But I was talking to uh, Kevin Rodriguez, the baseball sports information director, and we were just looking at the forecast for Sunday. I'm like, man, it could either be like a short game, like a run rule type game, or it could be a really long game because the wind forecast, Jordan was blown out of the south yesterday, straight out to dead center field at like 7 to, I think, 18, 19 miles an hour with the gusts getting to 30-plus. I'm like, dude, anything up in the jet stream is getting out, and Max Ballou did it three times. So props to baseball. Getting a nice series went over Baylor. Bats were good. And Jordan, they got good starting pitching. Started LBJ was kind of himself in the loss on Friday, just kind of what you'd expect to see from your number one guy. But, man, Ace Whitehead in the Saturday game, complete game. Allows only two runs. You know, Boogie's up there only throwing about 85. He's not burning up the radar gun, but a guy that extremely confident, pitches with conviction, isn't afraid to give up some hits. That's kind of what this staff needs, man. Doesn't have the greatest stuff, but a dude that just competes, man. And you saw him compete a lot when he was playing quarterback at Lampasas. You know, just a dude that, again, not the biggest guy in the world, not the greatest athlete, but just a guy that a lot of, I don't want to use kind of the, the lunch pail terminology, if you will, but just a dude that just finds a way to get stuff done. That's what he did on Saturday. Yeah. Um, agreed. Go baseball. <laughs> Any, anything, now, anything else to add on Ace Whitehead? Uh, not at all. And, I mean, for basketball, I was driving from Houston to Austin during the game, and, um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I tried download. I'm like, man, what is, what could I listen to this game on? And after like trying to drive 80 miles per hour and download like a few different apps, trying to hear Craig Way's voice, I'm like, yeah, it's whatever. So for, I already know what's probably going to happen anyways, and that's NCAA what happens. Tournament, and, and I'll just throw this out there just so everybody can file it away for future reference. For the NCAA tournament, you got to get, I believe it's the Varsity app from Westwood One because Westwood One has exclusive – broadcast uh audio broadcast rights for the ncaa tournament just kind of like cbs cbs and turner have the over the air television rights westwood one has the broadcast rights and i think you've got to get there i believe it's the varsity app that allows you to stream it but you know overall jordan i just felt like the game was not a microcosm of their season but kind of felt like you know it, it just showed this team was not perfect 
This team was not overly talented, but when they were able to put it together and string together, you know, kind of four or five minute stretches where everything clicked, they weren't a bad basketball team. And you, you've got to look beyond the surface, but on the surface, winning 20 games in a regular season, finishing 500 in the Big 12, winning a game in the tournament, and then putting yourself in a position to get into the second weekend, which is what you did on Sunday or on Saturday, excuse me, that's probably – that's about what I figured this team would do this year. Now, could they have been better than what they were? Yeah, they could have, but – it's just at times the flaws were noticeable and probably, yeah. To the Tennessee shoot the ball well on Saturday. God, no, they, they were terrible. Dalton connect had four points in the first half. As a matter of fact, Tennessee, I think ended up shooting. Was it 30? I've got that in front of me right now. Hang on just a sec. 30. Yeah. Tennessee barely shot. Didn't even shoot 34%. They were at 33.8, three for 25 from three and Texas gave themselves a chance. But you know, at the end of the day, a lot of stuff to overcome. You had to overcome the turnovers in the first half. I mean, Tyrese Hunter had six turnovers in the first half. You had the Brock Cunningham flagrant one towards the end of the first half, which just, it was a four-point game, and then that sparks a 10-0 run by Tennessee going into the half. Like, it, just insanely idiotic stuff happening yesterday or on Saturday. and But they got themselves in a position, you know, just, I didn't have a problem with the play set up at the end, uh, at the end of regulation when they were trying to tie it, but it just felt like Max Aismas decided, like he predetermined, I'm not kicking it to Tyrese Hunter for an open three. I'm not dumping it down to the Sioux for a quick bucket. I'm taking the shot, which, hey, man, he's been your ride or die all year. He's been your guy that's taken that shot all year. Let him take it. Not a great look. Didn't fall down. And I felt bad for Dylan to Sioux, Jordan, because he probably set a record on Saturday for most shots that I've seen one guy shoot that they were good looks, it looked good, and stuff that either you know rattled around the rim and fell off or stuff that was going halfway down and then popped out. Like he set a record for rattle outs on Saturday. He just felt, I just felt really bad for, for Dylan to sue. And it's not like he had a terrible game. You know, his final game as a longhorn, Dylan to sue's 12 points, four rebounds, three steals, two blocks. But he shot four for 18. And with DeSue and Aismas going seven for 28, we've talked about it, man. That's not a recipe for victory. But I'll let you, I'll let you take the floor on this guy again, because you saw him in high school. I didn't think going into the year that by season's end, we would be talking about this team going into the 24-25 season, where hey man, Kendall Weaver's probably gonna be the guy you build this roster around in the offseason. But here we are, man. And I just love the fact that in Kendall Weaver's game, man, he he has no fear. He there's nothing. He you know he's not afraid to to scrap. He's not afraid to attack the basket. He's not afraid to you know, get his hands dirty on defense. Just a dude that all around brings a ton of energy, a ton of effort. He's a plus athlete, and on Saturday he he carried you through the game. He got it to a point where Hunter and Desue and and Aismas were able to make shots late, but man, Kendall Weaver's the reason why Texas was even in that game. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, you can't, you can't have your two best players, or who I think are the two best players, Abe Miss and Desu combined for seven of twenty-eight, and then you can't have Tyrese Hunter. I don't even know what you want to call his <laughs> role. Um, you can't turn over the ball six times and expect all that to win. I know Kendall Weaver, everyone's like, oh, this is the guy next year, where it's like he still can't shoot the ball. Like, he's never going to be the guy. He's never going to be a guy at, at Texas. He's going to be someone who helps a lot and is a great second and third option. And, uh, you know, he plays with energy, hustles. He hustles his ass off. That's why the, all the fans love him and are excited for, you know, this new opportunity that's coming his way. But you're out of your mind if you don't think Trey Johnson <laughs> – if uh, I feel like they 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 got to build it around him, and again, I don't know a ton about basketball, but that's just the the people who I trust in Dallas from the basketball side of things. The way they talk about Trey Johnson is the way Ron Holland was talked about. Yeah. Um. So that being said, I'd be pretty surprised if you know things aren't built around Trey Johnson. But I mean, I think. <laughs> 
I know, you know, second round exit wasn't one anyone wanted, and we're all looking to next year, but the thing that fans got to be happy for is the fact that the NBA is getting rid of the G League Ignite team because now Trey Johnson and um, blanket on his name, the other uh, signee. Cam Scott. Are, yeah, 1,000% coming unless, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there was ever any yeah. doubt about Cam Scott that I heard anyway. And Trey, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, the G League might have been an option for him. As a matter of fact, I think if he was to go pro, that probably would be the option. I – and this is even you've got more NIL sources than I do, but I was even checking with some NIL sources and I never got the feeling that overseas was going to be a real option for Trey Johnson. I may be wrong on that, but I just I just never got the feeling that overseas was going to be an option for him. Uh, but, yeah, you're right with the NBA putting the G League ignite on the chopping block. It's a year too late because I'm sure RT would have loved to have had Ron Holland. And, and Ron Holland on this team does make it a second weekend team. I don't think there's any question about that. He's clearly your number three option on offense. He gives you the rebounder slash rim protector that you really didn't have other than the times Caden Shedrick was healthy. But when I say build it around Weaver, but Trey Johnson's here for one year. Trey Johnson's one and done. Kendall Weaver's a guy that might be here for a minute. And if Kendall Weaver, I'm not saying he's going to have the same career trajectory as this guy where he's going to play 10 years in the NBA. But if Kendall Weaver can be for Rodney Terry, kind of what Roy L. Ivy was for Rick Barnes, then that's kind of where I think the ceiling is for Kendall Weaver. He's never, I don't think he's ever going to be, to your point, Jordan, I don't think he's ever going to shoot it well enough or consistently enough to where he can be like a first round type pick. But he's a guy that I think can be kind of your anchor on defense. He's a guy that can go a long way towards establishing your culture and be the kind of the engine that makes everything go. Or if you pair him with a Trey Johnson or a Cam Scott or fill in the blank, you know, kind of first round type talent like Royale was with TJ Ford, then then you've really got something. So I, I think I just think Kendall Weaver has positioned himself to be a much bigger part of this program. I'll, I'll be honest, man. I I didn't think they were going to get much from him this year. And that's not me. That's not conjecture. That's talking to people inside the program like I, they they didn't think they were going to get what they got out of Weaver this year. That wasn't the plan initially. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, hey, man, the IT Horton thing didn't work out and Tyrese kind of hit a wall in terms of his development. And here's Weaver just kind of kept getting better and better to where he straight up just forced his way onto the floor. And ain't nothing wrong with that at all. So it, it's going to be an interesting offseason as it is for everybody in college basketball because roster building is a year-to-year -year proposition in college hoops. But with Weaver, Caden Shedrick's already said he's coming back. You've got the two freshmen. You know, Nick Cody, it sucks that Nick Cody tore his knee up and because who knows when he's going to be back now. But with the with uh, Shedrick, Weaver, uh, Trey Johnson, and Cam Scott, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good core to start thinking about, okay, what's this roster for 24-25 going to look like? Yeah, um, what CB said, like I know <laughs> it seems kind of like Texas fans have been spoiled a little. I mean, I know it's still the second round, um, but what CB said is true. Uh, they didn't win, or they had four wins from 09 through 22, which is the same amount they've had in the last two seasons. So um, not, not horrible. And it's always wild to look at, you know, how Shaka legitimately won zero. <laughs> tournament games it's you know you had the the abilene christian loss which was just brutal northern the, iowa baby paul jesperson you know buzzer beater prayer that knocked him out and they had a double digit lead on nevada a really good nevada team as we found out but you know that, that man that was a texas team that went through a lot the mo bamba year because remember they lost andrew jones got diagnosed with cancer early January I mean that lineup looked totally different and they still ended up making the tournament and still you now like that, that still could have been a sweet 16 type team it, it, that that team was that team disappointed you because even without Andrew Jones that was still a really talented team yeah um I mean it was Mo Bamba and wasn't was Jackson Hayes also on that team like getting them mixed up yeah Jackson Hayes was the next year Jackson Hayes was the yeah. NIT year but I mean, you had uh, 
uh, Snoop Roach was on that team. Jace Febbers. I mean, yeah, they, they were more talented than, you know, being a, a one and done team in the tournament. But I, I'll add on to CB's point. You know, this is the first time you've had three years in a row where you've won at least one tournament game since that run, that four year run from 06 through 09, where two times in that stretch, you know, Rick Barnes took you to the Elite Eight twice. Now, the second time in 08, I, there was no way they were beating Memphis, right? And Joey Dorsey and Derrick Rose turned the second half of that game into a dunk contest. But the 06 team, I still say, is is Rick's most talented team. Booby Gibson, P.J. Tucker, LaMarcus Aldridge. They had three, three guys that had pretty damn good NBA careers. And one of those guys, P.J. still playing. Now, LaMarcus, because of health reasons, had to retire. And Booby Gibson was on LeBron's first finals team. Uh, you, know, you were really talented that year. And, you know, the fact like that to me, how fo- how Texas football fans, Jordan, how they feel about like 08 or 09 or 2001, like the years where Texas got close. It's like, oh, man, you could have should have got over the hump and played for a national title. Like the fact like when LSU beat Duke in the Sweet 16 that year, because they played that was a region where they played at the Georgia Dome. LSU beats Duke. Duke had destroyed Texas earlier in the year with J.J. Redick. And I was like, dude, Duke's out of the way. Like that's. Texas is going to the Final Four. That LSU team had Garrett Temple, Tyrus Thomas, Big Baby Davis, and Texas just flat out just messed the bed in the Elite Eight to LSU. That was they were I felt like and still feel like they were a better team than LSU. But I digress. It's been since then that you had the kind of run of success in the NCAA tournament that you're having right now, where you've won again at least one game three years in a row. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure Kentucky fans would be like to say that at this point. But I, my thing with basketball, Jordan, it all goes back to kind of what what is your opinion of Texas basketball? Are you do you look at it through the prism of what it historically has been, or do you look at it through the prism of what it can be? If you're looking at it through the prism of what it can be, yeah, this year probably doesn't reach the the bar of success for you. If you look at historically what Texas has been. You know, growing up when I was watching Texas during the Tom Penders years and then into the Rick Barnes years, yeah, this is kind of the where the bar is. Like, get to the tournament, win a game, give yourself a chance to get to the second weekend. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's better than what it usually is, I guess. Yeah. Or what it's usually been in my life. But um, I don't know. Like, <laughs> There's always a part of me with with Texas and all sports, like you're the flagship school in the state that produces better athletes than just about anywhere else. And you're, in my opinion, (laughs) born and raised there, the best city in the state on a lake and a booming city too, with all these other things that Austin has to offer to where there should never be any reason that Texas doesn't have a top team in just about every major sport. There shouldn't be a reason because there's, there's money in Austin too, in NIL. Right. So um, I think eventually, and we talked a little bit about this in the horns 24 seven group chat, or at least I remember seeing Trey talk about it. Could there ever be a time we see other sports on campus say like, hey, football is taking up too much of the collective. We would like a large percentage as well. We've seen how much it's helped their program. We would like it to help us as well. I'm curious if something like that will ever happen. Um, I think it'd be a couple of years down the road if it was to happen. Um, but I mean, uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at the basketball season. Another important thing that, I think was remembered a lot early on at the start of the year, but it's kind of been forgotten about is, you know, we've come along and the tournament started is man, this team was built around a player who isn't on the roster, right? (laughs) Ron Holland. Like it was built and catered to be built around him. So Mm -hmm. it works as best as it possibly can with kind of, at least in high school when I saw him very ball dominant player. Right. Yeah. And then that's like building the Lakers around a LeBron type, not a LeBron type of talent, but a LeBron type of kind of ball dominant. It's just the way the team plays behind him, and yeah. then he's not there. Like Ron Holland would have filled the uh, Ron Holland would have filled the role Timmy Allen had last year. We're kind of a more, if, for lack of a better term, you're a point forward mm-hmm. who the offense can flow through you if you catch it in the high post, you catch it in the low post, you catch it on the wing, wherever. You know the offense can run through you and. 
I I would have loved to have seen, you know, Ron Holland, the offense going through Ron Holland, where Max Aceman doesn't have to handle the ball so much. And because I I don't know about you, I feel the same way about Max Aceman that I did about Marcus Carr. Both of those guys, and Aceman does a better job, a more consistent job than Marcus Carr did of creating his own shot and creating good shots for himself. But I just feel like both those guys are so much better when you can run an action for them where they're coming off a, a high a high ball screen or they're coming off a double screen or something, and you can get them kind of a catch-and-shoot clean look. I'd love to have seen if Max Ace has played with a guy like Ron Holland, like all the stuff that could have opened up. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, um... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um... What's up? Yeah, you got that phone ringing or what? No, just uh, like uh, <laughs> this kid doesn't even have his height or weight in his bio, which means he's probably like five seven, and he's just DMing me why are they playing with my stars. Film don't lie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> dude, I I'm not responding or following you back. Like, I just <laughs> yeah, no, you're good. You're good. You understand. There, there are days like this where I will turn my DMs off, where you can only DM me if I follow you back. Boys um, and girls, we don't we don't give out stars just because we feel like it that day. Yeah, right. I, I'll, I'll just text them back. Like, oh, sorry, my bad, man. I got you. <laughs> like, but uh, no, sorry. I I like your point. Your point. I agree with your point that you built this roster. This roster is supposed to be built around Ron Holland. Um. Do you think I, I don't know if any, have any of your nil sources had any kind of take on G League Ignite getting folded? What that means for basketball? I mean, it's got to be it's good for the college game. I know that. I just don't know percentage wise. Like, is it very good? Is it kind of good? Is it man, eh, whatever? Um, you know, I I really don't know. Uh, most of the nil guys I have uh, stick to just football. Some will double dip in football and basketball, but. Uh, I mean, I'm only ever asking football questions because yeah. I only ever am covering football. But um, I do know that, I mean, the, the G League was created because there was a name, image, and likeness. And, you know, a way for kids whose families could really use the money to make some legal money while also, you know, getting an NBA development. And I think it wasn't this week whenever they announced that they were just canning it. But a couple of weeks ago in a press conference, I believe, Adam Silver, the, the commissioner of the NBA. That was All-Star Weekend, yeah. Okay, All-Star Weekend. He gave a quote like, hey, uh, name, image, and likeness is a thing. These kids don't need to go <laughs> to the G League Ignite for us. And also, like, duh, I'm, I'm not surprised at all they got rid of it quick. The reason there's never, ever been – a legitimate developmental league for the NFL is because college is a free developmental league, right? Yeah. Who do you think was paying these guys on Ignite? Who was paying them? I, I don't. I, I don't know where the money is coming from, but I assume the NBA, right? Mm -hmm. So now they have a free full time developmental league again, you know, and it's locked in. And I think a lot of people are happy about it. Uh, fans for pretty much probably everyone, but like the top 10 players in the country. Cause that's really only who ignite will take. Yeah. Um, but I, I like the move a lot uh, as far as what NIL sources think, not sure, but I, I can try to, to get some more on it. I mean, you can, you can go overseas and play, but that hasn't really worked out for anybody that's done it. I mean, AJ Johnson, last I checked could barely get on the floor. Uh, you know, Terrence Ferguson, whenever he came out of did the prime prep thing and then went overseas, I don't know where Terrence Ferguson's basketball career is right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, it hasn't really Emmanuel Moody is like best case scenario, and he was like the first, right? Uh, I don't remember if he was the first, he was one of the first for sure. He went to play for the Guangdong Tigers, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, home of Kyle right. Kuzma. You're right. Moody A, I think, is probably the best case scenario of, of those guys that's happened. I was just pulling up some stuff. I just did a quick Google search. So Ron Holland making the, the contract he signed with G League Ignite could pay him up to half a million dollars, which that's Jonathan Kaminga and some of these other guys, Jalen Green. That's pretty much the same kind of deal they got. Uh, Scoot Henderson, when he signed his deal, it was two years for a million. So Breaks down to about half a million a year. Uh, Greg Brown, yeah, 
Antoine, thank you. Brandon Jennings back in the day was probably the first one because that was kind of post one and done rule coming into effect when Brandon Jennings. Brandon Jennings, I think, signed with Arizona and then went and played overseas. Mm. Uh, but, I, but anyway, uh, Ron Holland making about half a million dollars. You know, and, and for whatever it's worth, I heard that Greg Brown's offer when Greg Brown got offered to go G League Unite instead of Texas, that his offer was somewhere in that kind of four hundred thousand range. 350 to 400 somewhere in there yeah um i don't know i'm just kind of but you know it's like nick smith who went to arkansas was the number one uh number one player in the class uh nick smith i think for his one year at arkansas i think he got a ten thousand dollar nil deal you know so so the money you're talking about the money it's it's still going to be worlds apart but the opportunity that guys have to yeah, I want to I was gonna ask you this. This is what I was gonna ask you about the, the 400 to 500 offer from Ignite is pretty damn surprising to me because like there are freshmen ranked outside the, the top 32 who are gonna make that at Texas this fall. In football, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in football, but in, in basketball, like uh, what the top what the number five player in the country is going to get in basketball compared to what the number five player in the country is going to get in football is usually pretty different yeah. and the basketball kids a lot more so maybe it's just kids also just don't want to go to school and do class for four months or whatever but that could be part of it um i think the other thing too is ba- your basketball nil money the way it's structured and baseball structured the same way more of that's getting spent in the portal I think compare it, maybe compare it. I don't know, Jordan. Maybe you, I may put you on that task. No, like it, it, or something. Break down what percentage goes to portal, what percentage goes to incoming recruits for football. But I know for basketball and baseball, it's going to be more, that's going to be more portal. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. Like in, in football, unless you're going to be a, you know, top, top prospect coming out of high school, like you're always going to make more in the portal. Yeah. Um, Cause it's not, talent that needs to be developed it's proven talent it's pretty much plug and play so right. you know it's uh, i'll put i'll put it this way man from from a baseball standpoint i can't tell you exactly to the penny what they got but uh the roster lsu had they won the national championship with paul Skeens and tommy tanks they didn't sign nil deals for 10 grand i'll, t- I'll tell you that much Mm-mm. you know dylan, it- dylan cruz wasn't getting 10 grand you know, well, yeah. he might have, I don't know what Dylan Cruz got. I'd heard some of the numbers being thrown around for Paul Skeens, and it wasn't it wasn't ten grand. I'll tell you that much. But hey, real quick, because we got to talk practice, we got to talk recruiting. But on with the G League going away, mm-hmm. in your opinion, I don't know if you got any insight because I don't honestly on this. How come IMG hasn't been as much of a factor for basketball as it's been for football? Because the the resources you've got there, to me. It would make sense, and it may just be because whether it's La Lamira or Montverde or Oak Hill, wherever there, you just got more basketball academies, basketball factories. But like the advantages that we've seen guys that go to IMG for football that go go to college with, that they're ahead of the curve in a lot of areas. Man, IMG would make a if I'm a top basketball prospect, IMG would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, they had Keontae George for his senior year a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think it's mostly it, it has to do with kind of what you said that just there's so many more of those basketball academy type schools where they're <laughs> they're there to learn basketball. Um, Duncanville. It, it was, not, not even, I'm not even talking about like those. I'm talking about like Link Academy. I know. Like, I know. I, know. I, I kid. I just about done. Yeah. Like IMG is like the only one at in in football that I can think of that's like a legitimate. I mean, modern day and St. John Bosco are kind of in that for me, but not completely in the same category as IMG. Um, but I think it's just because, like, the game's a lot more oversaturated for prep academies and in the sport of basketball than football. Um, and also just because, like, mm, it's a one man – not one man. There's only one ball. There's five guys on the court. And yeah. in basketball in high school, like, it's pretty easy to tell – not pretty easy. Like, I don't know. I feel like it'd be easier to tell NBA compared to NFL because it's only going to be a one year gap um, compared to three years. Mm-hmm. But 
I don't know. Like, I don't food know. For food for thought. Yeah. I figured this, the, the, the market is much more saturated in basketball and even baseball, whereas – and baseball is more of a travel ball sport anyway at this yeah. point uh, at the amateur level. But for football, man, I I am G. I don't you you pro, I don't know if you remember because a lot of this is when you were a kid, so I don't even know if you remember the scuttlebutt. But there was so much concern that, and a lot of it happened around the time prime prep was a thing that somebody was going to try to build one of these football academies in Texas and try to recruit kind of the best of the best in Texas to build like an all star team, and like it, it I. <laughs> I feel the same way about that as I do now about sports talk radio in Austin. And what I mean by that is the people who have money don't know what they're doing or they're smart enough not to even get involved in it. And the people who want to do it don't have enough money to do it. Like you're just never, it's never going to happen. Like IMG, that's the, the money backing IMG. It's just way too much to where, I, I mean, they might be the only show in town for a long time. Granted, like you said, there's a couple like modern day. There's a couple other schools across the country that can do do different things. But the football market for those kind of factories is never going to be as saturated as, and in some cases, oversaturated like it is for basketball. Oh, yeah. So, so anyway, let's talk practice real quick because I've belabored the point long enough. Um, I'm waiting, excuse me, I'm waiting to get word from Chip and Eric. Uh, Sounds like uh, Malik Muhammad might have had some type of hamstring injury or something this morning. So we'll see what happens with that. I didn't see him participating a ton while we were out there today. So, uh, dude, spring, um, unless it's like, unless you're going to tell me it's like season ending or something, uh, spring practice injuries are kind of out of sight, out of mind for me. I'll tell you this, though, Jordan, the guy that probably generated the most buzz while us as media members were out there probably DeAndre Moore, man. And if I had to just pick a word to describe how his practice was sharp, that's how I would describe DeAndre Moore this morning. And it's interesting because this is an experiment of sorts that we're seeing the Texas staff go through because they put DeAndre Moore with Jordan Whittington. It was like his, you know, his, what do they call it? Like your, uh, like you're partnering up in school or whatever, just like your your buddy on the field trip that you have to stay attached to the hip with. It's basically what they did for DeAndre Moore. And like, look, you're taking over the slot for Jordan Whittington next year. You stay with Jay Witt. You follow it, do what he does, everything. Just watch how he goes about his business. Learn the position from him, and you'll get your chance to be that guy next spring. And at least, you know, today was practice four. He at least looks capable. I don't I mean, we're a long way away from figuring out if he's going to fill that role or not. But at the end of the day, he's getting the first crack at it and looks, from what we've seen, what little we've seen, looks pretty sharp in there in that slot position. Yeah, a little, I don't know, it sounds, uh, I mean, I believe y'all, obviously, but just a little surprised, to be honest. Um, were y'all in at Frank Denius or it looks like Stadium. DKR? Stadium, yeah. Okay, okay. Man, I was... Lee, I had just left my dad's house yesterday, like literally five minutes. I was in the car driving to Dallas. And I got the text from you in the group chat about the availability at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm too tired for this shit, dude. I'm going to just get home. And like, I don't feel like taking 4,000 photos and having to edit them and do all that because I still got thousands I still got to go through. But um Oh, if I would have sent that, because I sent that, the we got the email at 6.40 last night. Mm. So, and I sent that text at 7.13. So, you only saw, you saw it less than a half hour after, or a little more, a little over a half hour after we found out. Got it. Um, <clears throat> according to CB, per CB, Sark said Muhammad was, uh, Manny Muhammad was removed for precautionary reasons, but we'll be back at practice Wednesday or Friday. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, if we'll be back this week, we'll be back this week. No biggie. Um, good for, you know, the younger yeah, guys like to get some it. more reps. Unless you're telling me a guy like, you know, blew a knee out or something or some kind of season-ending deal or obviously anytime you're talking about head and neck, you're concerned. But that, that's – it's – um, What do you think of uh, Freddie DeBose? you notice any of him today? You know, 
I didn't see Freddie DeBose out there today again. So I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, the guy, he he's growing on me. He's tiny. He's tiny. Mm-hmm. But Aaron Butler growing on me a little bit. And like we've talked about, he's one of the guys that normally I would default to you and Hank on what you saw from a kid or call somebody in the network to figure out what they saw. Man, nobody from a Texas standpoint saw Aaron Butler because he committed before he even took a visit. He signed before he took a visit. Yeah, he got offered signing day or yeah. during the signing period. Yeah. And, and, and decided he's going to Texas. So, dude, I I didn't know what to expect. I saw just the very little highlights, not even game film, just the very little highlights. But Chip and I were talking, and I was like, man, he's tiny. And Chip goes, you know, he's like, well, X was tiny. I'm like, but X had some play strength, and like we saw him do it. And X was probably what one like upper one sixties, low one seventies. I mean, he's lucky. Yeah, dude. Aaron Butler looks like he's about one fifty, like one fifty five. But he's, I'm like, give him, you know, you're pro, you're not going unless you have just knock on wood, just a rash of injuries or something. You're not going to need Aaron Butler in 2024 anyway. Give him a year to get his feet under him, let him figure it out. And then after this year, when presumably Matthew Golden and Isaiah Bond move on, Silas Bolden will be gone. Then, you know, you go into that year from now in spring. Now you're looking at Aaron Butler moving up the depth chart and really figuring out exactly what you've got. Kind of like you are with Ryan Niblett right now. Like right now, the staff, they didn't need Ryan Niblett last year, but now they're starting to figure out, okay, can we count on him? And Ryan Nibble had a tough morning, dude. I, I saw him drop two or three passes and routes on air, so a little bit of a tough morning. But that's, you know, that's just a little nugget of information. That's not me saying, oh my gosh, Ryan Niblett's in trouble or whatever. You know, talented player, but like you, you talked about him too, Jordan. At the risk of repeating ourselves, dude, he extremely raw coming from Aldi Eisenhower, which you've said time and again with all due respect to the Ike staff at the time just didn't have a lot around him and there wasn't a lot of structure there to what he was doing as a senior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, had anything on Vosick is I saw someone comment. Uh, Elu Penn. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but yeah, he's asking about Colton Vosick. Not a ton. Uh, he's not even in the two deep right now. And that's no fault of his own. Uh, just right now today, the, the twos looked like, you know, obviously Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke were the ones. Uh, Trey Moore at the Jack position, Colin Simmons at the Buck were the twos. So he, you know, I, I do wonder, you know, the back injury he had last year, how much did that set him back? And, you know, how much does he have to work his way back to get to where he was before that injury? Got to sidetrack things for him. So, but I mean, I, you know, Colton Vosick's one of those guys, dude. I'm, I saw enough of him at Westlake to know, like, I'm, it's way too early to give up on him or think things are trending in a certain direction. Just you can, you got enough quality bodies in front of him that you can give him time. Yeah. And, um, you know, with his back injury, not a, not a ton is known. Like we, yeah. we found out about it because, uh, it would have been week three of the Texas high school football season. Westlake has a home game and the next day, Texas is going to Alabama to play in Tuscaloosa. And I get a text from someone at Westlake. It's a photo of Vosick on the sideline that Friday night, just in street yeah. clothes. <laughs> and I was like, yo, what? Because the text was like, why is he here? Like, if Texas plays Alabama tomorrow. And I was like, I don't know. And I hit up sources at Texas. And I was like, I'm not going to write anything about this, obviously. But, like, why is he not traveling? And they were just like, yeah, his back's messed up. Uh, he's not even going to suit up the rest of the year probably. And I was just like, shit, really? But didn't really want to push much more. It was also like 930 on a Friday night, so didn't know how much yeah. I was going to get. But um, we'll we'll probably get more details about the back stuff, you know, once he really starts to come into his own. Um, I think for Vosick, he was always going to have kind of a – I always felt – and this is kind of contradictory – but I always felt like Burke had the higher ceiling, was long-term, uh, better prospect. But short, short-term was going to need a lot of work, was not going to be able to play as a freshman. Mm-hmm. Whereas I felt of the two, Vosick was more ready to play early on, um, much higher floor but lower ceiling. Yeah. And 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's been slower than I thought for Vosick. Obviously, you can't predict a back injury. I wasn't expecting True. him to have some crazy freshman year, I mean, regardless of the injury or not. But, um, you know, I, I'm not ever going to be worried about him entering the portal unless something changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all remember his recruitment. He's obviously really close friends with uh, Arch Manning, Mookie Taft, guys like that as well. So, um you know, as long as I can keep him committed to the program and showing up every day, working hard and, you know, working through the back problems, then, you know, he can be something. There's a reason his ranking was what it was, and there's a reason, you know, uh, Texas still went in, out and got him after they were kind of embarrassed by <laughs> Oklahoma and his commitment. Like, there's yeah. a reason Texas still went, went through all that shit to go get him was because he's – that's where they valued him. And that's sure. yeah. the type of prospect, type of player he is. So um, I just think patience and – you know, again, we don't know the full story of what all is going on with, with his back problems, too. But, but yeah, so I think this year uh, – or not this year. After this year, Trey Moore, um, he has one more – he could come back for next season if he wanted. But, uh, you know, during when during his portal recruitment, when I was talking to some people close to him, uh, like all of them, that he, he's leaving after one year. Um, something will have to go very wrong for him to come back next year. Uh, because it, he's ready to be done with school and everything like that. Um, Ethan Burke could insert, leave, get insert drafted. Cardell, insert Cardell Jones catchphrase here. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, Ethan Burke could be drafted after this year. Uh, Baron Sorrell, he's out of eligibility after this year. Yeah, Sorrell's yeah. done. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities next year, and, you know, he'll be a junior next year. So – that's fine. Like you can start one year and go first round in one year. So with Vosick, I just think patience. And again, like there's not a ton of concrete info on him. And you know, Texas is being you know very careful with how that info gets out. I think so. Yeah, I think you know it's interesting. The edge is one of those positions where there's depth. I just don't know that there's talented depth in terms of proven commodities. You know, Trey Moore's a proven commodity, but not at this level. Colin Simmons obviously isn't a proven commodity yet. He's talented as hell. It's a lot of a lot of high hopes for him. He freaking looks the part, I'll tell you that. But he's got to do it in a game. And then you know you got guys that maybe we've seen flash or whatever. But man, it's Vosick's just in that group with like Justice Finkley and Jamon Tap and uh, I guess Cecilia Cana would be in that group maybe. But Billy Walton, Billy Walton, yeah, is another one. It's it's just guys that just haven't done it yet or haven't done it nearly consistently enough to where you can consider them more than a rotational guy. So I, yeah, I wouldn't be down on Vasek by any stretch. One one guy, Hey, one guy I wanted to mention to you, I think you'll like this note compared to what he looked like when you, know, you were out at practice last week. Uh, Sadir Mitchell was an active participant today. Okay. Okay. Going through drills, went through pursuit drills. So look, there was a sense of a noticeable sense of urgency that apparently wasn't there. I can't say it was or not because I didn't watch the defense when I was there last Tuesday. But well, did Kenny Baker make him run a lap around the field? That I didn't know. Media? No, I didn't know. I didn't see Sadir running. I didn't see anybody running laps today. As a matter of fact. Okay, because that happened to Sadir last week. So yeah, good good job, Sadir. Yeah, a little, <laughs> a little rough. Um, so I completely. I just want to go back to Antoine's question he asked at the beginning of the show of any truth Clark and Gibson potentially passing Wisner and Red. Uh, going to kind of leave it, lob it to you in a sec because you were at yeah. practice today. Um, me personally, I wasn't at practice, but I wouldn't be surprised by it. On the same note, though, it's currently March 25th, and we're almost a month from the spring game in however many months from spring ball. A final decision is far from being made, especially – uh, at that stage of the running back depth chart. So, yeah. Uh, that being said, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all by it. I mean, that's what Texas wants to do is recruit le like talented enough guys that are going to pass up other guys that quick. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised about it, but you know, I, I wouldn't expect it to happen quite yet. So, hey, I said this to Eric Henry this morning. Our guy Eric's our beat writer over course 24 7. For those who don't know, I said to Eric this morning because Eric's going to write about running backs today, as a matter of fact. And I just I feel like Trey Wisner with what he did on special teams last year. I think you've got to give him a chance to be a part of that rotation. Otherwise, 
why are you dangling that special teams carrot out in front of guys? You know? Yeah. Um, well, I'm just going to throw my body around covering kickoffs and not reap the benefits from it. But Trey Wise, that's why I think Jelani McDonald's going to get – Jelani McDonald's running with the twos today from as far as I could tell. Um, that's why you're uh, going to get safety. It's kind of – the secondary was just kind of a mix and match. Like during pursuit, like Jade didn't run pursuit drill, which mm. at this point – I, I don't know how much Jade Barron really needs to practice in spring, to be honest. Right. Like what what is what do PK and Terry Joseph need to see from Jade Barron in spring ball? You know, like really. Just make yeah. sure just make sure he gets to August healthy. I like guess Jade's one of those guys that that's all you're hoping for with him. But you know, they were mixing it up. Like the the ones at safety was like Derek Williams and Michael Taff, and then it was Jelani McDonald and uh, who was the other? Uh, Makuba were the twos today. That's safety. And you just kind of mix another guy. See Xavier Filson me in there. So they were just really mixing and matching all over the place. Uh, what were we talking about before safety? Uh, the running backs. And yeah. The, uh, Eric. I think I think Trey Wisner's done enough to, to warrant snaps in that group. Savion Red's got a soft cast still on his right hand. And I don't know if this is going to be me drawing conclusions, which is I know it's dangerous. I don't know if it's the staff doesn't expect a lot from him right now or they're whatever the case is. It just doesn't seem like he's getting as much attention as some of the other guys in that room right now. And maybe the injury is part of it. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I can't, it's hard to describe, Mm -hmm. but I feel like there's – when I watch Tashard Choice coach the backs, it feels like there's more of an emphasis on everybody else in the group and Savion Red's just kind of there. Maybe that's because of the injury. Like I said, I don't know. But, man, Jerry Gibson and Christian Clark, it's it's going to be really hard to keep those guys off the field. I know there's only one football, and I know you know Texas doesn't go too, too deep in terms of quality snaps, high leverage snaps for the backs. But, I mean, you know – You've got a really good example in Jonathan Brooks that shows you, hey man, if you if you keep working your tail off and you wait your turn in this offense, when you are the guy, you're going to get it, plenty of chances to touch the football. So, I just think Jordan, we're at the point now where I'm I'm about ready to call running back the deepest, most talented position on this team. I don't know that I'm there yet, but I'm I'm getting pretty close. Yeah. Other yeah. than quarterback, other than quarterback, because quarterback's a different animal with this team. Yeah. Um, I'll mm. say this, the offensive line today. Uh, and Jordan, we'll probably have to get the recruiting stuff tomorrow. That this all point. good, all good. Bad. But it, you know, your your call of Neto at left guard is is looking better because he was with the ones today. It just felt like Kyle Flood's going back to the well of. Let me get another look at Hayden Connor at center. And and look, man, Connor Robertson wasn't bad last year when he went in for Jake Majors in the OU game. But your backup center, I like this. I like the way Kyle Flood experiments during spring ball. Like he's Andre Kojo is a guy that he's moved around a little bit already. Uh, you know, Cole Hudson's a guy that he'll move around. He's moving guys around, getting a look at Hayden Connor at center. Kyle Flood, I like the fact that he he plans for worst case scenario. Like, all right, what if? What if you, you know, first play the Colorado State game? What if you lose Jake Majors for the year? What do you do at center? All right, Connor Robertson last year was probably a good a, a guy you could put in there and okay, he can get us through a game. But if we need a true backup center, you probably want your best five out there. It probably would have been Cole Hudson. It would have been Cole Hudson. Figure out him snapping the ball for the full season, you know. Yeah. And maybe Hayden, maybe Hayden Connor's that guy, or maybe it is Cole Hudson. Whoever it is, you know. You backup center is one of those deals that you don't realize how important it is until you need it. Yeah. Great point. Um, I'll I'll give you the floor with CB's question. Have you seen the Shadur Sanders press conference video that's gotten out? No, I actually haven't. What did what did they do now? <laughs> well, basically, Shadur said since he went to a private school, and and CB, anybody in the chat, feel free to correct me because I'm paraphrasing here. I saw the clip. Uh, on my way home from practice. So because he went to a private school, people have always doubted him and he's always tried to prove people wrong. He's basically, he's been the underdog 
and Deion Sanders' kids but had no advantages. So yeah, he's you know, I've I've always seen Shadour as kind of the plucky underdog. But basically, he said most of the guys that he was ranked with because he uh, played private school ball, he saw all these guys that went to big six A schools in Texas that were more highly thought of, and he doesn't see those six A guys doing anything in college. They're not really prospering on their college teams, which didn't make sense to me. It's like I called. I called my buddy, one of my buddies on the, on my way home. We were talking about it, and he's like, you know, that that could have been like a 30-second Google search to find out about that information before you set it in front of a live microphone. But it's just – it's this Colorado S show, man. The Colorado football with Deion Sanders at this point. And, I, look, I love Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders is one of my favorite athletes of all time. I had the, the primetime poster on my wall when I was a kid. Love Deion. But Colorado football with Coach Prime at this point, Jordan, it's kind of like that one relationship. And you're getting to about the age where you'll have one of these. It's that relationship everybody has right before you meet the person you're going to marry where it's really fun at first. It's great. But then you realize not long after, like, this isn't really going anywhere. And I don't wish you ill will. I don't hate you. I just want you to go away. And I think we're both going to be happier if you do. That's kind of where I am with Colorado football right now. Yeah, I mean, the – so wait, was that Shador who gave that quote or Shador, was Dion Shador. talking about his son? No, Shador did. That was straight from Shador. Yeah. Um, it's like the same shit as – I remember when Bryce Young got his Heisman trophy. Everyone was like, oh. <laughs> he's been so slept on his whole life you know yeah he's, he's undersized he had to fight for everything like he wasn't the number one fucking player in the country like, yeah what are we talking about the yeah 40 offers like and it's Kyle, like it's Kyle, the same Kyle thing Murray. as like the nfl draft where it's like his daughter's mom's wife's uh husband's dog was run over by a car and he saw it when he was six years old you know what i mean I, as like, God is my witness, I will throw something at my TV when if you know if Quinn Ewers is taken in the first round in 2025, or if Quinn wins the Heisman this year, I will throw something at the TV or maybe at someone, depending on where I am. If Quinn gets in front of a microphone, said, "Yeah, no one ever believed in me. Everybody doubted me." Like, yeah, you're the also, highest rated quarterback prospect in the history of our time doing this. Like, no, that's not. Not everybody's got the. Uh, is there uh, Trey? I know there's a lot of stuff that grinds your gears. Is there anything that does maybe more so than guys trying to force the underdog story on themselves when it's just not there? When it when the underdog tag doesn't apply. Yeah, people who don't give courtesy waves when you do nice things for them on the road is probably a bigger pet peeve. That, that's a big one, though. Yeah, don't you don't need to oversell this. You can just uh, enjoy the moment. But then again. A lot of sports figures do have to sell them se themselves as underdogs at times, right? You've got to find that motivating factor, the people that didn't believe in you. I mean, Michael Jordan still held, uh, held on to that grudge as he was getting into the Hall of Fame, and it was like a fabricated story. It wasn't even all that true as to some some kid or some – oh, I'm sorry, it was a coach yeah. who, uh, who didn't put him on the varsity team, even though he was just, what, a sophomore in high school. It's just like – it, uh, great competitors have to find ways to uh, motivate themselves. It would shock me if Quinn were to do that, though. Just having, uh, yeah, that, I don't didn't heard from him. The, if the, someone put that in his ear, if I were Quinn, I'd be like, "No, piss off!" I no, I, I've got a good, I've got a good enough story to tell without making. Quinn's got a good enough story to tell without making stuff up. Exactly. Yeah. the The main problem I have with the Michael Jordan story is no one talks about how when he was on JV, he was averaging like twenty eight a night. <laughs> <laughs> like he was crushing it on JV, um, but <laughs> was was he really? He was averaging twenty eight per game in JV because that's pretty freaking good. He was averaging twenty something per game because yeah. I, one of these books he talked about it. How he's like, yeah, that <laughs> that part was usually left out, but yeah. it was whatever. Um, but for Quinn, I doubt he'd go up there and be like, "Man, I got it out the mud." I, I think it'd be hilarious if he does, you know, yeah. with the South Lake kid. But uh, yeah, I don't see him doing that. What I am going to be pissed about because I'm just expecting this to happen is whoever the hell does the draft being like, well, so, you know, he came back for his fourth year, but he's actually young for his grade because he reclassed. Like Quinn, yours and I, he's 
in the same grade, uh, college a grade class as me, I guess. This will be his fourth season at Texas. If I was in college, this would be my fourth year of college. But he's a year older than me. Like, y'all get what I mean? Quinn so, turned 20. He turned 21 on the 15th. Oh, wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. Aren't you? Never 21? mind. I messed that up. I messed that up. He's my original age, but was originally a year below me growing up. My bad, my bad, my bad. Mm. And the reason uh, Michael Jordan got relegated to JV was because he was betting on a bunch of games in high school. And there Bryce you Young was the only person who needed to use a stand to reach the microphone at his Heisman ceremony. So I will give him some credit for that. You guys are too hard on the little guy. Hmm. Uh, you said that, and I just automatically thought of the Charlie Strong, you know, something like <laughs> something like his picture. It's a real picture, not Photoshop. Oh my god, that never gets old, man. It's it's hilarious. But dude, yeah, I don't know. I just it really just chaps my ass the whole like like yeah, Shador Sanders, your dad is one of the I don't know, top 50, 100 NFL players that ever lived. You grew up in freaking prosper. In a multi-million dollar house, yeah, you've you've been the plucky underdog your entire life. No one's ever believed in you. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, and Double D, I've never had a, a mullet. Um, I respect myself, so uh, yeah, evil yeah, kills won't, won't be getting I'm, a, I'm operating at about let's say uh, probably 80, 85 percent today. I had about a something yesterday. I don't know what the hell is going on, but stomach bug. Not even really stoned, but just a lot of just no real nauseous, nauseous room, room spinning, and just felt completely out of it. Oh, see, <laughs> there it does is. This help, does this help you, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I can see I can see how it can fool people because it looks <laughs> looks pretty legit. You know, also Charlie Strong had that build of like. You you could you could have done this to him and just smushed him like six inches and like it would have still looked like a normal human being. <laughs> yeah. So like it, it looks very realistic. <laughs> I mean, the the just the what throw what what gives it away is like the feet and the hands are not proportionate, right? No, no. <laughs> Based on his hand size, his feet should be like triple what they are there. Well, I mean, the finger it's like a, a freaking yardstick for a finger yeah you know? he's got, oh, he's got, man. He's got a lebron james draft suit length pants going on there too in this <laughs> yeah, I never he's just like wearing tj ford's basketball shorts <laughs> charlie strong is just like 510 <laughs> uh, i never knew i could be so jealous of a pointer finger until Tr charlie strong pointed yeah. out towards the crowd while wearing that golden hat after beating ou I'll say this in defense of uh, Terrence Gerard Ford. His shorts that are all his draft pictures are in, like all his rookie basketball cards where he's wearing like shorts that are literally like go to his ankles. He didn't do that on purpose. The Bucks sent him the wrong size shorts. The Bucks sent him like two XL shorts. So he had to wear the insane. Yeah. Yeah, man. TJ wasn't making a fashion statement. Blame the Milwaukee Bucks. God, they, I mean, they, they couldn't wait to take the pictures. Like if I'm TJ, I'm just like, I'm not doing this. I look like an idiot. Well, it makes it makes TJ look like he's about 5'6". Right. You know, TJ's 5'11". Yeah, he's, yeah. he's not a short guy. Looks like he's wearing basketball jinkos in that picture. Wow. Throwing it back, Trey. Trey, you owned a pair of jinkos at one point, didn't you? No, no. That was really? just... I was right on the edge of that, but the this big uh, group of douchebag white guys started a gang and called themselves the Jinkos. And they all were <laughs> going to be shocked by this Jinkos, and so that discouraged me from uh, from wanting to wear Jinkos the last year or two that I was in high school. I had Jinkos, just the uh, nothing, nothing ex extravagant, just straight up. They were just kind of normal size, as normal. As normal size, like chino type pants as Jinkos could be. I didn't do the whole painter jeans where there's like, you know, I could have fit a family of five in my pants. I didn't do that. Was a bad bit. Yeah. Every generation has just this hideous fashion that for whatever reason people get on board with. I never, I could never understand yeah. the Jinkos. I was more. Okay. Find a, find a picture, Trey. Why don't you find a picture of like Tim Duncan 2004, 2005? Like Tim Duncan wore like the Jinko painter jeans. That were like, 
I know Tim Duncan's a big guy, and it can be hard to find clothes if you're, you know, seven foot. Uh, something like that. Yeah, that's kind of like what Tim Duncan's jeans look like. Now, this is not Tim Duncan, obviously. That's but not I just, Tim Duncan. But I just did a Google search for Jinkos, and this is. I mean, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. This is more for my own curiosity than for the screen share, but this is uh, the picture that came up when I searched Jinkos. Trey, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Jinkos are like skater pants that like douchebag white kids adopted as a fashion statement at some point. <laughs> yeah, subur- d- douchebag suburban white kids who yeah. were trying really hard to be another ethnic makeup. Yes, those, <laughs> those were the kids that really popularized Jinkos. Hmm. All right, I'm going to go. Uh, this has inspired me to dig a, a pair of Dickies and some Air Force Ones out of the closet. So I'm going to go do that. And uh, Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to lament the fact that jeans don't do boot cut anymore, Jeff. It's all straight. It's all uh, catering to the hipsters now. It's all. Straight. Oh, dude, I I, uh, or super I try to find I try to find like the, the boot cut jeans because I, you know, I don't I like my pants to kind of give me some room in the thighs and some room in the ankles. Exactly. It, it's really hard for me to find those. It's like I'm like. I don't need to, why are you making size, you know, 40 pants and slim fit? Do I look like I need to wear slim fit jeans? No, I, I don't just want, want regular yeah. old pants. I don't want my jeans tapered. I'm not wearing joggers here. I'm wearing fucking jeans guys. Yeah. Yes. Evil kill switch. I did that in high school. Um, there are, my mom has my, you know, how you do your senior portraits where you know, you're leaning on the year that you graduate or whatever. And all that you do all the different poses and whatnot. I have one and I'm not joking. I'll find it. Uh, I'm wearing a FUBU jersey. It's a North Carolina blue jersey. And on the front, it says Dirty South across the front. I'm I'm not making that up. I, w- <laughs> I wish I was. I wish I was, but I'm Can not. Can we get this that. photo? Please. I, I've got I my to, mom. I need my to mom see 18-year-old Jeff. I've looked for it, and I can't find It's not in any stuff I have in my house. So if my mom doesn't have it, then that photo has been lost to history. But I'm pretty sure my mom has that photo. Wearing for us by us brand jersey, huh? And in, in Florence, wow. Texas, USA, America, oh, with my God. with my cheap with my cheap uh, silver chain I bought at the Colleen Mall. Yeah, <laughs> at Claire's or someplace else. Hot topic, maybe. No, you know those those kiosks that sell like the knockoff uh, knockoff platinum jewelry. Yeah, I bought me one of those like Geneva watches that looks really nice, but it's like and your wrist is green after. Yep. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> Oh man, that is awesome. Yeah, we all have some of those photos. I'm sure we're embarrassed about, but that's one we need to see, Jeff. We're all we're all huge douchers at some point in time in our life. Still am. BK, where's the where's that problem? I'm just picturing Joe pulling up to like Texas practice availability in like Coke White Forces, Dickies, and the dirty south football jersey in baby you'd, blue if you'd have seen me circa 2001 and that's that was pretty much it was either gonna be some air force one or some adidas shell toes that would match whatever color shirt i was wearing so that's mm. hey, it happens it happens yeah, yeah, be, yeah. Be, are you regretting hiring me at this point <laughs> i'm just i'm secondhand embarrassed right now that's that's what it comes down to so no regrets. I, I'll regret it if we don't get to see that picture. But if we get to see that yes. picture, then I'll find that one. I'll also find the one where uh tried to uh try to give myself one of my friends made had the idea to kind of put some blonde streaks in my hair, and I did it because I thought it would look cool. And it was a horrible hair dying accident. So yeah, dude, I've I've got the hey, I'm a, I'm 40 years old. I'm not ashamed to admit the dumb stuff I did at this Wait, point. So how 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 did the streaks go? Like straight back? Well, the streaks that ended up having to be a complete like die job. So I had I had I had blonde hair for a decent sized portion of the last semester of my senior year of high oh, school. Oh, you went Dennis Rodman in that uh, Sylvester Stallone movie, huh? Or I'm sorry, Wesley Snipes in that Sylvester Stallone yeah. movie, and then Dennis Rodman copied Wesley Snipes. It looked it was more Jonah Hill in Twenty One Jump Street, but yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> I got On double D, note, just like shit. Looks My like son I got and his friends. Right, looks like I got some pictures to look through when I get off the air here. See if I can find some stuff. <laughs> yes. Anyway, please. take it easy, fellas. Yep. Later. See y'all. Peace. Oh man, awesome. Always enjoy cross talking with the boys from It's Only an Hour. Shout out to Jeff. Shout out to Jordan. They're doing great work here, and of course, over at Horns twenty four seven as well. Now it's time for the award winning midday program. 
And, oh, man, we got to make that like a TSU project, just going back and finding some embarrassing pictures of bad fashion we all had back in the day. Because like Jeff said, I mean, every everybody's got those pictures, right? Like, we're, we're all different ages, so the fashion trends were different for all of us growing up. But every single one of us has a, a couple of pictures where we're wearing shit that we absolutely had no business wearing. Yeah, I think my more embarrassing pictures, because I've always been a pretty conservative dresser, is just having to do with being fatter mm. in junior high and early into high school before I got a grip on it after my grandparents said, hey, we think you're gaining a few too many pounds. You may want to do something about that. So I did. Did you wear tight clothes? Did you wear like extra oversized clothes to try to hide your rolls? Not extra oversized, but they were big enough. Like I was... My waist at the age of 14, 15 was like 36, and it was starting to go towards that 38 territory. God. That's pretty big when you're talking about somebody who's just entering pubescence. I was going to say, yeah, that's uh, that's a lot there, man. Yeah. Good good for you for shedding those LBs. And there's nothing worse than a big – I mean, really any guy, but especially a big person. I feel like they're more common for – doing this where they're just wearing clothes that are too small you just see like the bottom of their gut or if they like reach down for something you uh get way more of a view than you were ever hoping to get it's a bad bit you're not you're not fooling anybody by wearing smaller clothes big guy we we can tell you're big all right it may be one of those things where you don't necessarily realize it either because you've put on weight and you're still trying to wear the clothes that used to actually fit you like they're supposed to yeah. So it's it's a weird deal. You know, it's funny you mentioned the tight clothes if you're uh, on people who are too heavy, too fat, because I do have clothing that I'll put on as a sort of a reality check for me if I need to tighten the diet up or do some different things exercise wise. And if I'm really feeling bad about my, myself, I have two pairs of underwear in the underwear drawer that are borderline too snug if I'm at my ideal playing weight. I put those things on and I'll uh, I'll decide not to eat for a couple of days in a row just to uh, to get back into my own good graces. God, what are you, what's the point of that? That's the whole point, just to send a message to yourself that you need to lose some weight? It's much like with Michael Jordan and thinking about that coach who didn't put him on varsity and so he had to score 48 points per game as a JV. This is my motivation right here. It's a sort of self-hate that inspires me into into action the uh the opponent the uh the bad guy in that scenario unfortunately is me and the poor decisions that i've made over the previous several days to weeks uh that's well done right there motivating factor nobody said you could do it you're just telling yourself that in the mirror every day <laughs> that's right by the way we didn't talk about this pre-show but wells is joining us here in the next 10 minutes or so he actually texted me, thankfully, because otherwise I was going to completely forget about it. But uh, I did email him the link, so he'll be coming up here shortly. One of these days, we'll remember that Justin Wells joins us every single Monday. It's not like a once-a-month thing, too, where it should be difficult or could be difficult for us to figure this out. But, uh, yeah, you know, we talked for like 20 minutes before the show and didn't talk about that once. So, shout-out to Justin. We'll get some spring football with Jay Wells. We might ask him a basketball question. But I'll ask you a basketball question first, Trey. Uh, Texas, of course, they won their round of 64 game on Thursday, but their season came to an end on Saturday night, falling to Tennessee in the round of 32, 62 to 58, the final score. Uh, Texas was down nine at halftime. They trailed by 11, a few different instances, both late in the first and early in the second halves. They came all the way back. They cut the deficit to three a couple of times. They got down to two a couple of times. Hell, at one point, they were only down one in the final minute of that game, but ultimately they just couldn't get the big shot that they needed to get. And they come up short against Tennessee. So a hard fought game, but uh sucks. The Longhorns were right there against a really good team with a sweet 16 berth on the line. And they weren't able to get it done enough down the stretch to find a win over the fake UT. Hate to see Dylan DeSue go out like that offensively and just how inconsistent he's been over these last couple of games. He's a much better player than that. And this Texas basketball team benefited greatly from him being one of the best players in the Big 12 this season. And we said it going into the tournament. This team was going to go as far as Dylan DeSue could carry them. And unfortunately, he stunk for a couple of games. They were able to overcome it against Colorado State because overall it was a good matchup. 
uh, Colorado State, while they had some scrappy guys, they were also on the smaller side, and I felt like it would take a height to probably trip Texas up if they didn't trip themselves up. But in this game against Tennessee, who also wasn't very good offensively, there was uh, some really good defense being played. Max Asmus uh, was having a hard time getting shots up. Boy, talk about a struggle to end a basketball career. His last month left a lot to be desired. And I wish, as the former head of the Tyrese Hunter fan club, that the assertiveness that we saw to him really in the last 10 minutes of the second half of that basketball game is something that we had seen all season long or as many corrected me when I floated that opinion originally on Twitter that we had gotten it for that entire game because that Tyrese Hunter is the sort of guy that is leading his team to weekend two as he did with Iowa State as a true freshman. Yeah, I mean, it felt like Tyrese Hunter was point shaving for like the first 30 to 35 minutes of that game. I mean, he turned it over six times. He had a travel on an inbounds pass. He also wasn't on the same page with Max Acemas on another inbounds pass out of a timeout. Just like bonehead. I mean, forget freshman mistakes. These are like eighth grade mistakes that Tyrese Hunter, a junior in college, was making. And then, yeah, he hit a huge three, had a couple of nice drives to the 10, was super aggressive down the stretch, and was a big part of the Longhorns cutting into that lead. But, yeah, it's just a microcosm of Tyrese Hunter's whole career at Texas. You know, it's Every time you try to buy in, he lets you down. Every time you give up on him, he gives you another reason to buy in. It's just this never-ending cycle of mediocrity from Tyrese Hunter. And he can come back for another year. Buck and I talked about this a little bit. Like, you take him back if he says he wants to come back. Yeah. But, like, I, I don't know if it's in his best interest to come back. Like, is he an NBA player now? No. But for him, like, maybe a change of scenery, whether it's you know, trying the NBA route, probably not getting drafted and either going G League or Europe makes sense, or just maybe hitting the portal and going somewhere else. Because it's it's two years without much progression from Tyrese Hunter. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know where he goes from here. But, God, it's just it's annoying that both of his full seasons in Austin, it feels like we're right at square one with that dude. Does Texas have a true freshman point guard coming in next season that they expect to do a lion's share of ball handling or at least help out with ball handling? Yeah, I mean, I think Trey Johnson could be that guy. I mean, six six, he's technically a two, but at Lake Highlands in his high school career, he handled the rock primarily. So I don't know if he's the truest point guard option out there. Maybe that's a spot where Texas could look to the portal to try to bring somebody – with experience who can actually be a true point guard. But, you know, I don't know if there's any super obvious guy right now. If Tyrese Hunter is going to come back next year, he and Rodney Terry need to sit down and have a conversation on what the best role is for him to unlock him, to have him playing more consistent like he did as a member of the Cyclones. And that involves him being the primary guy. I feel like part of the problem for Tyrese Hunter is the fact that he's almost too accommodating as a teammate. He's willing to chill and do whatever is asked of him. Well, sometimes you need to be the assertive guy, especially as it pertains to that particular position. And we saw that down the stretch on Saturday, but it was too little too late. If he's going to be a member of this team next year, it needs to be in that sort of role versus this passive point guard role where by default he ends up as a shooting guard. And unfortunately for uh, this Texas Longhorns basketball team, Rodney Terry doesn't run the motion that we saw out of Chris Beard's teams the first year plus that Rodney Terry carried over last season. There's way too much of guys standing around and it turning into a two-man game. I would love him to reinstitute some motion principles just to got, see guys moving out there on the offensive end a little bit more. Another guy that I'm curious about, BK, and I want to talk about a dude whose draft stock has plummeted, is Dylan Mitchell. What does he do? This no. off season, like, is he a guy that you want to get back? Absolutely. You got to figure out how to get through to him to have him out there each and every night. This is, we were at nut cutting time this season with him having some NBA money on the line. And he was just uh, much like Tyrese Hunter, just uh, too up and down for the good of this basketball team. He is going to be a veteran on next year's basketball team. If he does come back. So you need to discuss with him what it's going to take to get full buy-in from that guy. I have no interest in Dylan Mitchell coming back. Um, I don't, I, I don't for that, and that's probably where I am right now, too. Yeah, I don't think Texas would turn him away if he decided to come back for another season. But, yeah, one of three, two points in the final game of the year for Dylan Mitchell. I mean, it's just you talk about guys not getting much better. Uh, Dylan Mitchell did have a better year, two than year one, but that guy offensively just is is lost out there. He's just a waste of space, and and like he, no one has to respect Dylan Mitchell on offense. That's a problem. Like he he's made zero threes in two years in Austin. 
So if you're a defense, there's no defensive three seconds or anything. You can just sag off Dylan Mitchell. You don't have to pay any respect to him. He can condense a defense, which makes it even tougher for your guards or your bigs to get buckets by the 10. Like he is a very good defender. He's a very good rebounder. We know that. But offensively, he is a liability out there. And I just like, I don't have interest in that. And I don't have much faith that Dylan Mitchell all of a sudden after not getting significantly better offensively from year one to year two is going to take that step and become a reliable offensive weapon for this team in year three. I just, I don't think he has it. That's not in his game and it sucks because this is a former top 10 recruit in the country, Trey. It's weird because we saw some signs that he was developing offensively at the start of this season. So I'm not sure if it was DeSue coming back into the lineup or him just reverting to old or bad habits or not putting the work in on the off days, but there was a an in-season regression with regards to some baby steps that seemingly had been taken this previous offseason. Um, Rodney Terry's not going to de- deny him if he wants to come back to school, obviously, but again, there needs to be a sort of come-to-Jesus conversation. It's like, look, you need to be fully committed to this basketball team because we need you, because you are going to be an elder statesman on this roster next year. I mean, they're going to have to replace more than half their guys anyhow, and uh, a lot of productivity. So the opportunities will be there. You were a guy that that was looked at as a lottery pick coming out of high school, and now you would be lucky to catch on as an undrafted free agent rookie. Yeah, the NBA still drafts on potential, so that may not happen, but anybody who watches tape of Dylan Mitchell game in and game out would be a damn fool to draft him at the NBA level. Yeah, there's a 0% chance, even with this flawed NBA draft process, that Dylan Mitchell would get drafted this year. 0% chance. So, I don't know. I don't know if coming back another year would help him. Uh, it might be his best bet to just try to get an invite to a summer league team and and hope he can hang around on a G League roster and have the Greg Brown type of deal where he just is a two-way player and is good enough to be on an NBA bench for a few years in the association. But – uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's annoying. You know, Tyrese Hunter and Dylan Mitchell, like you, you knew what you were getting from DeSue, even though Ace Miss wasn't here before this year. You felt like you had a, a pretty consistent scoring option with him. And those guys were great for most of the year. They didn't show up on Saturday, unfortunately. But those two guys delivered way more often than not. The problem is the guys who are supposed to be your three and four just weren't good enough. Yeah. And now, now for Texas, you talk about the future. Yeah, DeSue and Ace Miss are gone. You know, Cunningham and Horton are gone, but those aren't as big of losses as DeSue and Ace Miss. You lose your two best players, your two leading scorers, and you struggled to score, especially down the stretch, right? Texas didn't score 60 in either tournament game. It's a minor miracle that they won one game in the dance without even getting to 60. But yeah, you start to think about what this roster could look like next year. And obviously you got some recruits coming in, you know, RT is going to hit the portal, but a little scary, just wondering what life post to Sue and post Acemas is going to be. Cause on Saturday, you saw how bad your offense can be. If those guys don't show up. Now, your defense was great. That's why you were in the game. But if if those two guys didn't perform offensively, Texas wasn't good this year. And obviously, you're not going to have those guys at all next season. So you mentioned Brock Cunningham. I'm going to say something right now that's probably going to be pretty unpopular with Texas fans. But I am very happy not to have to watch him play basketball for the Longhorns anymore. We got one more of those moments in that game against Tennessee. A stupid, unnecessary play. A dirty play that has come to partially define what Brock Cunningham did here for the Longhorns for six seasons. And I realized that the butterfly effect means that if that hadn't happened, the game wouldn't have worked out exactly like it did. The fact that Tennessee got two free throws right there, made those two free throws, and then made a three-pointer could very well have been a difference in this game in the end. The scenario that Texas was looking at before Acemas took that terrible three-point attempt frustrating because it seemed like halfway through the season he was starting to figure it out and he had worked that out of his game but a a light switch turned on or maybe it's turned off maybe that's a proper way to refer to it with what happened in Lubbock and unfortunately he was uh, a a wildly ineffective player after that including just doing some unnecessary dirty shit at times yeah just couldn't help himself right like it's almost like he just wanted to be a villain or something so he thought it'd be a good idea to get a flagrant one in every game Uh, It sucks. I think a lot of people kind of shifted to your side of that spectrum when it comes to how they feel about Brock Cunningham because it it just happened too much down the stretch. And and when you lose a game by four and there's a five-point possession somewhere in that game, it's easy to harken back and say, well, what would have happened if that never happened? So, 
Yeah, even though it was in the first half, kind of feels like a fitting end of Brock Cunningham's Texas career. But yeah, that was uh, that was disappointing. And uh, yeah, you know, decent decent year for Texas. You go back, look at Chris Beard's year one. He was a six seed. He won a tournament game, lost in round two to a good team. Ronnie Terry, seven seed, won a tournament game, lost in round two to a good team. Uh, obviously, uh, and we'll see what happens with RT. He's coming back. He should come back. Um, but uh, I don't, you know, it's a fine fine season considering all that was lost. Real quick before we get to Justin Wells, who is in the green room, Papa K says, on the Longhorn football program, we criticize coaching for lack of player development. Why is basketball so different? It's a great question. It shouldn't be any different. And I think that uh, just looking up and down the roster right now, you have the example of Dylan DeSue really ve developing into a great player. You don't have a, a ton of other really good examples like that over these last couple of years with Rodney Terry serving initially as an assistant and now the head basketball coach. So that's something yeah. to monitor going forward, as is how he manages the roster this offseason. It felt like there, I don't want to be too harsh here, there was a charity scholarship or two given out this last offseason with guys who had been playing at the college level for a few years but were pretty worthless once they got here to Texas. You can't waste scholarships at this point. You have to make every single spot matter on the roster in this era of college basketball with the number of new guys that are on most rosters each year and how much uh, how much uh, you are having to replace scoring, rebounding, and everything else from guys who are either going pro or maybe going to a completely different school next season too. Big off season for Rodney Terry. There's no doubt. That's part of being a coach nowadays. You're going to lose guys every year, but you got to replace them in high school and in the portal. So we'll see what happens. We'll talk more about that moving forward. We got Justin Wells ready. Quick shout out to AV Consultations, 512-255-8678. If you want the home TV setup of your dreams, you got to call our buddy Tom McKay and the crew at AV Consultations. They will get you hooked up. Baseball season for Major League Baseball starts this week. You got the NHL playoffs, the NBA playoffs coming up. Of course, March Madness still going on. It's a great time to get that TV setup done in the comfort of your own home. Also, some love to Altstadt beer as well, the best beer that you could find all throughout the state of Texas and really anywhere in the universe as well. Uh, pick some up next time you are at the store. It's the official beer of BK. It should be the official beer of you as well. It's all stat beer. No impurities, no regrets. Okay, we go now to the hotline, stream yard line, something line, and bring on our man from InsideTexas.com and the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. The great Justin Wells joins us right now. Jay Wells. What's up, brother? I was waiting for you to say the Vaqueros hotline. Mm. I guess that's not a thing anymore. But, man, mm. I heard that transition so much over the years that that's, that's what I always fall back to. If I hear Vaqueros, I instantly think Trey, Trey and BK doing radio. Yep. Yeah, different different times now, but uh, yeah, same thing. Whenever I hear that restaurant being talked about, I'm like, who are we about to talk to? What's what's going on here? Shoot. Uh, well, we were talking some basketball, J. Wells, before we shift gears and get into some spring football and some Texas football recruiting. Just want to get your thoughts. We know you were locked in on Saturday, Texas, Tennessee. Of course, the uh, Rick Barnes revenge game, if you will. Uh, the Longhorns fought hard. They were in it till the very end, but ultimately they come up short. Just your thoughts on the game and maybe – put a bow on the season as a whole. Yeah, I was, I was, I was backstage for a little while listening to you guys. And I mean, y'all were, y'all were, y'all were really hitting it. Um, I think, you know, I do want to get to the Brock Cunningham stuff at some point. Cause I think Trey made a really, really good point. Um, you know, this is, this is who Texas was. I felt like they were likely going to win. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago. They were probably could win a game. Uh, the second round game, you know, if they made the Sweet 16, that would have been a season success. But, you know, it was iffy facing a two uh, coming into the second round. I liked the game. I thought it was a good game. I, I thought Tennessee played Rick Barnes style defense. Like that's what Rick Barnes wanted. And tech, Tennessee had a lot more athletes, longer athletes than Texas did. But Texas stayed in it. I never felt like they were out of it. But I never felt like they were making a run to, to, to put them over. I kind of felt like they were just treading water to stay close. Mm -hmm. And that happens when you don't have a go-to score. That happens when your primary ball handler leads the team in turnovers. Um, and that happens when, when Brock Cunningham does Brock Cunningham stuff. Um, and then again, if Dylan DeSue, if that shot falls with two minutes left, it's a different game. 
I mean, it was that close. Yep. Um, but I thought it was on par. I thought we saw exactly what we expected to see. You know, Rick Barnes craves that high intensity defense. They did a great job on Dalton Neck, their, their all American guard. I, I thought Ch Weaver, it was the brightest spot of the tournament for me. Like to see that guy's growth over the last, say, three or four months. I mean, I knew he was an excellent on ball defender, and he gave that all American absolute hell. Then he got a shot down. Then he starts sinking some jumpers and a couple three balls. And he became he he was the reason they stayed in the game. Let's be honest, because Amos and and Desu kind of puckered up a little bit, and then we all know what what you know, and we know what Tyrese Hunter did. Tyrese Hunter played great the final three minutes. It was that first thirty seven that was just bad. And so again, I not to not to you know moan the subject, but I just I felt like this was their ceiling. I think Rodney Terry got the most out of a pretty average roster. I felt like. This was the year they missed Ron Holland. Ron Holland was going to be their go-to guy. And this was the year they missed the point guard in Johnson. I think Johnson would have been a guy that would have had a lot of snaps and would have allowed snaps and football minds. <laughs> and it would have allowed Tyrese to play off ball. It would have allowed a lot of different guys to, to, to not have so much of a responsibility for that, you know, for that being or whatever at that time. Um, you know, that's Texas basketball. They made it that far. They probably won't finish ranked, which that's part of it. Um, but give Rodney Terry credit. The guy's five and two in the tournament at Texas. And and I think this roster is going to look a lot different next year. For what? I have no idea. But that's bad. That's college basketball these days. The portal, the portal affects football. The portal changes basketball. You go from a top 10 to a not ranked and, and vice versa. And so Give Rodney Terry credit. I think they got the most out of those guys. It was a good game. It was close. Both of them couldn't buy a bucket, it felt like, for 10 minutes at a time. But that's kind of what Texas was, and that's kind of what Rick Barnes' teams often resemble. And so, again, I think this was exactly what we thought it was going to be. So we're all in agreement that we're excited about Kendall Weaver and what things may look like for him with this basketball program next year. Justin, there are a couple of other guys who are multi-year starters on this team who theoretically can and will be back for Texas Hoops in 24-25. Do you want Tyrese Hunter and Dylan Mitchell back, though? Dylan Mitchell? Yes. Yes. Dylan Mitchell's still young. What is he, 19, 20? And has more athletic upside than anybody in the program. He just needs he just needs to play. He just needs ball. He needs training. He needs coaching. He just Dylan Mitchell. I have no problem with. I think Dylan's got a ton of upside. Well, I think, got, I think with Dylan Mitchell, he needs to learn how to be focused, and the coaches can help him so much with that. But you need to figure out how to get through to him to where he's not absentee for a couple of games, and then he shows back up and reminds you why he was once a top NBA prospect. That, that That's it. That's it. And, and Mitchell's coachable. That's that's what I like about Dylan. He's a really good kid. He's coachable. He's not ready for the NBA. He would be perfect for another season in college ball with some offseason, uh, working on his offensive game. He's got some of that flash. We've seen it. With Tyrese Hunter, I don't have a problem with Hunter as long as he's not the primary ball handler. And you think, well, he's a point guard. Well, I don't know if I'd call him a point guard. I'd call him the guy that brings the ball down. There's a big difference. And so with Tyrese, as long as he's not the starter, if you could convince Tyrese to come off the bench and give you 12 to 15 minutes a game, he's got a little bit of that. His dribble drive is as good as anybody in the program. He just didn't do it that much because there's not a lot of people. It, it just wasn't a lot of opportunities there. And he, and he was inconsistent. So I'm not a fan of some of these guys coming back. But Dylan Mitchell, I think, has a ton of upside. Weaver's got a ton of upside. Cam Ridley's going to come in and be and look good. Cam, uh, Cam Scott's going to come in and look good. Uh, Johnson's going to come in and look good. Um, it's going to be a different team. Let's we'll see what Rodney Terry can do next season. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the follow-up question. And look, Rodney Terry's going to come back, but it still feels like there's a large percentage of this fan base that is not sold on him. I mean, where, where are you at with RT? You said you feel like he did a pretty good job with this roster, all things considered, in his first full season as the head coach with Texas, but you still you, you feel like he's the right guy for this program moving forward? You know, I, I do. And I, and I guarantee you Texas fans are going to disagree. But you know what's funny? I, you know, every coach at some point at Texas, winning, the fans love you. Losing, the fans hate you. It's like that in all sports. I feel like against Rodney Terry, it's almost personal. 
I feel like against Rodney Terry, it's almost too knee jerk because spend 10 minutes talking to that guy. Tell me you don't love him. Tell me you don't want your kids playing for him. Tell him you wouldn't trust your kids living in Austin for three or four years under his tutelage. Now, does he have some in-game stuff he needs to twerk? Yeah, definitely. But I'm, I'm okay with Rodney Terry. As long as he's going to recruit at a high level, a pretty, pretty high level. As long as he keeps doing that and bringing in NBA-type guys, which that's what Barnes made his name on. That's what Beard had kind of started started to do uh, with, it, with in addition to the portal. Um I'm okay with Roddy Terry because I think fans are just too knee jerk with him. You know, Texas had a run in the Big 12 this year on the road. You know how hard it was? Nobody in this conference could win games on the road except for Texas. So I think Terry deserved a little bit of credit on that. Now you, you come up at home with, with, with some stinkers, and you got to refocus some guys. But I, I, I'm not an anti Terry guy. And, and, and you know what's funny? Texas fans weren't, weren't either after the first game against Colorado State. They weren't. Check, check social media. It, you you see <laughs> Gus Fring's po- p- picture from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul posted all over the place because that that was Rodney Terry. You know when they win they they loved him, and so I'm not an anti Terry guy. I think he's I think he's the right guy for this moment. Yeah. Now he's gonna have to put together a better a better roster. He's going to have to do that, and he can't he can't try to fit square pegs into round holes. Like some of these guys, you got to know your limitations on these guys. But I'm pro Terry. I, I think he's a great guy. I think he's a good man. I think he runs a good program. He's gonna need some. He's gonna need a couple five stars to come through this thing to, to keep it real. Because no, one, they're getting, they're getting out of the Big Twelve, so I think that's actually going to be a boost going to the charity scholarships. You can't bring guys aboard who are multi-year players at the college level who can't even give you more than a handful of minutes a night. There were two, at least two examples of that on this year's roster. One of whom was starting games down the stretch, which was bothersome. But uh, yeah, DJ brings this up again. He he asks if how much race is a factor. It's less about race in my opinion. And Jeff Barker and I talked about this on Friday and more about there being a lot of frustration from Texas fans who thought Chris Beard could be the guy to lead you to the promised yeah. land. And some of that probably gets taken out on Rodney Terry as a result. Yeah. Race has nothing to do with it. Yeah. I, 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 I hate that that's even mentioned. This it, basketball. It, yeah. Race has nothing to do with it. It's about wins and losses. It's important when it does get brought up to that level heads can talk about these things to say, no, look, I know that that's a natural place to want to go, but no, that's not the factor here. It's not anywhere close to that. No, no, that's not. It's about wins and losses. It's about green. It's not about black or white. It's about green. Mm. And, 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 and if Terry can get this group to the tournament every year, win a couple games, he'll be just fine. What Texas fans want is another Elite Eight run. Well, that's going to be tough. There were a lot of dudes on that team, and they, they got hot at the right time. And Rodney Terry galvanized the program at a time where everything that happened that year, there was no nobody envisioned they were 10 minutes from a Final Four, not even including people inside that program. Yeah, yeah race is not a factor here. It's about wins and losses. When it comes down to it, that's what Chris Del, Del Conte is going to measure this by. They'll go back to the portal. They'll grab three or four guys they really like. A couple will probably pan out. They got two signees coming in that are probably going to have to play early. Uh, just get a point guard, a real point guard. Get some more shooters. I say this every year I've been on this beat. 15 years, get more shooters. If Rick Barnes did one thing that I absolutely loved, he always had three or four shooters, always. And in the college game, in the NCAA tournament, shooters do it all. Look at Oakland's guard. They had a backup guard, a sixth-year senior, backup off the bench, hit 10 threes in the first game against Kentucky. It's about guard play at the NCAA tournament. And if Tyrese Hunter is turning the ball over six, seven times in a game, Winning is going to be tough. It's about wins and losses. Race has nothing to do with it. Yep. It's well said. Justin Wells. And, and on Brock Cunningham, I want to mention yeah. this before we, we slide into another subject. I love sure. what Trey said when I was uh, backstage. Um, I think he was different after the Texas Tech game. And, you know, you're, you're always going to have a section of guys, that are fans that are going to love him because he bled for the program. It's a, it's a Jordan Whittington type guy, just bled for the program. And I, honestly, I don't know if he has another year of eligibility. <laughs> I, I I have no clue. Like, I'll be – I was asking Joe the other day, is Cunningham coming back? And I think Joe told me something like, well, he's been there six or seven years. I said, and? 
Yeah. Is Cunningham coming back? Like, I don't know. But you made a good point. I was always been a Cunningham guy because I'm a, I'm a hustling kind of guy, a, a glue guy. If, if this was hockey, Cunningham would be the enforcer. I get it. But his get your game has to match the antics. So if you're scoring 10, grabbing about four or five loose ball rebounds, forcing some turnovers on defense, and you get a flagrant one, I'm cool with that. As long as you're playing hard, I'm good with that. If you're not matching the knuckleheadness with stats, you're a detriment. You're, you're hurting the team. So don't give me the hustle spiel because you're actually hurting your program. And you made it. That's a great point. Like, I don't remember him playing better after the tech fiasco. And if he wants to be the bad guy, that's great. I'm, I'm a Cunningham fan. I tweeted something about, oh, look, they're going to overreact to this call. And Texas fans got all upset because I like guys that play hard. I like guys that really they are physical. They play hard. But Brock wasn't the same. And I swear every game we watched the last month, he was getting a technical. He was doing something. You're blowing out teams. Doesn't affect you. You lose by four. And that, five, that, that, that tech turns into a five-point swing. Buddy, you need to check yourself. You need to look in the mirror because you're not being a great teammate. Yeah, it's well said. I mean, a guy like Draymond Green. That guy's going to be a Hall of Fame player in the NBA despite being one of the dirtiest players to ever step did on you, a basketball court. But did you see what Draymond good. Green's kid did? In that in that in little in basket little dribblers last week. Oh uh, no. He plays in the same league with Damanis Sabonis, the big post for the Sacramento Kings. Yeah. Both both their sons play. Sabonis's kid hits a three. Draymond's kid runs over and sucker punches him in the face. Turns into no a fight. way. And you and you just have to think these kids don't have a chance. You come out of you come from Dr- Draymond Green, you don't have a shot. You you don't. <laughs> But you're right. You made a great point. Draymond's going to wind up going to, to – to, he he better not be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, he'll be there. If Break he yourself. wasn't playing with Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, none of us would have ever heard of Draymond Green outside of Flint, Michigan. Like nobody. Now, he was a dude at Michigan State. Yeah. But, yeah, man, Green – I'm not going to go off on a tangent because I cannot stand that guy. I like talk, hearing him talk ball a lot because I think he's smart. I yeah. think he understands the game a lot better than people give him credit for. And then he'll say something that's so off the wall, that's so Skip Bayless-like, and you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. That's that idiot. After back-to-back titles with Kevin Durant, basically ran Durant off, that's that idiot. That's the guy that kicked a player in the Cleveland series in 2016 that Colton State was clearly going to win that title. And by his knuckleheadness, he's the reason LeBron actually won a ring in Cleveland. And that's yeah. that. So your comparison, that's perfect. You know, he, he'll he help you, but he'll hurt you. And if you're hurting your team, you're not a good teammate. And Draymond Green is not a good teammate. Mm-hmm. All right, Jay Wells, let's uh, let's get some football thoughts here from you while we've got you. Spring football. We're into week two of spring practice. I saw Joe put up some uh, spring practice notes earlier today over on InsideTexas.com. You know, a week and change into spring ball. What's what's been a big storyline or a couple of big storylines for you to this point? Yeah, it's it's been early. Got that they've gotten a week through, and they had a practice this morning. Joe Cook, our Joe Cook, was there uh, handling business, doing what Joe Cook does, dominating. That's what he does. <laughs> um, you know, we practiced. We actually got some real good stuff from Saturday's practice. We posted it last night at InsideTexas.com. That's Eric, Nalene, and myself. Um, just a couple things. One, um, I think the the quarterbacks and wide receivers right now, I think, have the advantage in these practices. Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning are throwing darts. And you've got guys running crossing routes at the 15, 20-yard mark, and they're not missing. When you got Bond going one way and you got, you know, DeAndre Moore going the other and Jonte Cook going this way and, and back and forth and back and forth, it's giving the defense hell because Quinn's not missing these guys. And Arch isn't either. Arch is, might be more accurate than Quinn. And so I think those the, the early impression there is quarterbacks and wide receivers are on the right page. You can tell these guys have, have gotten some work in together. You can tell, and it almost it almost makes me it almost pretends that Texas might be more heavily relying on the pass. You lose Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington, and AD Mitchell, and you might get better at receiver. How that happens, I don't know, but that's what it looks like right now. Uh, Trey Wisner, dude, he 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 um, turned some heads on Saturday. Wow. This is a guy, and understand Trey plays with an edge. Trey, Trey is Trey is a tough 
tough kid. Very tough. If the one thing I loved about Trey wasn't so much that his such a good teammate at DeSoto and Waco Connolly when he moved from running back to wide receiver for, for Tiger Ridden to take the job and, and he just turned himself into a really good slot. And it's not that he was a great on special teams last year. I mean, he was a guy that flashed as one of those freshmen on special teams, and that's how you get on the field early. It, it's the on ball defense he had in, in basketball, his intensity. He just, he just plays with an edge. And I think Wisner's a guy everybody talks about, Jaden Blue and C.J. Baxter. You better you better talk about Wisner because he is asserting himself in that conversation right now. Um, I think the O-line is going to be interesting. I think the O-line is going to be interesting. I think it's going to look good no matter what week one against Colorado State. How that right tackle position turns out is going to be the story coming out of spring. They want Cam Williams to take it. When he does or if he does remains to be seen. And so uh, they're, they're, they're not going to go into SEC play with Williams as he is right now. Cam's going to have to get a little bit lighter. He's going to have to get his protections down a little bit better. There's just a, there's some there's some things that need to be worked out, and that's what we that's what spring ball is for. On the defensive side, I think that's the, I think it's going to be a different identity. I think the D line was so the defense was so used to Sweat and Murphy just plugging up the middle of everything and forcing an offense to do a few things that they weren't always comfortable with, those days are gone. And so now I, I, I'm curious to see how this thing's going to play out. I think PK is going to get a little bit more creative because from what I heard Saturday, the edge play is a, is a plus. The speed they have coming off the edge and what was mentioned was Trey Moore, Colin Simmons, Ethan Burke, Colton Bosick, and Justice Finkley. And I think they've got some some real quickness and, and twitch guys on that outside now to get pressure on the quarterback. And if they can do that, you can put the D line will be just fine if they're getting to the quarterback pretty well. And so I think that's a big factor. And then the secondary, I, I think it's really just going to be these guys figuring out what's the best five, because I think they're they're going to be they're going to be able to go too deep. And then the truth is, I think they can go too deep across the board on this roster. That's the first thing we noticed practice last week was the depth. There's just so many guys that can contribute. So many guys that have been in the program for a year now, two years now, that are getting bigger, that are getting stronger, that are getting more effective. Trevor Goolsby uh, at, at, at offensive tackle could, could, could be one of the best on the team in the next two years. He's the backup to Kelvin Banks at left tackle right now, but that's a guy with a ton of upside that, that's flashing. Brandon Baker is probably going to find his way on the field in some sort of fashion. I don't know where, I don't know why or, or when, but he's so athletic. And it, it, him and Daniel Cruz just need to get stronger. And I think those guys are going to be able to contribute. I mean, listen, 17, 18 guys from 2024's class are, are in spring. To me, that's as big a story as anything. It's last year's class that came in early, this year's class that came in early, and then the guys like your David Benda, your Alfred Collins, you know, your Kelvin Banks, come some of your holdovers from the previous for the previous seasons uh, coming into their own. And so a week in, I think Texas is happy with what they got. I think Sark is happy with the effort. I heard it was physical on Saturday. It was the first time they got to pad up. They practice today. They'll practice again on Wednesday. They'll practice again Friday morning, and then they will be – they will let them go. They'll head home for three days for Easter weekend. They'll come back Sunday night ready to rock and roll towards uh, another week of practice. And then that first scrimmage, uh, April 6th on a Saturday. Justin, the depth is a beautiful thing. It is starting to flourish now. What is the shallowest position for this football team on either side of the ball right now? Tight end. And, and you know, last year that would have been an issue. This year, I don't think it is because that, you know, Jatavian Sanders was such a good safety valve for yours. I mean, when, when he was focal, he was good. He had a couple really big games, especially the Alabama game. But ultimately, Sark doesn't necessarily want to throw the tight end a lot. You want to keep the defense honest so you make sure they're a threat. But Gunnar Helm is probably a better blocker than JT was. And then you've got Amari Nyblack who's going to be in the conversation, and, and he should be pretty good as well. He'll have, you know, he'll come along. But I think after that, it falls off. And so I don't know how much of that 12, 13 personnel you're going to see with, 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 with the tight end position now. You know, last year I think they could get away with it. 
Now they still have the jumbo package with, with Malik Ogbo. I mean, he's not playing left, right guard. He's he's playing that jumbo tight end, and he, he slimmed down tremendously, so he looks good doing it. But if I had one spot, I think it's tight end, and that's just being picky. I mean, I like some of the young guys coming in. Will Randall and Spencer Shannon are still unknowns, but they have upside. Jordan Washington, the freshman that's there that enrolled early, already looks the part. I mean, that that was a little bit of a surprise to me. I felt like that was going to take a little bit longer, but that guy's already big and already can move and is already physical. So I think they're, they're going to get something out of him. But the lightest position, in my opinion, is definitely the tight ends. Mm, that's good stuff. Trey, any more for Jay Wells today? I'm good. Jay Wells, we could spend two hours doing this, brother. Always fun. Thank you for joining I us. I thought I was going to get a Shohei Atani question. All right, let's go. I got to tell you something. You guys know me in baseball. Yeah. You know, my son and I, we collect Shohei. This thing, guys, I am hoping that this is uh, this Shohei stuff. That, that's for another time for us to talk. But I, baseball season's right around the corner. And, man, well, some hold of this. On, hold on. What, what is your gut telling you? Is your gut telling you this is going to blow over? Or is there a major issue on our hands that may see him uh, go the Michael Jordan route and try and t- try his hand at professional basketball for a year and a half when it's all said and done? I do think it's going to blow over okay. the same way it did with Jordan. Show the face of the sport. Oh, yeah. Can't, can't have it, won't have it. That interpreter is going to get paid no matter what because he's going to be the fall guy. I don't know if Shohei's involved or if he didn't. I think it'd be naive to know that he didn't know a little bit about it. But, man, baseball just can't, can't see the forest for the trees just when you've got everything lining up, you know. Uh, you know, but but I'll say this: uh, I'm for Pete Rose. Give me give me 200 on the Reds, and I'll feel good all day long. That's awesome. Yeah, 4:45 today. Shohei Otani is going to read a statement. He will reportedly not field questions from the media. He's just got a prepared statement that he's going to read that uh, hopefully will help answer some questions about his sorry his interpreter's gambling problem. Make sure I get that right. We'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. That, that's, I'm going to be waiting on that because my son and I have a small treasure of his graded rookie cards. Mm. If something happens with that, that's going to sour the crap out of him. We've had so much fun watching him. He's one of the best. He's the, probably yeah. the best baseball player I've ever put my eyes on. Yeah, and so I pre- I, it's, I, it's so it's so it's so much fun. Baseball is about to start up. You guys know I'm a big baseball guy. I'm a huge yeah. Texas Rangers fan. Obviously, sporting the the Astros hat today, but. My son plays for the Space City Astros in Canton. That's our uniforms this year. And so I'm just I'm just ready for baseball and the Shohei stuff. I love that you talk. I didn't know he had a statement coming. Yeah. It's going to be interesting how he reads it, since considering he doesn't speak a lick of English. Um, but maybe he's got a new interpreter now. And if he does, if the interpreter understands the term money line. I'm glad you clarified while you're wearing that Astros hat as a Rangers fan. I feel much better about that now. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, you know me too. I collect baseball hats. It's true. I love baseball hats. That's I've always always have. But my son, and, and we've won our ship now, so you can be you can be more at ease with wearing. I can, the I can. Hat. And when Alexander approached us last year about, hey, can we try the space the City Connect uniforms from the Astros, the Space City ones? We thought there's no way that distributors going to be able to do that for the little league stuff. They they've got all this other stuff. They had everything ready, so we're going to look like Space City Astros while we're rooting for the Texas Rangers. You go in the, the blue tops and the blue pants. We are. We're nice. going navy blue on navy blue with orange stirrups. The, those 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 socks are going to be nice and orange. And I told the other coach it's going to be kind of warm <laughs> in May and June in these things. Yeah. The key is the kids love them. They're happy. And man, that's all that matters. They're seven eight years old. That's all that matters. Right. So Space City Astros for the next three months. Justin, tell me if this is the case uh, in your youth league. The uh, the post game snack bag has gotten out of control. It's like a birthday party every weekend for these kids with this brown bag filled with crap and toys. Yeah, you know what's funny? We don't do that. We don't have Boy, a post game snack your league then because I'm over it. We don't have a post, and you know what? I can't recall any other teams, and I'm not saying they don't, but I I don't see a lot of that. I really don't. We don't. We don't do that. We, you know, we have drinks for them in the in the in the dugout. And the biggest thing for us is throw your bottles away when you're done. We leave the dugout the way we found it. That's that's our rule. Um, but we just we don't we don't have a snack now. When we were in All Stars last year, we did. There was a lady that always brought orange slices, 
juice boxes, uh, bananas uh, for, for potassium, you know, different things like that. She was tremendous. She was awesome. There's no grab bags in this bunch, though. We, you know, they asked us, well, you want that warm up boom box for the warm up music? And it's like, no, no, we don't. We're hmm. here to play baseball. I, I want I want my son to get better and to have fun and to fight like hell. And so we're we're anti warm up music. We're anti post game orange slices. Um, yeah, kids kids don't need every sense overstimulated at all times. Like this is a bad habit we have a, we as adults have passed into. They're actually okay. They're better off with not having that overstimulation happening at every waking second of every hour of every day. What's funny for me is whenever I played baseball as, at, at his age, the the biggest thing for us was ice cream. After the game, yeah. if you won or lost, you still got to go get that cone from Dairy Queen or a choc chocolate milkshake from McDonald's. Sure. That was kind of your hey, you played hard. It's it's hot, you know. Go get you a treat, kind of deal. We don't we don't do the the grab bag stuff post game. We we really don't. And it, we we got too many people doing too many things. We have so many players that they have brothers and sisters that are also playing and doing other sports, and so. We, we, I'm lucky. I'm lucky we don't have to assign team moms. Now, we did soccer two years ago, and we had, like, assignments of what to bring and when to bring it. And I remember my ex thinking, you know, this is like a job. And I'm like, you got to spend some money on this stuff. Yeah. It is obviously to benefit the kids. But in baseball, I have not seen that in Canton yet, and I'm I'm happy. I'm not saying it's not there, but we, we don't roll like that. Mm -hmm. that's awesome great stuff there jay wells always enjoy it and uh, we look forward to talking next week my friend be good hey man always enjoy seeing you two guys nothing but love likewise amen. my friends hey man y'all be sure to follow justin on twitter at uh, justin wells 2424 and check out insidetexas.com and the inside texas football youtube channel as well all right it's right at one o'clock so probably don't have time for where are we at in society uh, let, let's do it real quick. I'm going to give some love real quick to Pest Wranglers, which amongst other things is the sponsor of where are we at and Pest Wranglers has been taking care of those pest problems going all the way back to 2006 here in central Texas. And now is a great time to get in touch with them because mosquito season is on the horizon. That's right. As the temperatures warm up, the mosquitoes are soon to follow and Pest Wranglers offers an eco-friendly treatment that doesn't target bees or butterflies and is non-toxic to birds and mammals. That includes your dog sniffing around the backyard. It's effective for up to a month in killing mosquitoes that transmit all sorts of deadly diseases. Sorry, I had a cough there. Uh, it's field validated with a ton of scientific research and has been used in Africa for malaria control. That's how good this stuff is. They also do more of a conventional mist treatment for a faster knockdown. Say you have a backyard party happening in the next weekend or two. Come, they'll come over. They'll do that treatment. It's effective for up to 21 days. In either case, non odorous that means no stink from the treatment and because they're big believers in their customer service you don't have to worry about signing a contract go to pestwranglers.com to find out more info and to get yourself on the schedule with pest wranglers pest wranglers pest wranglers did you want to drop oh yeah yeah <laughs> where are we at in society today didn't set it up very well there. We we just have a uh, Twitter video that I need to show you. We can bring Zay in for this if we want as well. He's uh, okay. okay and ready to go. Because this video is quite unsettling to say the least. What's up, Zay? How we doing? What up, fellas? Nada. Good to see you. All right. So this is from uh, a Texas beach, I guess, within the last few weeks. And the Dallas, Texas TV on X is sharing it. It's a great site for uh, all sorts of degeneracy videos. This is in Sabine Pass, Texas, guys, and that is a giant alligator just hanging out on the beach in Sabine Pass, Texas, chewing on something, perhaps a seagull carcass, or something along those lines. That is a massive alligator on a beach that looks decent enough in normal conditions for people to be hanging out on. Are, our, are our beaches getting invaded by alligators from Louisiana. What is going on here? That was not okay. <clears throat> could be possible. Um, also could be possible that the location on that post was made up. Uh, sometimes that I'll, I'll take a video of the beach in Galveston and then I'll tag like Lake Austin as uh, my location. Just okay. to mess with, just to mess with people. 
All right. So there's a chance that was going on, but uh, I've. I think I've encountered Pass is south of Beaumont, by the way. So that does yeah. make it more feasible that it is so close to the bayous of Louisiana. I've I've encountered a gator in Galveston before. Not on the beach, but Bayside near the canals. I've seen a gator or two there. Oof. So expecting or seeing one on the beach doesn't seem that far fetched. It's kind of terrifying. Uh, and it might dissuade some folk from considering their next trip. But I don't think, you know, I, I think there's a chance that that's definitely true. And I, my guess is that's not the only gator that's on a Texas beach at this moment in time, as scary as that might sound. All right. Well, looks like I will be going to less Texas beaches going forward. It was already <laughs> a number, and that number is going to be even lower now. I was gonna say, when's Yo, that was a pretty beach? hefty gator. That's like the DJ Burns of gators, man. That's that's like the Audi Crooks of Gators, man. See, I knew someone was gonna go with mm. that. Come on. Hey, the great Shaquille O'Meal playing center for Iowa State yesterday. Big game oh, for them. She's so good, man. She fouled old Cameron Brink out. I was hoping that they would have upset Stanford because I think that's a very tough matchup for the Horns if they meet in the Elite Eight, but too much Stanford. Vanderveer. Mm. Best Bob in the business, fellas. Best Bob in the business. Yeah, you know the Bob haircut. <laughs> that <white> women wear <laughs> a little short. Sandra Bullock, speed. Elite Bob, Mount Rushmore mm. of Bobs, right there. I didn't. I didn't know Tara that was called the Bob. She's up there. I didn't know that was called the Bob. Like I know Tara Vanderveer is one of the greatest women's basketball coaches ever. And she's been there forever, and I know what she looks like. I just didn't know that was the the term for that chili bowl esque haircut she's rocking. <laughs> hey, not many women can pull it off. It's a bold look. It's a bold look. Can, can she can she pull it off? Oh yeah, she's been doing it for like forty years now. Well, a lot of people have been trying certain things for a long time. Doesn't mean they can pull it off. You know that. Hey. Yo, don't sleep on Tara now. I don't know. Tara, you know she can work that thing in the bedroom. I want to put a pastor. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that, but I. I guess I also wouldn't put it past her. <laughs> you can just tell the way that she gets her players to play. She was the coach on that '96 Olympic team that was big part of getting the WNBA started, which I know a lot of people. We'll probably hate her for that, but look, she's a pioneer. Pull up the greatest. Picture. So, so Trey and Chip can see. <laughs> that. What do you think, Trey? Can why, she? Why, why this picture? That's the first one I Google imaged her, and this is the one. That's I, a I, great I... before picture. Now we need an after picture. Come on, man! Give me like Tara. Better or worse? Are we sure that isn't the after picture? Uh, I need her in the nineties, man, when she didn't need the bifocals. Okay, here, here's, so. here's a more recent one, I think. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> All right then. Yo, Trip, she looks like you, bro. <laughs> that is the meanest thing you've ever said. <laughs> I'm about to walk off. Like I had all these nice things to say to Zay today. Oh, and I'm sorry. And that's how I was wrong. You've been gone for a long time. I've been salty. You've been gone for a while. You've been vacation. I had to get at least one jab there since you're back. Mm. That's not really a jab though. Again, Tara. Hey, Fox. She's a fox. Come on now. Disrespectful to foxes. Is wrong with you. That's <laughs> terrible. Oh, Tara my goodness. Vanderveer. So, are you saying Chip is a fox? Yeah, exactly. All right. Hey, easy there, gumbo bros. Hey, Let's... hey, 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 hey. I am comfortable with my sexuality. Ain't nothing wrong with me shouting out my fellow friend saying that he's a handsome man. Have a lovely Good. wife. Chip, we got a little bit of rue for you if you would like. No, we don't. <laughs> you know? Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Look at that one on the left. 
Okay, so that's, this is the after picture. Yeah, there we go. That is that the thumb. after picture. Look at that thumb. Come on, man. Where do you want that thumb, Zay? What, what, hey. what is her name again? <laughs> we, even though we're unfiltered, Chip and I is still a family show. <laughs> uh, you pointed out the thumb. I was curious what you were insinuating with that. Tara Vanderveer, Trey, is the name of this oh, my God. woman. Stanford's basketball coach. She's a who, legend. Who was who was the dude on the left? Was that her brother Tom? <laughs> oh no! Oh god! All right, we gotta go. You're welcome for this one, fellas. Oh, yeah. Appreciate you guys. Have a great show, guys. Oh, hey, in the mortal words of Judy Brown, happiness is a choice. We're happy you're spending some time with us, Chip and Zay, holding it down midday right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. We got tons to overreact to on a Monday. I mean, NCAA tournament thoughts, men's and women's. Spring football practice number four happened today. We have uh, we had a chance to catch up with Steve Sarkeesian, who had a busy weekend himself including his coach's clinic featuring L.A. Rams coach Sean McVay. That's a nice little uh, coach's bad. clinic for near, nearly 300 high school coaches who uh, descended on Austin to hear Sean McVay impart some wisdom. Zay, how you doing, my man? I'm good, man. I'm good. Obviously, Texas basketball game hurt your boy a little bit. Men's basketball, Saturday. Thanks goodness the women took care of business on their way to Portland to have to play against the light version of Audie Crooks. And uh, what's old girl's name? Pell? Peel? I don't know how to pronounce it. We'll figure it out as the week goes on. But, yeah, they got their own test. It's been a good week of basketball, good weekend of basketball. Steve Sarkeesian talked today, listened to that press conference just a while ago. Spring football is popping. How are you, my guy? You know what? I'm doing okay. Um, yeah, how about Kevin Durant rolling in for the uh, for the women's game well, okay, yesterday? I feel That's impressive. Very impressive. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was really cool, man. I mean, That's yeah, my kid, man, we know that he's an advocate for marijuana. He looked very blazed yesterday at the game. I feel him. I can't Wait, knock what? him. What do you mean, what? Kevin Durant what has been on multiple interviews talking about how he is very pro marijuana. David Letterman talked to him about it went on his own podcast and stuff, which we know the health benefits that marijuana gives athletes, Ricky Williams being one of the first pioneers. But yeah, KD definitely looked like he ain't lying when he said, I love me some ganja at the game yesterday. Those pictures and videos that are floating around. I'm very relaxed, Kevin Durant. I appreciate that because I need you, KD. Time to make a big run. NBA playoffs. Time to do something because I had y'all winning the whole thing. It's not looking too good right now for what I said, but yeah, man. Shout out to KD showing support for his Texas Longhorns. Yeah. Well, let's uh let's and kudos to the uh uh Texas baseball team for winning the uh the weekend series with Baylor and the Texas men's tennis team. Zay, I told you, watch out. Those boys look like they're starting to put it together. They beat uh, number two TCU yesterday. So um, who knows? Texas men's tennis could be a national championship contender. But let's let's start off with um, – we'll get to spring football here in a second, but let's start off with the Texas men's basketball team because it was, um, you know, obviously uh, – a momentous occasion going up against former Texas all-time winningest Texas basketball coach Rick Barnes, who won 402 games while he was the coach at Texas. He's also um, on the ballot now for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. He got his uh, he went on the ballot for the first time in December, and 
this looked like it was – I don't know what to make of this game because I don't know if Texas's defense was that good or Tennessee was, you know, Dalton Connect was struggling with his shot, um, Ziggler. But it was a one-point game with 34 seconds left, say, and uh, Texas did not get the look they wanted. Down three, Max Aismas takes a Kawhi Leonard circa Toronto Raptors uh, world championship season. Three ball from the corner. It doesn't land like Kawhi Leonard's did. Um, and that was kind of it. They probably could have, would have, should have gone for a two there. But it was a one-point game with 34 seconds left. And in spite of all hell breaking loose, Tyrese Hunter, six turnovers, three of them on inbounds passes. I mean, this game was hard to watch, Zay, didn't you think? Yeah, the fact that Texas was even in it was incredible. And, yeah, I gave this season a 5 out of 10. I mean, it was all right. You go from a lead eight team in 2023, and this team had a lot of talent here in 2024. And to be that seventh seed in the Big 12, get that seventh spot, and then end up as a seventh seed in the tournament, you know, at Kendall Weaver, that was a hit. Max Aismith, that was a hit. Zirik Oyema, eh. IT Horton, eh. Like, you got to go back to the drawing board. If you see the teams that are having success, Chip, in the tournament right now, they're big guards, big wings that can take their man one-on-one, and they're not phased. Like, as good as Max Aismith was, he was completely phased by that shot in the corner. You know, it's hard to win when you've got two guards that are both sitting six foot. And RT, he tried to mix and match. I thought he made some really good adjustments going to that weird 2-3 matchup zone, 1-3-1 matchup zone. I don't know what the hell it was. It was confusing, and you could tell Tennessee was confused by it for a while. He had Dylan Mitchell in the game a little bit too late for my liking and Kendall Weaver out. It didn't make much sense. Brock Cunningham rolled at the end. Dylan DeSue, Max Aismas, Tyrese Hunter, even with how bad he was playing. And Tyrese Hunter came along the last 10 minutes. He had a couple of really good finishes to get them back in the game and make things interesting. But, dude, like, Dylan Mitchell had a play in clutch time where he was just classic Dylan Mitchell looking around, and his man in that weird zone goes back door for a dunk. Like, the defense was good, Chip. It was. Kendall Weaver's D on Dong Connect, like, he made life rough for him. Zakai Ziegler doesn't want to take 12 shots. If Zakai Ziegler is taking around 8, 9, that's good, cool. But to go 2 for 12, you play good D on him. So, it's just... Four for 18 for Dylan DeSue, that kills you. Because it wasn't like he was getting bad looks. He was getting good shots. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was getting what you wanted for your best player and best scorer on your team. Max Aismith, three for 10. That can't happen. You know, both of those guys only give you seven for 28 total. Your two best players. Yeah, that's a heartbreaking way for them to end it because they played so well all year. Texas wouldn't have been in the round of 32 without him. And I thought Dylan had a lot of good looks. And it it just wasn't falling for him. Max was having to work his ass off to get good looks. I thought Dylan had some good looks and it just wasn't going for him. And he struggled in the, you know, he's, this is where he took off last year. And I think you're hoping, okay, you know, Dylan DeZu to the rescue. And um it it didn't happen, but he what a great season. And I mean, the guy gave everything he had. And it just uh same with Max. I don't know what the hell was going on with Tyrese Hunter. It was the weirdest game I've ever seen where why is he still making the inbounds passes after two turnovers on inbounds passes? It was yeah. weird. That, that shit's unacceptable. That's like, don't, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Yeah, they played hard and all. That's unacceptable. 
It's you're at the D1 level. you got to be able to get the ball in. And a lot of that's on RT. Like have somebody set a screen for those guys or keep having Brock Cunningham to fly up there to receive the ball or your one of your bigs has to receive the ball and then the person that threw it in gets the ball back. They started doing that in the second half. We're in the tournament. Like we're, we're in the tournament. We should know this shit by now. This isn't, you know, we shouldn't have to figure these things out. I get it. Zakai like Ziegler's a dog. I completely understand that. He makes life rough for everybody. Defensive player of the year in the SEC. That makes sense. But Scovey played really good D on Max Aceman. As you mentioned, Aceman was working hard for everything that he got. And I and they said and I said on Friday, you weren't on. I told Buck how they were gonna play Dylan Dessou. They were not gonna put Adu on him. They were gonna have Adu playing on Brock or playing on uh, Dylan Mitchell and have him help and just stay in the paint while Jordan James goes out and makes the Sioux work the whole time. And that's tough because every time the Sioux, he's going to turn on that left shoulder. He's going to do it. That's one thing, Dylan DeSue, I wish he would have developed a right shoulder turnaround game, but that's just not him. He's going to go to that left side, left shoulder, throw up a hook or throw up a turnaround fadeaway. That's it. Rick Barnes knew that. Rick Barnes has been doing this for a long time. He knew that. So Dylan DeSue, every time he got the ball and was forcing it towards the middle when he was turning towards his left shoulder, they were there waiting for him. And Texas, the fact that Kendall Weaver even hit a three, which, man, that dude, he's just, I hope, you know, he might flirt with NIL somewhere else, transfer portal, but he seems like an RT guy. He seems like a Texas guy, stay close to home. Like that guy, he's just tough as hell. Like, he had another gully, just gully performance against Tennessee and matched their physicality, especially against Connect. But Connect hit some big-time shots and clutch. Like, that tip dunk, Chip, that that was the game right there. Like, you, right when he had that tip dunk, it's him struggling all night, and that's what separates good and great players. Like, he's struggling all night. Okay, how can I make an impact? I'm going to get my team – energized by having a nasty tip dunk. He was dunking on people all night. Like all his buckets were basically dunks and he hit that three in the corner where Kendall Weaver's right in his grill. Like you couldn't play much better D than that without fouling than Kendall Weaver being right there. And he just rolls over the top, which that was one thing I was a little concerned about his height differential against the best defender on Texas, Kendall Weaver. He has him by four inches. And once he elevates like he did, like thank goodness he only had 18. Like, I was a grimy 18 that he definitely worked for. Welcome to the tournament. But, man, Tennessee, they're a solid ball club. Texas, they had them. But, yeah, those turnovers by Tyrese Hunter, unacceptable. That can never happen. At this level, that can never happen. Like, one, there were two turnovers where he was trying to throw it in. And then the one where he traveled, where, again, Tyrese Hunter, the ball didn't go in. That's the only time you could run baseline. If the ball goes in, you can run the baseline. If the ball goes in and they call the timeout, you could run the baseline. If it's just a dead ball where it goes out of bounds and now it's yours, you have to be stationary. You're a point guard, bro. You're a point guard. Come on, man. That that's that's the thing. Tyrese Hunter was way too inconsistent this year. Like yeah. that game was as telling as his season was all year long. But when he was bad, he was really bad. But when he was good, like the last 10 minutes, he was really good. That's what we saw all season long. That's what he's gonna have to change is his consistency. He has to be more consistent. And those six turnovers, you could argue that being the game. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was maddening. And then, like you said, he's attacking the basket in the final 10 minutes. I mean, he where where was that? That was a couple of those finishes were Derek Rose-esque. Yeah. That he was jump stopping like six feet, clearing space, jump stopping, finishing with the left. He had one where he went baseline and jump stopped and did a reverse. He had one off the break where he like jumped from the free throw line, it looked like, and he went off the wrong leg, but he still laid it up with the right. It's like, dude, you have so much talent. You have so much potential, but I I think psychologically he knew because the guy Ziggler got him a year ago. Remember that when the horns went up to Knoxville, Tyrese Hunter didn't play the yeah. best there. So Kai Ziegler is one of those dudes that straight from New York, New York point guard, tough, rugged. He will get in your head. And I think he just had Tyrese Hunter's number until that last 10 minutes where Tyrese just said, you know what? F it. I can't play any worse. 
Might as well just attack and see what happens. But yeah, that's we've talked about we've talked about the fact that you know Hunter may only be six one or whatever, but he's broad in the shoulders. He can go in, drive against bigger guys, draw contact, still get shots up, and that's that's his. It should be his bread and butter. Yeah, you know when the shots not falling, and he had three over over shooting games this year. Marquette, um, Iowa State, Kansas State. Like it can't it can't be that feast or famine, you know. And yeah. you look at a guy like Kendall Weaver who just brought so much energy to the game. It bothered me again that he didn't start. Mercifully, it Horton didn't play a minute in the second half, but. Um, you know, Kendall Weaver ends up being what your leading scorer or tied for your leading scorer. And the guy just scra- scrapes and scratches and claws. And, you know, I, I, I have use for Kendall Weaver coming back. Yeah. I have use for Caden Shedrick coming back. Yeah. I just don't know if I have use for anyone else coming back because Tyrese Hunter really- included. I mean, I don't know. It, it we know when he's locked in, but when I don't, I I had no feel for him the whole year, right? And that's as a coach. I mean, you you probably have a better feel. You all a coach wants is consistency. He wants to know what he can expect from you night in and night out, so that okay, I got. This guy doing this. I got this guy doing this, 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 this. And if we put it all together, we should be okay. But if one guy is so wildly inconsistent that I have no idea what he's going to give me from night to night, it becomes a distraction to the team, especially when he's getting that many minutes. There were times throughout the year you and I said, you got to sit down Tyrese Hunter if he's making mistakes like this. You had to sit him down. You, I mean, he just kept making the same mistakes over and over again. Then in the second half, okay, there's the Tyrese Hunter that we we expected the whole game. I mean, a, a point, it was a one-point game with 34 seconds left. And you're sitting there watching that lead dwindle, and you're like, oh, my gosh, is Rick Barnes' team starting to get tight? And is this going to – impact things and my god it yeah you know like it's if you've been watching the tournament at Tyrese Hunter's height there's a certain way you have to play like Allen Iverson was an anomaly you know like not not everybody could finish like that that it for Tyrese Hunter you have to change some of the ways when you drive the lane and try to finish using your athleticism is cool, but you got to be craftier than that. I was watching Marquette yesterday, Tyler Kolick. He barely jumps over a Sunday paper when he gets off the ground, but he has these finishes chip where he's lefty. He has the ball out like all the way out here extended to where if you're a six, nine or shot blocker, um, only way you could foul him is if you go through him, he has the ball too far out. And his touch is ridiculous. Yeah, it's you know like a I mean? it's like a weird little sky hook. It's nuts. Like you have to have that in your back. If you no, not everybody's Derrick Rose, another anomaly. You like the D Rose was so athletic and he was in the air so long, but he was such a good finish. Like Tyrese Hunter thinks he has that. He needs more of a float game, like Tony Parker, like I, I just there's certain things that Tyrese Hunter needs in his game for him to be successful so he can be consistent because every team knows what you're about. They know you're going to drive and try to be physical and stuff like that. And again, if you're not Derrick Rose or Allen Iverson, that's not going to work for you, bro. Like it's not. These bigs are too physical. He was on the ground a ton this year. At times it does work. At times it looks great. Like we saw in the last 10 minutes. You know, especially on the fast break. But the fact that, which this is a part of RT's fault, the fact that he was playing off the ball a ton this year, there are a lot of games where he wasn't getting in the rhythm. Like he has to get in the rhythm with the ball in his hands. That's what that's just what it is. 
think you think about Trey Johnson coming in, which everybody thinks he's the savior. I don't want to put that on the kid, but that dude is a guy that's going to be able to play off the ball. He doesn't need to be like a Max Acemus and play on the ball, which again, a part of RT's fault. He should have put Max Acemus off the ball more, especially in this past game. Have Max Acemus coming off screens. Make Vescovi move. Make Zakai Ziegler move and have to dodge screens and get around stuff. But when you put the ball in Max Acemus' hands and all he's doing is coming off ball screens where they could double him, or Zakai Ziegler could just get over easily because he's so small and you know shifty and he's like able to just go through guys' knees and stuff without catching fouls or anything. He's so good at that. He was going around skiing so easily, especially in the tournament where you could be a little bit more physical. Zakai Ziegler's defense is ridiculous. And but RT again, make him go off of off ball screens more. You know, they, they didn't do that enough and then put the ball in Tyrese Hunter's hands at times. Don't have him taking the ball out, but at times get him the ball and see what you could do with Ace Miss and DeSue having a two man game off of a down screen or something. They never did that, man. And they just kept, you know, they had some good plays, but I, I like Tyrese Hunter coming back, but his role needs to change. Like he might be a guy that you bring off the bench. Like that's he'd be a terrific guy off the bench because Kendall Weaver should be a starter from here on out. Yeah, Tyree Thunder would be a really, really good off the bench point guard. And again, look around college basketball right now. You're seeing guys get away with not necessarily having point guards on their team, like point guards the size of Tyrese Hunter. Look at Illinois. They're doing it with Terrence Shannon Jr. and Marcus Domas. The Marcus Domas has one of the most beautiful games I've ever seen. He he's six six, slow as molasses, and he's out here just dribbling guys to their spot, using this hype, go getting into the paint. Okay, nobody's gonna double team me because we got shooters on the outside. I'm just gonna get anywhere I want and get these buckets. Tristan Newton for UConn, big guard, six six. Like the game is changing, man. Like the game is changing. And again, if you have a guard like that, that's that hype. He better be like a Tyler Kolick, and just. So crafty and his finishing ability is so good. He could keep you moving in March Madness to see where you go. But, yeah, teams that get exposed like the Texas Longhorns, it's due to guard play and it's due to a lack of size like we saw all year from this 2024 team. So Chris Bennett, CB, shout out CB, greatest volunteer producer in the history of radio, um, says, should Dylan Mitchell come back? And my contention is, what is he going to focus on? Because I didn't see notable improvement this year. I didn't see a go-to move. I didn't see a counter move. I didn't see him improve dramatically defensively. He talked about wanting to be a great defensive player. He left his feet too much. He doesn't play position defense. He doesn't set up early. He doesn't anticipate. And that stuff is huge. I mean, when you're getting lit up like you did against Baylor um, by the, the kid who hit all the threes, man. Yeah, Jalen Bridges. Point, yeah, Bridges. At some point, you got to dig in, man. You got to say, you know what? This dude is not making another three tonight. If I got to face guard this dude, and that didn't happen because the dude – was six of six from three. And I don't know about Dylan Mitchell. Nice kid, super nice kid. But where was the improvement? Where was the dog? Where was the dog in Dylan Mitchell? I didn't see the dog come out. And that, I don't know. I mean, God, he's got a ton of experience, Zay. He's gotten a ton of minutes. Yeah. But and that's what I'm saying. Like sometimes he'll just lose track of his man. Like he'll be, th- it just thinks too much on the court. There's, it's not as instinctual as he would like, you know, like his basketball IQ isn't where it needs to be. You know, he just had too many different lapses of losing track of his man, or, you know, as you mentioned, just not being able to lock up guys like Jalen Bridges, which again, Jalen Bridges is a tough matchup, but with somebody, the measurements and attributes that Dylan Mitchell brings, it shouldn't be that tough. You should be able to match up with him very well. And he did right, improve. What's the one thing we say about Dylan Mitchell all the time? Athletic, incredibly athletic. 
Like he's got good feet. He should be able to stay in front of people. He should be able to. I mean, I look at Houston play defense last night against AM. They're not taking ball fakes. They're not, they they stick, they play such good positional defense. They anticipate where the man is trying to go. So they're not leaving their feet. It, it's just a different world. Yeah. And yeah, talk talk about basketball IQs. Jamal Shedd, are you effing kidding me? That dude's IQ is ridiculous. Like Tyrese Hunter is a solid player. His IQ doesn't even touch what Jamal Sheds is. Like it, it's it's ridiculous going to that yeah. Houston game and Dylan Mitchell. That's what I'm saying. Like you could be as athletic as anybody out there, but when there's guys that are just as athletic or stronger than you, that IQ better come to the table. It, it better come. And coaching has a lot to do with it. Development has a lot to do with it. Where you came from, your upbringing. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody's wondering, oh, Zay, you'd be talking all this basketball talk. Yeah, because my pops was a head coach. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know a ton. That's why the basketball IQ, pretty good. You know, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but toot, toot. Like it's, it's pretty good. That's why I get to do this. That's why Brad Kellner gave me these opportunities. You know what I'm saying? Like, if your upbringing or where you come from, if you're not getting taught the right things, all that athleticism that you relied on, it's going to get exposed eventually. And for Dylan Mitchell, who I'm looking at NBA draft net right now for the mock draft, they got him at 49th going to Orlando. That's not good. Not good at all. So you talk about what he needs to work on. A jump hook would be nice. Run over the right shoulder. Jump hook. Easy. He should begin four of those a game. Four of those a game. After that, a counter to the jump hook. Oh, they're coming to my right. Okay, let me turn back to my left shoulder and shoot that shot on the baseline. Oh, that's what you should be working on. Like, you should understand, okay, two years in, how are guys playing me? They're giving me the shot. I have to work on it. I have to shoot an outside shot. I have to be at least somewhat a threat. I'm not saying go out and be Steph Curry, Clay Thompson. No, but somewhat a threat. To where Dylan DeSue, who played his last game, which is very depressing because Dylan DeSue, hell of a career at Texas coming from Vanderbilt. But if he's getting doubled, you have to make it easy for him to make a pass to you. It's not easy because Dylan Mitchell, he's right next to Dylan DeSue down right. low. And they just rotate around. And Kendall Weaver, he as good as he was, he has to improve that outside shot, which – you're way more excited about him improving that outside shot because you saw the form. He hit that one against Tennessee. He just needs reps and confidence. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like you, you don't even have to work on anything else, Kendall Weaver. Probably ball handling, cool. But jump shot, that's it. You ain't got to work on your defense. You ain't got to work on, you know, the hustle, the athleticism. You got to work on the best thing that you could possibly work on in the offseason to increase your game. Is that's a shot, the easiest thing to work on, because that's all reps and confidence. So yeah, Dylan Mitchell, man, I'm it's it's frustrating. It is because you see the potential. He had a good move yesterday where he went to the hole and got his own tip in when the horns were coming back and stuff. Like he, he does plays where you're like, okay, there there it is. But then you'll just see him completely lose his man. Like, dude. Basketball one-on-one -on, -one on defense, if I'm on the baseline, don't let anybody get behind me. And every time I go up, I completely have to run back and make sure nobody's behind me. Like, that, that's instinct stuff. you got to protect the goal. And I think just sometimes the game is so fast for him, he'll just lose track of that. And, again, at Mount Verde, when he was a top-five player in the nation, he didn't have to rely on that IQ because he was so much more athletic than everybody and his teammates – they're a national championship team. His teammates were also five and four stars. Yeah. So he, he, you know, he was a role player for that team. He was a really good role player that's been based on potential. And we expect him to be a KD because of the rating and stuff. He's not that. He isn't. But there's yeah. things that he has to get better at. Yeah. Well, and um, Eric Henry, my colleague at Horns 24-7, said that uh, I.T. Horton and Dylan Mitchell were the first guys out of the locker room after the game. Like, you know, the media was waiting to come into the locker room. And as soon as they opened the doors, Mitchell and Horton, like, went out the back door. 
and you know who knows what was going on there but um yeah it's they've got work to do in the portal i know that and you've got you've got kendall weaver coming back um hopefully caden shedrick comes back um because that dude when healthy can give you some some good minutes and on both ends i thought he should have played more down the stretch of this season because you can play Dazu and Shedrick together. And we didn't see enough of that. We didn't. So I think yeah. Ronnie Terry's gonna get a pass for for getting through Colorado State in the first round of the tournament, Texas going to the round of 32 for the third straight year. Um but now he's got to really put players around Trey Johnson. I mean, if Trey Johnson is as good as we think he is, and he's a guy who can light it up um, a la Max Aismas. Now, I'm not saying the guy's going to average 20, but he could. Um, then you got to get some players around Trey Johnson to space the floor. Guys who can set him up for success and and compliment what he does because Purdue they got guys who can shoot it all around Zach Eady that's why they're so hard to defend because the guy's a monster inside and he sees the floor and he kicks it out to the open man and those guys hit shots Texas it was game to game I mean, you knew Dazu was going to take shots. You knew Acemas was going to take shots. Beyond that, you never knew. You knew Kendall Weaver was probably going to go to the rim and draw some fouls, which he did again against Tennessee. And give him credit, he was hitting free throws. He hit a three. Um, But, yeah, Tyrese Hunter, I felt half the time, I had no idea where his mind was this season. And that that's really unfortunate. Because yeah. he he's so tough, he can be so good defensively. He can attack, and we just didn't see it with any level of consistency. So well, well, kind of like you know, going to just a little football reference with Texas football when Tom Herman was here and what he looked at with wide receivers. He wanted those bigger guys. He wanted those six four, six five guys that didn't necessarily have the speed and. You know, Tom Herman might have won every bowl game, but he got fired for a reason. You bring in Steve Sarkeesian, and he looks at wide receivers, and he's thinking about speed. You know what I'm saying? Like Rodney Terry, you're bringing in guys who are around six four, six foot. Yes, Max Aismas is good, but he can't be more than six foot. You know, IT Horton gave you absolutely nothing this season. Absolutely nothing. It was an absolute waste of time bringing him in. Thought he was going to be something. It was absolutely nothing. But even though he was absolutely nothing, he was only six four two. At least give me nothing when you're six eight. So then you can maybe like alter a shot or two on defense or get a steal because you're long or, you know, maybe you could be a mismatch somewhere. But at 6'3", 6'2", that's not going to cut it. You need bigger wings, man. Bigger athletic guys. Bigger posts. More physical posts. Look at what DJ Burns at North Carolina State's doing. You know, Keats out here was about to get fired. He just got his thing extended. His contract extended getting bonuses for making it pass each round because he has a physical big man and he has a good guard and horn. You know what I'm saying? Like Dylan DeSue's a four man. Dylan DeSue ain't no five. He had to play five. He had no choice but to play five due to the personnel. Zerik Oyema, complete bust, man. Complete bust. That was, that's a brutal get. Zerik Oyema means well, but what you thought he was going to give you coming in from UTEP, especially because he got the African name chip, you know how I feel about the Africa brothers. You got to literally go to Africa, Rodney. You got to go to Africa and get them dudes. That Dante dude that Oregon got, African dude, even though they didn't advance against Creighton, that brother was really good in the Pac-12 this year, and they weren't supposed to be anything, but they didn't have nothing else around him besides that Kuznar dude. But anyway, I digress a little bit. That, that's the type of players you need. You can't keep getting these smaller guys. Like right. Max Aismas and Tyrese Hunter playing together clearly didn't work. They're too small. They're a liability defensively together. 
You know, they had the this Hornets team had to make up so much for Max A. Smith being a liability and him being just going at his ass every team. So now you have to overly help. Like Kendall Weaver, he makes up for it because he's so damn athletic and he's so tough. So him at 6'2", he can he can pass for that. Kind of like what you see with Kelvin Sampson's guys at Houston. Like Kendall Weaver, I know Kelvin Sampson would love to have a Kendall Weaver. Oh, my God. You know, like he fits that mold perfectly. So it's just Rodney Terry needs to take a look at what's successful. You just mentioned Purdue. Like they got shooters around Zach Eady. Painter was like, okay, if I'm going to have Eady, I better have some of the best shooters in the nation. They don't have to be the most athletic. They don't have to be the best ball handlers, but they have to be able to shoot that rock because Zach Eady is going to draw so much of the attention down low with doubles and triple teams. He needs somebody to pass it out to and to knock that shot down. He has that. So you, you got to go about it a different way. And even the best coaches are dealing with you know, things changing. Calipari, I know Texas fans been throwing his name around since he got canned. Why would you want that, Texas fans? Like, let, let, why would you want John Calipari, knowing how he coaches and what he looks for and him struggling? Why, why would you want that? You know, that's just, that's a little wild to me, but whatever. It is what it is. It, it's difficult. That's all I'm saying. It, it's difficult. But there's examples around the nation right now on these teams that are having success and playing in the Sweet 16 on how you need to go about structuring your roster. Well, here's the thing. And part of what we heard was, okay, the late decisions of Ron Holland and A.J. Johnson left Texas in a pinch. So they got leftovers from the portal like I.T. Horton and Zurek Onyema. But you, you know – what you need. And here's the thing. What is Rodney Terry recruiting to other than the University of Texas, which is a great product, a great arena, great culture in the athletic program? Like I look at TJ Otzelberger at Iowa State, you know what he's recruiting to. And I don't know what the identity of a Rodney Terry basketball program is yet. So that makes me a little nervous. You got to have a great year in recruiting this year. Right. And you need some guys who have a little bit of like time. You need to bring in some portal guys with a couple of years left. Not just one and dones like, like Ace Miss, because then you're like John Calipari. You're bringing in one and one and dones. You're having to reestablish your culture every single year. And like, I almost feel sorry. I don't feel sorry for Purdue, but you almost like the fact that Matt Painter has been able to hang on to Zach Eady for as long as he's been able to keep him. You, you almost are like, God, surely they're going to do something with this two time national player of the year. Surely they're going to get to the final four. Right. Because look, Painter, He's got an identity. He does a good job recruiting, all that. He's just got to win. And I'm very, very interested to see what Texas lands in the portal and brings to put around Trey Johnson. We had a question, um, I think, from CB saying, does, you know, asking you, Zay, if the G League ignite being shut down, what's that? impact going to be for texas in terms of recruiting yeah i mean i guess it's a another outlet that's been closed down that these guys out of high school could go to a la ron holland but yeah those guys are just going to go to australia now just going to go to europe now you know if they don't want to play college ball you know you get you're going to get seen if you're talented enough you're going to get seen adam silver just a G League Ignite is a little sporadic, and Adam Silver does not like the way the youth is being brought up to the NBA. He doesn't like that these European guys, which he does enjoy the Jokic's of the world and, you know, onto the Kumpo and stuff, but there's a reason why they're just so far ahead of American basketball and a lot of things going back to the fundamentals where, again, Dylan Mitchell, if this guy's on mock drafts, that's kind of the point. You know what I'm saying? Like guys are coming into the league not ready on potential 
and they might be trying to change the rules because of it. Like I've been reading things about getting the defensive three seconds out of there because in Europe they don't have defensive three seconds. And they're talking about all these 70 point games and crazy stat lines and stuff. Hey, we might have to go back to those illegal defensive days, which I don't know if that's it. If that's what you need to do, but Adam Silver is trying to make moves to make it a better game. Like we know football reigns supreme, but basketball has taken a huge dip, a huge dip and just the product and people caring. You know what I'm saying? So there's certain things that you're going to have to alter. And yeah, I think this is one of them getting rid of the G League Ignite. So I definitely think it helps Rodney Terry a little bit, but yeah, like he, Rodney Terry's defense isn't bad. Like he wants to be a defensive minded coach, but you're not getting players that fit that. And if you're starting guys like IT Horton and stuff like that and starting Dylan Mitchell, then okay, what where, where's your mindset at, RT? That's that's why I'm giving the season a five out of ten. Because in some ways they've overachieved because the talent wasn't there at all. Like the, the talent wasn't there. But then it's like, okay, where's the development? RT, are you putting these guys in the best situation possible? You're not doing that by starting IT Horton. Like you, you, you can't, you, you did it in the second half and now you come back. You know, if you do it the right. whole game, if RT, if IT Horton doesn't start, maybe you win that game. Yeah, because I mean, he gave up three layups. He gave, he got blown by three times in the first half. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, what what's what's the logic there? We couldn't figure that out all year. That made no sense. That, that made no sense whatsoever. Hell, I still bring up Steve Sarkeesian going for the Bird Auburn fake field goal against Houston. I remember shit, Chip. You know this. Stuff that makes yeah. no sense to where you question the coach like, what the hell were you thinking? Right. You know what I'm saying? So RT's going to have to change that too. you got to play the best personnel out there that gives you the most success. IT Horton, the whole thing about him was, oh, we're banking on him to hit some shots to give us some offense. He gave you no offense all year. Why would he do it in the tournament? Why would he come around? You're hoping and praying that he does something in the tournament. No, he's not going to do that. Then in the second half, you don't play him at all. You figure it out then. It's too late. Right. It's too late. Right. They, too late. He had wide open looks at three that would have been a nice boost to the team. You have to hit it if you're IT Horton because the ball movement was really good and he was wide open in the corner and he missed it and then he missed another one and you're like what what's going on why is he <laughs> what is he floor? giving you what, what is he you giving doing? you i would have been pouring confidence into kendall weaver because you could tell when he finally started getting minutes he was not confident and then they built his confidence and he got confidence as he played and made plays and saw man i bring energy to the floor i create additional um, you know, exactly. possessions with my, my ability to offensive rebound, get steals and it, just keep building that confidence because look at what he did against Oklahoma state. Look what he did against Tennessee. I mean, look, he's not perfect. He's going to make mistakes. He's, he's still hesitant on the offensive end, but that's going to get better. I would have poured confidence into that guy to get him as far as he could go because his ceiling was so much higher from a plus standpoint compared to IT Horton. But, and I'll, I'll we got to give some credit because we haven't talked about the Colorado state win, you know, Brock Cunningham, his toughness when he kind of levels Joel Scott on that foul. I, I know it was another reputation situation there oh that was dirty that you don't do that this is not a move you could go into his ribs fine that's still pushing it but you see him and you go high you're brock cunningham of course they're gonna call that on you come on but, it's not but, sell it yes he but kendall it. weaver dove on the floor for a loose ball in that kid's face with the he looked like salami from white shadow he had the headband and his face goes mashed into the floor and Weaver was – there was no foul. He went – he tied, He dove for a loose ball. He tied it up and ended up rolling over the kid's face into the into the floor. That was good, tough, physical basketball. And there was some – you know, they kind of took away Colorado State's 
Mojo and um, there was, that was a good defensive game. It was not pretty to watch. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but that was a good gutsy win for Texas. Kind of. No, Rodney Terry can coach defense. He can. Sometimes you just have the personnel that doesn't fit what you do. You have Max Aceves on the court. Like Tyrese Hunter wasn't locked in all the time defensively. Even Kendall Weaver will give up size as good as he is defensively. Dylan DeSue, you know, he's big and stuff, but he's not the quickest guy. So you could see him getting beat off the dribble sometimes. Caden Chetrick, the same thing. And then you got Dylan Mitchell, who some just will get lost, doesn't have the IQ. Brock Cunningham is tough as hell, but doesn't have the athletic. I'm like, he made it work at times to where you're like, man, this team, they really got it figured out. Then the Colorado State game was a prime example as to what you're saying. Like Clifford, he was tough against Virginia. He didn't do nothing. Stevens, he was good all year for them. He was their best player. Tyrese Hunter had him locked down. You know, it was just... Man, when they played a team that was just athletic or had different bigs and stuff, like the Tennessees, you know, like the U of H's, those high quality teams that you see playing in the Sweet 16, like all the teams that Texas lost to this year, basically all advanced UConn, Marquette, Tennessee, you know. They, they've played some really good teams that they lost to, but. Yeah, Rodney Terry, he's going to have to go back to the drawing board. And I, 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 Trey Johnson's going to be a good player, really good player. I think it'd be very difficult to put everything around him his freshman year. That that's that, That'd be tough. If he's built for it, then cool, prove me wrong. But, again, I, I think it'd be very difficult to base your whole offense around that guy coming in as a freshman to the SEC, which is a very underrated basketball conference. Well, and this this is tough. Dylan DeZue in the postseason, uh, three postseason games, 11 of 44 shooting. That's 25%. That's from two point. And then two of 15 uh, from three point range in the loss to K-State in the Big 12 tournament in the win, he was five of 18 against Colorado state, which is not, I mean, none of that was him all year. He was, you know, a 50% two point shooter and a 50% three point shooter. He was so good. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Zay, do you have a thought? Um, um, I, I think he wasn't a hundred percent after that Baylor game where he went out. I think that, he was laboring in a little bit. Like when he fell in the Tennessee game, he didn't even fall weird. He just fell. Yeah. And then and he was that, telling the trainer to push his knee a certain way. Yeah. And it's like, dude, at, at this point, it's just like, man, can we get this through healthy enough just through the game? Like you were yeah. always worried about that every time he fell on the ground. But that Baylor game, if you, pro if you go look at the stats after that game, he just wasn't the same from there on out. Yeah. You know, that, that really set him back. And yeah, that's, you know, I know he probably wouldn't admit that. He would probably say he played bad because he's that type of person. And I love what he said about RT, you know, basically bringing his love back for the game. I think that's very important to what RT brings to this team. I know sometimes we get after him, especially me, but there's a lot of really good things that Rodney Terry does and him being the player's coach that he is, like somebody like Dylan DeSue saying those things, saying those types of things, that means the world. But yeah, Chip, I think after that Baylor game, he just wasn't the same. And I talked about it with Buck when you were out. He – just this offensive push, you know, you, you used to see Dylan the suit before that injury. He was dunking on guys, you know, yeah. where that dunk he had against Emmanuel Miller against TCU and things like that. Like you weren't seeing that as much after Baylor, you weren't seeing him drive as much and be that guy. He was settling more for jumpers and stuff, which Dylan DeSue, he could shoot that shot, but when his inside-out game is working, that's the best Dylan DeSue that you, you would see. So, yeah, tough time to go cold, but 
you know, the other guys have to step up. And some did, and Kendall Weaver, and at times Tyrese Hunter, and some didn't, you know. And that's what happened. Yeah. Your other guys got to step up. Shaka Smart played seven guys yesterday. Seven guys. That's it. You talked about it last week. This is the time you shrink that bench. Shrink it. Only the dudes that are ready. Like, hey. Make them play 40 minutes because it's all or nothing. Colic played 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Kolek. Gave them a double-double. Colic was huge. Oh, he's so good, man. Like, he – he. those are the type of guys that makes me realize why I love the game. Guys like him. Because he's not going to dunk on you. He's not going to do anything crazy. But it's rare that he gets in any – bad situation with the ball in his hands and, and he was coming he was coming off injury yeah and it pisses you off because it's like shaka why couldn't you recruit those guys here what were you looking at you know what i'm saying why why weren't those guys here like matt coleman was cool and all both of those dudes were south paul coleman and colic but he wasn't that at all you know what i'm saying like that dude changes their cam jones Joplin, Igadu Igaduzo, like Shaka has guys, man. Yeah, guys. The like, the job was too big for him. It was too big. Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you don't know exactly how you're gonna conduct your business at Texas, if you don't know exactly who you are, this place will eat you alive. Right. You talk about imposter syndrome. I mean. Shaka had imposter syndrome and he clearly can coach. That's what's so weird. He got down here and he was like, uh, what do we need to do? Like, yeah, you, 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 how do you we don't have backbone. You can't be yeah. listening to all these people. This is your team. This is your system. Yeah, you go rub some people the wrong way. Once you start winning, them people that you rub the wrong way, they gonna come around. But you can't have somebody else influence everything that you've built your whole philosophy on and he's found that back at Marquette like he they got the Packers up there they got the Bucks like Marquette they do their own thing they don't got no football team and all but you're right the moment was way too big for him here in the ATX and I'm glad he's thriving like yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad he's thriving Rick Barnes too like Rick Barnes I like you didn't get one of those Dalton Connects for a long time. Like, after KD and them left, those Dalton Connects, like, bring that in. Well, <laughs> and how big was it that that Awaka picked up his third foul in the first half? Yeah, he was good. Because he was destroying them. He played six minutes, and he had eight points and, like, five rebounds He's so in physical. six minutes. He's so physical. And he picked up his third foul and went out after playing only six minutes in the first half and that allowed Texas to kind of hang around. But yeah, that dude, uh, rt has got to find, he's got to find guys like that. That exactly. A walk of six, eight, six, eight in plays what? like he's, it's 16. a monster. He's a monster. Like those guys are around. No, they don't have to be the four or five stars, but if they're physical and they get, this basketball IQ and fit your system and play hard. You develop those dudes, man. That's what that's what Scott Drew has done at Baylor. Yeah, he found those long dudes that were three stars, but were going to have a chip on their shoulder, play really hard. And then he, you know, obviously had really good success recruiting guards, but he developed them, man. He brought them in and saw the raw athletic ability and said, I can develop that dude into what I need. And, and he has, yeah. and that's what, that's what Texas is going to have to do. They can't get, you know, seduced into, we got to have this five-star and we got to have this guy and we got to have the best guy in the portal. No, go find the guys that you like that are going to come here and be developed. I mean, that's what, that's what Otzelberger did with Tyrese Hunter, and the kid was on the all-defensive team as a freshman. Yeah. I mean, Brad Brownwell, who Clemson's head coach, who beat Baylor yesterday, 
the guys that he has, those big white dudes, they're so skilled. That Shefflin dude, get a guy like that. Yeah. That dude, another guy that can't jump over a Sunday paper. But he's out here making no look passes, finishing, tough, physical. Like, I, I'm just – the fact that Dylan DeSue played out of position this year says a lot. Like, everybody thinks just because he's big, he's a center. He's not a center. He's a power forward. He should have been on the perimeter a, a lot more than what you had him at. Just because you need that burly guy down low. Like, again – all these teams, they're advancing with that. It might be the best player in the Zach Eady, or it might be a Donovan Klingon for UConn, who had eight blocks yesterday. Seven three, eight blocks. Like or Hulk Brenner at, at Creighton. Yeah, Cole Brenner at Creighton. Like there's bigs everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Like that are actual sinners. That might be able to step out a little bit, but they're actual sinners. Like Caden Shedrick. See, that's – Caden Shedrick, you need him. Like, I think just him yeah. being injured all year, that was a big problem. But, yeah, like that Caden Shedrick is a solid backup center. Yeah. If he's starting for you next year, that's not good. I'm sorry. Well, that ain't good. Before, before we move on, Max A. Smith, his last two games as a Longhorn, 8 of 25. That's 32%, and 6 of 22 from 3, that's 27%. So, look, a better shooting night from him or Dazu, and that outcome might have might have been different. It just – it's unfortunate that it went down the way it did, but Tennessee is a really good defensive team. Those guys obviously felt pressure whenever they had a, a, a chance to shoot, and – Kind of like we saw against Iowa State. Iowa State sped Texas up. It was kind of amazing that Dazu got it going against Iowa State in the second half of that game when they played in Austin and got them within five after trailing by 14. Um, but it it wasn't there. I mean, it was. I, I say that. I just read you those shooting statistics they're terrible for Dazu and Asmus and yet it was a one point game with 34 seconds left so um they they had to do it in other ways and defensively they were they were pretty good so um but uh Zay let's get to some spring football let's get it because uh day four of spring football practice number four I should say should say happened today it was inside the stadium we got a chance to get a little look see and, um, you know, it, it's always interesting to hear Steve Sarkeesian because I do I do think he's pretty transparent. I don't think he, um, you know, is guilty of as much coach speak as other coaches. Yo, yo Chip, man, we're the thermostat. We ain't no the thermometer. The analogies, he hitting us again. He hitting us with him again. That's my shit. You know, that's and, my uh, shit. We need thermostats. thermostats. Thermostats set the temperature. Thermometers just read you the temperature. And yeah, he was saying, he said he told the team, I don't think he liked practice today, quite honestly. I think oh, they yeah. they practiced in pads on Saturday. It sounded like it was physical practice and a good practice. And then they came back on Monday and it wasn't as good. And that's, so Sarkeesian said after the practice, he was talking to him about, I need more thermostats. Thermostats set the temperature. And he talked about some of the guys who were being thermostats, like Alfred Collins, Baron Sorrell. Where's our man, Barry Sorrell, today? Barry, you listening? Because your, your man, Baron, uh, got uh, a thermostat. That's kind of like when Zay and I give out some Olipops, you know? Our, our Olipops are like getting some thermostat awards. Uh, uh, We're we gonna be saying that all year, man. I oh, love yeah. it. We go. <laughs> oh, a thermostat. oh yeah, thermostats, man. Set that temperature, man. Alfred Collins, Baron Sorrell, Ethan Burke, Trey Moore, Andrew oh. Makuba. Yeah, I like what he said about Trey Moore and Makuba today. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, I could probably get some bootleg audio on that for you. Yeah, man, because that's a big question mark. 
the defensive line. We'll continue to talk about it all year long, but Kenny Baker, you got a big job on your hands taking over for Bo Davis. So are you going to get these guys right? Pete Kwiatkowski, you're going to get these guys right. Yeah, Trevondre Sweat and Byron Murphy are gone to the NFL. They deserve to go to the NFL. What's that mean? Who going to step up? Who going to be that thermostat guy? Trey Moore, this ain't UTSA, bro. This the SEC. All right, well, that was a perfect lead-in. Here's what Steve Sarkeesian had to say about Trey Moore. Yeah, what, what I like about Trey is I think, first of all, um, is his work ethic. You know, you, you can tell a guy who comes into the program and has a chip on his shoulder. You know, Trey has got something to prove. Um, and I and I think there's some value to that in um, in the portal when you can recruit a guy that maybe is not coming from an SEC school or a Big Ten school, and now they get here, they got something to prove. And he's a really talented player, and we saw that firsthand we played against him. But the way he worked all winter conditioning, and now the way he practices, he practices with real intent. Uh, he's a he's an extremely effective pass rusher. Um, he's really good kind of his awareness of the game of football and the things that we're doing of beyond just rushing the passer. Um, and then he has a sense of physicality in the way that he plays, but I, and I think it starts with his approach. I mean, he maximizes it every day I mean, he tries to squeeze every drop out of the day and, uh, it shows in, in the way that he works in practice. He's a thermostat. There we go. He's squeezing every drop out of every practice. That's what thermostats do, baby. Come on. Yeah, man. So, yeah, man. Trey Moore getting some love. And then he uh, he gave some love to uh, Trey Wisner in the running back room. Put that in your little notebook because uh, I love the way that Trey Wisner played on special teams last year and whatever opportunities he got, man. You know, Sarkeesian was asked about C.J. Baxter today, and it was kind of like Sark was speaking it into existence. He said, you know, for his for the size and speed of C.J., he's at his best when he runs violent. And that's how Trey Wisner runs. That's how Savion Red runs. Um, so I thought that was a, a good little nugget. And then. You know, one of the guys that uh, that he singled out was Andrew Makuba. And let me see. If, oh, yeah, here it is. Here, this is Steve Sarkeesian um, when asked about guys who've popped on film from the first four practices, Sark on Andrew Makuba. The guy who I just talked to after practice, I love the way he's practicing right now is Andrew Makuba. Um, I think that I think he, he he's you feel his experience as a player. Um, you feel him having the ability to play multiple positions. Um, and I love the intent in which he practices with. You know, he's uh, he's aggressive. He's tough. Yet he knows how to practice. He doesn't go to the ground. He knows how to do those things. And, and I hope he serves as a really good. Uh, benchmark for some of the other guys on how to do it. Like he's definitely shown up, um, shown up that way, and, and, and been impressed with that. Um, you know. Okay, so then he moves over to the offensive side of the ball for guys who've popped in a good way, and he mentions Juan Davis, tight end wasn't surprised you know this has definitely been his best spring so far since we've been here um and, and proud of him and the work that he's putting in um and, and outside of that really they're all they're all working you know i hate to just start and rattle off a bunch of guys this is funny inevitably i'll leave somebody out and then i think uh, that they're trying or somebody on me why didn't i reference so and so so i'll leave somebody out and i'll have a parent or a trainer calling me saying what about my kid um, if I had something good to talk about your kid, I'd say it. That's what I'd say. Tell your kid to step up so I can talk about him in these press conferences. That's right. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting. He said, of you know, he was asked about Trey Owens, the early enrollee quarterback, and he said that uh, Owens gets 
down on him, you know, hard on himself. He's hard on himself. And Sarkeesian said, he told him, hey, man, it's my job to come down hard on you. It's your job to stay up and pump yourself up and keep going. Like, don't, you know, don't get down on yourself. You're out here to learn. You're going to grow. You're going to make mistakes. Just keep listening to what we're coaching you to do and come out with a great attitude. And, and that's, look, players get, they get down on themselves. If you were competing with Arch Manning and Quinn Ewers, who are both multi-year guys now in the program, it's going to look, that mountain's going to look pretty steep, but just keep ascending the mountain because by the end of this first full year in the program, Trey Owens will have all the ins and outs down. He's, you know, Sarkeesian said, look, his head's swimming. We have installed the offense. The defense is putting in their stuff. He's just trying to get through the play. And then he's got to worry about what the defense is trying to do to him. You know, all the stuff that happens to a young guy. But he, uh, you know, he also, speaking of the quarterbacks, he talked about how uh, it's on Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning to help develop these skill guys because he had veterans. They had veterans at those skill positions. Now they don't. And it's on the quarterbacks to make sure that the receivers are running the route exactly right and to stay flat when they need to stay flat and to bend it when they need to bend it. And, and so, you know, Sark said the command of Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning is going to be, it's huge to the development of this offense this year. Yeah, that's what I said last week. Like, no Jordan Whittington and no Adonai Mitchell who played in two national championship games and Xavier Worthy who's a top dog and, you know, all those guys that left, who's going to have to step up and be that guy in the wide receiver room? Well, we don't know. But until then, Quinn Ewers, that's your job. You know, I'm, I like that he put Arch Manning in there, but really it ain't Arch. Like, Arch has to be prepared and locked in and knows that, God forbid, if anything happened to Quinn, that once he steps in, that the team has a lot of confidence in him getting the job done. But really, it's on Quinn Ewers to make sure everybody's right. So, yeah, I appreciate Steve Sarkeesian for saying that. And, you know, think about Trey Owens, like not too many people talk about the transition from being a all district, all state high school player, and then going to college where everybody's good. And then now you're having to be tested by failure. Like you're going to struggle. You're going to the adjustment process for some guys. It's quicker, you know, for guys like Ant Hill. Okay. Probably really fast. They get it where they could perform in the Alabama game in the second game of the season and have those types of games. And then some guys, you look at Alfred Collins, it's still taking Alfred Collins a while to figure it out. Do I have faith in him that he can this year? And that's a big task for Kenny Baker? Absolutely. But everybody has their own pace. And somebody like Trey Owens, who was a terrific player at Cy Fair, now you're backing up Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, and you see the success that they're having and the throws that they're making. You're not there yet. And that's fine. But keep working. I like what Sark said about, okay, stay upbeat. Stay poised, you know, stay positive. Like, let me get after you. And then hopefully, Sark, it's that constructive criticism where you're not completely chewing his head off. You're just kind of, hey, man, you need to look at this before you look at that. And don't forget this. This is the play. Like, just the terminology that Trey Owens has to memorize. Right. Coming in. Like, that's probably one of the most difficult things for guys. We always see that John Gruden, uh, Chris Sims, <laughs> mic'd up special where John Gruden's giving Chris Sims the play and Sims fucks it up like eight or nine times it seems like and Gruden's losing his mind like yeah, that could be a lot especially from a high school kid coming into the college game with the complex system that Steve Sarkeesian throws at you so yeah they might not have had a good practice today but you're gonna have some bad practices man you just don't want to have a lot and hopefully those leaders are emerging from week to week day to day yeah yeah, it uh, it's gonna be it's it's gonna be fun. I mean, Sark said that um, you know if the season started today, the starter at middle linebacker would be Anthony Hill. But he said, you know, we're we're miles from 
having to make that decision. So let's see how the other guys come along. And if that's still the best place for Anthony Hill, or is it, you know, the weak side linebacker position, Anthony Hill is going to be on the field. It's, it's a matter of who best complements him and, and how do they flow together? So that, uh, that's that's definitely something to watch but um you know i think the the news on andrew makuba is is really big because sarkeesian didn't talk about jalen catalan the same way he's talking about andrew makuba and i get the feeling makuba feels comfortable obviously he and jade baron know each other they go back and I think that, um, you know, I've talked about Makuba's feet, man. He's got good feet. He's going to be a good coverage safety. And that he just needs to keep coming because you put him back there with Derek Williams. You got Xavier Filsimi coming. You've got Michael Taff, who's just a consistent, good leader. Um, you know, they've got to got to develop that position it's got to get better and i think makuba is part of the solution yeah i agree i also like what sark said he talking about the secondary you know you think about austin jordan jalen gilbo you know jade baron playing that star spot sark said that he's moved those guys around a little bit and moved some of those safeties to that star spot just because you never know somebody goes down you know it might not be that next person up on the roster it might be an andrew makuba okay God forbid John A going down, but if he does, we can move Andrew Makuba up to that star spot, even though he might have been playing safety, knowing that we got Xavier Filsamy, Michael Taff, and uh, Derek Williams playing that back end of the safety spot. So that, that's what you want, man. Like, that's what's going to benefit Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon on just the talent that they have back there, because last year the rotations didn't make sense. <laughs> it didn't make sense in the secondary. Like they were trying their hardest, and I think from game to game, based on the personnel that the offense was throwing at them, they were trying to figure out which safeties made the most sense. And you kind of just got stuck with Michael Taff and Derek Williams at the end of the day, even though they believed way too much in Jaron Thompson and Keaton Crawford. That was a problem, but you you, you should know. Like you, you, I feel like they need to know earlier. Uh, and Sark talked about that too. He said they're gonna they're gonna have to shrink it to what makes sense. But you talked about you know Wardo Mack and Warren Robeson, Jelani McDonald, like those guys. Not everybody can be happy, but there's a lot of talent in that secondary. And they didn't even mention the Gavin Holmes or the Malik Muhammad or the Terrence Brooks. Like there's so much damn talent back there. Who's gonna emerge as those lead guys that we're gonna see Saturday in, Saturday out, playing the most reps? Yeah, yeah, and I think you've got a solid nucleus at corner with Malik Muhammad and Terrence Brooks and Gavin Holmes. Um, those guys weren't bad. Um, they had some bad moments in in the OU game, obviously. I mean, you only lost two games last year, so you immediately think to the games where Texas lost, and there were some bad moments in there. But, listen, I can work with, a, with someone who's aggressive and – get them to tone it down a little bit. I'm if I got to keep trying to pull it out of you, that's going to be a losing battle. So I think they've got guys who are aggressive. They just need to play cleaner football. Um, Yo, I've seen pictures of Terrence Brooks at spring camp. Yo, dude looks like he's gained at least 10 pounds or so. Yeah. He's, he's thick. If, if he can run the way he, he can run, Okay, let's go. Yeah. Let's and go. you're really who you're talking about is him more than any of the other two guys that you just said in that nucleus, like Terrence Brooks. If we could get the fundamentals right, your technique right, yo, man, like yo, guys were going at Terry on Arnold earlier this year. 
Terry Arnold flipped the switch like that. Now he's going to be the first cornerback taken out of Alabama in this year's draft. Everybody was talking about Kool-Aid. I remember when we were prepping for that second game of the season, I was saying, yo, you better attack Terry on Arnold and not Kool-Aid McKinstry. That narrative changed as the season went on for Nick Saban. And Terry on yeah. Arnold, again, is going to be the best corner taken out of this draft. So you, you, you can make those changes within the season and the off season. And again, going back to Terry Joseph, bruh, Big year for you. Contract year in the way. You know what I'm saying? You and Blake Gideon. With these guys, this talent, let's get them going. Let's get them going. Let's figure out who's those dogs that you could be confident in. I didn't even mention Kobe Black. I know the Waco native has some big upside. Like, there's a lot of guys that are going to be scrapping and clawing for clock. You know, those freshmen coming in, they ain't trying to wait for nobody if they don't have to. You know? I got, I got the. Uh, I finally did a breakdown of all the salaries on the coaching staff. Nice. So let's go from highest paid to lowest paid. Okay. Pete Kwiatkowski, one point eight million this season. Uh, Kyle Flood, one point three seven five million. Jeff Banks, $1.15 million. Johnny Nansen, $900,000. Terry Joseph, $825,000. Tashard Choice, $700,000. All right. They got him bumped up. And then you've got Tory Becton at $650,000. Blake Gideon, AJ Milwe, Chris Jackson, all at six hundred thousand, and Kenny Baker at five hundred fifty thousand. Okay. So, I hope Kenny Baker outperforms his contract. Hell yeah! That's a big, that's a huge role on the coaching staff. A defensive line coach, almost as important as the D coordinator. But I liked what he was working on today, you know, when he was having him work on getting guys' arm off, like when they're kind of like when you're getting past the guy and he's got that arm, he was showing him how to get that arm off of him. And it's practical. It's a detail. But that hand work is everything for a defensive lineman, man. If you know how to use your hands, especially in coordination with your feet to maximize leverage, you're a, you're way ahead of the game. And that's, that's the word on Kenny Baker is that he's a technician when it comes to hand work, hand placement. And that's, that's huge because if you can master that as a, as a defensive tackle, Man, you're going to be ahead of the game, especially with the kind of athletes Texas is recruiting. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I know we obviously have been talking about Vernon Brown and Alfred Collins, but Dre Bledsoe, Sadir Mitchell, Tia Savea, you know, these guys, they got a lot of potential to do some big things. I mean, it, again, it's just so easy to look at the loss of Trevondre Sweat and Byron Murphy and say, okay, it's obviously going to be a drop off, but what degree is it? going to be you know you mentioned what 82 yards given up on the ground this year like okay if we get under 100 not bad it's just we're always going to be comparing last year's defensive line especially in the interior so yeah that hand placement that you're talking about to gain that leverage I mean how many guys are picking up on that and how quick is it it doesn't match their physicality you know, like Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, even though they played around the same position, different guys. You know, Bo Davis was probably telling guys, okay, you're best suited for this type of uh, technique. While Byron Murphy, you're best suited for this type of technique. Don't mean that y'all can't do some of similar stuff, but let's fit what you're working with measurement-wise to get the best of your ability. It's Kenny Baker seeing those things with all the players. 
You know, also the DNs, like the Barrett Sorrells, Ethan Burks, you know, Colin Simmons. Is he going to be able to bring anything to the table? Trey Moore. Sark talked about him today. Like, there, there's a lot of talent there. It's just can we get those guys all playing together to where this defense, which I think is going to be it's really good defense going into the SEC. I do. I think they still have a lot to prove, but I think they can be really good and shock a lot of people leading the horns to the college football playoffs. So, yeah, this is when it starts. starts now, and a lot of questions, but the talent's there. Sark, year four. Anthony Hill is huge because he is a spark player. He's an intense player who's going to demand the people around him be on their game. And having that at the middle linebacker position, that's going to be huge because Ant Hill is a warrior. And uh, I think he's even more of that than Jalen Ford. I think Jalen Ford is a super smart player, um, but he's not as, as intense as a guy like Anthony Hill. So I'm really interested. Look, it, that can cut both ways. So, you know, if, if that player's getting on people and then that player makes a mistake, how does the rest of the team react to him and all of that? So, um, but I'm nothing but excited about the development of Anthony Hill because everybody talks about how he draws people, he draws people in got a great personality on top of being a total dog who's going to pick up dudes and body slam them instead of just bringing them to the ground. So, yeah, Anthony yeah. Hill, if you're, like, making a list of irreplaceable players, Anthony Hill's way up there. Yeah, and kind of like with what Kenny Baker's going on, Johnny Nansen, just because you've been around a little bit longer doesn't mean that, the uh, you know, Stress level ain't there for you, too, on um, what you're bringing in. Because Jeff Cho, like you mentioned with Jalen Ford, like that development process, Jalen Ford always talks about Jeff Cho and what he brought and how he, you know, helped him with his game. And now you're going to see Jalen Ford playing on Sundays. Jeff Cho, he ain't here no more. He in Nevada. So, every, every you know, even though everybody's high on Johnny Nansen, goes back with Steve Sarkeesian being friends and coaching with one another – is he going to be able to get it the most out of those guys? As you mentioned, like Ant Hill, is he really going to be able to showcase what we all think Ant Hill could be? And that's just that dominant warrior linebacker that you have to be to play that position. David Benda, year six. I expect huge things from you, bro. Huge. You had a solid year last year. I expect even bigger things from David Benda coming into this season. Mo Blackwell. We know how good he is, especially in coverage. I think he needs more opportunities to be good. So that's what that's that's what I find really interesting. Let's say Anthony Hill is the best middle linebacker on the team. We get through fall camp. Oh yeah, Anthony Hill gives us the best chance at middle linebacker. That's where it gets interesting for the weak side linebacker position because Mo Blackwell is he and David Benda are both in a contract year and Mo Blackwell is on a mission. Is his best better than David Benda's because Mo Blackwell's put on the weight to play weak side linebacker. And that's going to be fun. Maybe they're both, you know, maybe you can rotate at that position and feel good about it. Um, Cause I think Mo Blackwell is really talented and he's been kind of pigeonholed into like a hybrid, you know, linebacker safety kind of role, um, a quarterback spy with his speed. You know, he helped to kill the K state quarterback run game with that package where he and Jalen Ford and Jody Barron were at the linebacker level and Anthony Hill was up on the line. And that, it, yeah, there, there are some talented dudes and I can't wait to see how they get deployed. And then we got to see how Leonga LaFau continues to develop 
because everyone says he is a prototype middle linebacker, good pass dropper, and those kinds of things. So um, that's that's my only hesitation with Ant Hill. So what what's uh what were you think? Where are you going to think Kendrick Blackshire could end up at that middle spot or weak spot? He's going to have to play middle. And he's probably more of your – like he's going to go up against your power run teams. He's going to go up against Georgia and Kentucky and, you know, the teams that are – Michigan that are going to try and run it down your throat Um, if he's in shape enough and all of that because obviously they weren't real excited about him coming in at 261, although I'll say Kendrick Blackshire – is cut out of a different body. Yo, that picture that he had, especially rocking like 14, when you're rocking one of those low numbers, yo, he looked he gigantic. Is, oh, man. Yeah. I can't wait to see that dude play because he's a good player. I mean, he yeah. there were people at Alabama who felt like he should have been playing ahead of Tresman Marshall last year. And just because they brought Tresman Marshall in from Georgia, that he got – screwed um so yeah. I, I hope he I, brings it i mean that's the beauty with anthony hill you could put him in a lot of places to where those guys could be okay rotating yeah you know just because and hell he's gonna need his rest too i don't want him playing jalen ford numbers like that's the last thing i want Right. That's, that's ridiculous. No one should be playing that many snaps. Same right. with Johnny Barron. Johnny Barron snaps, they should be cut down a lot this year. With the talent that you have around, they should be cut down a lot. And hopefully you could get to that point. But yeah, the fact that you could put Ant Hill on the line at times at that normal linebacker spot, have him rush, it's kind of like what Dan Quinn did with Micah Parsons these few years. He's that type of player. And that will allow guys like Blackshire and Benda and Blackwell to all get reps too, just like guys on the line. So, yeah, man, this defense, that's what I'm saying. They are versatile. So, yeah. And Pete Kukowski, they're going to have their hands full trying to mix and match from week to week. Okay. Right. You know, sometimes maybe Leon Le- Le- foul, he might not be valuable one week. And you play a team now, throw that thing across the middle where you need linebackers that are good in coverage to what he excels at or what we've been hearing he excels at, and you throw him in there. You know, you, you, that's what coaching's all about. Talk about what coaching's all about. That's what coaching's all about. If you have all this talent, what do these guys do well in those situations? Throw them in there. Some guys that don't, take them out. You should have enough guys where you could do that, especially when Sark talks about, okay, this added game to the college football playoff, you might need more bodies. Well, you got all this talent on the field, use it, man. Wide receiver room, secondary, linebackers, defensive line. The only thing that needs to stay the same, quarterback and offensive line. Other than that, everyone should be rotating. Everyone. Yeah, Yeah. and Cam Williams got some sugar today too from Steve Sarkeesian for keeping his weight down. Being able to move, um, you know, he said, look, that's the – we want large humans, but we want large humans who can move. And he yeah. said Cam Williams has done a good job of managing that. And and so um, Cam Williams was working at right tackle today. So, all right, let's get, let's get to the commentary before we do that. How about uh, – saw my man Brian Spielis today out at, at DKR. Uh, with brain vaults, the brain vault mouth guard developed by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U E C K E R T. Uh, the brain vault mouth guard, it is proven patented to reduce the effects of concussion. And there are Texas football players wearing it. There's, you know, players in the NFL, B. John Robinson. Look, if you've got a competitor in your household, you need to make sure they're in a brain vault mouth guard. Whether it's cheerleading, flag football, lacrosse, um, basketball, any sport, soccer, any sport where you are concerned um, of a possible head injury, you need to be in the brain vault mouth guard because it helps to keep the jaw centered so that when you take any kind of blow uh, to the brain, it's not as bad as it would have been 
without the brain vault mouth guard. So it's real simple. You just go to brainvault.com to set up a fitting. If you're the coach or the manager, the team mom, team dad, they'll do group fittings. They'll come to you to do the group fittings. Just go to brainvault.com. Of course, Apple leasing, getting you into the car you really want to be driving. And you're not paying for the future trade-in value of that car. So you're getting into a better car than you thought you could afford, and it's brand new. Whether you want to keep your payments in the $400 range or get a Range Rover at Leasing, it's going to get you any make and model of car. Um, and you want to change make and model two, three years into your lease? No problem. It's the easy lease. Everything's easy about Apple Leasing. Just give them a call, 346-9977. Visit AppleLeasing.com. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. And of course, when you're ready for the big screen of your dreams, the surround sound, the New lighting, electronic shade, surveillance, audio, visual consultations, avconsultations.com. Uh, really, all you need to do is make one phone call to 255-8678, 255-8678, and let Tom and his crew bring everything to you. Don't go shopping. He's going to bring you the best price on big screen, surround sound. Don't be punching holes in your drywall. You Let the experts do it, Tom and his crew bring everything to you, make it so simple. And of course it is Monday, which means all night happy hour at salt traders, coastal cooking, uh, dollar raw oysters, the best selection of raw oysters in Austin and dollar raw oysters during happy hour at salt traders, coastal cooking. You're also getting $5 off the beginnings menu, which has the grilled oysters and the new Orleans style barbecue shrimp, salt traders, coastal cooking. Get just some seafood tonight. And of course, cover three, your NCAA tournament headquarters right there on Anderson Lane, uh, up in Round Rock at Old Settlers. Cover three, unbelievable menu, but great place to gather your, your buddies for uh, some great high-end food and a place to watch your favorite team. Um, Zay, I went to... Moody Center last night. Yeah. And I was watching the Texas women handle their business against Alabama. And this was uh uh it was really cool. A because Kevin Durant was in the house sitting right behind the Texas bench. He knows that Madison Booker, the co-big 12 player of the year, wears number 35 because of Kevin Durant. And it was really cool on his day off to take the time, come in, um, cheer on the, the Texas women. And it was really cool to hear the players react after the game too. Cause Madison Booker is so shy, like on the basketball court, she's a killer off the basketball court. She's just wants to go about her business. And so you know, of course, she's asked about Durant. She's like, well, you know, I guess I played pretty good today. But, you know, it was really cool to have Kevin Durant here. And he can give me lessons if he hears this. So she was she was fired up about it. Aaliyah Moore was really funny about it because she's like, I didn't even know he was here until I turned around. Talk about somebody that's not shy. Oh, yeah. She's the opposite. Oh, and she had one of the most unfortunate uh, malfunctions happen during the game. Um, Alabama player ended up like going for a loose ball and kind of hitting her in the forehead and kind of knocked her weave like off. Aaliyah Moore ran off the floor like right during the game. Texas was playing four on five, and so she, yeah. Jalen Gonzalez is like, Vic, do we need a? And he's like, Yeah. And so they get a timeout, and then Aaliyah that, that, comes That should down. be a rule in the women's game. A weave falls out, stop the game. <laughs> stop the game. Yo, don't play with no sister about her weave, Chip. That That is her hair. Who knows where it might have came from Brazil. It might have came from Atlanta. It might have came from New York. Who knows? But that thing is hers. It costs a lot. Them bundles cost a lot. All that. I get it, Aaliyah Moore. I get it. Go get that thing corrected. Absolutely. But she she was like, I didn't even know KD was here until like right before halftime. And then she said, I turned around. I was like, oh, hey, KD. You know, appreciate the support. And, you know, we always appreciate the shoes. Wink, wink. Yeah, yeah man. So 
KD's Ooh. latest shoe, the KD 16, it's going to be a classic. That's a good-looking shoe that Nike put out. The last few have been all right. Nothing will ever be better than the KD4, but Durant's on the 16th signature shoe with Nike. Yeah, that's a really good shoe. Really so the good. KD4 is the masterpiece? Oh, my gosh. That's a classic. That's up there with Jordan's 11s and Jordan 3s. And, yeah, I don't think LeBron has one of those. He might. It might be the very first one. But, yeah, as far as guys' signature shoe line, like Penny's first shoe is a classic, Penny Hardaway's. Paul George had a classic first shoe. But, yeah, Durant's catalog of shoes, now he's on the 16th. The fourth one, it has a strap on it. Oh, my gosh. That that shoe is like an absolute classic. KD4. KD4. Doesn't your get favorite, much better than that. Your, your Max Aceman was wearing it a lot this year. Max Aceman was rocking the KD4 a lot this year. And your favorite Jordan shoe is the 11? Not mine. I know that's the most classic. My favorite Jordan shoe is probably the 6. I wore those in my Bowie days. The 3 and the 4. So 3s came out, 88. When he won all those awards, like the slam dunk against Dominique and defensive player of the year, MVP, he won everything in 88, 489, sixes, 91, the first ring, the black sixes that he wore in the playoffs. Oh, man, that's the shoe right there. But I know the best one, the most popular one is the patent leather 11 that he rocked in Space Jam in 96. So, well, yeah. let's get to the right call. Let's get it. Let's get it. Before the right call, though, Cover BK got to shout out the lovely family owned Cover Automotive Dealerships and groups in the greater Austin area for over a hundred years. Getting you out of them hoopties, getting you out of them pentos, helping you out with that check engine light, saying just get a new car. It's done. Come on, man. The smoke coming from the hood. That's a bad look. Go to Cover BK and get hooked up seven terrific brands to choose from dodge gmc chrysler cadillac ram jeep and buick covertbcave.com for all the latest specials and inventory nobody beats a covert deal not now not ever all right chip brown the right call today my friend gotta talk about your girl my girl kim mulkey kim mulkey always in the headlines for Probably not the best reasons, and she's back in it today trying to protect her name. This happened two days ago on Saturday. Her LSU Tigers advanced to the Sweet 16, but in between the round of 64 and the round of 32 game, Kim Mulkey came to the podium and let the people know that the Washington Post, y'all are wrong, because she said, and I quote Kim Mulkey, Former players have told me that the Washington Post has contacted them and offered to let them be anonymous in a story if they'll say negative things about me. The Washington Post has called former disgruntled players to get a negative quotes. Yeah. So, Kim, look. I've known people who have went to Baylor that used to tutor those girls that don't have the best things to say about you. Kim Mulkey, you have presented yourself in a way to where a lot of people, you rub the wrong way. I see the good and bad in Kim Mulkey. The whole Brittany Griner thing, not the best Kim Mulkey. Whether you believe she deserved it or not, that's still one of your best players, probably greatest player of all time, and you weren't there for her at all. So to come out and say this, threatened to sue like th the story hasn't came out yet so how how like i get and, and at least she has her players letting her know hey kim this is going on you know this that and the third we have that incident where she said our girl carlozo should have went you know put her dukes up with angel reese instead of knocking over flage johnson even though flage was the one while in and started the altercation in the first place you know what I'm saying? So I, I don't really understand it, Chip. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anybody, you know, go out there and say something before it even happens. 
You know, this is a weird story. And you know it's true. You know it's true. Like the things that they're trying to get people to say about her, you know it's true. Because again, this is Kim Mulkey. Like, she's not the best person. <laughs> she's tough. She knows ball. She could coach. All those things true. But as far as being just a good civilian, um, Kim, I don't think you're going to be winning any of those awards anytime soon. So I, if I'm the Washington Post, why not? Why not? Why not? Well, I want to hear the truth. The guy, the uh, reporter, Kent Babb, um, his – you know, he's an award-winning reporter. He's also written a couple of books, including um, a book on Allen Iverson. The, uh, let's see here. It's the, uh, he wrote the, oh, heavens. Something like the, un unbelievable rise and unthinkable fall. Oh yeah. The incredible rise and unthinkable fall of Allen Iverson. Damn. Um, but yeah, you know, she's a fear coach. She's, she's, you know, one of those coaches that is, is going to be tough. You're going to be afraid of her. She's going to, she's going to put the fear of God in you. Um, and it's always interesting to see when her players, when there's a little bit of, I think there's some, something going on with, within that LSU locker room because they've got everyone back and they added Haley Van Lith from Louisville and they're still not maybe, I mean, we'll see, they could end up winning it all. I don't know, but I mean, Mulkey knows how to get best out of players, but I don't think she relates well to her players. It's like Bob Knight. I mean, Bob Knight knew from a basketball sense what his players could do and what he felt they should be able to do, but he wasn't going to sit around and have a chat with them about how things are going at home or if their girlfriend is making them feel okay, you know? Yeah. So different styles. I don't think Urban Meyer, you know, Tom Herman, those guys are not guys you're going to, you know, look to go into their office open door style and be like, hey, coach, I'm struggling with some stuff off the field. Kim Mulkey's there to coach you and try to help you be your best basketball player. I don't know. I don't know if she's there to, you know, some coaches are like, I want to help these guys to become a man. I want to help these women become women. And some coaches aren't like that. <laughs> that there? Yeah. That's hit it on the tee. That's her. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I, Haley Van Liff, they asked her about those comments. She was like, yo, you know what you're going to get with Kim Mulkey. She's going to be consistent. She's going to shoot it to you straight every time. There was no real compliments in what Haley Van Liff said. She just kept saying, you know what you're going to get. You know, she's tough, and she's consistent on how she's tough. So if you come here to hoop, then all right. If you come here to – become a better person and get your degree while doing it and also play basketball, LSU might not be the right place for you. Baylor and Waco back in the day probably wasn't the right place for you. But if you're coming in a straight hoop and win championships, hey, come on down because Angel Reese loves her, which Angel Reese, it makes sense. Like Angel Reese is tough as hell. Like right. she let Angel Reese do all that. John Cena, you can't see me. And Angel Reese fouled the girl out yesterday. What did Angel Reese do? Waved at her. Waved at her to the sideline. Bye-bye. Like, Kim Monkey likes that shit. 
She she loves that type of stuff. Now a lot of coaches don't like that. Like Vic Schaefer would lose his mind if Aaliyah Moore waved at somebody after they fouled her out. You know, so she her personnel fits her and the type of players that she gets. Like Haley Van Lift is basically Kim Mulkey 2.0. Like, you go watch Haley Van Liff play and the toughness that she plays with. She's the only white girl on that team. Just like Kim Mulkey was the only white girl on that La Tech squad that was winning national championships in the mid-'80s and stuff. You know, like, there's just certain players that can feed from that, and then there's certain coaches that love that type of stuff. Kim Mulkey's one of them. So I, I'm interested, like – I'm interested to see if anyone's going to come out and say something bad about her, which I don't know how she could sue. I don't know what the rules are in that. I feel like you could be, you know, freedom of speech. You can say anything you want out here. Like Kim Mulkey, she can go off the record or on the record and say, this is true, this ain't true, whatever. But Kim Mulkey's been in the business for a long time. She's rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, ruffled some feathers, not just for her jacket. Like, it's <laughs> like well, hey, it comes with the job. Everyone is speculating that this story is going to have a lot to do with Brittany Griner. And we know that Kim was not excited about Brittany coming out, you know, while she was at Baylor and then never said anything about, never said anything when Brittany was incarcerated over in Russia. Like, didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. So, Went out of her way not to say anything. Right. This is a woman who helped her win, what, two of her yeah. national titles? At least say you praying for her. Something. At least say, like, your heart's with her and the family. Something. You have nothing to say? Just because she's gay in a way and you don't like that? That's not what your beliefs fit? Like, probably half of the girls that she's had go the other way. Like, come on now. Let, let's be real. Like, I'm not. That's just. Oh, wow. Kim Mulkey should have embraced that. She should have known. Because there was probably girls on her La Tech team that went that way. You know what I'm saying? Those are still your teammates. Did you disown them? You know? Like, that's, that's what I'm saying. Kim Mulkey. Tara Vanderbilt don't got these problems. Gino don't got these problems. And Don Bailey don't got these problems. Right. And you know Kim is taking this offensive approach to protect her recruiting. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't want anything coming out about her political views or wh whatever her personal views are because then it can cause recruits to say, well, maybe I'm not going to LSU. You know, yeah, he doesn't want anyone else telling that story other than Kim and how she manages her relationships with re recruits. Yeah, this was just ridiculous. Like Vic Schaefer don't got those problems. Them girls love Vic, man. Yeah. Like Vic be tearing up. Vic's hard on them, too. Vic's yeah. so hard on them girls, man. As a man, like sometimes I'm like, whoa, Vic, you might be overstepping the line, but then I see him tearing up at the Big 12 championship, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is Vic, the balance is there for Vic Schaefer. He gets it. He gets it. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't think you're ever going to find anything like what you're seeing with Kim Mulkey from Vic Schaefer. You know, Gina R.E.M., I'll be hard on him sometimes just because I, don't, I didn't really like the way him and Pat Summit's relationship was. That was weird. Like, Gino, as a man, a lot of you wrong, bro. You don't need to have no rivalry with anybody, you know? Like, you're in the women's sport. You need to respect the fact that you're in the women's sport and you are having success. So there are some things that Gino did, especially during the Pat Summit era, that rubbed me the wrong way. Don Staley, love Don Staley. How do you not want to play for her? If you're a big-time five-star like that, how do you not want to play for Don Staley? She's the coolest coach in the world. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't know, man. It, it's interesting to hear all this stuff. And you're, you're probably right. It's definitely, you know, the Brittany Griner stuff. That stands out more than anything. But, again, like I know people that went to Baylor that tutored those girls and stuff like that. And 
not many nice things to say about Ken Mulkey. <laughs> you know, like at, at all. Just her views and how she talks to people and how she acts, you know, like she has she has like a macho aura to where she's like, oh, I know I'm a woman, but nah, I put my pants on the same as a man's. And okay, that's cool, but she's taking it so overboard. Like the thing she said about Cardozo was ridiculous, man. Like, what are you talking about? Why why are you proing the fact that you want one of her players to come fight your biggest player? Why the hell is that an influence? Like, I don't understand. Why are you hyping that up? Well, Don Staley's like, this doesn't represent us at all. Don yeah. Staley's like, this is the last thing I want. We are not fighters. We go out there to ball. I apologize to everyone. And Kim Mulkey's like, oh, I wish you would have went up to Angel Reese and put the Dukes up. And then, you know, go for somebody bigger. Don't go for someone smaller. Like, that's Kim Mulkey. That's how she is, man. Did you see her throw out the first pitch at uh, an LSU baseball game and they set it up to where she would get into it with the umpire and like kick dirt on him and stuff. <laughs> I mean, they're playing it up. They're playing it oh, up. Playing up her gosh. tough, tough gal, tough gal image. Tough gal. Oh my gosh. Man. Kim Mulkey, tough gal. I wonder yeah. what that's like. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> a night with Kim Mulkey. Like, what is that like? Wow, that rock your world. That, All right, that, let me ask that change. That change a man. That change a man. Even the most hung men in the world probably would be intimidated by that. Hello, you know what I'm saying, Kim Mulkey, the bedroom throwing you around, tossing well, you did. around the bed. <laughs> She dated, she dated Trace Atkins, Who? who's like, she dated Trace Atkins, who's like six seven, country Trace. singer. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. You Trace. might be right. She, yo, Trace was probably like, yo, man, what have I got myself into? Because I, I see the appeal. Sometimes, you know, a woman that just, oh man, she. She really don't give a damn. That could be hot, depending on the woman. Like a woman that just don't care about nothing will slap you in the face if you act up. So there's some sexy about that every once in a while. So just, you know, and she's tiny too. There's, there's a lot. I see it. Bucky Gabo loves Kim Monkey. Oh, yeah. Or got Buck. See, I don't even think it's the older thing. Oh, yeah. Mulkey oh, always used to be like, there ain't no new sheriff in town. Whenever she'd come to play Texas, she'd be like, there ain't no new sheriff in town. It's the same old sheriff. How's Karen like, doing? She at UTSA? Ain't she still there? How yeah, she where doing? is Karen? I hope she's all right. That, that was, I thought she'd be have a better run at Texas, but, you know. I hope she's doing well. But, yeah, Kim Mulkey, I'm ready for the SEC next year, women's basketball, because Vic, he ain't going to take that shit. And you know she going to be all puffing her chest out because Vic's a man and stuff, so she want to, you know, show who has the bigger cojones. But Vic ain't going to back down. He respects Kim Mulkey, but he ain't going to back down. Roy Harmon coming back. Mass and Booker, oh yeah, you better be lucky. Angel Reese and Van Lith gonna be gone. All right, Karen. Karen Aston is uh, she went seventeen and fourteen at UTSA this year. Finished tied for fourth in the in Conference USA and uh, is in the WNIT. Yeah, it's hard to win at UTSA. That's a big fall off going from Texas to UTSA. That's that's tough. She was solid at she was solid at Texas, bunch of sweet 16s, just just couldn't get them over the hump to that elite eight final four and even national title contention. 
there was a lot more going on behind the scenes too. Like not all of it Karen's fault. Like that was back when Plonsky was way too involved in stuff. I think part of the reason Del Conte went and hired Vic Schaefer was to break some of the bonds that had been kind of orchestrating things behind the scenes, women's basketball. And it's worked out great. I was going to say, look at him now. Yeah. Yep. What is, hey, yo, what, Trey. What, what is Plonsky's current role with the program? Is she still, what does she do? So she's in this kind of general manager's role. And so she's good at being on committees and stuff like that, NCA committees. And, and so that's what she does. She's she's out of the business of managing people mercifully. So she doesn't work for the athletics department anymore then. No, she does. Okay. Um so yeah, whenever they need someone like on an NCAA committee cuz you know, I think her thing is she's been in the business a long time. She has a big picture view of things and that's very helpful, practical. It's when she's managing people that it goes off course. So I think Del Conte has navigated that beautifully and gotten her out of the management of people role and into where her expertise is still, you know, a resource. Gotcha. Okay. Barker, I'm not going to ask you this because you're a newlywed and I'm not trying to mess anything up for you. Trey, I'm going to ask you because this is what it is. How many beers, Kim Mulkey? (laughs) I think if you gave me a Viagra and then threw a keg on top of my head and completely knocked me out, that might be the number of beers. (laughs) Come on, man. Like it, it probably yeah. needs to cause serious brain damage too, because I wouldn't even want subconscious memories of that. <laughs> well, on that note, you you guys are wild. You guys are wild. Zay Zay is Zay's always off the rails, leading into us, and um, and, and not that Trey and I are gonna get it, getting it back on the rails, but you know that's that's what that's what makes oh, it fun. What Trey and BK does to me and Chip before we jump on, <laughs> yeah, they have it coming. Trey has it coming. You know, Absolutely. maybe I just bring out some extra professionalism in my guy Trey. <laughs> Wait until right, we start talking about throwing kegs off of our heads for other reasons later in today's show. That's true. We, oh, we I, have I, talked about I, some crazy shit too. I lean into the uh, I lean into the insanity. That's that's my favorite style of broadcasting, yeah. as you all know. Well, I'll leave you all with this. The wife and I are about to get on the road. She won tickets to see Madonna tonight in Dallas. Yeah. So I'll give you a full report tomorrow. Like a virgin. Enjoy that. First time. Yeah, man. So have a good show, fellas. See you, fellas. Good travel. Appreciate you. Guys. Good show. What's up, Jeff? What's going on, Trey? Not a lot. How you doing today? Good, good. Just coming down from from the weekend. Got a little extra sleep on my uh, my my Mondays. Everyone else is Saturday, so a little you know, a little sleep in today. Mm-hmm. Trying to still wrap wrap my brain around what what happened Saturday night in Charlotte. Like a lot of Longhorn fans, is there that much you need to wrap your brain around other than Ace no. Miss and Sue both being bad again? Yes, that's more what I'm trying. I'm trying to wrap my brain around still how. Dylan DeSue, as great as he was all year, could not get a freaking shot to fall, man. It's painful. Like it was so it, it was so hard to watch, too, because he was getting good looks. You know how good he's been all year. And it was just tough. Tough to see uh those little swirlies where they didn't fall. Well, the stat line, too, where he takes nearly half his shots, or I think it was half his shots from three-point land. Like that causes you to grit your teeth a little bit, but a lot of those threes were open and they're shots that he's been hitting all season long too. So perhaps that worked to the detriment of him trying to work the ball inside a little bit more to really get things going. But ultimately you don't fault him for the shots that he was taking, even if the final stat line was as ugly as it was. No, I mean, you, you, 
You said it perfectly. Those are shots that he's been hitting all year at a ridiculous clip at one point, you know, more than I think 15 games into the season, still at or above 50% from three. Mm -hmm. And his shot was something that he he improved a lot. I mean, there was a lot of talk about that, his shot improvement. There was the, you know, Fran Fraschilla nugget that everyone used to joke around about, or, you know, that everyone still jokes around about, about learning how, how to fix his shot in the chair when he couldn't run and practice with the team. But, you know, as much as we joked about that, it it came to fruition on the court for most of the season. Just unfortunately, in the two biggest games of the year for them, he just couldn't get one to fall. Uh, but yeah, you, you know what? You you can live with that. You can live, I think, with going down with your best players, just not having a great night, especially to Sue. Because Ace Smith, I think you, to talk about him for a second, like we we kept waiting for that nuclear Max Ace Smith game. Like just that, like, I mean, I mean, to probably being a little ridiculous saying like a 50 point game, but I kept waiting for just the Max Aismas game where he carries them. And I know we saw it a little bit against TCU. He had a really good season. He hit the game winning shots, which really kept them on, you know, from not completely falling off the rails early in the season before DeSue got back the Louisville buzzer beater, the Cincinnati game winner. But man, I mean, you just, you thought in one of those two games, you, you might get, just a 25 point outburst from him, or they kept saying it on the broadcast too. just whoever, when Texas started keeping it close down the stretch after the under eight, the announcers kept saying like, somebody's going to hit a couple shots and win this game. Like that's all it's going to take is somebody eventually will hit a couple shots and Tennessee just hit more of them than Texas did. Like sometimes it's just that simple. It is that simple. And it's also as simple as, Looking to the fact that other than Kendall Weaver, and he was a viable third option, the other third option options weren't very good for a majority of the game. Tyrese Hunter was great in the second half of the second half, as I'm just going to keep repeating myself with things that have slightly different meanings, apparently. But he was also not very good for a large portion of that night. Six turnovers. I wish that aggressive Tyrese Hunter we had seen more, not just in that game, but throughout the season, because if so, things would probably look drastically different right now. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And one of the big questions that Rodney Terry and Tyrese Hunter face this offseason is, would it be a good idea for Tyrese to continue his basketball career here in Austin? Because I believe that there are arguments to be made for that answer being yes and for that answer being no. And then Dylan Mitchell in two years has worked his way from a guy who is a surefire first round NBA draft pick to someone that teams would be damn fools to select him. Even the second round of this summer's NBA draft, he's got all the, here's that P word. He's got all the potential in the world, but when you only put it together once every three or four or five games at the college level, you can't be consistently dominant at the college level. Teams will watch that over the course of two seasons. They'll give there will be some forgiveness in season one, especially with the talent around him. But with that need on this year's roster for him to step up and him not to do so more more regularly, as a lot of NBA teams questioning whether he is cut out for the league even in the next year or two, but certainly not this offseason. <laughs> I mean, you make a great point about this year. That's what teams are going to look at. They're going to look at what was your role on this year's team? What did what was the expectation for you to make that improvement? And again, I've gone on the rant about how I don't understand how everybody says he's so improved. I mean, I know he was their fourth leading scorer, but it, it wasn't ever consistent. Like it was it was never it was never, "Hey, we need a bucket and two guys are off tonight. Let's post up Dylan Mitchell." It was all like things that you know, lobs in transition or put back dunks, things that are important. But when you're supposed to be the third best player offensively on this team, and we've been sold that you have a jumper and you have a three point shot. I mean, remember he goes to the combine last year and there's all this video circulating about his three point shot. Oh my God. Look at all these sh he, guy can't miss a three. He's in front of NBA scouts and he can't miss a three. Well, he comes back here and then he doesn't even shoot it. I mean, we were, we were being sold this, and maybe that's where my frustration comes with how everybody else is or how some people have painted his improvement is it's more so a, like what we were sold. I mean, we were sold that he was going to be, you know, 
this dynamic, improved, versatile weapon and more than just a rebounder and a, and a good defender that he might even be able to take the ball up the court and lead a transition after getting a rebound, you know, lead transition offense. He might be able to post up. He'll hit a three. He's got a mid-range jumper. Like, I just, I feel like I was fleeced. I mean, Longhorn fans were fleeced on what, what we were, I mean, you don't agree? Like, what we were sold on him was that he was going to be so much better and so much more dynamic. And his entire offense was basically you know, like I said, put back dunks and transition layups and dunks where he was, he was, you know, stuffing the stat sheet with eight points a game. And he was a great rebounder. I'll give him that. He was a great rebounder, a willing defender. You know, he's a lengthy guy that can be a tough mismatch or, you know, help if you have a tough mismatch, but there was never any reliable offense from him. None. You're right about that. It does feel a little bit like a bill of goods, but the weird thing for me is that, that we seemed to see that progression offensively at the start of the year. And I don't know if it was DeSue coming back into the lineup and that moving everybody down a peg or what, but whatever seeming progress was evident in non-conference play almost completely vanished in conference play and then in the NCAA tournament. And it's funny you mentioned him as the fourth leading scorer of this team that's one of those by default stats because there always has to be a fourth leading score. Like there's a fourth leading score on every right. junior high team in the country. That doesn't mean that that kid is a good score. And right now Dylan Mitchell, unfortunately is still very much a one dimensional score and a guy that teams, you don't completely neglect him because he can go for alley-oops. That's the aspect of his game right there. But if you are running even a decent zone, you take that option away and you render him next to useless on the baseline or in the corner. And oftentimes too, by the way, because spacing was an issue for this offense all season long, you saw more of it against Tennessee. There's too many moments where guys are standing next to one another on the court watching Ace Miss and DeSue do their thing. Like I know Rodney isn't a full-on motion offense guy like Chris Beard was, He's got to work to get guys moving around regularly within the parameters of that offense next year. I don't care who's on this team next season. Tyrese Hunter, Dylan Mitchell, whatever guys you get in the transfer portal, Trey Johnson, uh, the other high school recruit who Cody believe will at least provide depth next year, if nothing else. Like Guys need to move around because otherwise you get a sort of stagnation that really plagued this basketball team in the tournament. Even though they beat Colorado, they did so while stinking on offense in the second half and stinking on offense through the first five minutes of the first half too. That's not just a Texas thing though, by the way. If you can be decent offensively, it puts you at such an advantage in this version of college basketball with how much bad offense we've seen throughout the tournament so far. I mean... We, I'm sure we'll talk more about the tournament and the other teams in a minute, but to your point on that, at the end there, look what the Aggies did. The Aggies, because they, I mean, and you can, you know, fault Buzz Williams and the reliance on Wade Taylor and some of that, but they almost took down number one last night because yeah. they could keep up with them. Because Houston, who is arguably the best defensive team in the country all season, Iowa State clearly staking a claim to that now down the stretch, given what they did to Houston. But, I mean, they scored – I know there was an overtime, but they scored almost 100 on what a lot of people wouldn't really argue with you is the best defense in America. So, yeah, to your point, I mean, maybe if Texas has a little bit more of that offense, then, you know, they could have they could have gotten past Tennessee. But one one more thing on, on Dylan Mitchell, just to set the record straight there, because I do want to talk about what, you know, we think the roster construction may look like moving forward. I'm, I mean, we talked about this last week too. I'm so curious to see what he does and what Tyrese does. But for Mitchell specifically, I, I want him to come back. Like, I would love for him to come back and continue to improve. And I think sometimes these guys, you know, I'm sure they like it when they're in high school and it helps them get recruited and gets the attention. But we almost force the one and done label on too many guys. There's only so many guys that can be a one and done. There's only so many like one close to us here, you know, at Baylor, Jacoby Walter. Like there's only so many of those guys that can come in average 15, average 15 a game as a freshman in the best league in the country and then immediately go one and done and go pro and be great pros. There's just not as many of those guys as we think. So we throw that label around too much. So 
he's almost a victim of those expectations and that label that was placed on him that again, I'm sure he gladly accepted, but like maybe he decides to come back and be a four-year guy, or maybe he decides to come back to school and say, I'm a four-year guy, but I'm going to hit the portal and I'm going to go somewhere else. And I need to change the scenery and a fresh start. I don't think he's going to get drafted. I mean, I looked again, they just put out another mock draft on ESPN. He's not in the, he's not in the entire draft. He's not even on the mock draft. He showed up at the very end of a top 50 prospects in this year's March Madness. And Dylan DeSue, sadly, wasn't on that list at all. But he was like number – he may have been like 48, 49, or 50, something like that. Yeah, I I just looked at what ESPN put out. I mean, the top 50 prospect list is, I guess, different than what they think is actually going to happen when the teams pick. But he he wasn't even on that mock. And again, I know it means he he could come in and – he could come in and – impress again at the combine and do well in interviews, which I'm sure he will. Cause he's a, you know, seems like a fantastic dude from the interaction that I've had with him. But I think he's got a big decision to make because you basically decide, do I just rip the bandaid off and just accept that, you know, my stock's fallen, but someone will give me a chance, even if it's not, you know, via draft pick, like even if it's just a, a, a two way contract, like a Serge Barry Rice S contract with the Spurs that he's on, and you get the opportunity that way, and you just go and you see what happens. Or do you say, I like college. I really like RT and this staff. I love being at UT. I'm making NIL money and come back and really, really work on that development even more. Cause I, I just think I'm not trying to make an excuse for him after I kind of ripped him, but I do think that label that was put on him slightly, you know, unfair maybe and he's not the only one that's gotten that all these guys just get oh he's a one and done even if it doesn't come out of their own mouth we're told that they're a one and done and then maybe we just set the bar way too high i mean throw greg brown in that list too it's been a gripe of mine with the nba for far too long now that they've had to rely on drafting too much on potential versus letting those guys develop at that next level before making a four to five year decision And Texas guys are the best examples, I think, of dudes who, uh, the dudes who exist who are full of unrealized potential. You know, the best of the bunch so far is um, just in terms of that Shaka Smart era, guys. Was Jericho Sims a Shaka guy? Yeah, he was. Mm -hmm. Jericho Sims is the best. I'm sorry, not Jericho Sims. Uh, Jared Allen is the best example right now. Jericho Sims is one of the better examples, but for those two guys, you've got, Mo Bamba, who's now on a second team. Kai Jones, who knows where the hell he is. Some falling somewhere off the face of this planet, losing things mentally. Writing it up for the Bahamian national team. Yeah, something like that. Uh, Greg Brown, and uh, that's that's just too many guys that were looked at as surefire lottery picks, most of whom were selected in that first 15 to 16 picks, and most of whom haven't panned out like had been hoped. And you could see it with some of those guys too, by the way. Like, you know, I joke about Kai Jones, but Kai Jones, though, I forget if he was here for a year or two. His basketball IQ was so low, it rendered him as a less than effective college player. That's not just going to magically get better. And look, I get it. He didn't start playing basketball until I think he was a couple years into high school in the Bahamas. So that is, uh, there's a learning curve there that he was going to have to catch up on at some point. But he was so far off. When he was at Texas, the idea that he would go to an NBA team and regularly play and provide a consistent sort of positivity was extremely far-fetched. But he still got drafted high because that's what the NBA has to do in the here and now. You don't want to take a guy at 19 who turns into the next fill-in-the-blank. I'm not going to say LeBron James because he's generational, but somebody who is a multi-time All-Star, somebody who is making those end of season, all pro teams. And with a guy who's got insane athleticism, who's only a year removed from high school, you just don't know. It's very much a guessing game. Baseball had to go through this for a while with arms specifically, but also position players coming out of high school. But because they are a little bit more reliant on the college model. Now baseball has gotten to a very healthy place because those two things are playing off of one another. Nicely. The NBA and college basketball, not only aren't doing that, the problem has somehow gotten even worse because the transfer portal has created even more player movement within the college level. And therefore 
Uh, the NBA is, in a sense, having to play more of a guessing game. And by the way, the best college basketball players aren't the one-and-done guys. Look at the All-American teams this year. Yeah. It's like all juniors and seniors right now. That just goes to show and should be an eye-opener for NBA teams that, yeah, you may get a guy who's a little bit older, who's not 19, 20, 21. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Remember, you are drafting these guys for the first four or five years of their careers. You're getting somebody who is not only physically a little bit more mature, but also mentally and emotionally more mature too. When you're talking about kids who are about to enter that next level, it's been a dream for many of them for much of their lives. And not only do they get to take part in that dream, but they also get millions of dollars in the attention that comes with being a professional athlete to boot. Yeah. And I mean, a hundred percent agree with what you said. I popped this stat from a, uh, I mean, I have a stat. It's just a record. For, it's just a fact from CV right there. Yeah. Shaka went 11 and 22 with Jared Allen back in 2016, 17. And, and, Jer and Jared Allen, by the way, not to cut you off, no, was ahead. like far and away <laughs> watching those guys play the most NBA ready. Like it wasn't even close with some of those other guys. And there were other impressive guys that were on that team too. Sure. That I, I believe Andrew Jones was like a young guy on that team too. Yeah. Um, was Matt Coleman maybe on that team? I mean, I'd have to go back and look again, but some guys that ended up being really good college basketball players, um, even though, you know, somehow, you know, speaking of mind boggling, seeing what Shaka's doing now, I, I will never, and like he might make the final four this year, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I will never watch that guy coach and not look at whoever's next to me and go, how in God's name did a coach that good because I really think highly of Shaka. Like, I think a lot of people do, even now that he's left. It didn't work at Texas for whatever reason. How in the hell did this guy not win a single tournament game at Texas in six years? Like, I can't see his face and not think that, ever. I will never see his face for the rest of my life and not think, how in the hell did he not win a game in the tournament at Texas? It's just, it's mind boggling. Cause I do think he's a really, really good coach. I mean, he's two wins for making a final four with the second team. He is two. He's what I think they play NC state. And I forget whose region they're in there. I don't have the bracket in front of me. I know that NC state team is tough, but he's got to beat an 11 seed, win one more game after that. I'm making it sound easier, but you know, that it really is. Well, look, here, he, here's the thing though. The <laughs> This is like the year, although that was a slightly different situation because his team just caught fire from three-point land. If they even make the Elite Eight, like credit to them for getting to that point. You have to win those games, but they'll have faced all double-digit seeds to get to that level. And then they might have to play, uh, they're going to have to play Duke or Houston. So, if, I mean, if they play Houston, they're not making it past. I'll, I'll tell you how Shaka Smart didn't win a game at Texas. Despite the talent, it was a weird mishmash of guys who didn't necessarily fit his system. He got away from the style of play that made him so successful at VCU. And Shaka Smart, spoiler alert, is not a very good X's and O's coach. So in the Big 12 and then in the tournament, he was routinely getting out coached by his opposition. No, I, I totally agree with all that. But, like, win one game. Yeah. Like, win one game. They had some pretty good teams there. I mean, I, I know the... That was his second season when they went 11 and 22 because they basically like all those guys that he ended up having his best teams with were really young guys on the Jared Allen team because they had that team the first year where they went to the tournament. And I think, was that the half court buzzer beater year? Was that the Jesperson year? Yes, I believe so. And that was like all of Barnes's guys that were all of Barnes's older players after he left. Um, that stayed like the the Cam Ridleys and and those kind of guys, and man, it just yeah, it's just crazy that that not not once. Uh, I'll just never be able to get over that. But you know, back to what we were talking about with the the one and dones. I mean, Texas fans don't need to look far at all for that. I mean, we don't need to go through all the the guys that you know were sold as one and dones and didn't end up making the difference. And um, I mean, look at look at the upsets that end up happening in the tournament it's a lot of times younger teams or maybe teams that, you know, of, of the better seeds, Kentucky, Oakland, a, a stockbroker with two kids and a mortgage and a receding hairline gets hot from three. And he's playing with a bunch of grown men against Cal coaching a bunch of, you know, NBA draft picks that are just younger. And, and you make, you made a great point earlier about, you know, 
as a, as emotionally mature and as mentally mature and stout as these guys are when they come into college, they're they're still younger guys playing against grown ass men. They're playing against bankers and firefighters and school principals, like you know, that still are in their prime technically. And I think we're seeing that even in something other than their sport. I mean, they are the the definition of that. And look, that's what makes the tournament fun. But eventually, you know, and not to turn this into a whole Kentucky rant, but Cal, if he wants to make this work, is going to have to realize that that's the way the game is going. You can have one or two of those guys. You can have a Reed Shepard like he had this year who was an awesome freshman. The team around that's really got to be you know, talented, grown ass men who have played a lot of college basketball. And I know Kentucky had a few, they did have a few seniors uh, like that. Like I actually, that's why I picked them to go to, they're my only final four team. That's lot that's gone including because I did Mitchell. think what's that including Trey Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah. I did think they had a nice mix of those guys. So, I mean, they may not even be the best example of all time, but you do see that a lot where um, yeah, the teams with more talented, more experienced players end up pulling it out and, to an extent, I think that's maybe why, to, to bring it back to Texas, they even had a chance that they held on against Colorado State and then even had a chance late against Tennessee is they did have guys that you know are and Max and Dylan and even Tyrese that are emotionally mature enough to shake off a really bad shooting performance and the frustration that that, that could cause. I mean, if I'll tell you what, if that was me at that age, as talented as those guys are missing that many shots. I mean, I would be losing my mind. So I give them credit for sticking it out. And as, as Rodney would say, working the game for 40 minutes. So as is going to be the case, pretty much every off season going forward, not just for Rodney Terry, but every college basketball coach, it's going to come down to how he manages the roster in the off season. The Texas basketball team right now is at least going to lose five of their regular rotation players. There's a possibility that the sixth and seventh could leave if Hunter and Mitchell decide to go pro or go play that next season someplace else. So you're essentially looking at Kendall Weaver as that building block, as that foundational piece. Nice building block, by the way. Speaking of the few positives that existed in that Tennessee game, Kendall Weaver did so in the game before too, provided that spark and really helped get Texas back on track. But for Dylan Mitchell, you already said you wanted Dylan Mitchell back. I think the bigger decision is going to come with Tyrese Hunter. So my question for you is, do you think Tyrese Hunter comes back next season? And do you want Tyrese Hunter back in Austin next season? That's tough. I do want Tyrese Hunter back. I'll make that very clear. The The latter is an emphatic yes for me. I I know people were frustrated as hell with him, and rightfully so on some of those mistakes. I think Tyrese Hunter is a really freaking good college basketball player. I really do think he's a really good player. Yeah. Will he come back? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to claim to you know, have a close enough relationship with him and, and all of that, but just – from the times we have gotten to interact with him, he really loves this staff. He really loves being at Texas. And, um, you know, he, he loves, I mean, he was going on and on after the loss about, you know, just how much his relationship with Brock meant to him and going down the line of all the guys that, you know, mean a lot to him, but guys that aren't going to be there next year. I mean, that's why he was getting emotional about that. I think these, I, I would love to be inside these exit interviews. I think every you know Texas fan or media member would for that matter. I'd love to be in that meeting with Rodney Terry and from Tyrese's standpoint too. Like Rodney's, I'm sure Rodney wants him to come back. Why would you not want a guy going into his fourth year who's been to two sweet 16s or he's been to an elite eight, two sweet 16s and now a round of 32. I mean, he's played a ton of tournament games and you saw what he can do when he's you know aggressive and got his head on right and not making some of those mental mistakes like he made on those inbounds plays saw what he can do, as you said, in the second half of the second half. Well, we just, we need, instead of 10 out of the 40, you know, we need to get that as close to 40 of 40 as possible for Tyrese. But I think if I'm Tyrese and I'm not saying Rodney should say yes to this or needs to say yes to this, I would come in and say, coach, I want to come back. I'm your point guard. I am your ball dominant point guard. This is my team. Now, maybe that's too much. 
But I do think that is where Tyrese Hunter thrives the most is when there's no, almost no like filter in his game for lack of a better phrase. It's this is my team. I'm running the show. I'm going to be the senior point guard next year. You can bring in Trey Johnson. I'll get him passes. I, I Hey, get D Mitch to come back. I'd love to keep throwing D Mitch lobs and be in the highlight every night, you know, and I'd love to find a way to ease Kendall Hunter's offensive game into it. Cause as, as high as we are on, on Kendall Weaver, eh, there's times where I watch his game and I'm like, it's a little bit of the just, you know, Sonic head down, downhill, full speed, hundred percent. So I think there's going to be, if he takes on a bigger offensive role, I think people are being a little, a little overly optimistic that, that's you're just going to snap the finger and that's going to click and he's going to be a 15 point a game guy and it's going to look really smooth. Now he may be one of those guys where it never looks smooth, but uh, yeah, to bring it back to Tyrese, that's what I would pitch him on and say, you know, Trey Johnson's going to be a really talented freshman. He's a shooting guard. He'll fit well with me. You know, I'll help facilitate him his adjustment to the college game, getting him shots and all that. Caden Shedrick should be back. He'll take over the main big man roles. And then wh- whoever isn't, you isn't Sh- Shedrick gone. He didn't go through senior day. I think he can come back. Oh wow! Okay, I, he j- he is just listed as a grad student on the oh. roster, so I assumed that meant that he was done. So I, I, I think he may. I I maybe a, someone maybe a, can fact check me on this. I think he did three years at Virginia and maybe graduated early, so he went grad transfer, but then has the COVID year still. Oh, he has the COVID year. Okay, well, yeah, as a redshirt junior at Virginia. I think this may be it for him because he was a freshman. I was wondering why he didn't go through senior day then. He was a freshman at Virginia in 1920. Mm -hmm. That would have been the COVID year, and he redshirted that year. So 2021 at Virginia, 21-22 at Virginia, 22-23 at Virginia, and then this year at Texas. Hmm. Well, that that does matter one way or the other. I think Caden Shedrick can be a really nice player for you, assuming that his back is healthy. Did he tweak something in that game? I don't remember seeing that, but he only played 11 minutes. I was disappointed well, to see that, to say the least. Sorry, I'm only laughing, and I'm not trying to be mean, but you said, did he tweak something? And like, when did he not tweak something this season? But again, if you if you can get him back, I think it seems like, I think he can come back. And I don't know the exact details on that, but let's just say, let's say he can. Scott and CB are saying that, so we'll we'll take it as truth right now over what I just said. So that that's four. That's only having to replace. I say only. That's having to replace four of eight guys, if not. More. And you hope that you get more from him next year. And you know, I know I'm going on and on about Tyrese, probably a little too much, but that would be my pitch if I'm Tyrese. And I would say, go get three guys in the portal. Go get an athletic wing who can score and create his own shot, whether that's you know in the mid range or in the three point game. And I would, I would tell Rodney, like, let's, let's build a team, not necessarily around me, but I'll be the leader. I'll be the ball handler, you know, and, and go get guys that complement my game. Cause you, you made a great point multiple times this year about just the almost flawed nature of this roster of them, them having a ton of talent and, and then being able, you know, and being able to maybe overcome some of the flaws in the roster construction just because you have you had two guys in Ace Miss and DeSue who were really good, really experienced scorers. Um, and I think Scott makes a good point too here. If you're going to go to the portal, you do need some guys, but Texas can be picky. That's a great point to try to go get guys that'll be here at least two years. Because to Beard's credit with how he constructed the roster, which helped Rodney last year, um, is that he, he got those guys, a Marcus Carr, a Timmy Allen, you know, those two key pieces were able to come back for another year. And then, of course, you know, he got Tyrese. And then DeSue. DeSue also had, you know, played at Texas for three years. So go get guys that have shown something, but that can also be here another year. Because, you know, that's tough with a where you're like, man, like they didn't have another year to keep building around him and give it one more go. I mean, Rodney mentioned that multiple times, how much he would love to have a back for another year to build around him. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, sure, but I think the word was out on him on how to defend him, and that's just throw a big body at him because Texas doesn't have enough movement in their offense, so you're relying on him to create his own shots, and he was having a hard time doing that over the last month, which is why you saw him struggle so mightily. I don't know, maybe an, maybe some sort of injury issue will come out now that the season is over with that he was dealing with down the stretch, but it felt as simple as uh, teams putting 
bigger, more physical guys on him, and it really affected him, his ability to get good shots. And he didn't shoot the ball as well as we thought he would from three. Like, he just he just didn't. You know, there were a bunch of games where he kind of lit it up late, but again, I, I said this earlier in the show, I just kept waiting for that game where he was going to go crazy, you know, and just have a ace miss can't miss kind of game like he had when he was at, at Oral Roberts in the tournament. And I, I held out hope until the very end. And I'll tell you what, man, they, they sure as hell could have used it Saturday. Not that again, not to pin that loss on him by any means. I mean, there was a lot of things that they needed to do better in that game. No, but, if I'm pinning the loss on any one person, sorry, I'm going to have to go here again. Texas fans, you heard me say this in the midday show. Got to call out Brock Cunningham. Sorry. Yep. Lunch pill guy does a lot of the little things uh, routinely throughout his time at Texas would do, would make stupid plays and do dirty shit that put a target on his back and ultimately hamstrung his team in their ability to win games. And something changed for him after that game in Lubbock. And that cheap shot that he threw is he and the tech player were running towards the sidelines because he could not get out of his own way after that. Some of it was maybe being a little bit harsh as compared to how something might be called uh, against a guy, but that's also a reputation that he had created for himself, not just this season, but over the previous five years. And for him to do what he did in that game versus Tennessee, there was no message being sent right there. It was just a stupid needless play that you would expect your sixth year senior, a guy who already has a degree and is going to grad school to get another degree not to make, because I realize that the butterfly effect is an effect that had he not made that play, who knows how things would have gone the rest of the way. The simple fact of the matter is that Texas lost that game by four points in Tennessee after that flagrant one makes two free throws, and then makes a three-pointer. That is a five-point swing right there. Even if you just say, ah, the three was made, but we're going to take away those free throws. That creates a different end-of-game situation for Texas. And maybe you don't see Max Aismas taking such an ill-advised three-pointer in a sort of desperation. Damn shame that Brock Cunningham, for the positives that he did with this program, is likely going to be remembered just as much for doing something that stupid at the end. I really like Brock. I I wish I could disagree with you, but I can't. I tried every single time he got one of those calls and they went to the monitor. I tried my hardest to like almost defend him, almost go go to the spot of okay, you know, are they officiating him differently? And there was a little bit of that, I think, yeah. but that was a really 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 colossally stupid play to make in that moment of the game. And I, I couldn't agree more with how it shifted the game. And typically I don't like doing the, Oh, well it changes the way that, you know, like it, it changed the end of the game. If you take those two points off, but in a game where, where points were that difficult to come by, man, I mean, ugh, I don't know. I mean, that's uh it's, it's hard not to look back on that when you only score 58 points and the momentum swing that that was when they were just trying to hang on. I was at, I was at, at the station and I said to our producer, who's a UT grad, we were watching the game. And I said, that is a huge momentum swing in this game. Cause it was 20, I think 21 to 17 at that time. And they went right. Mm -hmm. And they went from, it was about a three or four point game, close to a one possession game. And then they were trying to claw back, which they did the entire game. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's a lot of Texas fans defending Brock. I mean, I think people still like Brock and you know what he brought to the table and just how much being a Longhorn meant to him and bleeding burnt orange. I think people will always appreciate that, but there'll always be, you know, in the back of people's minds knowing, you know, not, not pinning it all on him, but just the amount of kind of silly plays he made like that, that, that are just not, they're just not smart plays. They're not plays that you see from a guy who's supposed to be, the spark off the bench, the leader, the six-year senior. And it doesn't mean that Brock was a was a bad leader by any means. I mean, he's very well liked amongst teammates. And um, like I just said, I think a large majority of the fan base. But th those are just plays that are uncharacteristic for a six-year senior. For any sort of experienced veteran leader on your team, now a guy that 
is the all-time winningest player in Texas basketball history. You know, most career appearances in a Longhorn uniform, most wins for any player in a Longhorn uniform, and I'd say they'll probably probably be hard-pressed to find a guy that'll beat that anytime soon because, one, you got to actually play for five or six years to do that, and you got to play for five or six years at the same school. <laughs> and no more no more COVID years either. Back to a point that you made earlier, hopefully Brock Cunningham serves as a good lesson for Kendall Weaver. Not that they're the exact same type of player. I think Kendall Weaver inherently does less dirty stuff than Brock Cunningham does. But because Kendall Weaver is almost operating too fast at times, it leads to a sort of recklessness that I was watching officials referee differently down the stretch this season. You're seeing Kendall Weaver get into more foul trouble as his reputation was out. So Kendall Weaver just needs to recognize that, yes, you can go hard for the basketball. You also need to understand when you, when you should have a little bit of let up. I said since he really started getting regular playing time, he needs to do that a lot when he has the basketball in his hands. He gets going too fast, and it's just out of control. And I realized, look, I mean, you and I joked about this on Friday. Like, he he hangs up there so long that he it's – he out jumps the guy who's attempting to block him and he gets the ball up and he's very effective with those sorts of shots. That's an example of Kendall Weaver in control. We've also seen a lot of examples of Kendall Weaver, Weaver either borderline out of control or flat out out of control. And that that's something that will become more problematic over time. It will. Yeah, definitely. And you would think that as he plays more minutes moving forward, again, Again, assuming that he comes back. I mean, I have no thought or no inkling that he wouldn't. I mean, I don't see why he he would not, considering how well he played and you know the, the the statement he made and then all the guys leaving. But yeah, you would think that maybe if he becomes a thirty-two to even forty-minute a game guy, you know, like I don't know if he's ever going to develop into the skilled offensive player of you know a Jamal Shedd at Houston or somebody like that who just a guard who you know, plays with that spark, plays with that that athleticism. And, I mean, that putback Shed had last night. Woo. You don't see a lot of six-foot guys that can do that. And Weaver's another three inches taller than him. So, yeah, you know, I don't know if he's going to develop into that kind of offensive player, but, you know, hopefully a very productive player for Texas. And I think when you play more minutes like that and your role is not spark guy off the bench, then maybe you tend to dial it back a little bit more. Yeah. As far as Tyrese Hunter returning is concerned, he and Rodney just have to have a conversation about what his role should be for it to benefit Tyrese and this team. And well, I would continue that's- to harp on, and I look, I know he had six turnovers in the game on Saturday, that he needs to be the primary ball handler. And part of it is on him because there's other dudes that are going to want to bring the ball up the court. So part of it's on Rodney to set out that expectation with everybody else. And part of it is on Tyrese to be the initiator, to be the aggressor. Like what we saw in the final five minutes on Saturday, that I was desperately trying to speak into the universe at happening all season long. And unfortunately never really did except in small doses. That Max A. Smith's corner three at the end, where I still think people criticize that a lot which is fair, but I think you can live with that considering who took the shot. Even if he didn't shoot as well as he did at Oral Roberts at Texas this season, I still think you can live with that. He's been your most clutch player all season. Um, you either get a, you either get a shot for him or you take the quick two. But I think to your point right there, the, the moment that almost most defines Tyrese's season was when they were setting that play up. The way it was set up, when he dribbles from the corner up closer towards the top of the key, like almost in between the corner and the top of the key there, like that elbow three, I guess you would call it, he's right there. If he turns, he has a wide open lane for a quick two to the basket, and then they foul. You know, And it's a one-point game, and you make them make free throws again, and then maybe there, you you then go to max you know, taking that shot after. But that was him again deferring to and I don't know if that was the play called I wasn't there to ask the question and all that but if that was the play called then I guess you know you do it but it was almost just him deferring all season to Max and Dylan and like you said that that conversation needs to be had with Rodney and if I'm again I'll I'll say it again I sound like a broken record but if I'm Tyrese I say if I'm gonna stay 
build this team, build this team offensively, at least around me, even if it doesn't mean he's going to score 10 more points a game. He's not, I don't think he would ask to be a 20 point a game guy, but let me be the leader. Let me run this offense and run this team. And I don't think that would be a bad idea. Like maybe Texas fans think I'm crazy. What are your other options? Like we are here in the business to talk about realistic solutions for this team and going out and getting the best point guard in the country, the best two guard in the country on and on down the line. I don't think is realistic. And then also even at Texas and then asking them to then play together and, you know, bleed, burn orange and all these things that Texas fans want these guys to do when they get here. (laughs) I don't, I don't think that's realistic. So I think you can build around Tyrese if you if you really sell him that vision of what his senior year will look like. Because I don't think it's a guarantee for him to go somewhere else and just be better. I mean, that's a whole other transition and, and a whole other adjustment for him. And he's got one year left. I do think the X factor in this that no one's really talking about, but I'm really curious to see, is if Chris Johnson, the freshman last year, who was a four-star a top 10 player in the state of Texas, combo guard, 6'4". If he comes back, which I think he will, we saw him in the tiniest moments this year. But what can he turn into with A. Smith out of the way, the Sioux out of the way, Brock out of the way, and truly a chance to come in and develop and, and show what he can do? Because this year they just didn't have, they didn't have the flexibility with the roster and with how they – kind of struggled early in the season and early in big 12 play to really let guys like that develop, but he gets a full off season now with those guys. I mean, I hate to phrase it as out of the way, but that's really what it is They're, You know, they were barriers to playing time and development early on for him, but you know, Rodney needed to win this season, which obviously is the goal every year. So I'm curious to see what he becomes because he was a a four-star recruit. I mean, he was a guy that I think people were, were excited about. So hopefully um, you know, he comes back and, and maybe he can develop into a nice combo guard for Texas, even if it's just in a role off the bench early on. Yeah, I, I wonder what his future is, too, because it does seem like he and Trey Johnson play very similar positions. But you can also have multiple six, four, six, five guys out there, too, especially when both of them are, you know, one of them will be a sophomore with very little playing time and one of them will be a true freshman. I, I think that would pair great with Tyrese running the point running the show for this offense and this team, and then going out and getting the guys that you get in the portal. Like, again, I just think this team, this roster needs an experienced wing. Just somebody, you know, like almost uh, like what, what Terrence Shannon is for Illinois right now as they get ready to play in the Sweet 16. A guy like that who can handle the ball a little bit and get his own shot, but is, is just, just a bucket. Like, they just need to go get a guy that, that's a bucket and not – six foot like Max Acemas because Max Acemas was a bucket, but they need more height, especially because Tyrese is only six foot. You know who is coming back next year for one more season, at least he probably has a COVID year. So maybe he has two on Yema. I thought he was a senior, but he's only a junior. So we get him for one more year. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, we'll take the, uh, take the fat L on that. People could pull the tape of me talking about how I thought he was going to be a nice contributor for them this year. But you he's, know what? If Rodney didn't think the same thing, he wouldn't have gotten him. He's got the basketball body, but now I can't help but to wonder if that was uh, that was a little bit of a charity scholarship. A guy who played for Rodney at UTEP that he wanted to hook up with the scholarship to Texas before it's all said and done. He had to have known what he was getting there, even with that basketball body. Rod- Rodney watched him play basketball. He had to have known that. I just thought he would even carve out a role where, you know, almost like a like what Weaver's role before we realized that he could score and had a decent offensive game, like almost like the big man version of that, where you come in and just knock some dudes around, not in a Brock kind of way in a legal physical kind of way down low. I thought he could carve out that role, but hell man, I was, I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know? Okay. All right. All right. I'll, you know, all right, Alan. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for kind of backing me up here. He looked okay early in the year when he was the only big man out there and they, and they had to play him. So I think, I, I do think I, I just said this with Chris Johnson. Sometimes that is, that is something that's overlooked is, you know, a lot of these guys, they, most guys are good teammates and they, they know their role and they want to be a good teammate and they, and they want to be coachable. The majority of players I think are like that, regardless of the rants people will go on about this generation. So 
hopefully it's just that kind of issue with him this year was, you know, he just, he couldn't find the role there because Desu and Shedrick were just so experienced and better players. And they had that locked up in those, you know, kind of four and five spots. Yeah. So, uh, Shedrick does have that extra year. I'm looking on the Texas roster right now. Uh, Brock Cunningham, he's out. Dylan DeSue is out. And Max Aismas is out. So there's four guys, and uh, we'll wait to see on some of these other dudes. Like, part of roster management is convincing the right guys to come back, and it does seem like in all four cases, you want to bring those guys back with maybe better defined roles. And I think it's a good opportunity for Rodney to uh, to look into the mirror also and see what he can be doing better as a coach. I think he does have a net positive X's and O's acumen on game day, but he's got to get some things figured out on offense. I know part of that is the pieces that you're working with, but even with decent pieces, um, it just it seemed like the offense was prone to long stretches without scoring baskets. Oh, and nowadays, look, that's part of the gig. You're responsible year in and year out for the pieces that you do or do not have, barring injury. It's the reality of roster building in college basketball today. College football, too, but especially college basketball. And I'm guessing on on Shedrick, it must be because if you said he was a freshman at UVA in 1920, then they basically like wiped that season because there was no tournament. So, so then I think he, so he was, he registered that year, but the next year, did they give everybody a free pass too? I feel like that's what it was. No, oh, I feel like they didn't even count that year. Maybe I'm remembering that incorrectly, but I think they like oh, didn't they even count that banished. year. They just completely banished it from the record. That's what it was. Maybe. So, so I guess he didn't even have to use a red shirt then. So then he's, he had all kinds of eligibility left. So basically, I mean, 2021, I guess would have been starting fresh for him. Yeah, we'd have to go back and look at that, but he's part of that last class and maybe one more crew after that where you're just we're always just going to be confused as hell about his you know their eligibility. He played in 11 of 25 games in 2021, so maybe that's what it is. He was allowed to redshirt because he fell below whatever the threshold is now. Well, that's a that's a win for Texas to get him back for sure. I Let's let's get him healthy. Let's go through some core training this off season, some uh, some back muscle training. I'm not even sure what that would entail, and make sure that he is out there more often than not. Because I think he started to come on at the end of the season. You saw the flashes of why they went and got him to begin with. He's a good player. I mean, no doubt about that. He didn't really have a full off season healthy this year too. So you know, that's that's a great point. Getting him back and then a whole off season of hopefully keeping him healthy, developing his body and having no limitations in, you know, the development going into his last season would, would go a long, long way. Cause yeah, he did show a nice, you know, post up game when he had opportunities and it's not going to be, you know, your auto offense, but it just gives you another threat to score in every, every spot on the court. So yeah, that, those, you know, those are my portal. I, I'll give my, before we move on, I'll give my, my portal, muskets in athletic scoring wing and then more shooting too because in ace miss and to sue you're losing the two guys that shot the best for you despite what we saw in the tournament yep so uh how's your bracket doing other than oh, i actually had texas losing to tennessee so that uh that one game worked out well for me how's your bracket doing though I am in the, I got to go look and see where I'm at in the TSU rankings. It's not popping up right now, but I'm in like the 41st percentile, but I have, I have most of the core teams intact. I got lost Kentucky. So that's big, but I have Purdue winning it all. And I think only 10% of brackets pick Purdue. So if they run the table, I know a lot of people, that was a trendy upset pick because of what happened last year, but I'm going with the, UVA a couple years ago when they lost to UMBC and then came back and won the tournament the next year. That was one of the best future bets I've ever hit. Don't ask me about all the other ones since then, but that was one of the, one of the best ones I hit where I just said, this is, I think I picked them final four. And then I also picked them to win the whole thing because I knew everyone was going to do the whole, you know, Oh, well last year, the scar tissue. And maybe that hurts teams, but 
man, I think Purdue looks like a completely different team. So, you know, they're my champion mainly because not just because of Edie, we know what he does, but the guard play is more experienced and significantly better this year. And then I got Arizona in the final four and like everybody else, I have UConn. So those are my three teams that are left. I was surprised it was only 41st percentile, I guess, because it was just so chalky with the teams that won. And we only have, we have 11 seed NC state in the sweet 16. And then the worst seed after that is six seed Clemson. It's, it's almost all one through fives or It is all one through fives after that. So yeah, I'm, I'm 41st percentile. How about you? 41st percentile. Okay. So the better the percentile, the better you're doing. Yeah. You want to be nine. You want to be like 99. Like there's some people. Oh my God. There's somebody in our bracket. Who's 99.4. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but this I am 54th percentile. So I'm tied for 60 second, uh, 62nd right now. And how many final four teams do you have left? Three of four, stupid Baylor. Dumb of me to pick Baylor. Baylor cost me. That was my first Final Four team to lose. That, that was my Clemson Kentucky. Is, that Clemson team is fun, though, so I'll be rooting for them the rest of the way. But, yeah, Baylor uh, Baylor sunk my – or I guess that it kept me from having a perfect Final Four, which is obviously a big deal if you can get to that point. Yeah, and it's just about – I mean, winning those things or even finishing high is – it's all about the champion. Yeah. And Picking the the sweet the sweet sixteens too. Oh man, Ike throwing some shade. Oh, uh, what did Ike? Say? <laughs> Where's he at? Where are you at, Ike? Um, uh, I okay. I see Ike. He's tied for twenty fourth right now, eighty two point nine percent. Okay. Right, right where he wants him. Tom McKay was trash talking yesterday. He and I were chatting, and he's like, "Oh, I'm top four right now," but I don't see where he is currently. So maybe that fell in the later games yesterday maybe i just missed him on the first page yeah so congratulations to everybody who's near the top right now i hope hope it's for early. my sake that you don't stay there that yeah, uh, it's, it's early well i know a few of you aren't going to be staying there because uh somebody has texas tech winning it all and somebody else has kentucky winning it all exactly i've, I've been there before where my champion loses early but i pick the other games really well yeah, but that doesn't really matter that much because it, not that you have to pick the champion, but you can't have your champion lose early and then only pick like one or two of the final four teams. Like you, yeah. then somebody's going to get you eventually. Tom McKay is tied for eleventh right now with a bunch of other people. Hey, that's a good. Good spot for Tom. Yeah, look, if any of you lose to me in the uh, the college basketball bracket challenge, it just shows how random chance this whole thing is. Because <laughs> I know. Outside of Texas and a little bit about some Big 12 teams, which is probably why I, I leaned heavy on picking Big 12 teams. I had Texas Tech going to the Elite Eight. Yeah, stupid of me. Um, it's just a roll of the dice. It's a flip of the coin other than some of the worst teams. And I probably went chalkier than I might certain years if I knew more. And that's working to my advantage right now, I guess, and having me in the top 100. Uh, one thought on where we're at in the tournament right now too. There weren't as many of the crazy upsets that we typically have. I mean, I know we had 14 Oakland over three seed Kentucky. And then what NC state's done is, is a cool story. Uh, Yale winning their first round game, but I'm, I'm actually thrilled with how the sweet 16 shaken out because you still have the 11 seed in NC state who, I mean, no, no reason to think that, you know, or no reason to be completely shocked if they win two more games and get to the final four. And then after that, like I said, all you have is, all you have is Clemson and they're a six seed, like a six seed making the sweet 16, you know, beating Baylor, beating a three seed is not, not the most surprising thing. But I think when you have too many of these double digit seeds that make the sweet 16, it makes the first round really fun. And we get all emotional about it and all fired up kind of makes the rest of the tournament suck in a lot of big games. Mm -hmm. Really? I, that's my ideal tournament is I want to see a couple, a couple top seeds like the three and four that we saw go down. I mean, a 16 verse one is always fun. You know, we saw Max Asmus's 15 seed Earl Roberts team make the sweet 16. Uh, we saw St. Peter's do make the elite eight a couple years ago, but really the best tournaments are what we've had so far. A couple, couple upsets early. And then, you know, we get we get the chalky favorites down the stretch. And those are the best teams 
and it makes for the best games when they play on the biggest stage. So I'm pleased with with where the tournament as even where the tournament's at, even despite just a you know tons of upsets like we've seen in the past. Upsets are fun and cute up to a point. If you've got too many double digit seeds making it to the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight and God forbid Final Four, that's a terrible thing for the sport on a given year. And by the way, this is not a flawless year for college basketball. We've seen a lot of ugly basketball during March Madness, which is unfortunate, but at least we don't have too many of those teams moving on. I agree with you on that. And the teams that are are actually pretty fun and are playing really good basketball right now, like NC State. I will root for just about any team that has a, uh, a fatso as one of their best players. So I'm on the NC State wagon right there, now. There are few things that get me as fired up as just a hefty lefty going to work in the yeah. paint. I mean, a hefty lefty just sticking it to dudes in the paint is fun as hell to watch. And they've got another, their guard, the other DJ, DJ Horn, yeah. he's really damn good too. Yes, like they've, they've, got a, they've got a good team. Like that, that just seems like one of those teams What you know what? They're what I thought Texas could have become. Mm. <laughs> the team that has the talent and has just been inconsistent and hasn't been able to put it all together. And again, they, they may lose by a million in the Sweet 16, and then they would have only won one more game than Texas. But right. that was kind of what I thought Texas could become, not in the same version of you know the personnel, but in that, in that sense of surprising some people when they get hot late and finally put it together. Yep. So what's uh, what else is going on with you this weekend, sports or otherwise? Well, uh, I was I was at the women's game yesterday. That was a fantastic atmosphere at the Moody Center, and I gotta I gotta give credit to to Vic Schaefer when he came in here and took over this program four years ago. He talked about you know filling the seats, and again, this was the Irwin Center, but he talked about you know, basically doing what he did at Mississippi state. And I I'm one of the rare people in Austin who had a first you know front row seat for what he built at Mississippi state too. And I was just a little bit skeptical. It wasn't even necessarily a, a women's basketball thing. It was just a basket college basketball in Austin. And you even see the apathy and, you know, or you, you at one point did see the apathy in the Irwin center with the ups and downs of the crowds and, Oh, if we're not playing Kansas or Oklahoma or Baylor's got a good team, then, and then, with the women, it was if you're not bringing UConn in or the Baylor women and Mulkey, the crowd was met in the Irwin Center. And he he talked a big game about, you know, come see us play, putting butts in seats, like having a home court advantage. And I know that was an NCAA tournament game on a Sunday night, but man, they've had really good crowds all year. Like what he's built is worth watching, in my opinion. Like they've he he's built up the fan base to the point where I think it's kind of where he wanted it to be when he came in. And yeah, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I was a little bit skeptical about that, but dude, they've got, they've got a squad and Madison Booker is phenomenal. Like she's one of the most exciting players in the country, not just one of the most exciting freshmen. She is right now already one of the best players in the country. Kevin Durant was there to watch yesterday. I mean, Kevin Durant at a at a women's basketball game last night, you know, for a second round NCAA tournament basketball game, Kevin Durant sitting front row behind the behind the Texas bench. Like I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had that on my my bingo card a couple years ago. So Phoenix playing in Texas right now, or did he just take a yeah. quick flight in and out? I don't know. I didn't I didn't look at that, but um, but again, credit to to what they've built and yeah, she's she's freaking awesome, man. Aaliyah Moore had a great game yesterday, and like the fact they're doing all this without Rory Harmon, excited to see what they can do this year, potentially making a Final Four, and then and then bringing the band back together next year and adding Harmon back to the mix. I mean, it's it's an it's just an exciting time to to be a fan of Longhorn sports overall right now. I mean, Phoenix, every Phoenix plays at San Antonio tonight, so the answer is yes to that. Okay, that makes sense. I figured it must have worked out somewhere somewhere along the way like that but still he didn't have to do that and he's you know he's gone out of his way to hype her up because the reason she wears 35 is because she looked up to KD and in a lot of ways the way she's a menace in the mid-range 
to opponents is very similar to what KD does. She's She's got that size where she can get to a spot and almost always shoot over the guard or even forward that may be the same size, you know, cause she's, she's got really good quickness, really good handles and a, and a great shot. It's, it's fun to see her work in that mid range. It's old school basketball kind of at its finest, the way, you know, they run their offense through her. So that was, that was great atmosphere. That was, that was most of my Sunday watching them get a big dub. Not only does Phoenix play in San Antonio tonight? They were also in San Antonio on Saturday. So it was an even easier decision for Kevin Durant to go watch the women play. Yeah, no, no brainer. And they'll um, you know, they'll they'll have a tough I don't know if they'll they'll have a tough time winning at all, but this team definitely has final four potential. And, you know, they're they're worth they're worth getting behind. I mean, he's built a a really good women's basketball product here. Happy for all Texas fans who are looking for another team to get behind because it does seem like, according to you and Zay and everybody else who follows it closely, that this isn't this isn't just uh, cutesy, everybody jumping on the bandwagon. You start watching this team and uh, you find yourself falling in love, much like last year, Texas men's basketball team. They had a bunch of likable dudes. That, they had some adversity that they had to deal with midseason. Different adversity, I understand, last year to this year, but... Uh, in the end, it was a fun style of play and just uh, an enjoyable team to embrace and go on that ride with. Yeah, and like this women's team too. I mean they they just play like really hard, and I know that's cliche, but it really is true. I mean that that's a hallmark of of Coach Schaefer teams. But you know you hear coaches say that no one's going to play harder than us and all that and i mean when you're in media long enough even if you're a fan like i think you kind of roll your eyes and you know i i love vic but i'm sure at times like i heard him say that and was just like okay yeah no one's great no one's gonna play harder than you guys but like are you gonna score enough to win and are you gonna be exciting they have they now have the combination of both the way they play the effort they play with the intensity the defense and then they have really good skilled offensive players to go along with it. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the the most generic successful formula for basketball. It's obviously more difficult to actually pull it off and get kids that are that talented to buy into playing defense at that level while also scoring on the other end. But that's that's yeah. Vic's greatness is he's been able to do that everywhere he's been. And, you know, I saw him for the two and a half, three years I was at Mississippi State, and he – he went to two Final Fours, and they lost to Don Staley's South Carolina team, the one national title game he went to. And I, I've always said on those teams, they had good scores, but they never had, like, they had some of the best players in the country, but it was always a post player or a wing. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't the girl who has the ball in her hands the entire game, like it is with Booker right now. So this is, this is built to last. It's built to last with them, with the defense they play, the buy-in they have, the momentum – they're building up a nice fan base. People are getting behind it, you know, and then you have a player like Madison Booker who, if she stays, you know, if, I was assuming she's going to stay her entire four years at Texas. It, she'll go down as one of the best Texas basketball players of all time. Like mm -hmm. barring any, you know, knock on wood, anything that changes health wise, you know, an injury, anything like that. But I mean, she's going to break a ton of records, basically scoring 20 points a game right now as a freshman. So if you do that for four years, you're gonna you're gonna go down as an all-time great. May choose to go to the WNBA before her four years are up. That's a great part about NIL right now. When you're at a place like Texas, you know you see Caitlin Clark cleaning up, and not that Iowa is known for for being huge in NIL, but she's so big and generational nationally that you know she's she's cleaning up on all the ads and the endorsements. You can make more money if you're Caitlin Clark playing at Iowa than you can in the WNBA right now. Correct. I, I would honestly would say it's probably about the same year on the WNBA because isn't that what she's making at Iowa? Well, I would just say it's about the same because she's potentially going to make even more in endorsements when she goes to the WNBA, and then you're getting whatever that guaranteed WNBA salary is to be the number one pick. I mm. have no clue what that is off the top of my head, but you know, I think some people, you know, they want the challenge. She probably wants to step up, but. But let, let's let's be honest. She's getting more attention nationally playing in college women's college basketball than she's going to get in the WNBA. I mean, people will will cover her. ESPN will show her highlights and all of that. But 
she is getting a ton of media coverage and attention right now that I don't know if it's guaranteed she's going to be getting in year three in the WNBA. Hmm. But yeah, that's, you know, NIL has changed the game with, with all of that is, you know, whether it's the women's game or the men's game, but definitely as we see the evolution of the women's game, you know, the, the fact that they can make that much money in NIL and I have no clue what Booker's making, but I assume, you know, she's making something and, and doing some deals. And if she's not, they'll get on that stat as soon as the season's over and she'll, she'll start making some, some good coin. What do you think about the drama surrounding Kim Mulkey from this weekend? They're getting at trying to get out in front of a Washington Post story that is talking to former players about how bad a person Kim Mulkey is, I guess. It's the sense that I got from that. I can't say I've ever seen somebody come out and address a story that hasn't even dropped yet. And yeah. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it just dropped, right? Mm, let's see. I think maybe if someone in the comments knows, I think it dropped like late last night, maybe. Mm. Um, so if it has, I, I haven't had time to read it. But yeah, I thought the behavior in that press conference was interesting. I know Mulkey's going to do it her way and – she is not going to back down, but okay. calling out the, you know, I know you're big, bad Kim Mulkey, you know, the, the baddest woman in the Bayou, but, uh, <laughs> the Washington post took down a president. So let's, uh, let's maybe, let's maybe settle down a little bit, but also for multiple former players talking on the record about how they either don't like you or, you mistreated them or whatever the quotes are. That's not a false story. Like that's not like, I don't think you can sue for defamation on that. If there's people going on the record, just talking about their experiences being coached by you. Like maybe I'm someone not, with a law degree can pop on here, but I don't really know what she's going to sue them for. I don't either. A um, couple of things. This is not a defense of Kim Mulkey, but the Washington Post is a shell of itself at this point. Pretty much That's every fair. major newspaper is now. They've been gutted. New York Times has some decent sections, but they are largely a joke at this point, sadly. Uh, relegated to also ran status isn't exactly it, but it doesn't have the reputation or prestige that it once did. And the Washington Post is squarely in that category too. Uh, Kim Mulkey. Think about another former Baylor coach that lived his life a certain way. Art Bryles made a lot of enemies over time with how he conducted himself at the high school and college levels as a football coach. Kim Mulkey has done something similar in women's basketball. And now a lot of those chickens are coming home to roost. And that's not to say that she's going to be dealing with a scandal like what Art Bryles was that ultimately forced him out at Baylor. But she, if she is smart, she will read what is being said, especially if any players put their names to what's being said and eat some crow and say, you know what? I've made some mistakes. I've acted like a complete shithead at times in an effort to accomplish that ultimate goal. And I have accomplished that ultimate goal. I've won championships, conference championships, national title, titles or title. I forget. I feel like it's multiple. Oh, multiple. I think she has three now. I think she won two at Baylor and then she won last year at LSU. But at what expense was it worth it? These are things that I'm thinking about right now as I enter the latter part of my career at my alma mater. And it's important for me to sit down and reflect on these things and see what's valid and see what is just conjecture, what is more TMZ style journalism. She won't do that though. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's you know, wishful thinking. That. They continue to evade personal responsibility constantly blaming others or calling themselves the victim. Even when, again, you got to use this word lightly because Art Bryles is one of the people here that uh, they, they've left a lot of uh, victims in their wake, sometimes figurative, sometimes more literal, like with Art Bryles. Yeah. When, whenever I think of, about some of the most polarizing coaches, you know, whether it be a, a Kim Mulkey a Bill Belichick coaches that coach with that old school style. It's, it's always ironic to me that 
the one thing they almost preach the most is accountability. Yet so many of them for decades on end refuse to actually practice what they preach in that same department. So, you know, I, again, I would, it would be great to hear Kim Mulkey, you know, show a little humility or, you know, say, Hey, I, even if you just acknowledge, like, like, even if you say, I don't regret what I did, that's fine. But if you just even acknowledge that, you know, it does pain me a little bit to hear that despite all the winning we did and success we had, they had bad experiences playing for me. Like even just saying that I think would be showing, even if it's not the most uh, true form of accountability, it's at least, you know, showing a little empathy, showing, you know, a little bit of, of that side of things. And, and look, uh, a, a lot of it too is, I guess you could say what's made some of those coaches great, but it's just always, it's always ironic to me, the lack of accountability from some of the coaches of, of that era that are a little more old school. And yet that's the one thing that they preach maybe above everything else is accountability to your team, your coaches, yourself. And whenever it, whenever they're criticized about something, there's no sense of accountability whatsoever. Thank you, Roy, for correcting me there. Her alma mater was Louisiana Tech. It was her son, I think, that was maybe going to LSU at the time or had played at LSU previously. But she Kramer is, played baseball there. Yeah, so uh, she is a Louisiana gal, even if LSU wasn't her alma mater. We appreciate that. Uh, I don't remember what she said during the Bryle scandal, CB, so you're going to have to fill us in on that one. Jeff Belichick and the Apple TV docuseries about the Patriots comes off as terrible. I have not I, heard or seen anything about this. I just finished episode eight before I came on here. So that's why Belichick was top of mind for me. That's funny. How, CB says that. How many episodes are there? 10. Okay. Yeah. So I just, episode eight ends with uh, the 2016 season, the 17 Super Bowl, the comeback against Atlanta. Holy cow. Fantastic episode because it goes into detail of when they, and again, I, with documentaries, you know, if you don't want spoilers, like I guess cover your ears, but with documentaries, like these are things that we all watched and it's just fun to go down memory lane and get more perspective and insight on it. But it goes through the draft in 2014 where they took Garoppolo and kind of how Brady felt about that. And then it goes through Garoppolo going three and one in 2016 when Brady sat out the first four games, Brady coming back with a vengeance, going crazy. And then it really dives into how Belichick not only treated him the same as every other player, almost treated him worse than everybody else. And Brady eventually getting to a point where he was just sick of that, just sick of, you know, saying I have four Super Bowls now five after that 2017 comeback against Atlanta like you don't need to just constantly treat me like complete dog shit. He doesn't say that word for word, but that's basically how it comes across. And then, and then it ends with, with him bringing them back against Atlanta. So yeah, if you, if you, you haven't seen that, I mean, I'm a huge fan of documentaries. I think you, you said you're the same way, Trey. It's, it's a fascinating documentary because it, it really is, it's one of the most polarizing dynasties of all time. You know, as much as I love the dynasties I grew up around, USC football was a mini dynasty. The Lakers were a dynasty with Kobe and Shaq. And even if you want to count the dynasty where, you know, if you want to count it all the way up until Shaq left and they brought Pow on and they won two more, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like the most polarizing dynasty. It was like, yeah, the Lakers are really good again. And they had two of the best players ever. And then there was the Kobe Shaq rift the Spurs dynasty, probably the most, and this is not a knock at all. It's a, why they were so good. Probably the Spurs are the most boring dynasty of my lifetime. And the Patriots were the complete opposite. <laughs> all the scandals they had, the, the stretch they had in between where they didn't win Super Bowls and then reinvented themselves. Uh, you know, the deflate gate, the Aaron Hernandez situation, how it all ended with Belichick and Brady fascinating watch if you haven't if you haven't seen it i am a fan of documentaries have not watched the patriots doc yet but i did watch 
Quiet on the Set on HBO. Have you heard of this one? Uh, Jasmine's been watching that and told me that I I need to watch it. I've I've had a hard she, with the way she she gave me the summary and I kind of gave her the I don't think I want to watch that. It is it's disturbing. It's fucking right. disgusting. The fact well, that you have groomers and pedophiles routinely on sets in and around Nickelodeon during a heyday for that company and the signs being there, but nobody really doing anything about that. Really sad, but a fascinating documentary. Nonetheless, that wasn't even my era of Nickelodeon necessarily. I was probably a little bit older, but to see them go back and to hear just what some of these kids were going through, unfortunately, look, Gaining fame as a kid is already a mind-boggling enough process. You're going to throw sexual assault into the equation as well. It's just, it's uh, gut-wrenching. And even just general harassment from, from what I've heard about it too. General harassment. I mean, there was a lot going on. But in the worst examples, the fact that some of these kids have been able to come out the other side as adults and not just be completely ruined is it's somewhat inspiring because the expectation is that they their life will completely go down the toilet. And that's not to say that there weren't hardships along the way after the fact, but yeah, it is uh, very compelling. It's likely going to win some awards at some point for exposing a lot of fucked up shit happening at Nickelodeon and the, uh, the, the odds, the 2000 odds. Sometimes there's, whether it's a documentary or something written, it's one of those where it's a tough watch or a tough read, but an important one. Yep. Of just, like you said, I mean, the, the way that those, you know, kids now adults, you know, what they had to overcome is just disturbing, awful. And, you know, you, it's sad that, that they had to overcome that to, you know, become the people that they are in these cases. NFL has officially okayed a ban of the hip drop tackle it's now going to result in a 15 yard penalty and an automatic first down this was at the owners meetings which either got going yesterday or today this is to be expected after the story came out last week but uh, this does seem like another one of those discretionary things those subjective things that there's going to be no real consensus as to what justifies a hip drop tackle in certain situations another step toward flags trey I watched the video that, that I think somebody leaked uh, about a minute of the video that was shown at the owners meetings about the, you know, here are the plays last year that would have been flagged to give people an example. And I, in the rare, this is one of the rarest cases of social media for me. I agreed with almost everybody in the comments. Basically everybody in the comments was like, so we're banning legal tackling. Like, I just don't know. And I know, you know, I even get sick of this sometimes too, of doing this. It's easy to fall into this hole, but like, how do you play defense? How do you play defense now? I, I really don't think I'm exaggerating when you say at some point, you just got to put flags on people because you're asking defenders in the most bang, bang physical sport in our country. You're asking players to think before they make a play. And that's not how football's played. You know, a lot of you on here have played football. And even if you haven't, you know, you've watched it up close and you know that that's not how football's played. Football is instinctual. It's reactionary. It's all of those things. And now you're basically trying to take defenders' instincts out of the way or change instincts in defenders that have been built up over years of playing football at every level. It, it makes no sense to me why they keep doing this. I didn't even know what it like when I watched it, I obviously understood and I'm sure they're trying to protect what they're saying is the hip drop tackle like that, I guess is more likely to make a guy get his feet stuck in the ground and tear an ACL or rip an Achilles. Is that what they're getting at? Yeah. Lower leg injuries or leg injuries. Generally speaking, like you roll up on a guy, it, it leaves open the possibility, not just ACL tear, but a knee injury or rolling up on an ankle, or doing something to a foot, or an Achilles. There's lots of different body parts at play with that one. When it's done in a manner where the defender ends up on the legs of the ball carrier. 
Okay. So Rodney says a lot of these hip drop tackles look intentional to me. Yeah, they, they, they are intentional. You're trying to get the ball carrier down, right? You're trying to tackle a guy. Like it's really, it's really freaking hard to tackle at any level of football. No level, of course, more difficult than the NFL. And I'm not saying to, to Rodney's comment, I'm not saying that there's never been a cheap intentional hip drop tackle, but I think most of the ones that I see, it's a guy just trying to make a tackle when he's out of position. So now you're, so now we're going to throw a flag on, on every guy that makes a tackle when he's out of position. Like, how do you bring a guy down? You know, we can practice tackling all we want, but a lot of it too is just, is just finding a way to bring a guy down. Now, of course there's things that we're going to eliminate where grabbing a face mask, helmet to helmet. Like I'm not, I'm not the guy that played football that goes rogue and is against every, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be some sort of maverick here. Like I'm going to go against every single, you know, play that, you know, goes against the defense, but there are some where you just reach a point where you go, how much more can we ask these defenders to think about before they make a tackle? We're already asking defensive linemen and pass rushers to hit a guy, a quarterback as he's moving. A lot of these quarterbacks more elusive than they've ever been in the history of the game. We have some of the best athletes playing quarterback now that we've ever had in the game. And we're now asking pass rushers who are 50 to hundred pounds bigger than these guys in a lot of cases to tackle them square to bring them to the ground, but don't fall on them when you're on the ground. And guys have already, to their credit, adapted pretty well to that over the years. You see it all the time. A guy hits somebody and then fall off to the side. Yeah. Like you, you just, you reach a point where you cannot ask guys to think too much when they're playing. I mean, that is how you create more injuries too. When you're thinking about getting hurt or you're thinking about too many things and you're not trusting your instinct and your gut, that's how a lot of injuries happen too. Yeah, so in terms of just how much of an injury risk that play is, Dr. David Chow, who is known as Pro Football Doc on social media. He's great for gambling, gambling insight too. In, in my opinion, he's one of the smartest voices on sports injuries in the entire country and maybe on the planet. He's he's growing out of niche to, uh, in a couple of years, it's going to be like his information is going to be used in, every gambling bit, every crawl, like, you know how they do win probability and things like yeah. that. It's going to be whatever the injury nugget is. Like I followed a little bit of his gambling stuff yeah, during the season. And it's pretty incredible. He basically just picks the most healthy team. <laughs> well, it's also crazy how he'll watch an injury happen and he'll be pretty accurate with regards to what that injury is and how long a guy will be out for. But it's crazy. He weighed in on it, and while being, I don't actually don't remember if he was being critical on that, so I'm not going to attribute that to him. But he did say that the that the hip drop tackle is as if not more dangerous for the ball carrier's health as the horse collar tackle. So take that for what you will. We want the game to be played hard. We want it to be physical, but we also don't want malicious injuries happening. So if that is a play that is leading to not just gruesome injuries, but a sort of malicious intent, as Rodney is suggesting right now, then ultimately it probably does need to find its way out of the game. But at some point, we are going to have to draw the line. Because especially with the landing on a guy that you just tackled, which is definitely in play with quarterbacks, there's times where that subjectivity is taken entirely too far. and Or a guy like his helmet kind of touches the quarterback after he's released the football and he gets charged for a personal foul because the quarterback is good at a, at a flop. Like there, there needs to be the pendulum needs to swing back in certain instances where it's like, yeah, this is a football play though. Much like with basketball. I think basketball is doing an okay job now where you see an elbow end up high or hit a dude in the face. It's not an automatic flagrant one. It's like, no, this is a basketball play right here. There was no malicious intent. It's unfortunate that a guy gets clipped in the eye or the nose with an elbow, but that's what happens sometimes in the sport. Same thing with football too. But I'm not reason I'm, that the NFL is going to do the right thing there either. Only reason I'm chuckling there when you said that is because it just immediately, I know everyone thought of Brock when you said that. <laughs> well, dude, that's another one of those where I, I actually, I'm sorry. I know how to box out. 
You don't box out with your elbow at somebody else's head level. That was fucking horseshit. That pissed me off so much to watch him do that. It's like you're sticking your elbows up to basically dare somebody to stay in the way of that. And unfortunately for the dude, and they ended up not calling a flagrant on him in that situation, if I'm remembering correctly. No, they. you're talking about the Colorado State game? I heard of the result. It was a flag. They called it a flagrant one. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They did call it a flagrant. They needed to call that a flagrant. There's no reason for you to have your elbow up and out like that when you're going for a box out. Your arms are down a little bit more. So not, the only, not, what's that? I, mean, I, I know the refs made the right call there based on, on the rule, but – I so they're just doing their jobs, but I just struggle with there was there on that one. There was clearly no intent. He didn't mean to do that on the one in the second round, the one against Tennessee on Saturday. He definitely meant to throw that dude on the ground. I, from, from the first time I saw that before I even saw a close up replay, that was clear intent to a frustration, throw a guy down during a box out because of whatever else was happening. But the first, the one in the first game, I know they need to call that because it's it was a it was a flagrant one based on the rule book, so they did what they needed to do. But I still I just hate when you're giving flagrants or throwing guys out of the game for things that clearly weren't intentional. Well, so with Brock, I think that that's not it's not necessarily guaranteed that it wasn't intentional. I saw exactly what he's doing right there, and it is a dangerous play that he is creating again by daring that guy to stand there and deal with the, an elbow being in his face. The problem for Brock is that dude was looking up for the ball like Brock was. So Brock realizes that his elbows are high. He's done. He's been, I'm telling you, dude, he's been doing this shit for six fucking years now. I've been watching it. I used to kind of play like that. It's how I can spot it so well. But the, the fact that he gets called for that flagrant one in that game. And look, I agree that that wasn't, he wasn't like swinging his elbow, trying to knock the guy's teeth out, but he knew what he was doing by keeping his elbow that high too. All right. All right. Fair enough. But also to bring it back to the NFL, he wouldn't have, I don't think he would have gotten a flagrant had he actually dropped his hips. Like you're supposed to in a box out. Cause that really, when I watch that again, I'm like, that's really why they called that is he was just like, basically I know his knees were bent a little bit, but he's basically just like standing straight up in the air. And then, oh, yeah. And then had, had his elbow box. like way out. If he was, if he was like box, way, you don't box out up here. You don't box out like you're hanging on a cross. You box out with your arms down a little bit. You're trying to find the guy's body. You're not trying to find his neck. Right. I think if he had dropped his hips a little bit, it, it would have been okay. But here, here's what I'll say. Uh, oh, bring- great point. I'm sorry to cut you off, Jeff. No, no, great point, ahead. by the way, Double D. Anytime that look ends up on his face, you know he's guilty. I don't know why it gets worse the guiltier that he is, but it does. It, it is. It was amusing, to say the least, amidst the, the madness of him doing that shit over and over again. Uh, Well, I'll say this one last thing about the hip drop tackle. Here's what's going to happen. It's clockwork when the NFL implements a new rule. They will make it a point of emphasis all off season, all preseason. They'll call it a bunch in the preseason. They'll call it a ton the first couple of weeks of the season. We'll lose our minds. Guaranteed, Trey, after we're sitting here in a September show talking about a Texas football game, when the NFL starts, there will be a conversation or two where I lose my stupid mind about one of those calls affecting a game. And then guess what? By about week four, five, six, you'll see it occasionally. And then it'll almost go away and they'll never call it in the playoffs. Definitely not in the Super Bowl or the conference championship games. That's basically what the NFL does is they say, hey, we want to legislate this out of the game. So we'll call it a ton early on. You know, again, here here are the stages. Point of emphasis all offseason. Call it a ton early in preseason and the first month of the season sort of start to weed it out with some behind closed doors conversations with the officials only call it if it's egregious. And then they'll basically just, you know, never call it in the playoffs or only call it when again, it's completely egregious and kind of to Rodney's point in the comments earlier, there's clear intent to injure or clear, like frustration. This guy's been running over me through me around me all game, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to take him down this way. That's going to be how this goes. Cause it's almost always how it goes when they change a rule. There is another rule change. This is, I guess this has to do with on the field, but it's not directly on the field. So up to now NFL teams that challenge twice and get both challenges, correct. Get a third challenge. 
the Lions propose that if you get one of the two challenges right, that you get a third challenge. And the NFL agreed with that. So congratulations to those teams that get one of two challenges right. You will get a third challenge in a game. Oh, Dan Campbell suggested that? I'm surprised he didn't suggest if you get them both, you get a fifth down to use at any point during the game. (laughs) You get a redo on a fourth down, a fourth and a go for it that doesn't make it. Because the only thing Dan Campbell would like more than uh, more than winning a challenge is winning a challenge and getting to miss again on fourth down or fifth down. Yeah. Now that I mean, I'm I'm fine with that. I don't have any strong opinion about that. I really don't even think that'll factor in that much because so much is reviewed to begin with. Like right. we already review we already review all the turnovers. We already basically review everything in the final two minutes of you know the most critical situations. Yeah. Do we want to go? Do we want to play Kim Mulkey's comments about the Baylor scandal? Sure. The, the video, audio, and video of this. Let's do it. We're kind of jumping around all over the place today, but that's how it goes. Thank you to CB for sharing these, by the way. Hmm. <laughs> probably one of the best votes. Maybe second best now, Kim. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's just playing to a base at the end there. Yeah, well, still, still no, still pick your words a little bit better than that. Good luck. Oh, for sure. There's there's one thousand percent. I wish I could bet on this. There's a one thousand percent chance she runs for some sort of political public office. Like she's gonna have a political run at some point. Don't think so. Who is voting for that psychopath? All the uh, that, that's all the crazies that like her. <laughs> that's a stupid question by me. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, she you has a pace. To, uh, certain ultra conservative bastions, and I'm sure she'll be uh, mayor before too long. And she's right at home in Louisiana. Like literally, like that's. I mean, I know we just said you know her alma mater is is La Tech, but you know Louisiana is one of those states where. You, know, you go to La Tech, you grew up in Louisiana, you're still an LSU fan. You know, nine times out of 10, those people are still LSU fans because it's the only big time blue blood program in that state. I didn't realize this in talking to a couple of New Orleans comedians in the last several months, but there's a big rivalry between New Orleans people and Baton Rouge people. Did you realize that? I mean, it makes sense. No. It makes logistical, regional sense. Because cities like to go back and forth with one another, but Baton Rouge has a little brother complex, apparently, according to New Orleans people. Yeah, that's like Austin and Waco trying to battle. Austin, San Antonio. Well, no, but Austin and San Antonio are on the same. That's fair. They're on the same wavelength, population wise. Like I even, you know, the TV guy in me looks at all this from like the TV. They rank the TV markets. Yeah. And we're, we're like 35 and I think they're 31 or something. So it's basically the same size, but Waco is, you know, it's still a decent sized market, but it's in the eighties or nineties. So, and Baton Rouge is the same way. How are we 35? Because aren't we top 20 in overall population right now? Is it just the Metro area isn't up to par with a lot of other cities? No, it's all. So TV markets are, simply put all about the amount of TVs or households in a certain viewing area and where they draw those lines. So for us, North and South, the most populated areas, we don't go as deep, you know, square, square mile wise and all that as some other viewing areas because we butt up against two kind of, kind of big cities. So like, as you get orders, Waco get temple. Uh, Waco gets temple. So we don't get, we don't get temple. Like we basically, once you pass Georgetown, there's no, I mean, you know, there's like Gerald Salado, some of those, but then it gets like fuzzy up there. And then all the way down, anything past San Marcos, you get San Antonio TV and then anything East and West, the population's not enough to really like sway the, you know, I guess rankings or, or that kind of stuff. So, I mean, Austin, Austin's definitely moved up. It was in the forties when I got here. So that was a completely random 
sidebar that I'm sure no one cared about, but I cared you, about it. Yeah. I like to hear about that stuff. Cause I always ask that question. Like Austin is a top 20 city population wise. Now, how in the world are we still not even in the twenties in terms of market size? And that answered the question. Yeah. It'll, it'll slowly creep up like it has, but it'll never go through like a huge, like it'll never go from like 30 to 10 or something well, like the, that. The key is the East West explosion there's only so much that can happen west but the east the east especially and then the northwest too because i'm guessing that austin gets marble falls fredericksburg maybe definitely johnson city yeah and then kerrville ends up with san antonio which i only know because uh, i spent a lot of time there and the local news was always san antonio yeah it stops at about like blanco out that way in the hill country Mm. I'd know even more if I was the weather guy. <laughs> but there are times where I'll go to I'll go to the the meteorologist. Like some team will make a like Mason will make a state championship run in basketball or something and I'll I'll go to the meteorologist and I'll be like, "Do I need to cover this? <laughs> is this is this in our DMA? Does does this need to make my sports cast tonight?" And oh, because they know they know the exact viewing era area. That's smart. Yep. Oh, yep. they know it because as soon as there's severe weather and there, you know, it hits an area, it doesn't matter how small the population might be. If it's in our DMA and there's life threatening weather, doesn't matter if it's the masters on Sunday, we got to cut into programming and at least two box it. And at least two box it to where they can get their information. Ooh, I'm glad you mentioned the Masters because you're a big golf guy and the Masters are going to be nearing a s completion of second day by the time you and I talk again. So you are a DJ when it comes to betting on golf. What are uh, what are you thinking right now in terms of guys that you like heading into this weekend? I, uh, I well, no, no, it's not this weekend. Oh, it's not? No, I they're in... Um, I thought it was always Easter weekend. No, they are in Houston this week. That's a shame. My apologies. Yeah. No, no, it's all good. Scratch well, that question then. No, I will all just, just one minute of therapy real quick. Uh Oh, I have three weeks in a row finished with a second place finish in my golf bets. Three not pay out. I mean, it doesn't pay out like a hundred to one, you know, or something like that. It pays out maybe like four to one with, with what I had and you have to place when you do those, it's called an each way in golf. So you can do an each way up to five places or 10, 10 placements, but you have to make a bigger bet to do that. You know, so you're instead of just putting five bucks, 10 bucks on a guy to win, you really have to bet 15. So you put the five or 10 on him to win. And then all the placements after that. So gotcha. Anyway. Yeah. Need a need, need some good, need some good mojo going into Houston this week. I had uh, I had Cam Cam Smith not Cam Smith excuse me um oh my gosh Cameron Young finished second yesterday I had Wyndham Clark and Brian Harmon the week before who both finished second so ouch yeah yeah anyway don't gamble kids I'm looking around to see the Shohei Otani statement that is supposed to be coming out soon don't have see we it gotten that yet not gonna be not going to be taking questions from reporters. That's not a shock. But this seems like it's not going to end well for him. I know that everybody keeps saying that the interpreter is going to serve as a scapegoat. I don't know if they're going to be able to avoid this. They may have to suspend their most popular player for a large chunk of time for betting on baseball games. And just when baseball had it humming, they had the modern day Babe Ruth. They finally hit on some really good rule changes. The games were faster. There was more action, more stolen bases than we've seen in a long time. And baseball was in a really good place, especially if you're, especially if you're a Rangers fan like like you are, Trey. And now here we are with baseball. Just <laughs> however you want to look at it, can't get out of their own way. Can't catch a break. Probably more the can't catch a break in this one because I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure they could have even in their wildest nightmares predicted this happening, but yeah, there's just two with this story. And I'm sure, you know, multiple shows on here. I've, I've talked about it over the last couple of days and going back to last week when it happened, it just, nothing adds up. 
And now when you've already, you know, we're already in a situation where it looks like the crime could be, or the cover up could be worse than the crime. Yep. And we don't really know what the crime is. We don't really know who did what and what's not helping them are all the little details and layers that are being peeled back. Now the interpreter's bio apparently had all kinds of things that were inaccurate in his public bio. Huh? Yeah. So that's, that's not a great look. Um, no, it's not. We'll, we'll see. But. So a lot of people have just assumed that Anthony Hill, the Texas linebacker about to enter his sophomore season is going to take over for Jalen Ford in the middle of that Longhorns defense. Yes, Steve Sarkeesian is telling people to pump the brakes there by saying that he's a chess piece that you move all over the board. I, I'd like to think that that's the case, but I also saw how they used him last year, and I think they are going to end up utilizing him at one position more than the others, and it's probably going to be more of a uh, traditional linebacker position to the detriment of this Texas defense being as fierce as humanly possible, especially when getting after the quarterback. Playing a devil's advocate, I guess, on the side of people that don't like that move, Maybe it just speaks to how how much Sark truly believes that the pass rush on the edge, the true edge guys that they have, how much better they're going to be there. Like maybe he thinks a Trey Moore coming from UTSA is going to be that good. A Baron Sorrell with another year to develop will be that much better. Same goes for Ethan Burke. So maybe he thinks that that's, you know, that they almost don't need him as much on the edge. But yeah, I agree with the chess the chess piece, I mean, it's rare that, that you get a guy like that because he's he's one of the rare freshmen that came in immediately and from the word go, from the you know toe-meeting leather in the first game, looked like he belonged. I mean, you went to Alabama, and he looked even better than he looked in the first game. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what, what that means. Uh, what that means from Sark there, or if maybe it's – Sark playing chess with their opponents. Who the hell knows? He's got like that. Look, that, that, that dude's going to make plays wherever you put him. I agree to a certain extent. I think if you're asking him to drop into coverage too much, that's going to be a problem based on what we saw this year. Maybe he develops in that regard, but I, I also think that's, that's, that's not using him to the best of his ability. Kind of like how, look, Joseph Osai was a great player, obviously, at the end of his Texas tenure. But there was a play in that final season where he was the Big 12 defensive lineman of the year, maybe he was the defender of the year, that he was dropping into coverage against wide receivers. That's There, there are right ways and wrong ways to use even the most flexible of guys. By the way, we do now have the Shohei Otani statement. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you got so, it? Says his interpreter has been stealing money from my account and telling lies. I'm very saddened and shocked that someone who I trusted has done this. So they are sticking with the interpreter done it defense. Well, I'm sure he's, uh, you know, for being the scapegoat, whether or not he actually did this or not, who knows? He's he's probably going to get a nice, uh, <laughs> nice hefty sum of more than four and a half million to go along with this. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna play part of this statement from the interpreter, and then I have a question for you after. Wait, the interpreter has his own statement now. The interpreter oh, oh. for Shohei Otani, speaking through an interpreter, says he's saddened and shocked by the scandal. I'm very saddened and shocked that someone who I'm trusted has done this. You think that interpreter is sweating bullets right now? Mm. Like if he ends up getting too deep in all of this, that he could be the uh, the next fall guy. I, or Shohei's people are going through every possible over, offshore's book to see if this dude has an account. <laughs> hey, even on even on shores, <laughs> even yeah. in the states, in yeah. legal states, that is. Sports gambling not legal in California yet. If so, that's somewhat surprising. They are desperate to do anything to make a little bit more money at this point, aren't they? I actually, well, yes, on that. I actually don't know off the top of my head if it is fully legal there yet. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, my Man, apologies. In California. You've got another revenue stream that you can exploit. Oh gosh. That what a freaking mess. Yeah. And yeah, that interpreter, 
holy cow that's a that's a thankless gig to now move into that that interpreter gig oh god well it does feel like this though that there's got to be at least one you've got to be there has to be one interpreter between the guy who's taking the fall now and the next guy to take the fall so you're probably safe and they'll move on from you after a couple of years just to get that taste washed out of their mouth and then they'll move on to the next guy that they can pin on the next transgressions if if there are future transgressions i just can't get that clip out of my head that they keep showing of the the game and because that's what makes this even crazier too was this happened while they were playing those games in korea yeah and those games counted in the standings yep. so they were playing real games in korea now they're now they're back and they're going to play some exhibition games before starting the real season later this week with everybody else mm -hmm. But that clip that we all saw of them being buddy buddy at the end of that game, and then apparently they walk into the clubhouse and everything just goes haywire. Like that to me is just an absolutely ridiculous part of this story. That's crazy. You're right. <laughs> this is a great comment. The interpreter after the interpreter. Like Charlie Strong, you're smart. Yeah, you never want to be the guy that replaces the guy. You you want to be the guy after the guy. I'll tell you what, you really. I mean, that's not that this applies here, but in other cases, you really don't want to be the guy. It's one thing to be the guy that replaces the guy, and the second guy being a, a legend here. But it's one thing to be the guy that replaces the goat. If you're if you're Kalen DeBoer. Like you're literally, you're not just replacing a legend. You're literally replacing the greatest college football coach of all time. That's why I do wonder in retrospect, if Kellen DeBoer wishes he had just waited for the Michigan job. Cause I feel like he's better suited for that job. Like his per personality is, but if you win, you win. You're just in such a pressure cooker at Alabama with what Nick Saban had done over the previous 15 years that it's a, I, it's a pretty massive challenge. I would have to think that DeBoer had his people go through back channels to get it about as on the record as you could get being off the record that no matter what they were going to hire Sharon more. Mm, maybe you might be right about that because, because I agree. I think otherwise he would have waited and said, Hey, am I going to be, am I going to be a top candidate for this job? If it opens, I think we would have, you know, he would have seen that uh, he, he, he would have stayed potentially if there were pretty good assurances that, Hey, I don't think we're going to hire more and you would definitely be one of the top candidates, but I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I guess it really is just that much better of a gig at Alabama uh, than even Washington going into the, the big 10. Like it's definitely a better job, but the replacing Saban part of it is, is kind of crazy. And I'm oh. wondering if he didn't totally anticipate the fallout in the portal after, like if he just thought, those guys would respect his resume and recent success and his acumen with, you know, Penix and some of the other draft picks that they've developed guys that went last year and then guys that'll go this year. But Hey, he's getting one of those guys back. Caden Proctor is already done with Iowa. He's transferring back to Alabama after spending spring break was with his former Crimson Tide teammates. Just the ultimate reminder that yes, these guys can vote. Yes, there's certain things that they can now do as adults, but they these are still kids at the end of the day. I mean, they I don't know what point you want to say exactly they reach where they're uh, the grown men, you know, mortgage lenders and stockbrokers that I talked about in the tournament for some of these teams. But definitely at 19 years old after your freshman year, you're still still a kid. You're still a teenager. Oh, yeah. Shit, but look, most guys are still very immature until their mid to late twenties. That's why insurance companies will still charge a higher premium <laughs> until you're at the age of twenty five or twenty six. I forget what the exact number is. True. Like we are, <laughs> many of us just continue throughout our lives thinking with the little head more than the big head. But that's pretty much consensus for every guy up to a certain point in their mid twenties. True that. True that. All right. How about we end today with some ads for some of our great sponsors, starting with Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. 
Our newest location in the gorgeous Hill Country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Colbert, born and raised in Austin. Also need to show some love to Big Hat Spirits, bighatspirits.com. You see it right there on the screen. If you're watching on YouTube right now, so many great flavors. Ranch water, jalapeno ranch water, the margarita. They also have the prickly pear paloma, blackberry smoke, Texas mule. And for you non-alcohol fans, the margarita and mojito mocktails now. That's right, the mojito mocktail, a new addition to the Big Hat cocktail in a can family it is low in bs while high in real ingredients real alcohol real kombucha no added sugars and low in all the other bs as well that i try to avoid as somebody who is fairly health conscious most importantly when you go to bighatspirits.com you'll get great information but most importantly you can find that map of central texas and hey look at that it's starting to expand now it's not just central texas going all the way up into waco Going a little bit east now as well to the Round Top Liquor Shop. That's right. Go to that map at BigHatSpirits.com. Click on the icon that's closest to where you are. And that's where you can find those Big Hat Spirits, the cocktail in a can. And also want to show some love to audiovisual consultations. AVConsultations.com is the website, 255-8678. That's the number that you call to get that dream home theater set up going in your home. Maybe you've got grand plans in a place of business. Just think about what they've done in all the Pluckers locations across the state over the decades that they've been hooking Pluckers up. Yeah, that's all audiovisual consultations. You want a television in your bathroom, just like Pluckers, audiovisual consultations can do that and so much more. That's why you go to avconsultations.com to see all the different things that they can do for you. And then you're going to give Tom McKay a call, 512-255-8678. It's 255-8678 for audio visual consultations. Jeff, with that, we are at the end of another three to five show. Great stuff as always, man. Yeah, man. This was a blast as always. Always is. And I'll talk to you on Friday from three to five. Thanks to everybody for tuning in today. If you're on YouTube right now, please click that thumbs up button and do subscribe to the channel as well as downloading our free audio app. Just search Texas Sports Unfiltered in your app store. For Jeff and everybody else here at Texas Sports Unfiltered, I am Trey Elling. We'll talk to you tomorrow starting at 8 a.m. with Bucky and BK. In the meantime, have yourselves a great rest of the day and night, and hook them.